July session of 2023. So we are going to have the uh, rapid revision of the physiology. And this rapid revision is going to be done in two parts. This is the part one and there will be a part two also. So in this rapid revision, our main concentration, my main concentration is that, that you, you should, should never miss a single MCQ. MCQ. Okay, you, you should, should never miss a single MCQ, MCQ and, and that's, that's our target. target. So, so now, now in this today's class, class let's go by system wise. wise. We'll, we'll start, start with the cardiovascular system, system and in this cardiovascular system, system, what are the important topics that you should know? Okay, we are mainly concentrating on those topics where the questions are being asked. At the end of the day, this rapid revision should bring you as many questions as possible from the physiology point of view. Okay, so that's our target. Now, if you have any uh, doubts, uh, uh, like you know, if you, are, if you are getting any queries, you can al always post it in the comment section. I will likely to answer your questions in the middle way because it will disturb the flow. So, having said that, without any late, Let's begin our session. Now, guys, we are starting with the cardiovascular system. In this cardiovascular system, the first thing which I want you to know is the action potentials. The action potentials of what? The action potentials of a synod and the ventricular myocytes. Okay. Look here. Here I am showing you the synodal action potential, the pacemaker. Is the synod is a pacemaker, right? We know it controls the heart rate. Now, the first question which I want you to know is: so this synod. Is a pacemaker. Why it is a pacemaker? Even AV node can act as a pacemaker. Bundle office can act as a pacemaker, and the Purkinje fibers can act as a pacemaker. Okay, so why only SA node is a pacemaker, but not the AV node? Because SA node right here produces maximum action potentials in a minute. Okay, so maximum frequency. That's the important point. SA node is a pacemaker because it produces maximum frequency, maximum frequency of the action potentials. Okay, almost 60 to 100 action potentials will be produced by the SA node. So, the entire heart rate is under the control of the SA node. Okay. Now, if you look at the action potential graph here, okay, this is the SA nodal action potential graph. Don't confuse. See, the resting membrane potential, this is the MCQ. What is the resting membrane potential of the SA node? The resting membrane potential of the SA node is minus 60 millivolts MCQ. This is the MCQ. Okay. So, the SA node, the resting membrane potential is minus 60. And do you think it's going to stay minus 60 all the time? No, definitely not. This is the pacemaker cell, self-depolarizing, self-activating. So, it doesn't stay at minus 60 all the time. Now, what will happen? So, from minus 60, it is going to little positivity. From minus 60, it is going to minus 50, minus 40, something like that. So, look here. From here, minus 60, Okay, let's take this value. This is the starting point. Now, look here. It is moving towards, see, it is moving towards minus 40. Okay, this is the minus 40, right? See, this is the minus 40. So, now, the point which I want you to know is, so, what is this phase called as? This orange color line which I am depicting, what is this called as? See, the resting membrane potential is moving towards minus 40. This graph is called as, this phase, this phase of this graph is called as the prepotential. Okay, so, this is called as Prepotential, also called as pacemaker potential. Okay, pacemaker potential or prepotential. And it is also called as one more name, restless membrane potential. Why? Because it's not resting. It's not resting at minus 60. It is going from minus 60 to minus, uh, minus 50, minus 50 to minus 40. So, this is also called as restless membrane potential. So, now the question which will come in your exam is, so this pre-potential is due to, or the restless membrane potential, or this pacemaker potential, this part of this graph, it is due to what? It is due to influx of, okay, it's due to influx of sodium ions, as well as calcium ions also, later I will tell you. So, the point, the first point which I want you to know is, sir, this pre-potential phase, this orange color phase, this pre-potential phase, it is due to what? This pre-potential phase is due to influx of sodium as well as calcium. That's the MCQ. Okay. So, okay, done. Threshold potential is attained. Minus 40 is attained. Okay. So, minus 40, yes, it is attained. This level. Okay, it's attained. Now, what is the next phase which was shown in the graph? The next phase which was shown in the graph is in red color. Okay. Are you able to appreciate? Look here. This is the red color. 
See, now this red color phase is called as a depolarization. So, depolarization means activation, the cell is getting into positivity. Now, this a depolarization in an SA node, the SA nodal cell activation, the depolarization, it is due to what? It is due to influx of calcium ions. Okay, so this depolarization, it is due to rapid influx of calcium ions. Now, some students will get it out. Prepotential is due to sodium as well as calcium. Okay, but important point is, now let me tell you here, see in prepotential, okay, in prepotential, both sodium is coming into the cell as well as calcium is coming into the cell. But this calcium is coming via T-type calcium channels. So, that calcium is coming via the T-type calcium channels, T for transient, for little time, only little amount of calcium will come via the T-type calcium channels. And if you ask me one more important MCQ, this sodium, sodium is coming via which channels? The sodium entry into the SA nodal cell, the sodium will come via which channels they will ask you? During prepotential, sodium is coming into the cell via which channels? Via leaky or funny are also called as IF, okay, leaky sodium channels, funny sodium channels are IF channels. So, sodium is coming into the cell during prepotential via leaky sodium channels. Calcium is coming into the cell during prepotential via the T-type calcium channels. But look here, this is the depolarization which I am showing you in yellow color, okay. So, this depolarization is due to influx of calcium via L-type calcium channels. Okay, see now I am writing about the phase of depolarization. So, depolarization, it is due to influx of calcium again, but via which channels? Via L-type. Okay, via L-type calcium channels. Okay, done. After depolarization, what is the next phase? The next phase is the repolarization. See this blue one coming down. Okay, the blue color curve which is coming down, this part, this part of the graph. So, this is called as a repolarization. And what is, uh, why this repolarization? Repolarization means inactivation, coming back to the shing membrane potential. So, this repolarization, it is due to potassium efflux. Don't forget, it's the outflux or efflux. Efflux of potassium ions will cause the repolarization. Guys, again, I'm telling you, here I'm not going to explain you in detail. This is not the time to go in detail explanation. Here, our major target is in a limited amount of time, let's complete as many important topics as possible. So, at the end of the day, this one session should give you all the MCQs. Okay, that's the target. So, remember, in SA nodal action potential, three phases are there. One is restless membrane potential due to sodium and calcium influx. Second one is the depolarization. Depolarization is due to influx of calcium via L-type calcium channels. And repolarization is the due to efflux of potassium. Done. Okay. But sometimes they can change the names. See, this depolarization is also called as phase 0. Okay, depolarization is also called as a phase 0. And a repolarization, okay, this repolarization is also called as phase 3. Okay, phase 3. So, depolarization is all the time phase 0. Repolarization is also called as a phase 3. So, that's it. Done. Okay. Now, after SA nodal action potential, now, let's discuss about the ventricular myocyte action potential, ventricular myocyte, the ventricular muscle. So, what happens in this ventricular muscle? How, like, you know, it's going to have its uh, um, action potential, the depolarization and the repolarization. Now, look here. See, this is a muscle cell, right? This is the muscle. So, do you think muscles can undergo self-depolarization, self-activation? No. So, they are all the time relaxed. Okay, they are all the time relaxed. But when you stimulate them, Yes, they will undergo depolarization and later they will undergo contraction, okay. So, what is the resting membrane? It's all the time resting. The muscles are resting. When you stimulate them, they will undergo depolarization followed by contraction, okay. So, the resting membrane potential MCQ is minus 90 millivolts. So, RMP of a ventricular myocyte is minus 90 millivolts. When you stimulate them, what will happen? Depolarization, okay. Depolarization means activation. The cell is getting into positivity. So, the next phase which I am showing you here, in this green color curve, this is the depolarization. You also know this depolarization is also called as a phase 0. Depolarization is also called as a phase 0. And this depolarization is the due to what? This depolarization is due to influx of sodium or calcium. See, in SA node, don't forget, in SA node, 
the depolarization is due to influx of calcium. But here look, in ventricular myocyte, right now I am talking about the ventricular muscle. In this ventricular myocyte, the depolarization is due to influx of sodium. It is due to sodium influx. MCQ, depolarization is sodium dependent. After this, next point which I want you to know is after depolarization, any cell will undergo repolarization, inactivation, like relaxation, right? So now, see, cell is undergoing repolarization. See, this is the phase 1 cells start to undergo repolarization. So, phase 1 is early repolarization. But do you know something what happens now? See, during repolarization, is, is potassium is going out. Okay, potassium is going out. But do you know something what happens? This is the question which came in NEET PG 2023 exam. NEET PG 2023 exam. I think which happened almost uh, uh, 120 like this back. I think. See, now when the repolarization is happening, potassium is going out. But at the same time, do you know? Calcium will start to come into the cell. So, positive ions are going out of the cell. K plus is going out of the cell. At the same time, what is happening? Calcium is coming into the cell. So, efflux of potassium is balanced by influx of calcium. So, do you think there will be any change in resting membrane potential? Now, uh, the membrane potential, do you think any change will be there? No. It's all, it's now it's going to be constant. It's like a plateau. Okay. So, now, please, please look here. This phase is called as a plateau also called as a phase 2. Now, what is the important point? In this phase 2 or plateau, there is a calcium influx which is balanced by potassium efflux. Okay, they will ask you, in plateau phase, what is happening? Calcium influx balanced by potassium efflux. That's it. Now, after that, what happens? Repolarization, repolarization, after some times, the calcium influx decreases, the calcium influx decreases, potassium efflux continues, so that there is repolarization again. So, again, phase 3, repolarization is due to efflux of potassium. Okay, let us uh, sum it up. Now, tell me guys, the ventricular myocyte, the ventricular muscle. Now, what is the resting membrane potential of the ventricular myocyte? Minus 90 millivolts. When you stimulate, depolarization will occur. Depolarization is also called as a phase 0, dependent on sodium influx. After depolarization, what do we have? Repolarization. But during repolarization, there is a phase called as a plateau phase, phase 2 or a plateau, where calcium influx is balanced by potassium influx. Okay. After that, there is phase 3 or repolarization. Done. Okay. The two important topics completed. Now, after this, what else you should know in cardiovascular system? The most important, the question which was asked in uh, FMG exam as well as a NEET PG exam, the last FMG and last NEET PG exam, this question has been asked. The question is, S2 heart sound is heard during NEET PG exam. This was the question. S2 heart sound is heard during when? And S1 heart sound, S3, S4, these heart sounds are heard during. So, here, as we don't have much time, let me tell you some basics. Okay? See, the systole, okay, the systole, the heart contraction, the systole, mainly I am talking about the ventricles, not the atria. We are not concerned about the atria. When I am talking about the heart contraction relaxation, we are mainly concerned about the ventricles. Okay. So, systole means contraction. How many phases are there in the systole? See, in the systole, there are three phases. One is isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase, slow ejection phase. Three phases are there. So, in systole, there are three phases. How many phases are there in the diastole? See, in the diastole, there are five phases present. Okay. What are these five phases called as? Protodiastole, isovolumetric relaxation, rapid ventricular filling, and uh, rapid ventricular filling, diastasis, and atrial system. These are the five phases. Okay. So, again, I am highlighting. See, don't worry about the PDF. PDF will be up, uh, up, uh, uh, uploaded in the Telegram group. You don't worry about the PDF. Okay. PDF you will get. So, what are the three phases in the system? Isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase, slow ejection phase. Systolic phases are completed. What are the five phases of the diastole? The five phases of the diastole are protodiastole, isovolumetric relaxation, rapid ventricular filling, and atrial, uh, rapid ventricular filling, diastasis, and atrial systole. These are the five phases of diastole. Now, what they will ask you the questions? Sir, S1 heart sound, it is due to what? Okay, you will hear S1 and S2 heart sound, say, lub dub. Okay, this is S1 and S2 heart sound. So, this S1 and S2 heart sound, they are due to what? Why we can hear this S1 and S2 heart sounds? Okay, for uh, you to understand, I am just showing you the heart in a simple way. You already know this. Now, look here. This is the four chambers of the heart. These are the four chambers of the heart. Now, this is the right side of the heart. This is the left side of the heart. This is right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. 
Now please tell me what are these valves which are present over here? What is this valve which is present over here? What is this valve? This is the tricuspid valve and what is this valve which is present over here? This is the mitral valve. Okay, this is the mitral valve. And what is this blood vessel which is coming out of the left ventricle? It is the aorta. And what is this blood vessel that is coming out of the right ventricle? This is the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk. The blood is going to the lungs. Now what is this valve which is present over here? This valve which is present over here. So this valve which is there over here is the aortic valve. This is the aortic valve. And what is this valve which is present over here? This valve which is present over here is the pulmonary valve. Okay. Aortic valve and pulmonic valve. The semilunar valves. Now question is. Why S1 heart sound? S1 heart sound is due to, it's a closure of mitral and tricuspid valve. This valve, this is the mitral valve. Okay, let me write here. This is the mitral valve and this is the tricuspid valve. Closure of mitral valve and tricuspid valve. Yeah, here. Yeah. See, the closure of tricuspid valve and mitral valve. Whenever they close, okay, whenever these valves closes, then it will cause a heart sound called as S1 heart sound. So, that's why here also I have shown you, please look here. See, this S1 heart sound, this is due to closure of M1 and T1, mitral valve and tricuspid valve, they will close and cause the S1 heart sound. Okay, but question is, when S1 heart sound is heard, during which phase? Look here in the timeline diagram, in this time graph, in this entire time graph, please look and tell me. Sir, S1 heart sound is heard in the beginning, in the beginning, beginning of the isovolumetric contraction. In the beginning of the isovolumetric contraction, there is S1 heart sound. Okay, so S1 heart sound is due to closure of mitral valve and tricuspid valve and it is heard during uh, beginning of the isovolumetric contraction. Completed. Now, next question. Sir, why the hell is this S2 heart sound is there? Why S2 heart sound? Sir, S2 heart sound is due to closure of aortic valve and pulmonic valve. Whenever the aortic valve and pulmonic valve, whenever they close, they cause the second heart sound, S2 heart sound. And when S2 heart sound is heard, you look at this time diagram and tell me when S2 heart sound is heard. See, the best answer, the best answer is S2 heart sound is heard during protodiastole, remember. Okay, see this S2 heart sound due to closure of aortic valve and pulmonic valve. A2, P2, aortic valve closes and pulmonic valve closes. So, closure of A2 and P2 will cause the S2 heart sound and S2 heart sound is heard during protodiastole. But in some of the exams, the protodiastole answer, like you know, if the, if the option is not there, then you have to pick up which phase. Then you have to pick up the next best phase is isovolumetric relaxation C in the isovolumetric relaxation or you should you can say in the beginning of the isovolumetric relaxation okay so S1 is heard during isovolumetric contraction and S2 is heard during protodiastole if protodiastole is not there in the option then go with the isovolumetric relaxation okay in the beginning of the isovolumetric relaxation completed okay next step what else you should know is S3 heart sound Okay, don't go with the ejection click opening snap, not needed. S3 and S4. See this S3 heart sound, it is heard during and S4 heart sound is heard during which phases? Which phases of the cardiac cycle? Again, just try to recollect guys, how many phases are there in the systole? Three phases. Isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase REP and slow ejection phase SCP. Okay, here I am showing rap uh, isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase and slow ejection phase. Okay, done. Now, look here in the diastolic phases. There are five phases in the diastole. But in which phase S3 is heard? Look and tell me. See here. This phase, there is a phase called as a rapid ventricular filling. Okay, ventricles are getting filled. Rapid ventricular filling. Okay, so during rapid ventricular filling, blood is filling into the ventricles, right? Blood from the atria, it is coming down into the ventricles. That will cause a sound. Okay, so that is called as S3 heart sound. So look here, S3 heart sound. So S3 heart sound is during rapid ventricular filling. MCQ. And also remember, I am asking you, just try to answer it. Rapid ventricular filling, ventricles are getting filled by actively or passively. During rapid ventricular filling, the ventricles are getting filled with the blood. And that filling of the ventricles can cause the sound. That is the S3 heart sound. Now, question is, this rapid ventricular filling, is it happening actively or passively? See, this rapid ventricular filling, it is a passive phase. It's a passive filling. 70% of the ventricles, MCQ, 70% of the ventricles are filled passively. Means, no need of atrial contraction. Most of the students will think, atrial contraction will cause filling of the ventricles. Yes, that's true. But, 70% filling of the ventricles happen passively. So, simply blood will directly fall into the 
ventricles without even atrial contraction. So, rapid ventricular filling phase is a passive phase, which is 70% filling of the ventricles. Then, if 70% ventricles are filled during rapid ventricular filling, then 30%, the other 30%. See, atrial systole, guys, see, the atrial systole, it accounts for 30% filling of ventricles. So, 30% filling of the ventricles is due to atrial systole. So, atrial contract fills 30% of the ventricles. So, atrial systole is active phase. Okay, atrial systole is active. Now comes the question. See, now even when the atria is contracting, when the atria contracts, even it causes a sound. Okay, the atrial contraction will also cause a sound and that sound is S4 heart sound. Okay, see, this is the beauty. Now, S1 is heard during isovolumetric contraction, in the beginning of the isovolumetric contraction. S2 is heard during protodiastole. S3 is heard during rapid ventricular filling. That's a passive filling of the ventricles, 70% filling of the ventricles. And S4, okay, S4 is heard during atrial systole where 30% Ventricles are getting filled. Okay, done. Okay, these are the important points which I want you to know. Uh, S1, S2, S3, S4. And my question to you is in a healthy individuals like you and me, now usually the S3 and S4 heart sounds, they are not heard. Okay, S3 and S4 heart sounds, they are usually not uh, they are not heard. They are very low pitch heart sounds. They are usually not heard. They are heard in pathological conditions. But one MCQ is S3 heart sound is physiological. The physiological in children. In children, you can hear this, okay, but in adults, no. So, S3 heart sound is physiological in children. Done? Completed? Now, after this, what else I want you to know? Um, guys, we have discussed about the heart sounds, four important heart sounds S1, S2, S3, S4, and their phases uh, when these heart sounds are heard. Now, I have also discussed that S3 and S4 heart sounds. See, in the entire medicines, there are uh, there are these heart sounds which are low pitch heart sounds, which means you cannot hear them uh, with the normal side of the stethoscope in healthy individuals. So only you can hear them in pathological conditions. That too with the dap not with the diaphragm side, but with the bell side. There is a small side of the stethoscope, right? It's called the bell side. So in these heart sounds like S3, which is heard during again rapid ventricular filling, S4 that is heard during atrial contraction. And there is a sound called as a tumor plop sound. And this tumor plop sound, they will ask you the question. So, this tumor plop sound is seen in which condition? See, whenever you are having a tumor, look here, there is a tumor which is called as an atrial myxoma, means tumor in the left atria. Okay, there is a tumor in the left atria which is arising from the intraatrial septum. Okay, there is an intraatrial septum, right? From there, this tumor is arising. And this tumor, it's a pedunculated tumor, it's a dangling. Okay, it's a pedunculated tumor, it will dance and it will cause heart sound. Okay, so this a tumor plop sound is heard in a condition called as atrial myxoma. In the medicine, these are the only low pitch heart sounds. So, S3, S4 and tumor plop sound, these are the low pitch heart sounds. Okay, so these are the points which I want you to know. Next, what else you should know for your exams? Guys, without knowing these things, you cannot understand the left ventricular pressure volume loops. What are they? See, end diastolic volume, end systolic volume. So, what is this end diastolic volume and what is this end systolic volume? Simple, man. Look here. Let me draw a heart for you. A four chambered heart, left atria. Sorry. This is not left atria, this is right atria. Okay, right atria, right ventricle, left atria and left ventricle. Okay, now see, now normally, normally, heart is there, right? Left ventricle is there. I am talking about the left ventricle. Now, heart is filling with the blood. Yes, right. Heart is filling with the blood. Now, how much blood is going to fill into the left ventricle? Before contraction, see, ventricle is absolutely relaxed. Ventricle is now relaxed like this. Now, ventricle is getting filled with the blood. Okay. Now, how much blood is going to get filled in this left ventricle? How much blood? So, that is called as end diastolic volume. End diastolic volume means at the end of the diastole, means at the end of the relaxation phase. How much blood is going to be filled in the left ventricle? Somewhere around 120 to 150 ml. So, your heart is going to be filled with almost 120 to 150 ml of blood. Okay. So, with every contraction, okay, now 120 ml blood is there or 150 ml blood is there. Okay, now with every contraction, okay, how much blood is going to come out? 
out of 120, there is 120 for example, round figure, like you know, 120 or 140, 150, the range from 120 to 150. If there is 120 ml blood with every contraction, how much will come out? That is called as stroke volume. Okay. So, blood coming out, blood ejecting with a beat. Okay, blood ejecting with one heartbeat. This is called as the stroke volume. And how much is the stroke volume? Do you know? The stroke volume will be somewhere around 70 ml to 90 ml. Okay, so, so with every heartbeat out of this 120, once if the heart contracts out of 120, do you think every all this 120 will come out? No, all this 120 won't come out. 120 is filled, but with every heartbeat, 70 will come out or 90 will come out, 70 to 90 depends on the performance of the heart, okay. And this is the stroke volume, okay, stroke volume also completed. Now, after this, what you should know, out of this 150, okay, 150 is the end diastolic volume, okay, end diastolic volume is 150 or 140. Now, out of this, for example, 150 is there. Now, out of this 150, maybe, now how much is coming out? 90 is coming out. Okay, 90 is coming out. Out of 150, 90 is coming out. So, how much is left over in the heart? Still in the heart, something is left over. Means all the time in the heart, something is left over. Means even after the contraction, see, even after the systole, some blood is still in the heart. How much is that? That is called as end systolic volume, ESV. So, end systolic volume, what is the value? The end systolic volume is out of 150, if you minus 90, 60 ml. A round figure, like you know, round figure we will talk about 50 ml. Okay, 50 ml of the blood is all the time there in the heart. Means even after the contraction, even after the contraction, 50 ml is there in the heart. Okay, how much came out? 70 to 90 came out. But how much filled? How much is filled in the ventricles? 122, 150, 122, 150. Okay, so different, different books mention different, different things. So some books mention 120 to 140, some books mention 120 to 150. So, completed. End diastolic volume is completed, 120 to 150. End systolic volume completed. End systolic volume is somewhere around 50 ml. And what is the stroke volume? 70 to 90 ml. Completed. Done. Now, after this, what else you should know for your exams? It's the murmurs. See, the importance of this end systolic volume and diastolic volume, uh, that will be like, you know, that you will understand better in the topic called as the left ventricular pressure volume loops. This is called as the LV pressure volume loops. Okay, this topic. Here you will understand that. But for now, first let's concentrate on the murmur part. Okay, sir, what are these murmurs? See, these murmurs are the abnormal sounds, right? Definitely. Now, how to understand this? Step by step. Look here in this time graph. Okay. See, systole is a phase which is present between which heart sounds? Look and tell me. So, systole it is present between S1 and S2. So, between S1 and S2, what do you have? Systole is there. And again from S2 and S1, between S2 and S1, which phase is there? Diastole is there. So, systole is present between S1 and S2. And between S2 and S1, which phase is, which phase is there? Diastole. So, in the same way, look here. So, this is the exact image based question exact image based question which was given in NEET PG 2023 exam image based question I will tell you what is that also okay see here look here concentrate S1 and S2 so between S1 and S2 which phase is there systole so yes this is the phase of systole and between S2 and S1 which phase is there diastole there is a diastole okay so now look here in this phase systole there is a murmur present Okay, there is this murmur present. So, what is this murmur called as? This murmur is present throughout the systole. Again, say this murmur is coming throughout the systole with the same intensity. The intensity of the murmur is also same. So, this is called as pan-systolic murmur or holosystolic murmur MCQ. So, holosystolic murmur or pan-systolic murmur. Okay. Now, it is heard in which conditions? Important. It is heard in mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation. Now, you can ask me, sir, what is this mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation? In a simple way, okay, in under less than 30 seconds, we can explain. See, what is this wall? This is the mitral wall. What is this wall? This is the tricuspid wall, okay? See, when the ventricles are contracting, when the ventricles are contracting, the blood was supposed to go into aorta. 
and the blood was supposed to go into the pulmonary trunk. But what if this tricuspid valve is not closing properly? What if this mitral valve is not closing properly? What happens? So during systole, see during ventricular contraction, blood is going back into the atria. So will it cause up, uh, like an unnecessary sound or not? Yes, it do cause an unnecessary sound. Okay. So that's why there is a murmur during systole or throughout the systole. What are the causes? The causes are tricuspid regurgitation or mitral regurgitation. So, during mitral or tricuspid insufficiency means regurgitation only. Okay. So, during mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation, there is holosystolic murmur or pan-systolic murmur. Murmur is there throughout the systole. And any other condition, VSD. Okay. Ventricular septal defect. Okay. Ventricular septal defect also called as a VSD. Sir, sir what is this ventricular septal defect? Again, under less than 25 seconds, let us see this. Now, what is this septum called as which I am showing you? So, this septum is called as the interventricular septum, right? Now, look here what is happening, okay? Now, look here what is happening. There is a defect, interventricular septal defect, okay? There is a hole, okay? Now, what happens? All the time, we know left side have higher pressures. See, left ventricle have higher pressures than the right ventricle. So, this is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. Now, left ventricle have a higher pressure. So, what happens? When the ventricle, left ventricle is contracting, Okay, when the left ventricle is contracting during systole, high pressure is there. So, what happens? The blood is going to unnecessarily, it is getting shunted towards the right side, into the right ventricle. So, does it cause any murmur or not? Yes, it do causes the sound, it causes the murmur. But when murmur during systole? So, again, yes, this ventricular septal defect, VSD, even during ventricular septal defect, during systole, there is abnormal sound. The blood is getting shunted from left ventricle to the right ventricle. Okay. So, please tell me, holosystolic murmur or the pan-systolic murmur? This is heard during which conditions? Mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, ventricular septal defect. That's it. That's it. Okay. Next, the second type of murmur. Look, the second one. This is the first murmur completed. Now, look here, guys. This is the second murmur. Now, when this murmur is heard, during systole or diastole? First, tell me. Sir, even the second murmur, it is heard during systolic phase only. Okay, see, between S1 and S2. This is the phase of systole, right? The blue color one, which is the systole. Now, but important point is, the murmur intensity increases and decreases. Okay, murmur intensity is increasing and decreasing. Increasing, decreasing. So, it's like a diamond shape, right? Okay, or rhombus shape. So, increase in intensity, decrease in intensity. Like, something like that. Okay, increases and decreases. So, this murmur is called as a crescendo, decrescendo murmur. So, MCQ, crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Yes, it is a systolic murmur. Or the diamond shape murmur, rhombus shape murmur. It is heard during which condition? Now, it is heard in conditions like pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis. Remember simply aortic stenosis. Sub or, or sub aortic stenosis, they are one and the same. I will, they, yeah, there is a difference, I will explain. Now, how to understand this? Okay, let me show you here. Okay. Guys, here I am showing you the crescendo, decrescendo murmur right here. Crescendo, decrescendo murmur. Okay, so now by this time you already know crescendo, decrescendo murmur, rhombus shape murmur, all the diamond shape murmur seen in pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis. Why? Why this murmur, sir? Now, if you look here, this is the heart in a simple way. Now, what are these outflows? These, these outflows from the left ventricle. What is this outflow called? This is the aorta. Right? And what is this one? This is the pulmonic trunk. This is the pulmonary trunk. Now tell me, what is this valve which is present over here? This is the aortic valve. What is this valve which is present over here? This is the pulmonic. Uh, that is the aortic valve. This is the pulmonic valve. These are the semilunar valves. Now what if they are totally stenosed? Stenosed means now they are totally calcified. Maybe. Okay. Because of uh, some senile reasons, there is senile calcific degeneration of these valves with age. Okay. With age, they are calcified. Now, whenever they are calcified, what happens? Now, left ventricle have to generate more pressure. Okay. Now, after load is increased. Okay. Because of the stenosis, after load is increased. Now, it is totally narrowed. Now, the ventricle have to generate more pressure to open these valves. They are calcified valves. So, now, there is a very little outflow. The outflow tract is getting calcified. Whenever the outflow tract is calcified, See, now left ventricle is generating more pressure. Even the right ventricle, they will generate more pressure. But see, what about the outflow? It's very much narrowed down. 
let me show you here see now it is very much narrowed down it's like a tunnel so when the blood is going through this tunnel will it make sound or not yes it makes sound so initially more blood will be there in the left ventricle okay initially in the starting in the starting more blood will be there in the left ventricle when this more blood when it start to go out into the iota with higher pressure what happens the murmur sound also increases but with the time what happens blood is going out okay the amount of blood in the left ventricle decreases the pressure generated by the left ventricle also decreases so less sound so intensity of sound increases later decreases increases decreases initially more blood so more sound simple later less blood less sound so both in both same the right side also the same thing okay so both in pulmonic stenosis as well as aortic stenosis or subaortic stenosis all the same things there is crescendo decrescendo murmur the outflow tract is calcified now it's like a narrow tunnel when the blood is passing through this narrow tunnel with high velocity it causes some abnormal sound that is called as the crescendo decrescendo murmur simple that's the mcq okay so second murmur also successfully completed okay next what we should know so for your exams especially fmg exams the next uh, murmur which i want you to know is see there is this murmur which is present in the systole as well as this murmur is continuing through the diastole there is again murmur coming in the systole as well as the diastole so systolic murmur as well as the diastolic murmur the, what is this murmur called as see this murmur is called as the continuous murmur or machinery like murmur okay so continuous or machinery like murmur this is the third murmur which i want you to know okay no need to remember these murmurs so there is a continuous murmur also called as a machinery murmur seen in which condition it is seen in a condition called as pati, patent ductus arteriosus pda okay so in a condition called as patent ductus arteriosus there is continuous machinery murmur now you some students will have a doubt sir why this uh, continuous machinery murmur okay for them let me show and let me give an explanation within just under 30 seconds so this is the heart Okay, let me draw the heart in a different view so that you can better understand see this is the heart with right atria right ventricle left atria and the left ventricle okay can you tell me what is this outflow i am drawing the outflow now like this what is the outflow from the left ventricle what is that blood vessel that comes out of the left ventricle simple iota sir and what is that blood vessel which comes out of the, the right ventricle pulmonary trunk okay so pulmonary trunk and the iota this is the okay let me write the terms also this is the pulmonary trunk this is the pulmonary trunk okay now why i am showing them in red color and blue color you know they contains oxygenated one contains oxygenated blood iota contains oxygenated blood and the pulmonary trunk contains the deoxygenated blood okay see if there is uh, this abnormal connection actually this is a uh, connection which is physiological during uh, like embryogenesis during intrauterine period this is okay but if you, ha you have if you have to uh, like you know if you have this connection even after the birth see there is an abnormal connection between these two blood vessels so this abnormal connection this is called as patent okay before birth it is called as ductus arteriosus that is okay before birth that connection is okay but now this is called as pda patent ductus arteriosus so now whenever there is this patent ductus arteriosus do you know what happens so this patent ductus arteriosus it is causing left to right shunt okay remember all the time during systole diastole 24 by 7 the pressure in the iota is always greater than the pulmonary trunk so what happened to the blood now the blood is going to shunt into the pulmonary trunk okay you know 24 by 7 24 by 7 it is not like during systole during diastole no continuously throughout the day the blood it is some amount of blood not the total blood some amount of blood is getting shunted from the iota into the pulmonary trunk pulmonary trunk so do you think it will cause some abnormal sound or not what do you guess yes this unnecessary shunting will cause abnormal sound so this is called as machinery murmur okay machinery murmur also called as a continuous murmur why we are calling it as continuous murmur why because it happens continuously so continuous murmur or machinery murmur it is seen in patent ductus arteriosus crescendo decrescendo murmur seen in pulmonic stenosis or aortic stenosis or subaortic stenosis 
ओके नेक्स्ट मर्मर होलो सिस्टोलिक मर्मर और पैन सिस्टोलिक मर्मर सीन इन मिटल रिगर्जिटेशन रेगस्पेड रिगर्जिटेशन आर विंटर क्लाइड सेपरेट इफेक्ट इफ यू नो दिस यू नो दिस मर्मर नाउ आफ्टर दिस वॉट इज दिल आस्क यू इन योर एग्जाम so if i am the examiner i will definitely give you this question only why because this is a question which was tested in many fmg exams and many pg exams any fmg and many pg exams this one graph they will ask you see here i am not going in detail first of all i am not going in detail but i will tell you what you should know for your exam okay even the uh, recent neat pg exam this question was there okay recent neat pg exam also this question was asked okay See one thing again. I am telling you, if you know these concepts enough, okay, hundred percent. If you know these concepts, if you watch this rapid revision part one as well as part two and go to the exams, you will answer all the physiology related questions with flying colors, just like that. Okay. Now, first, when student look at this graph, they will feel depressed. Oh my God, sir, graphs we can't understand. Simple man, simple. See on this x-axis, what I am showing you. i'm talking about the volume some volume and do you know these volumes what are these volumes sir the volumes which i'm talking here are the end systolic volume esv end systolic volume what is that end systolic volume sir even after systole how much blood will be there in the ventricles even after systole 50 ml blood will be there so that's why see i'm starting the point here look here the end systolic volume i'm starting from this 50 ml okay 50 ml blood is there now ventricle is like this How much blood is there? 50 ml is there. Now ventricle is like this. Its contraction completed. Now, even now, 50 ml blood is there. Now what will happen? Ventricle is now getting relaxed, completely relaxed, and now it is getting filled with the blood or not? Yes, 50 ml is not sufficient. It have to fill 140. It have to fill 140. Okay. So now look here. The ventricle is getting filled with the blood. So that's why look the graph is moving. The pink color line. So what is the importance of this pink color line? same yeah so here what i am showing you is the ventricle is getting filled the ventricle is getting filled and how much filling how much it will fill so at the end of the diastole how much volume is going to be there see 120 so end diastolic volume is going to be 120 okay so this top, in the bottom most in this graph the bottom most curve what it is representing ventricular filling ventricle is getting filled okay ventricle is getting filled okay now questions what they will ask you is see what is this starting point see at this starting point what happens they will give you i am giving the mark a okay so what is happening now see ventricle is like this okay ventricle is like this ventricle have to fill no think logically man ventricle have to fill okay let me show you the image so that you will have a better clarity okay i am talking about see for example mainly i am talking about the left side left side what is this left atria And what is this? This is the left ventricle. Now, how much blood is there? Fifty mL is going to be there. That is the end systolic volume. Now, if the left ventricle, if it have to fill, now tell me which valve should open? So there is a valve called as a mitral valve. It is closed actually during systole. It is closed. Now, if you want the ventricles to be filled, if you want the ventricles to be filled, now what happened to the mitral valve? This valve have to open. It have to open. Then only the blood will fall into the left ventricle. So that's why I say in the beginning, beginning at the A point, what is happening? The mitral valve is opening. Mitral valve opened. So blood is falling into the left ventricle. So left ventricular volume increases from 50 to 120. So that's why look here the volume is increasing. Now how much increased? 120. So left ventricle is having how much volume now? 120 volume. Now tell me, after filling, what should happen? After filling, what should happen? The ventricle have to contract. Ventricle have to contract. But before contracting, see now, ventricle if it contracts, the blood have to look here and tell me. So now, because of the filling, how much blood is there inside the ventricle? Now filling completed. Okay, now filling completed. Now let me write here. There is. 140 uh, 150 ml of blood is there 140 to 150 ml of blood is there that is the end diastolic volume okay, end diastolic volume see the range can be 120 to 140 or 150 okay i have already cleared this 120 to 140 it will be the range the left ventricle will fill now when the ventricle is filled tell me the blood where it have to go the blood have to go into the aorta 
but not into the left atria not it should not go into the left atria so what should happen sir when the ventricles are filled properly 140 ml 120 ml they are filled so first what should happen now this wall this mitral wall it have to close like the mitral valve have to close okay so that's why whenever you are having this 120 ml of blood okay whenever you are having 120 ml of blood or 140 ml of the blood what is happening see at this phase at this point immediately what happened mitral valve is closed so at a mitral valve opens at c point they can give you any number like you know, 1 2 3 4 or a b c d doesn't matter at a in this graph i am showing you mitral valve is opening and at c mitral valve is closing from A to C, what is happening? See, from A to C, this area, the left ventricle is getting filled. Okay. Again, I am telling you guys, this graph is called as left ventricular pressure volume loop. We are talking only about the left ventricle, not about the right ventricle. We are only talking about the left ventricle. Okay. So, done, sir, completed. Now, after this, what is happening? After this, see, mitral valve is closed. No, mitral valve is closed. Once the mitral valve is closed, now what is happening? See, the left ventricle it is contracting. When the left ventricle is contracting, pressure increases are not tell me. Inside the left ventricle, see, the left ventricle is contracting. When the left ventricle is contracting, the pressure inside the left ventricle increases. Okay, how much increase, sir? You know, right? The first pressure will increase to 80. So that's why, see, now, do you, do you know what is this blue color phase which we are showing here? See, this blue color line... What is happening? See, the pressure, the pressure in the left ventricle is increasing up to 80. Now, for the first time, we are talking about this axis. What is this y-axis? On the y-axis, I am talking about the pressures. I am talking about the pressures in the left ventricle. On the x-axis, x -axis, what I am talking about? On the x-axis, I am talking about the volumes, volume of blood in the left ventricle. Volume of blood in the left ventricle. On the y-axis, I am talking about the pressure, pressure in the left ventricle. Okay, see, now after filling 120 ml of blood, left ventricle is contracting. When the left ventricle is contracting, the pressure increases to 80. Okay, the pressure is increasing to 80. Do you know what is this phase called as? This phase is the systole, right? So, this phase of the systole is called as isovolumetric contraction. Aha, uh -huh, now you understood. Previously, we have discussed, see here, in the systole, in the beginning, beginning, I ask you to remember, see, in the systole, what is the first phase? isovolumetric contraction do you know what is happening during isovolumetric contraction so during isovolumetric contraction the pressure is increasing up to 80 okay the pressure is increasing up to 80 mmhg now we will get it out sir so after isovolumetric contraction what is the next phase rapid ejection phase rapid ejection phase simple but look here okay this timeline diagram is very important guys even if it takes some time not an issue Look here. Same. Isovolumetric contraction, you already know. It starts with S1 heart sound. Means mitral valve. See, mitral valve is closed. Mitral valve closed. Isovolumetric contraction. Pressure increases to 80 mm Hg. Now, now, do you know what happens? Sir, when the pressure is 81 mm Hg. Now, look here. Look at in this uh, left ventricular pressure volume loop. Now, comes here. Now, 80 pressure, okay. But when the pressure becomes 81 mm Hg, do you know what happens? Immediately, aortic valve is now opened. Okay, now aortic valve is opened. So, in a simple way, look here. This is your heart. Okay. Now, this is the mitral valve. This is the tricuspid valve. What is this one? This is the aorta. Okay. Now, heart is, like, you know, this normally aortic valve is all the time closed. This aortic valve it's closed aortic valve is closed now what it is doing heart is generating a pressure of 80 okay but when the heart pressure when it becomes 81 when it crosses 80 and becomes 80.1 okay now what happens immediately this wall will open this aortic valve it will start to open aortic valve is open now okay the aortic valve is open so immediately what happens very very rapidly blood is going to eject into the aorta Iota. So, that's why please tell me what happens at this D point, at this D point, aortic valve is open. Once aortic valve is open, what is the next phase? See, next we are going to have the rapid ejection phase. Now, rapidly, rapidly, blood is getting ejected. But also know one point. This left ventricle, 
it is still contracting. At 80, this valve is open. But left ventricle, it is still contracting. And the pressure which it will generate is maximum of 120 mm Hg. 120 mm Hg. Okay. See, everything you will understand. Just listen what I am saying you. Okay. Now, what I am showing you here. So, the left ventricle maximum, how much it will generate a pressure? It will generate a pressure of 120 mm Hg. So, what is this phase called as? This phase which I am showing you is called as a rep, rapid ejection phase, rapid ejection phase, where the pressure is moving from 80 to 120 mm Hg. Okay, done, completed. Now, next, what is the next phase? The next phase, after rapid ejection phase, you are having slow ejection. Why we are calling it as a slow ejection? Because, see, now, the pressure is falling from 120, the pressure is falling from 120, again back to 80 mm Hg. The pressure is falling. So, the ejection of blood into the iota is also decreasing. Okay, the ejection of blood into the iota is also decreasing. So, that's why this is called as slow ejection phase. Blood is going out, but slowly. Okay, so now, please tell me, here, this is x-axis and this is y-axis. Okay, on x-axis, I am telling you, I am showing you two values. What are they? 50 ml and 120 ml. For example, 50 ml and 120 ml. What is this 50 ml and what is this 120 ml? You should tell me. See here, I am showing you what is this. This is the curve which I am showing you. Like this, there are certain points. Point number A, point number B, point number C. Ah, not like this. Point number C. Point number D, point number E. Now, see, here the pressure is, uh, let me show you the graph like this. Okay, now this is the pressure of 80, this is the pressure of maximum 120. Okay, now what is this graph? First of all, this graph is left ventricular pressure volume loop. Left ventricular pressure volume loop. Now, what is this point number A? Which event is happening during point number A? Simple. Mitral wall opens. Mitral wall opens. Okay. And how much blood is there inside the ventricle at the starting point? End systolic volume. That is 50 ml. 50 ml. So, what is this point B called as? This B point or the C point? Doesn't matter. They will give you any number. This point is called as? Sorry, this point is B point. What happens during here? Here, mitral wall closes. Mitral wall closes. And what? This is the C point. Okay. This is point number C. Oh. This is the point number C. Now, what is this phase? What is this phase? This is the isovolumetric contraction. IVC. Isovolumetric contraction. The pressure is increasing. Okay. Up to 80. Now, which event happens during C point? During C point, Iotic wall opens. Iotic wall opens. Okay. Now, from C to D, for example, if this is point number D, what is this C to D phase? This is called as a rapid ejection phase. Rapidly, the blood is getting ejected. Rapid ejection phase. Now, from D, D to E, what is this D to E is called as? Now, this D to E, it is called as a slow ejection phase. SCP, slow ejection phase. And what happens? When the pressure in the left ventricle, see when the pressure in the left ventricle, when it is coming down below 80, below 80, what happens? So now again, aortic wall closes. Okay, aortic wall closes. That's what I have shown you here also. Look here. See, when the pressure, when it comes below 80, below 80, immediately aortic wall again closes. Okay, aortic valve is now closing. So at F point, aortic wall closes. Okay, this area, aortic wall closes. Now, once aortic valve is closed, okay, heart is contracted. Now, what is happening? Blood also went out. Isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase, slow ejection phase completed. Now, heart is relaxing like this. When the heart is relaxing, what happened to the pressure inside the heart? Decreases. So, now look here. The pressure is falling down. The pressure is coming down. From 80, the pressure is falling down. So, what is this phase called as? This is called as isovolumetric relaxation. This is called as IVR. This orange color curve which I am showing you is called as a IVR. Okay. So, my dear students, here, I will 
show you certain points, you just tell me what they are. Okay, this is the left ventricular pressure volume loop, right? This is the left ventricular pressure volume loop. So, this is, these are the points. Okay, now you please tell me what are these points. Uh, this is the point number A, B, C, D, E. A, B, C, D, E. Now, what event happens at A? Do you think and tell me? So, at A, what happens? Mitral wall opens. Okay, mitral wall opens. At B, what happens? At B, mitral wall closes. Okay, mitral wall closes. Now, from A to B, what is happening? Left ventricle is getting filled. Left ventricle is getting filled. Okay, ventricular filling. So, at A, it is end systolic volume of 50 ml. And at B, end diastolic volume. The ventricles are getting filled. How much? 120 ml, 120 to 150 ml. Okay. Next, what is this phase from B to C? The phase from B to C is called as isovolumetric contraction. What is the phase from C to D? The phase from C to D is called as rapid ejection phase. What is the phase from D to E? This is called as the slow ejection phase. Now, what is the event that happens at C? At C point, aortic wall opens. Aortic wall opens. What is the event that happens at the E? Aortic wall closes. What is the event from E to A? What is this event? This is called as isovolumetric relaxation. Ventricle is relaxing. The pressure is coming down. Okay, pressure is coming down. Okay, so 100% the question will come from this area only. They will ask you only these things. What is isovolumetric relaxation, isovolumetric contraction, rapid ejection phase, slow ejection phase, which wall opens, which wall closes. Okay, so these are the questions that will they will ask you. Okay, and uh, the one more thing for your exams, which I want you to know is the difference between these two points is called as a stroke volume. Okay, the difference between these two is called as a stroke volume. Simple, no? See, what is this one? This point and this point. The difference between these two points is a stroke volume. How can you, like, you know, how can we say this is a stroke volume? Simple. Endastolic volume is how much? 120 minus 50. Okay. So, 120 minus 50 is how much? 70 ml. That is a stroke volume. How much is filled, sir? How much ventricle is filled? 120 is filled. After contraction, how much is left over? 50 is left over, which means how much came out? 70 came out. Okay, 70 came out. So, this is the stroke volume. So, difference between these two points, the difference between these two points is the stroke volume. More the difference, more stroke volume. Okay. Now, again, this was the question which was asked in the FMG exam. Okay. See, now you know. These are the left ventricular pressure volume loops, right? Okay, these are the left ventricular pressure volume loops in different, different conditions. Okay, here I am showing you four different conditions. I am not going in detail. Just by looking at that, you can say. See, whatever which was given in this dark color, that is something normal. The left ventricular pressure volume loop. Okay, normal pressure volume loop, sir. That's a normal thing. But whenever you see, see in a condition called as aortic stenosis, aortic valve is closed, is stenosed. Then do you know what happened to this left ventricular pressure volume loops? It is going to be like a tall tree. Okay. Why it is a tall tree, sir? We can explain, but we don't have enough time. Whenever you see such a tall left ventricular pressure volume loop, blindly answer it is AS, aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis. Simple. If you think logically, you can answer this. Why? Why? Because normally, how much maximum pressure a left ventricle will generate? A left ventricle will generate a maximum of 120 mm Hg pressure, sir. But now, aortic stenosis. Aortic valve is stenosed. So, to pump the blood into the aorta, to pump the blood into the aorta, now, left ventricle have to generate more pressure. That's why, see, it's generating more pressure, 200. Left ventricle is generating more pressure to send the blood into aorta. Okay, so simply tell me whenever you see such a tall tinted left ventricular pressure volume loop, what you should think? Iotic stenosis. Okay, now in this condition, what is happening? 
left ventricular pressure volume loop is now more shifting towards for example here now uh, let me show you this is the left side this is the right side if i show you left and right sides okay <clears throat> now the graph the left ventricular pressure volume loop it is more shifting towards the right side right it is moving towards the one side right side then the condition is aortic regurgitation i'm not going in detail just like a by heart thing things just like a uh, mnemonic kind of thing you can remember array if left ventricular pressure volume loop is shifting towards the right side regurgitation which regurgitation aortic regurgitation right side regurgitation aortic regurgitation okay so next look here whenever you see this left ventricular pressure volume loop if it is getting smaller and smaller chota like it's getting smaller and smaller like this then this condition is mitral stenosis this was the question asked in the neat pg exam fmg exam these are the questions asked whenever you see such a small left ventricular pressure volume loop it is going to be seen in which condition mitral stenosis okay mitral stenosis done completed and whenever you see look here the left ventricular pressure volume loop it is shifting towards the right side as well as left side like you know it's like a obese person on both the sides it is extending like this then what is this what might be the condition they will give you simply they, they will give you this image based question and they will ask you what what is our, what is wrong with the patient what is wrong with the patient that's that's what they will ask you maximum okay so whenever you see this left ventricular pressure volume loop is extending on both the sides the answer will be uh, this is mitral regurgitation only on one side it is aortic regurgitation only on right side it is aortic regurgitation but on both the sides it is mitral regurgitation okay so even without looking anything just answer this look here here i am showing on x axis this is y axis now i am showing you see the left ventricular pressure volume loop is something like this and the second one the left ventricular pressure volume loop it became small like this okay x and y now the left ventricular pressure volume loop when compared to normal when compared to normal it is more deviating towards the right side and x and y it is the left ventricular pressure volume loop it is extending something like this on both the sides can you tell me the abnormalities in which conditions this first one can you tell me what is this a so this is aortic stenosis in aortic stenosis you have the tall tented left ventricular pressure volume loop small left ventricular pressure volume loop is going to be seen in mitral stenosis ms okay and this one the third one abc this third one it is more towards the right it's more moving towards the right then it is aortic regurgitation on both the sides it is mitral regurgitation that's it okay these are the questions that will come in your exams okay so So mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation. See the second lecture. This is the first part. The second part will be most probably um, a day after tomorrow. Okay. So the second part is going to be coming most probably in day after tomorrow. Okay. So done, sir. Left ventricular pressure volume loops are also completed. Now they will ask you in which left ventricular pressure volume loop the stroke volume is increased so much. Stroke volume is increased so much. It looks like the stroke volume is increased so much. Can you tell me? See, look here, I have said you that difference between these two points. Okay, the difference between these two points is the stroke volume. Okay, so if you look at this mitral regurgitation, the condition, the mitral regurgitation, stroke volume is too much increased. It looks like, actually it's not, but it looks like the stroke volume is too much increased. The difference between these two, okay, that's the MCQ. Okay, so the stroke volume is very much increased in the mitral regurgitation. So done. Now, after this, what we should know the next important topic is jugular venous pressures jvps jugular venous pressures sir. so in this jugular venous pressures how many waves are there simple a wave c wave v wave x wave and y wave okay a c x v y a c x v y these are the jugular venous pressure waves most of the students uh, they don't understand the concept of the jugular venous pressures easily. It's very simple. It's very simple. See, there is a jugular vein which is bringing the blood from the head and neck, deoxygenated blood from the head and neck. Now, try to understand like this. Here I am showing you only the right atria. 
only only see i'm showing you the right atria okay and i'm showing you the jugular vein internal jugular vein anatomically this is not uh, not correct like you know that deoxygenated blood is coming into the right atria via the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava everyone knows that but what i'm saying you is sir see internal jugular vein which is present in your neck it is bringing the deoxygenated blood into the right atria right see there is any pressure change try to understand that right atria and internal jugular vein they are almost connected each other okay they are almost connected if there is any pressure change in right atria that will also cause pressure change in the internal jugular vein if pressure increases in right atria internal jugular vein pressure also increases if pressure decreases in right atria internal jugular vein pressure also decreases so the atrial events especially right atrial not left atrial right atrial events will change the pressure in the internal jugular vein okay so now let's see what is normal and what is abnormal and again question was asked in the recent neat pg exam see how many questions were being asked just from one cardiovascular system you might think like you know why i'm taking so much time about the card just for the cardiovascular system you will think like you know sir if you take so much time for the cardiovascular system then what about the other system? see i know where the questions will come from what are these important topics we can complete the entire rapid revision session in two hours also but that won't be really helpful for you target is to complete all the important topics so that you'll answer all the mcqs okay now sir look here what are this acx and acx v by waves what are these waves normally i'm asking you your atria will contract or not right atria it will contract right when the right atria is contracting what happened to the pressure in the right atria right atria is contracting when the right atria is contracting the pressure in the right atria increases also the pressure in the internal jugular vein increases so if you are measuring the pressures if you are measuring the pressures in the internal jugular veins see now the pressure in the internal jugular vein is increasing like this so this is called as the a wave means positive wave the pressure is increasing in the internal jugular vein why the atria is contracting the right atria is contracting so automatically the pressure in the internal jugular vein is also increasing okay so that's why this a wave it is seen during atrial contraction when the atria is contracting the pressure in the internal jugular vein is also increasing try to understand it like this okay so is for like i am just trying to make it as simple as possible okay so a wave is seen during atrial contraction okay after atrial contraction what happens atria is getting relaxed simple relaxed so that's why see the atria now is relaxing so that's why the pressure also coming down but something now happens look here i'm showing you so this is the right atria this is the right ventricle and what is this blood vessel which i am showing you on the top the blood vessel which i am showing you on the top this is the internal jugular vein okay internal jugular vein okay see now atrial contraction completed now atria is relaxing 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 like this okay now suddenly what happens right ventricle will contract after right atrial atrial contraction what will happen now ventricle will contract ventricle contract when the right ventricle contracts do you know what happens sir this wall what is this wall which is present over here so this is the tricuspid wall this tricuspid wall actually it will bulge okay the tricuspid wall actually it will bulge into the right atria when the ventricle is contracting the tricuspid wall it will bulge into the right atria so what happened to again now the right atrial pressure again increases right? because this valve is coming no it's ballooning into the right atria no so right atrial volume decreases pressure increases so that's why there is a little pressure increased so also in internal jugular veins pressure increases so that causes the c wave see this c wave why why what is the importance of the c wave c for closure the tricuspid valve is closed this tricuspid valve it enters okay it little it balloons little into the right atria so right atrial pressure increases okay little increase so a wave is because of the atrial contraction and c wave is because of the closure of the tricuspid valve and in like ballooning of the tricuspid valve into the right atria it causes elevation of the pressure in the right atria and elevation of the pressure in the internal jugular veins that's it okay done sir after this what happens so a wave c wave are completed both this a wave and c wave both these are the positive waves why because pressure is increased these are the positive waves now sir atria contracted 
Now, what happens after atrial contraction? A wave completed. Now, atria is completely relaxing. Completely relaxing. See, now, that's why, see, the pressure is coming down. Okay. So, this X. So, X. This V, X wave, which is coming down. So, what is happening during this phase? Sir, atria is completely relaxing. But you should also know when the time atria is the relaxing, what happened to the ventricles? Ventricle is contracting. Atria is in relaxation mode, but ventricle is in contraction mode. So, during this X phase, what are the, which cardiac events are happening? Okay, which cardiac events are happening? Atria is relaxing, but ventricle is contracting. Okay, so that's why X is systole, systole of the ventricle. The systole of the ventricle. Ventricle, atria is relaxing, so pressure is going down. But at the same time, ventricle is contracting. Okay, now sir, we, X wave also completed. X for remember, X for relaxation. X for atrial relaxation. Atria is completely relaxing, but ventricle is contracting. Okay, done. Next, what happens? Next wave is called as a V wave. Okay, the next wave which I want you to know is this V wave. A, C, X, V, Y, right? V wave. V for remember. Sir, atria contracted, atria is now relaxing, so pressure also coming down. But what is this V? Once atria is relaxed, now it will fill with the blood, right? Atria have to fill with the blood. Now when the atria is filling with the blood, pressure again increases in the atria. Why? Because venous blood is coming, right? So that's why when the atria is filling, when the atria, right atria, whenever it is filling with the venous blood, okay, when the right atria, whenever it is filling with the venous blood, now look here, what is happening? Now the pressure is increasing. The pressure is increasing. So that's why this V wave, V for venous return or venous filling, venous filling of atria. Okay, maximum atrial filling. The atria are filling with the blood, not ventricles. Atria are filling with the blood. So that's why the pressure is increasing. Now atria are having full blood, sir. Atria are filled with the blood. Now what happens? The blood from atria will go up into the Ventricles. So, atrial filling completed. What also open? The tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve, it will open. The blood will fall down. The blood will fall down into the ventricles. So, pressure in the atria will decrease. So, V wave completed. V wave is because of the venous filling. Now, after that, if you see here, what is happening? What is the next wave? The Y wave, sir. Y wave. So, Y wave is because of Y for MT. EMPT, Y. Okay. So, emptying E. M, P, T, Y is there, right? Y. So, Y wave is because of the atrial emptying. Atria are leaving the blood into the ventricles. Okay, atria are leaving the blood into the ventricles. So, atrial pressure decreases. Internal jugular vein pressure also decreases. Okay, so that, sir. So, these are the MCQs which I want you to know. Now, please tell me uh, here. Now, how many waves are there? There is A wave, C wave, X wave, V wave, and Y wave. Okay. So, A, C, X, V, and Y. A, C, X, V, and Y. Now, please tell me, guys. One, one. A wave is because of. Can you tell me? A wave is because of. Sir, A wave is because of atrial contraction. C wave. C wave is because. And, and they can ask you, so what is the event that is happening during C wave? C wave is because of closure of tricuspid wall, the tricuspid valve is closed, the tricuspid valve is closed and it's ballooning into the right atria, right atrial pressure increases, internal jugular venous pressure also increases. Now this X wave, what is this X wave? Atria is relaxing, completely atria is relaxing, the pressure in the atria comes down, the pressure in the internal jugular venous also comes down, okay. So, but, but important point is, sir, during X, what other cardiac event is happening? Ventricular systole, when the atria is contract, sorry, when the ventricle, sorry, when the atria is relaxing, ventricle starts to contract. So here, now there is ventricular stole. Ventricular stole is happening. Okay. Now, what is this V wave? What is this V wave? So this V wave, remember V wave is because of the venous filling. When atria is getting filled with the blood, so atrial pressure increases. Internal jugular venous pressure increases. So V for venous. Okay, V for Venous filling. My God, just give me one minute. V for venous filling.
okay v for venous failure and what is happening during this y y y for empty atrial emptying okay atrial empty so that's it completed so atrial emptying also completed so acx vy waves are completed now i'm asking you just look at this and tell me which are positive waves and which are negative waves which are positive waves and which are negative waves see the two negative waves are x and y x y remember x and y are negative waves why because the pressure is going down the pressure is going down so x and y waves x and y waves they are negative waves okay so right x x wave uh, that is the atrial relaxation atrial relaxation is happening and the ventricular system is happening and y atrial emptying is happening so both these are negative waves okay now what was the question which was asked in the fmg exam as well as an epg exam which question was asked fmg exam this question was asked see this was the question uh, first let me come with the basics okay all right please tell me students please tell me a wave is because of what atrial contraction atrial contraction causes a wave in the jugular venous pressures atria is contracting right atria is contracting pressure in the internal jugular vein also increases okay that's the a wave now look here large a waves are seen in which conditions i'm not going in detail they will ask you in the jugular venous pressures large a waves are seen in tricuspid stenosis and pulmonic stenosis in the conditions called as the tricuspid stenosis and pulmonic stenosis there are large a waves okay why if you ask me look here this is the heart okay i'm just giving you one example this is the right atria what is this wall can you tell me this is the tricuspid wall right this is the tricuspid wall now this tricuspid wall which is totally stenosed it's totally stenosed sir it is totally calcified and it is stenosed okay now if it is stenosed now how much pressure the right atria should generate tell me it have to generate more pressure the blood is not going in the forward direction the blood is not going in the forward direction the, the right atria have to generate more pressure so when right atrial pressure increases what happens to the internal jugular venous pressures internal jugular venous pressures also increases okay so during right atrial contraction it generates more pressure so a wave also will be large so large a wave so that's why right. is seen in tricuspid stenosis okay so large a waves are seen in tricuspid stenosis and pulmonic stenosis that's it next what else you should know see absent a waves this was the question which was tested in the exam i'm concentrating on those questions which were asked in the previous exams now okay absent a waves are seen in see now only uh, like look here which waves are seen no need to remember the graph the graphs are not important only terms are important there is no a wave a wave is not seen now think logically and tell me sir a wave is because of right atrial contraction if right atria or if atria if atria is not contracting then a waves cannot be there in the jugular venous pressures so a wave is absent in which condition absent a waves are seen in conditions like atrial fibrillation okay so in the conditions like atrial fibrillation see atria are not contracting atria are just quivering like this atria are not contracting sir they are just like shivering okay so in the conditions like atrial fibrillation there is no a wave a waves are absent so now tell me large a waves are seen in tricuspid stenosis pulmonic stenosis no a waves are absent a waves are seen in atrial fibrillation where atria is not contracting you can write here atrial fibrillation or atrial uh, sorry it was given here also seen in conditions where there is atrial asystole atria are not contracting no a waves simple okay next what else you should know next important mcq is canon a waves okay sir what are this canon a waves canon a waves okay in which conditions you will see canon a waves normally guys remember atria will contract followed by ventricular contraction first atria will contract later ventricles will contract both atria and ventricles they do not contract at the same time okay they do not contract at the same time first atria will contract fills the ventricles then ventricle will contract atrial contraction ventricular contraction atrial contraction ventricular contraction but sometimes because of some pathologies both atria and ventricles they will contract at the same time 
so this is called as atrioventricular dissociation so in the conditions called as av dissociation or atrioventricular dissociation both the atria and ventricles will contract at a same time at a same time now do you know what happens the entire heart is like contracting like crazy at the same time the entire heart is contracting now the pressures inside the heart is going to be super high the pressures in the right atria is also going to be super high okay entire ventricles and heart uh, the right atria are contracting at the same time so the pressures in the heart are so much also the pressures in the internal jugular veins are so high so that's why you can see here there are these canon a waves like sharp a waves okay so the canon a waves are seen in those conditions of atrioventricular dissociation that. so now tell me internal jugular venous pressures how many waves are there a c x v y you know a wave is because of what a wave c wave x wave v wave and y wave that because of what you already know this next what you should know large a waves are seen in this one large a waves are seen in tricuspid stenosis pulmonic stenosis absent a waves absent a waves are seen in atrial asystolic conditions like atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation means atria are not contracting just shivering like this just shivering like this and canon a waves the canon a waves are seen in av dissociation where atria and ventricles are contracting at the same time then you will have very sharp a waves called as a canon a waves the next repeatedly repeatedly ask mcq no need again i am saying you no need to remember the graphs graphs are not needed sir this was the question which was asked if the patient is suffering with the tricuspid regurgitation okay tricuspid regurgitation what kind of abnormality is seen in okay what kind of abnormality is seen in jugular venous pressures three abnormalities will be seen okay three abnormalities what are these three abnormalities now you can look here see tricuspid regurgitation okay are you able to appreciate here this is tricuspid regurgitation in tricuspid regurgitation there is blunted exudescent x wave the blaze blunted exudescent and see severe tricuspid regurgitation tall v waves are there and again in tricuspid see, again in tricuspid regurgitation there is prominent y wave okay sir pro, sir prominent y descent is there so what i am trying to put into your mind is sir this never ever forget this one thing sir in tricuspid regurgitation you will see three changes in the jugular venous pressures three changes are there what are these three changes tall v wave tall v waves are seen blunted x descent tall v waves blunted x descent and a prominent y wave okay so now tell me in tricuspid regurgitation there is a tall v wave blunted x descent and a prominent y descent okay so these are the changes which are seen in tricuspid regurgitation so with this if you know this 100% you can answer the mcqs regarding the jugular venous pressures also so jugular venous pressures topic is also completed a c x v y waves and the abnormalities large a waves canon a waves absent a waves and what are the changes you will see in tricuspid regurgitation what are the changes tall v waves are seen blunted x descent and a prominent y descent okay these are the things which you will see okay so now after this what else you should know see regarding the other things like you know i will give you in the pdf if you want to go through them you can go through them but not that important not that important the crazy question which was tested many times in the fmg exam is what is kusumal sign kusumal breathing is different kusumal sign is different what is kusumal sign sir okay what is kusumal sign kusumal sign let's discuss now and normally listen whenever you are taking deep inspiration or simple normal inspiration also whenever you are taking inspiration let me right here explanation was given over there you can like just go through the explanation once the pdf was is shared whenever you inspire whenever you do inspiration do you know what happens sir inspiration the jugular venous pressure jvp decreases okay during inspiration jvp decreases sir then what is kusumal sign so during inspiration if jvp jugular venous pressure if it is not decreasing okay not decreasing or if it is increasing jvp is increasing okay jvp is not decreasing or if jvp increases then it is called as 
kusumala signs and that's it okay normally for understanding purpose i am telling you see whenever i am doing inspiration what happened to my thoracic cavity thoracic cavity increases okay whenever thoracic cavity increases the negative pressure in the thorax and negative pressure is generated sir this negative pressure it will suck it will suck the blood from the jugular veins it will suck down the blood from the jugular veins so what happened to the jugular venous pressure during inspiration decreases blood is being sucked no the blood is being sucked to the right atria so jugular venous pressure decreases but what is kusumal sign kusumal sign means during inspiration the jvp is not getting decreased or if it increases rather if it increases then it is called as a kusumal sign which is an abnormality what you should know for your exam this kusumal sign is seen in which condition sir mcq this kusumal sign it is seen in at least for your exam you should know these two things there are conditions called as constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy in pathology you will study these things so in constrictive pericarditis and in restrictive cardiomyopathy in these two conditions you will see kusumal sign if you know this enough okay so restrictive pericard uh, sorry restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis you will see kusumal sign so completed next after kusumal sign what you should know guys uh, are you able to understand soyab varun musa musavir sanjay davin see i am actually i am not like you know going through your comments because i go through your comment it takes a little time it takes a little extra time so it will like you know our session will be prolonged i know this is a very important time for you you need to cover like you know many subjects so that's why i'm not going through your comments regularly is it okay guys okay 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 so at the end of the day we have to cover all the important mcqs that's it okay next let's talk about the frank starling law okay frank starling law what is this frank starling law okay see frank starling law tells us the end diastolic volume you already know this okay you know this already know this frank starling law end diastolic volume is directly proportional to the stroke volume sir what is end diastolic volume you know the value end diastolic volume means how much blood is there in the heart okay after relaxation how much blood is going to be filled in the heart how much blood is going to be filled in the heart sir almost 120 to 140 ml 120 to 140 ml is going to be filled in the heart for example if i fill 120 ml of blood how much will come out out of this 120 70 will come out out of 120 70 will come out now instead of filling see instead of filling 120 if i fill maybe 200 means what i have done i have increased the end diastolic volume do you think same 70 will come out no sir if you put 120 sir if you put 200 maybe um maybe how much will come out maybe 140 will come out now or maybe 150 will come out or for example now if i increase not 200 i am keeping here 250 how much will come out now maybe <clears throat> 180 will come out okay maybe 180 will come out so what i am trying to put into your mind is sir if you increase the end diastolic volume see if you increase the end diastolic volume see edv automatically stroke volume is increased the more you fill the heart the more will come out or in a easy way we can say we can say something like this the more you stretch the heart the more powerfully it will contract and more will be the stroke volume are you getting so the more you put into the heart more will come out so end diastolic volume is directly proportional to stroke volume this is called as frank starling's law okay frank starling law also completed next after this frank starling law what else you should know it's a fixed principle sir fixed principle a long back this question has been asked recently this question was not there in the exams but anyway it's a fixed principle is it's a estimation of the cardiac output we know if I, if i ask you what is the cardiac output you will say 5 liters is the cardiac output sir every minute our heart is beating and 5 liters of blood is getting pumped okay it's getting like you know circulated but how to estimate whether it's 5 liters 6 liters 7 liters how to estimate by using a principle called as a fixed principle so fixed principle it's the estimation of okay it's the estimation of a cardiac output by the rate of oxygen consumption by looking at how many marks you are getting by looking at your progress card i can estimate how good you are with your studies in the same way 
by looking at how much oxygen you are consuming, we can estimate what is your cardiac output. That is called as a fixed principle. Okay. So, look here. The formula for this fixed principle is Q is equal to Q means the cardiac output. Q is equal to VO2. Okay, Q is equal to VO2 means how much oxygen the person is consuming. Usually, healthy individual will consume 250 ml of oxygen. V, that is a VO2 by arteriovenous oxygen difference. Okay, arteriovenous oxygen difference. So, what is this arteriovenous oxygen difference? See, in the arterial blood, how much oxygen is there? 190 ml of oxygen is there per liter, per liter. 190 ml of oxygen is there per liter. And in venous blood, how much oxygen is there? Even in venous blood, oxygen is there. How much ml? 140 ml. Okay, 140 ml is there, sir. Simple. Okay. So, in the arterial blood, 190 ml of oxygen is there. In venous blood, there is 140 ml. So, minus, how much is the difference? 190 minus 140, 50 ml. 50 ml is the difference, no? So, 250 divided by 50, how much? 250 divided by 50 is 5 liters. Aha, okay. So, by looking at the, how much is the oxygen consumption, we can estimate the cardiac output. For example, see. Now, you get a cylinder. You get an oxygen cylinder. See, to me. Okay, sir, I am doing, doing a treadmill test. Okay, I am doing a treadmill test. I am running or I am sprinting. Okay. Now, you just get an oxygen cylinder. You just keep an oxygen cylinder to me. I am just breathing through the oxygen cylinder. Okay. So, that you can know how much oxygen I am consuming. For example, I have consumed 300 ml of oxygen. 300 ml of oxygen. My arteriovenous oxygen difference, it is constant, 50. Okay. Now, tell me, what is the cardiac output? Okay. Now, my cardiac output is 6 liters. So, by looking at the oxygen consumption, if you calculate the cardiac output, that's called as a fixed principle. Okay. So, by fixed principle, we can calculate or we can estimate cardiac output. Okay. So, VO2 divided by arteriovenous oxygen gradient, oxygen difference. Okay. Concern. Now, after this, what else you should know? The next concept which I want you to know is the baroreceptor reflex. Okay, baroreceptor reflex. Sir. Even before going to the baroreceptor reflex, see, we know what is the normal BP. The BP is 120 by 80. 120 by 80 is the BP. Okay. Now, what is the pulse pressure value? Pulse pressure. What is this pulse pressure? Pulse pressure is systolic BP minus diastolic BP. Systolic minus diastolic BP. Okay. So, 120 divided, uh, sorry, 120 minus 80. So, it's a 40 mm Hg. So, pulse pressure value is, you know it. So, pulse pressure is 40 mm Hg. Okay, 40 mm Hg. Next step, one more pressure is there. That's called as a MAP, mean arterial pressure. So, what is this mean arterial pressure? Mean arterial pressure, the formula is, our, uh, for understanding purpose, let me tell you. Okay, for understanding purpose, see, 120 by 80, during systole, the pressure is 120. During the astral, the pressure is 80. See, don't tell me so many values. If I, if you have to tell me one single value, you have to tell me an average value. Average value. Not 120, not 80, but in between value. Like a mean value. Okay? So, the mean arterial pressure is how much? The formula for this mean arterial pressure, the formula for this mean arterial pressure is diastolic blood pressure, that is 80, plus one third of the pulse pressure. You know the pulse pressure value? The pulse pressure is 40. How much is one third of pulse pressure? 40 divided by 3. It is somewhere around 13. So 80 plus 13 is 93. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So on an average, my blood pressure is 93 mm Hg. Not 120, not 80. Average value, 93. In between value, 93. And what is the formula for mean arterial pressure? Astronomic blood pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure will give you mean arterial pressure. And now, the topic which I want you to know is, is the baroreceptor reflex. So, baroreceptor reflex. What is this baroreceptor reflex and what you should know for your exam? Okay. So, we are almost like, you no, know, at the end of the cardiovascular system, this, uh, with this and uh, with some other reflexes, we can complete the cardiovascular system. We are at the end, sir. Same. My mean arterial pressure is how much? It is 93 and it should be maintained all the time. Okay, 93 mm Hg, mean arterial pressure. Who is maintaining this mean arterial pressure? Who is checking this mean arterial pressure all the time? See, there are receptors called as a baroreceptors. Okay, there are receptors called as a baroreceptors. And where do these baroreceptors are present? So, these baroreceptors, they are present in an area called as common carotid, like, you know, carotid sinus. There is an area called as a carotid sinus. 
okay and in the arch of iota this is the iota right so in the iota and in the carotid sinus there is an area called as a carotid sinus in these two areas this baroreceptors are present and what are these baroreceptors they are all the time measuring are what is the mean arterial pressure how much is the mean arterial pressure is it 93 or not it's maintaining like it's all the time getting checked and this information you now look here what i'm trying to put into your mind is sir here what do you have you are having the aortic baroreceptors okay and what is here there is these are carotid baroreceptors aortic baroreceptors and carotid baroreceptors and what they are checking they are sensitive to what they are sensitive to mean arterial pressure not systolic blood pressure not diastolic blood pressure they are sensitive to mean arterial pressure now mean arterial pressure it is going to 140 from one from 93 it is going to 140 is it good definitely not from 93 it is coming down to 70 and it's coming down to 60 is it good definitely not so now the bp need to be regulated there should be a reflux which is all the time regulating the mean arterial pressure or the bp how it will happen let me tell you so first normally normally all the time information about this mean arterial pressure is going where it is going to the central nervous system via which nerve via the ninth cranial nerve that is the herring's nerve a branch of ninth cranial nerve a branch of ninth cranial nerve it's a herring's nerve a branch of 10th cranial nerve called as the science nerve so via the herring's nerve and science nerve the information is going where see the information is going to nucleus of tractus solitarius okay which is present in the medulla okay so now tell me what are the receptors receptors are the carotid baroreceptors carotid baroreceptors and the aortic baroreceptors information is going about the bp information is going to the central nervous system to which nucleus the nucleus is called as the nucleus of tractus solitarius okay it's nts the nucleus of tractus solitarius which is present in the medulla information is going via the ninth cranial nerve and 10th cranial nerve that is the herring's nerve and sans nerve okay and these uh, these um, baroreceptors aortic baroreceptor carotid baroreceptor they are sensitive to what they are sensitive to mean arterial pressure they are sensitive in this mean arterial pressure range they will work they will work and they will give the information okay so now information is going information is going so central nervous system nucleus of tractus solitarius is all the time checking what is the mean arterial pressure what is the mean arterial pressure now look here look here now mean arterial pressure is increasing for example map mean arterial pressure increased now you are having a fight with your girlfriend now your mean arterial pressure is increasing your bp is increasing now what will happen see the carotid baroreceptors and the aortic baroreceptors now they are activated due to increase in bp now this information is going to the central nervous system via the ninth cranial nerve and 10th cranial nerve see ninth cranial nerve and 10th cranial nerve now they are exciting and information is going where information is going to nucleus of tractus solitarius okay now what this nucleus of tractus solitarius what it will do a problem is more bp high bp do you know what this nucleus of tractus solitarius what it will do at the end of the day i'm not going in detail i'm simply telling you so this nucleus of tractus solitarius what it is doing it is activating okay it's activating the parasympathetic nervous system the vagal see excites the vagal neuron means the parasympathetic nervous system is being activated so when the parasympathetic nervous system activates what happens the heart rate decreases it automatically bp decreases the same nucleus of tractus solitarius what it is doing so the sympathetic activity is decreasing so sympathetic nervous system activity will be reduced so again what happened to the heart rate heart rate decreases if heart rate decreases what happened to the bp bp decreases automatically so what i am putting in your mind is sir there is this reflex happening whenever you increase the bp suddenly now if you increase the bp automatically my heart rate will come down after that bp will also come down okay so it's a reflex trying to protect my body okay trying to protect my blood vessels and to keep the blood in the circulation 
Okay, so whenever you increase the BP, nucleus of tractus solitarius, this medullary center, the nucleus of tractus solitarius, it will understand, are mean arterial pressure is getting increased. So what it will do? It activates the parasympathetic nervous system, decreases the heart rate and decreases the BP. And not only that, this nucleus of tractus solitarius, it inhibits the sympathetic nervous system. Inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate and BP decreases. Okay, sympathetic nervous system is getting inhibited means also the blood vessels will undergo relaxation. BP decreases, BP decreases. Okay, so here comes one important law. If you increase the BP, what is happening to heart rate? Increase in BP causes reflux decrease in heart rate. If you increase the BP, there is a reflux decrease in heart rate. Can you tell me what is this law? Okay, now I am giving you a chance. Can you tell me what is this law guys? Increase in BP decreases the heart rate. What is this law called as? This is called as Mary's law. Okay. So done, sir. Mary's law states as if you increase the BP, automatically heart rate comes down. Mary's law also completed. Now, after this, what else you should know? The next MCQ point which I want you to know is if you do carotid sinus massage. Okay. You are doing the carotid sinus massage, which means you are compressing the carotid sinus. See, the carotid sinus is there, no? It is the blood vessel. It is getting compressed. When you are compressing the carotid sinus, what your nucleus of tractus solitarius will think? Or if you are compressing a blood vessel, locally here, only here, the blood pressure is increasing. The, the, because of the external pressure, okay, because of the external compression, the carotid sinus is getting compressed. So now tell me the carotid baroreceptors, okay. So carotid baroreceptors are activated. Now this carotid baroreceptors are activating which cranial now? Ninth cranial now. This ninth cranial now, what it will do? It will take the information to nucleus of tractus solitarius. This nucleus of tractus solitarius, what it will do? It will activate parasympathetic nervous system. When the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, what happened to heart rate? Heart rate comes down. So that's what. So, whenever you do a carotid sinus massage, first heart rate comes down. The decrease in heart rate will further later. Okay, later decreases the BP. Okay, this decrease in heart rate, it will decreases the BP. Okay, so that's why whenever like you know, a patient is having severe hypertension, now simply do the carotid sinus massage. When you do the carotid sinus massage, heart rate decreases followed by BP decrease. Okay, so MCQ, carotid sinus massage, MCQ is also completed. Now, after this, what else you should know? Reflexes, sir. Reflexes. Simply, I am telling you, you don't need to go through this entire big table. Three reflexes are there. Okay, three reflexes. One is Cushing's reflex. Cushing's reflex. Okay, Cushing's reflex, the first reflex. Second reflex is Bain. Bridge. Reflex and the third reflex is Bezold Jarish reflex. Sir, first remember all the cardiac reflexes, baroreceptor reflex, we, we know ninth cranial now, tenth cranial now, herrings now, sands now, okay, carotid baroreceptors, aortic baroreceptors, you know all this stuff, okay, you know about this. The Cushing's reflex, all the cardiac reflexes, they are radicardic reflexes only. At the end of the day, heart rate decreases. Okay. Heart rate decreases. Bain, uh, basal jar reflex, heart rate decreases. But remember, the one reflex which I want you to know, Bain bridge reflex. So this Bain bridge reflex is the one exception. It is a tachycardic reflex. Means heart rate increases because of this reflex. So heart rate increases. That's the question which will come in your exams. All the cardiac reflexes are the bradycardic reflexes. They will decrease the heart rate. But which is the tachycardic reflex? It's a Bainbridge reflex. Bainbridge reflex. Now, what you should know about regarding these reflexes? See, first one, Cushing reflex. If you increase the intracranial pressure because of some reason, man, simple. If you increase, there is some head trauma. That head trauma is increasing the intracranial pressure. Okay, intracranial pressure is increased. When intracranial pressure increases, at the end of the day, end of the day, that will cause vagal stimulation. 
why this is not the time there is a like you know there, there is a whole reflux pathway what happens i am not going in detail simply whenever the intracranial pressure increases because of some reason see head injury happened increase intracranial pressure at the end of the day do you know what happens vagus vagal tone is increased that do you know what it will do so because of this vagal tone increase in the vagal tone heart rate decreases heart rate decreases so that's why pushing reflux look here the point which i want you to know is pushing reflux is seen in the conditions where intracranial pressure is increased when the intracranial pressure is increased the vagus nerve is activated when the vagus nerve is activated vagus is a parasympathetic now it's a parasympathetic now right so what it will do it decreases the heart rate simple okay and second one bain bridge reflux i used to remember something like this or for example you are like standing on a tall bridge okay tall bridge now on that bridge you are like standing and you are looking down into an abyss okay you are looking down into a cave or abyss automatically you will feel frightened right you will feel scary so what happened to your heart rate heart rate increases so remember it like that it's like a mnemonic the so bain bridge bridge when you are standing on a top of the bridge your heart rate increases so brain bridge reflex is an example of tachycardic reflex heart rate increases okay but why is why when you will see this brain bridge reflex when 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 means see when you increase the volume okay when you increase the volume of blood simple i am putting in a simple way are a simple answer my question this thing i am giving you the saline infusion okay i am giving you the saline infusion means i am injecting the saline into your body what happened to your blood volume your blood volume increases when you are having more blood volume tell me your heart should work more right simple when you increase the blood volume heart rate will increase sir simple that's it so bain bridge reflux is seen in those conditions where the blood volume is increasing when you increase the blood volume heart rate increases the heart will work more simple that's a bain bridge reflux okay next basal jaris reflux see basal jaris reflux means because of certain chemicals okay because of certain chemicals like serotonin capsaicin like you know if you put certain chemicals into the heart or if you put certain chemicals into the blood these the chemicals chemicals will decrease the uh, heart rate okay so that's why it's a chemo reflux like you know something like a you know, chemical regulated thing that's why see even here also if you see bain bridge reflux uh, sorry basal jaris reflux basal jaris reflux see it's a chemo sensitive means if you put certain chemicals into the heart these chemicals will actually decrease the heart rate okay so at any way guys i don't want to like you know uh, go through all these things right now only important point bain bridge reflux is a tachycardic reflux basal jaris reflux is the bradycardic reflux Cushing reflux is again a bradycardic reflux. Cushing, Cushing, Cushing reflux is seen due to increased intracranial pressure. Vagal tone is increased. Heart rate decreases. Okay, heart rate decreases. All the reflexes are bradycardic reflexes except Bain bridge reflex. On the bridge, you will have tachycardia. Okay. So after this, what you should know? Next, the point which I want you to know is, sir, this was the question asked in. 2019 fmg exam okay 2019 fmg exam 2017 fmg exam this 2019 and 2017 fmg exam this questions has been asked what are these questions sir i'm concentrating only those questions now imagine there is a blood vessel okay uh, even before that even before that let me tell you about the poisley hagen's formula see what is poisley hagen's formula simple blood flow the relationship between Blood flow. How a blood is moving fastly or slowly. Blood flow relationship. Relationship in blood flow and pressure difference across the blood vessel. Radius of the blood vessel. Length of the blood vessel and viscosity of the blood vessel. Don't worry. I'll explain in a simple way. For example, see here this Poiseuille Higgins formula is telling us blood flow. It is directly proportional to means blood flow. increases with what blood flow is directly proportional to the pressure difference pressure gradient blood flow is directly proportional to the radius of the blood vessel and blood flow is inversely blood flow decreases the velocity of the blood flow the speed of the blood flow decreases if the length of the blood vessel increases 
blood flow is inversely proportional to viscosity if, if the blood viscosity the thickness of the fluid if it is more if the viscosity of the blood is more blood flow will be the velocity of the blood will be less Are for example say now let's take a condition called as a polycythemia polycythemia what is polycythemia more rbcs are there more hemoglobin more rbcs is there now what happened to the viscosity of the blood thick blood sir thick blood do you think this blood will move faster with high velocity no so velocity of the blood or the blood flow it is inversely proportional to viscosity inversely proportional to the length of the blood vessel more the length of the blood vessel more friction will be there so less speed less blood flow will be there okay now look here and answer this now imagine there is this one blood vessel blood vessel a okay blood vessel a now this is point number okay sir point number a and point number b this is the first blood vessel first blood vessel number 1 now this is the blood vessel number 2 again i am showing you look here see the pressure at the point number a is 100 mm hg the pressure at the point number b is 99 mm hg in the second given example look the pressure at the point number a is 100 mm hg at the point number b the pressure is just 1 mm hg now tell me in which blood vessels blood will move in which blood vessels the blood flow will be more first of all in case number 1 blood flow will be there or not sir here the pressure is 100 and this point number b at this point one end and the other end at the other end the pressure is 99 mm hg will the blood move or not yes sir the blood will definitely move why because there is a pressure difference high pressure to low pressure but how much is the pressure difference how much is the gradient sir the pressure difference is only 1 mm hg yes blood will move but low less blood flow less blood flow will be there but when compared to first one second one here it is 100 mm hg here it is just only 1 mm hg so the gradient how much how much is the delta p the gradient is 99 mm hg okay the gradient is 99 mm hg sir so the more blood flow will be there so that's why the blood flow is dependent on the, the blood flow is dependent on what the blood flow is dependent on the pressure gradient that's the first thing okay blood flow is dependent on the pressure gradient now second look at the second thing so blood flow is also directly proportional to the radius to the power of 4 so what is this radius to the power of 4 look at here now imagine this is a blood vessel okay this is a blood vessel now you have dilated the blood vessel now more blood flow will be there or not yes more blood flow will be there if you double the radius for example say if you double the radius blood flow will be doubled no blood flow is not doubled radius to the power of 4 which means now look here according to the poisson lee higgins formula what we have discussed see if you if the radius of the blood vessel if it is doubled what happened to blood flow we know according to the formula blood flow is directly proportional to radius to the power of 4 if you double the radius see look here you double the radius means 2 in the place of radius i am keeping 2 means i am doubling the radius i am two times increasing the radius see 2 to the power of 4 how much 2 into 2 into 2 into 2 16 okay so 16 times blood flow increases okay now what you should know is if you double the radius blood flow is not going to be doubled rather blood flow increases by 16 times there is 16 times more blood flow that's the important point okay so blood flow increases by 16 times for example look here if the radius of the blood vessel if it is tripled if you triple the radius how many times the blood flow increases so 3 to the power of 4 3 to the power of 4 81 so 81 times the blood vessel increases okay so you should know these things if the blood vessel radius is double 16 times there is more blood flow if the blood vessel radius if it is triple there is 81 times more blood flow completed that so with this the cardiovascular thing is completed now as a part of cardiovascular thing it's not exactly the cardiovascular thing but it comes under the blood now this was a question asked in the recent recent fmg exam which has happened okay in the recent fmg exam this question was asked okay now guys i hope you already know this but i am not sure whether you have gone through this or not in pathology this will come again again physiology also this will come so the topic which i am going to discuss here is 
the clotting cascade. How clotting will occur? The clotting cascade, sir. Okay. Now, to make the things easier, to make the things easier, I will just show you, see, in a simple way. Are how many clotting factors are there? Just concentrate for the next five minutes. You'll, uh, you'll answer the questions like this. You'll, you can answer just questions like this. Okay. How many clotting factors are there? 12 clotting factors are there. 12 clotting. Actually, 13 are there. But sixth clotting factor is missing. Um, so, always write 10 in the middle. Okay. Always, always write 10 in the middle. Okay. Otherwise, it will be little, very, very difficult. You will study about like, you know, the intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, common pathway. So many things are there. Concentrate for five minutes. You will understand for sure. Okay. See, this is 10. Clotting factor number 10. Now, after writing this 10 in the middle, now tell me. How many clotting factors are there? 12 clotting factors, sir. 12, okay. After 12, what is, before 12, what is the number? Before the 12, 11, okay. So, before 11, what is the number? 10 is there, which was already written over there. Okay, which was already written over there. So, before 10, what is the number? Before 10, the number is 9. Before 9, what is the number? 8. Before number, what is the number? Before 8, what is the number? 7. Okay, write 7 on this side. Okay. So, 12, 11, 9, 8. And on the other side, 7 and 10. Now, tell me, 5, 2s are how much? Okay. See, before 7, there is no 6. Before 7, there is no 6. Forget about the 6. I am just generally asking, 5, 2s are how much? 5, 2s are 10, sir. So, right, I am just showing you. 5 into 2s, 5, 2s are 10, sir. 5, 2. 5 into 2 into 1 also 10 only, no? 5 into 2 into 1. 5, 2s into 1. So, sir, same thing, 10 thing. So, here I have completed, okay, I have completed the intrinsic pathway as well as the extrinsic pathway. So, look here, sorry, yeah. So, this side, on this side, what I am showing you, this clotting factor number 12, 11, 9, 8. See, so 12 will activate, once if 12 is activated, 12 activates 11, 11 activates 9, 9 activates 8, 8 activates 10. So, this pathway which I have shown till 8, this is the intrinsic pathway ip intrinsic pathway this pathway is called as intrinsic pathway and this pathway which i am showing you seven from this side this is called as the extrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway okay and what is this 10 5 2 1 this the middle things this 10 5 2 1 this pathway is called as common pathway simple that's it so extrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway common pathway do you know what is like, sir, we can't understand what is happening exactly over here. Simple. First 12 will be activated. 12 activates 11. 11 activates 9. 9 activates 8. 8 activates 10. 10 activates 5. 5 activates 2. 2 is going to, do, do you know what this 2 will do? So 2 is going to convert. Okay, let me show you. This 1 means, activation of 1 means nothing but. So this clotting factor number 2, <laughs> which is the prothrombin, it is, do you know what it will do? It will convert. P, Bri, Nogen, soluble fibrinogen, the clotting factor number one, it is, which is soluble in form. Soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. Soluble fibrinogen will be converted into insoluble fibrin. So, that's it. Clotting completed fibrin. Now, it is not soluble. It is now totally in the form of strands. Now, it's totally in the form of the strands, sir. Totally in the form of the strands. Fibrin strands. Clot is formed. And that's it. So, now tell me, 12, 11, 9, 8 are the intrinsic uh, clotting factors which are involved in the intrinsic pathway and 7 is involved in the extrinsic pathway. And what are the uh, clotting factors which are involved in the inter, uh, common pathway? 10, 5, 2, 1. Now, if you are a really good student, you should have a doubt. Sir, one clotting factor is missing. Can you tell me what is that one clotting factor which is missing? Mainly 3, 3 sir, 3. So, where is that 3? Like, you know, where we have to fit that 3 here? Let me tell you, okay? First of all, why we are calling this as an intrinsic pathway? Intrinsic, something within the blood. Whenever, see, whenever there is a damage to blood vessel, whenever there is a damage to blood vessel, the subendothelial collagen will be there, no? Something inside the blood vessel only. The subendothelial collagen, see, subendothelial collagen, it will activate the clotting factor number 12. Now you will get it out. Who will activate clotting number, factor number 12, sir? See, whenever there is a damage to blood vessel, the subendothelial collagen, it will come into contact. It will come into contact with the clotting factor number 12. Activates clotting factor number 12. 12 activates 7. You know the story. 
Okay, so that's why it is called as intrinsic pathway. Something intrinsic to the blood vessel is triggering the clotting cascade, is stimulating the clotting cascade. Okay, so then why it is called as extrinsic pathway, the 7 and 10? Why? Because see, whenever there is any damage, trauma here, whenever there is any trauma, not only the blood vessel is damaged, but surrounding tissue is also damaged, no? So from the tissue, there is something called as tissue factor. Tissue factor, also called as tissue thromboplastin, tissue factor or tissue thromboplastin is getting leaked from the tissues, this is getting leaked from the tissues, this is also called as tissue factor is also called as clotting factor number 3, clotting factor number 3, so this clotting factor number 3, it will activate 7, okay, from where this 3 is coming from the tissues, 3 will activate 7, 7 will activate 10, okay, so that's the point. 3 will activate 7, 7 will activate 10. So now tell me, this was the question asked in the FMG exam. Which of the following is, uh, which of the following is a, like you know, which of the following protein is involved in extrinsic pathway? 3 and 7. Which of the following uh, clotting proteins are involved in intrinsic pathway? 12, 11, 9, 8. Which of the following proteins are involved in common pathway? 10, 5, 2, 1. What is the last step in clotting cascade? Conversion of soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. Done. Done. That's it. So, if you know this, that's uh, more than enough. And one point if you want to know. So, this clotting, this intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway, they are studied by timings. Only, like, you know, that I hope you already know. So, this is, this is a big pathway, right? So, you have to give the bigger name, bigger name. Do you know what are the studies called as the timing, clotting timing is measured by PT and PTT. So, this is a bigger pathway. I am giving bigger name PTT. This is a smaller pathway. So, I am giving the smaller name PT. So, PT, prothrombin time. PT for prothrombin time. PT measures which pathway? Tell me. The PT is the time measuring the extrinsic pathway. Then PTT is measuring the time for which pathway? PTT. PTT is measuring intrinsic pathway. Simple. If I ask you, see the question like this, deficiency of factor number 8, deficiency of factor number 8, it will increase the time of PT or PTT, it will cause, like you know, it will increase the time of PT or PTT. So, 8 is a clotting factor which is involved in the intrinsic pathway. So, PTT time will be elevated, PTT will take, now, now it will like, like, you know, a lot of time for the intrinsic pathway to occur, it will take a lot of time, so PTT will be elevated. Okay, so this is the point which I want you to know. So, in, completed, guys. Completed. So, this is the thing which I want you to know. So, done, sir. Now, one more thing for your exams, which I want you to know is, uh, sir, have you ever heard about vitamin K? Vitamin K. We'll take a break now. Have you ever heard about vitamin K? So, vitamin K, it is needed, from biochemistry especially, it is needed for activation of which clotting factors? Vitamin K, it is needed for the activation of 2, 7, 9, 10. 2, 7, 9, 10. So, clotting factor number 2, 7, 9, 10. These clotting factors. For their activation, for their working, for the, for the activation of the 2, 7, 9, 10, you need to have vitamin K. Okay, that's the MCQ. Okay. So, that's the one point which I want you to know. Vitamin K is needed for the gamma carboxylation activation. I'm just using the word activation, but it is actually vitamin K. There is a vitamin K with the help of an enzyme called as vitamin K epoxide rectase will cause gamma carboxylation of 27910. In a simple way, you can say vitamin K is needed for the activation of 27910. Can you tell me that there is a drug, there is a drug which will cause, which will cause inactivation of this vitamin K uh, epoxide reductase. See, there is a drug called as warfarin. In our FMG exam, these questions were repeatedly asked. It may be repeatedly tested. So, there is a drug called as warfarin. What it will do? It will do, you know, it will inhibit an enzyme. It will inhibit an enzyme which is called as vitamin K epoxide reductase. Okay. So, vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme is inhibited. So, gamma carboxylation Okay, gamma carboxylation of 2, 7, 9, 10 clotting factors does not occur. Okay, so remember, in war, what we will do? Killing, right? In war, we will do killing. So, that the same way, sir, in war for N, who will be affected? Vitamin K, K for killing. Vitamin K epoxide reductase. 
is inhibited. So, 2, 7, 9, 10 flactors are not activated. So, that's the reason why we will call this warfarin as anti-clotting factor. It's like an anti-clotting, right? Warfarin is, so it prevents the clot. It's anticoagulant. It's an anticoagulant. It prevents the clot. How? If you take warfarin, vitamin K epoxy reductase is inhibited. Factor number 2, 7, 9, 10 are not activated. So, do you think clotting will happen now? No, there is no clotting. There is no clot. There is no. Okay, there is no clotting. Okay, so this is also completed. Intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway here, same is also completed. So, okay, guys, so now shall we take a break? Now, I have integrated so many things. I have discussed all the important concepts. If you if you go through these concepts, that's more than more than enough. Okay, you will you will nowhere find like you know, all the important concepts in one in, in one single place. Okay, just go through this more than enough. I'm telling you. Okay, shall we take a break for now? Shall we take a break of uh, five minutes? In five minutes, we'll take a break and later we'll continue with the new concepts. Is everything clear, guys? Divya Prakash, Naimat, Varun, Suleiman. If you have any doubt, you can ask me. Okay, so just even before giving the break, just I'm asking you, a, a two, three questions I will ask you, you just try to answer yourself, okay? Sir, in tricuspid regurgitation, okay, in tricuspid regurgitation, what kind of jugular venous pressure waves, like, you know, uh, what kind of abnormalities are seen? What kind of changes, what kind of changes that you will see in uh, JVP waves? Sir, in tricuspid regurgitation, three things are seen. What are they? Answer. Tall V waves, blunted X descent, and a prominent Y descent. Okay. Hollow systolic murmur. Hollow systolic throughout the systole. Not, not throughout the systole and ash only. Hollow systolic murmur or pan systolic murmur is seen in mitral regurgitation, trigaspid regurgitation, and ventricular septal defect. Ventricular septal defect. Continuous machinery murmur. Continuous machinery murmur. Both during systole as well as diastole patent ductus arteriosus okay like if you ever see such a kind of like you know if you ever see such a kind of left ventricular pressure volume loop such a kind of left ventricular pressure volume loop, tall thing what is this one aortic stenosis aortic stenosis okay whenever you see such a kind of left ventricular pressure volume loop both extending from that side to this side where the stroke volume like you know is more, which is showing more. What is this one? This is mitral regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. Okay, these kind of things. Okay. See, preload and afterload. See, preload is nothing but, see, first of all, preload is nothing but end diastolic volume. We have said, right, that 120 ml of blood. At 120 to 140 ml of the blood, how, the amount of blood that's going to stay in the ventricles, the amount of blood that's going to come into the ventricles during diastole, means during diastole or during relaxation, how much blood is going to be there inside the ventricles? It is called as an end diastolic volume. It's nothing but the preload. End diastolic volume preload, they are one, they are one the same. Okay. So, this preload and the end diastolic volume, they are the same things. MCQ which you need to know is if you want to know in the MCQ point of view. So, preload depends on what? Depends on venous return. Venous return. So, preload depends on venous return. For example, now let's understand like this. If there is vasoconstriction, now I am giving, I am using a drug called as vasoconstricted. Vaso. Now I am doing vasoconstriction. Especially which vessels? Veins. Okay, so let's write that veno constrictor. I'm using it called as veno constrictor. When your veins in the legs, when your veins in the lower extremities, whenever they are constricted, whenever they're compressed, what will happen? More blood is going to come to the heart. More blood is coming means more blood is going to be filled into the heart. So simple. So if you do veno constriction, what happens? Sir, venous return increases. When venous return increases, more filling of the heart will happen. So, what happened to the end diastolic volume? End diastolic volume increases. 
when endoastric volume increases it's nothing but yes preload increases its preload increases okay more the blood in the heart more load on the heart simple if you keep 120 ml of blood then preload that's a normal preload if you give 150 or 160 180 ml of blood 180 ml of blood you are increasing the load on the heart so you are increasing the preload that's a load on the heart the load on which the heart is working the load on which the heart is acting is called as a preload so preload is nothing but the blood amount of blood which is taken in the heart okay now what is after load after load is a load against which the heart is working for example uh, to make you understand in a simple way see this is the left ventricle i'm talking about the left ventricle from the left ventricle who is coming out what is this blood vessel so this blood vessel is the aorta okay now look here now this aorta it is divided into what so this aorta is going to divide into arteries now this arteries they are going to further divide into arterioles something like this these what are these these are the arterioles right arteries are further divided into arterioles now my question to you okay this is also very important mcq actually see this is aorta now what is this wall can you tell me so this wall is aortic wall now usually in your aorta what is the pressure all the time in your aorta the pressure is 80 mm hg 80 mm hg let's take it as a base value 80 mm hg okay so now this left ventricle this left ventricle how much it should generate the pressure to open this aortic wall to open this aortic wall the left ventricle have to generate now the pressure of more than 80 mm hg like 80.1 it have to generate okay are you getting it so now left ventricle have to generate a pressure of 80 80.1 or 81 mm hg in a simple way okay now my question is saying you will understand for lifelong you have to know this so this arterioles this arterioles are there right this arterioles are totally surrounded by they are having highest concentration of smooth muscle these arterioles what they are having they are having highest concentration of smooth muscle okay okay now because of the smooth muscle activity now arterioles are constricted now let's take an understanding like this arteriolo constriction arterioles are constricted arteriolo constriction arterioles are constricted now when the arterioles are they are totally constricted now tell me when the arterioles are constricted do you think the blood can move forward easily now do you think the blood from the aorta into the arteries to the organs do you think it will move easily no sir the blood cannot move easily forward so what happened to the pressure in the aorta the pressure in the aorta now is not just 80 mm hg now it will increase now baseline pressure now it will increase to maybe 120 mm hg now left ventricle see now left ventricle to open this aortic wall to open this aortic wall how much pressure it have to generate that the left ventricle now it have to work more now it have to generate a pressure of now 121 121 okay for example now if you think that the pressure in the yeah the pressure in the iota now the pressure in the iota is maybe 150 mm hg now how much left ventricle have to generate left ventricle have to generate a pressure of 151 so more the pressure in the iota more pressure the left ventricle have to generate the more work it have to do the more like you know load is there on the now more load is there on the left ventricle more load in the sense it have to work more so this is called as after load after load so after load it is nothing but aortic pressures aortic pressure or in a, in a way we can say after load is nothing but the pressure generated by the left ventricle how much pressure the left ventricle is it like you know they need to generate how much pressure the left ventricle need to generate to open the aortic wall to open the aortic wall that's called as after load sir simple now tell me after load is dependent on what so the pressure in this iota Okay, the pressure in this iota, it is dependent on what? The pressure in the iota is dependent on whether the arterioles are constricted or dilated. Okay, now this is the MCQ. Preload depends. 
on see here i have already shown you preload it depends on venus return more the venus return more preload but what about the afterload afterload it depends on afterload depends on the resistance of the blood vessels is arterioles when they are whether they are constricted or dilated this is called as total peripheral resistance okay so tpr after load it is dependent on what it depends on the total peripheral resistance whether the arterioles are constricted or dilated now the question can come something like this also so this tpr is maximum for which blood vessels so the tpr is maximum for which blood vessels arterioles arterioles why why arterioles why because arterioles have maximum smooth muscles okay so now remember arterioles are having maximum smooth muscles so there will be arterial constriction arterial dilation based on arterial constriction arterial dilation after load changes okay total peripheral resistance changes and total peripheral resistance changes are uh, like an you know, after load also changes so after load is nothing but i am telling you see after load is nothing but the pressure which is generated by the left ventricle in order to open the aortic wall and it depends on what it depends on it depends on arterioles mainly whether the arterioles are constricted or dilated okay now i will give you one example you please tell me see here this is your left ventricle this is your lv left ventricle and what is this aorta after the aorta what do you have these are the arteries after the arteries what do you have see these are the arterioles now in this given example the arterioles they are not constricted now arterioles are absolutely dilated okay now arterioles they are not constricted they are dilated now they are like this now whenever they are dilated whatever the blood is there it's not staying it's simply going easily in the forward direction the blood is not being stagnated it's not getting congested so now when the blood is now moving very easily now what happened to the pressure in the aorta the pressure in the aorta decreases now then the pressure in the aorta may be just 70 mm hg now what about the after load now tell me what about the after load now left ventricle just need to generate 71 mm hg 71 mm hg simple no need to even generate 80 just 71 is enough so what i am trying to put into your mind is after load is nothing but the pressure generated by the left ventricle to open the aortic valve okay so is that clear hope is that uh, hope that's clear now let's continue with the endocrine system the target is in the next half an hour in the next half an hour or maximum to maximum next like you know maximum 40 minutes let's complete the endocrine physiology from here everything is going to be easy now tell me so here i am showing you this uh, this gland which i am showing you is the pituitary gland now in the pituitary gland how many lobes are there there is anterior pituitary as well as posterior pituitary anterior pituitary it is developed from rathke's pouch anatomy mcq you need to know okay anterior pituitary it is derived from the rathke's pouch and the posterior pituitary it is derived from the neurectoderm okay that and see in an adult okay this rathke's pouch if still this rathke's pouch cells are there and if they form a tumor if they form a tumor then it is called as cranio pharyngioma mcq from the pathology point of view tumor see tumor to the remnants tumor to the remnants of rathke's pouch that will cause a, like you know a tumor this tumor that is coming from the rathke's pouch is called as a cranio pharyngioma okay that after this what i need to teach you in the anterior pituitary okay Uh, here let me show you here see this is hypothalamus now what is this this is the anterior pituitary now in the anterior pituitary there are different different types of cells are there for example look here there are five different types of cells are there there are somatotropes the color coding is very much important specifically there is a reason why i am just showing the colors like this somatotrope lactotropes and what are these these are corticotropes thyrotropes and gonadotropes now see the question which they, they will ask you in your exam very very important question if you stay in the cells in the anterior pituitary you take a tissue from the anterior pituitary and you stay in those cells see two cells are taking red color stain these are called as acidophilic cells so 
which cells are acidophilic cells which will which cells will take the eosin state are eosinophilic acidophilic not the basophilic which cells are eosinophilic are which cells are acidophilic cells say somatotropes somatotropes and lactotropes somatotropes produces the growth hormone lactotropes produces the prolactin so these cells are the acidophilic cells so the same thing which was shown over here the acidophilic cells somatotropes and lactotropes okay so this that's the reason why these hormones are also called as growth hormone and prolactin they are coming from the acidophilic cells and they are also called as the growth uh, they are also called as the twin hormones okay they are also called as the twin hormones do you know the reason why they are called as the twin hormones the reason is see both is prolactin coming from the lactotropes is prolactin coming from the lactotropes and this uh, growth hormone coming from the gonadotropes see these two prolactin and growth hormone they use one kind of receptor called as a tyrosine kinase receptor okay tyrosine kinase receptors again mcq from the physiology okay again this will come in even in the general physiology also when i will teach in the second part second half again there there i will like tell you this uh, i will explain you this so there are these hormones called as a pig hormones what are these pig hormones prolactin insulin growth hormone that so is pig hormones these, these three hormones they will use a same type of receptor they will use the same type of receptor what is the type of receptor called as that receptor is called as a tyrosine kinase receptor all these three will use the tyrosine kinase receptor come on guys please tell me acidophilic cells what are the acidophilic cells the acidophilic cells are uh, the acidophilic cells one minute acidophilic cells are the lactotropes as well as the lactotropes as well as the somatotropes these are the acidophilic cells and why they are called as a twin hormones the growth hormone prolactin they are called as a twin hormones why they are called as twin hormones because they use the same type of receptor okay, okay. now after this what else you should know the very very important point which i want you to know is see uh let me draw here itself yeah, let me draw here now let's understand this as a hypothalamus you guys already know this this is the hypothalamus and this is the anterior pituitary Okay, here is the anterior pituitary. Okay, now see from the hypothalamus. Now let me show you. This is one. Uh, okay, let me show you the red color. This is the somatotrope. Somatotrope. Normally, what it will produce? It will produce the growth hormone. Okay, it will produce the growth hormone. There is one more cell called as a lactotrope. What it will produce? It will produce the prolactin. Okay, what it will produce the prolactin? Now MCQ for your exam, especially from pharma point of view, okay, they, they will integrate this. What they will ask you is there is a nucleus here in the hypothalamus. There is this nucleus. Do you know what this nucleus is producing? So this nucleus is producing a substance called as prolactin inhibitory hormone, also called as dopamine. Okay, dopamine. Do you know what this dopamine will do? Sir, so dopamine will always inhibit the lactotropes. Now in a 10-year-old girl, 15-year-old girl, 20-year-old girl, she is having hypothalamus, pituitary gland is there, she is having a breast tissue, but why she is not lactating? Why she is not producing the milk? Because her hypothalamus is producing the prolact, sorry, her hypothalamus is producing the dopamine or prolactin inhibitory hormone. This prolactin inhibitory hormone inhibits the lactotropes so that prolactin is not produced before delivering the baby. So without baby, there is no prolactin. Okay, so there is inhibition. This is called as an inhibitory control. One inhibition. And not only that, there is one more hypothalamic nuclei. This hypothalamic nuclei produces something called as somatostatin. Somatostatin. Do you know what this somatostatin will do? Somatostatin will also inhibit the somatotropes. So when the somatotropes are inhibited, growth hormone production will go down. So again inhibition only. So the question which was asked in one of the exam is inhibitory control. See inhibitory control by hypothalamus is shown on which anterior pituitary hormones? Somatostatin inhibits growth hormone. Dopamine or prolactin inhibitory hormone inhibits prolactin. Okay, so completed that. Now after this, what else you should know for your exams? Now First clinical case number one, if there is damage to the pituitary stack, the pituitary stack is damaged, what happens? Because of some road accident or because of some trauma, the pituitary stock is gone. Yeah. What happens? The pituitary stock is gone. See, all hormones, growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, like luteinizing hormone, these are all the anterior pituitary hormones, right? You would have already studied these things. Okay. This is a rapid revision. So all these hormones goes down, except like ACTH, everything goes down, except prolactin 
prolactin will be increased the levels of prolactin are increased why do you know the reason why prolactin is increased because i taught you something see look here i taught you normally normally all the time what happens normally the dopamine see dopamine is continuously inhibiting the lactotrope somatostatin is not continuously coming somatostatin will come not but not continuously dopamine continuously inhibits the lactotropes but whenever there is a pituitary stock damage now you think logically and tell me whenever see this pituitary stock here there is a damage now whenever there is a pituitary stock damage now do you think that this prolactin inhibitory hormone or the dopamine can it come down to the lactotropes can it come down and inhibit the lactotropes no it cannot so now what happened to the lactotropes now lactotropes are very happy now lactotropes are activated now lactotropes what they will produce they will produce prolactin so one point which i want you to know is there is pituitary stock damage all hormone increases except prolactin okay mcq completed next there is a condition called as shihan syndrome okay there is a condition called as shihan syndrome so shihan syndrome is nothing but see there is a female pregnant female pregnancy now this pregnant female is getting delivered now delivery happened during delivery there is postpartum hemorrhage too much blood loss heavy blood loss heavy blood loss whenever there is a heavy blood loss do you know what happens there is vasospasm in the body too much vaso spasm all the blood vessels are constricted like this now even the blood flow even the blood flow to the pituitary gland is also decreased so now what happened to the pituitary gland the entire pituitary gland not just like you no know, anterior or posterior but the entire pituitary gland the whole pituitary gland is necrosed so that's why here i am showing in black color so this is called as shihan syndrome it's a complication it's a complication of postpartum hemorrhage okay in even this will come in uh, uh, the obstetrics okay so whenever the female who delivers the baby whenever she is having this postpartum hemorrhage too much heavy blood loss immediately what happened to the blood vessels blood vessels will undergo vasoconstriction now whenever there is vasoconstriction there is less blood flow to the pituitary gland there is hypoxic conditions in the pituitary gland the pituitary gland might undergo necrosis so this is called as a postpartum necrosis of the pituitary gland okay so postpartum necrosis of the pituitary gland is called as the shihans syndrome shihans syndrome so what happens in shihans syndrome every hormone decreases right? because the entire pituitary is dead no the whole pituitary is dead all hormones growth hormone thyroid stimulating hormone fsh lh acth and prolactin every hormone is going down okay so why we need to know this sir is because a case will come if you imagine that you are a female imagine yourself you are a female you delivered a baby now after delivering the baby what is the first thing that you will do you will do you will be going for the breastfeeding or lactation but now lactation will be possible no pituitary gland is gone no prolactin no breastfeeding so that's a major problem okay so completed next step the next case which i want you to know is see if you look here actually these are your eyeballs right these are your eyeballs so back to the eyeballs what is this cranial nerve that's coming out this is the second cranial nerve that's the optic nerve okay now both these optic nerves they are fusing at this point this point is called as this junction point is called as the optic chasm that junction that junction both optic nerves they fuse that's called as the optic chasm now whenever you are having see, see this is a normal location of the pituitary gland okay let me show in red color this this is the place where normally pituitary gland locates but now whenever there is a tumor to the pituitary gland prolactinoma maybe a tumor called as prolactinoma tumor of lactotropes that's the most common thing most common tumors most common pituitary tumors are prolactinomas now your pituitary gland is increasing in size like this something like that now whenever there is a prolactinoma tell me which structure is going to be affected sir now optic chasm look here because of this prolactinoma optic chasm is getting compressed what happens if optic chasm is getting compressed definitely there will be some visual abnormality now in central nervous system physiology i will try to explain it better but here now whenever there is any damage to optic chasm because of this prolactinomas or anterior pituitary tumors now both the eyes both the eyes the temporal vision the side vision the side vision this is the nasal vision okay but the side vision called as a temporal vision that will be lost this is called as a bitemporal hemianopsia okay this bitemporal hemianopsia is due to damage to optic chasm that's the one point which i want you to know so prolactinomas which are the most common anterior pituitary tumors they compress the optic chasm leading to bitemporal okay 
Now, one more thing which I want you to know is if you are having, for example, a prolactinoma. Now imagine you are a patient, you are having the prolactinoma. Now this prolactinoma, what it will do, it will continuously, continuously produce the prolactin. Because of this prolactin, what might happen in the patient? Because of this prolactin, there will be gynecomastia, breast development in the males. Because of this prolactin, a female, a just 15 years old female, now she will start to lactate because of this prolactin, unnecessary prolactin. Now she will start to lactate and it's called galactobia. And because of this prolactin, normally see, prolactin inhibits the menses. This is the thing which you should know from your gynecology. Till the time prolactin is there in the body, prolactin inhibits the menses, inhibits the reproductive cycles. So, in prolactinoma, there is amenorrhea, no menses is going to be there. So, whenever the patient is getting this prolactinoma, what kind of problems he or she is going to get? Bitemporal hemi and apsia is going to be there. And there will be, uh, headaches will be there because of that tumor, no headaches will be there. Bitemporal hemi and apsia will be there. Uh, lactational amenorrhea, amenorrhea will be there. And uh, galactoria and gynecomastia will be there. Okay, these are the problems. So, these are the problems. And in the recent FMG exam also, this question has been tested many times. Now, prolactin, like if, imagine, I am the person, I am the person who is having prolactinoma, I am having a prolactinoma. Now, too much, too much prolactin is getting produced in my body. If I come to you, how you should treat me? You have to decrease the prolactin levels in my body. As a medical management, as a medical management, you have to decrease the prolactin levels in my body. Who is the antagonistic of prolactin? The antagonistic of the prolactin is dopamine. So, dopamine-like drugs are used. So, drugs which will decrease the prolactin levels, drugs which decrease the prolactin levels are dopamine-like drugs, are dopamine agonists like cabergoline and bromocryptin. At least I want you to know these things. Cabergoline is a drug of choice okay, for all the prolactin related problems. So, cabergoline and bromocryptin, these are dopamine agonists which will decrease the prolactin levels in the blood. Okay. So, completed. After this, what else you should know? Now, for your FMG exam, I will tell you the one thing, posterior bitter. Posterior bitter, it will produce which hormones? Come on, tell me, posterior bitter, it produces which hormones? The so posterior bitter, it produces, it doesn't produce any hormones, first of all. It doesn't produce any hormones. It stores certain hormones. What are they? Say. Now, this is the hypothalamus, no? Hypothalamus, actually. Hypothalamus, there are two nuclei. Remember it like this. Many times this mnemonic, I have said this mnemonic many times. There is a nucleus called as a supraoptic nucleus, S-O-N. See, supraoptic nucleus, which was written over there, don't worry. See, this supraoptic nucleus, S-O-N, it produces a hormone called as antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Antidiuretic hormone. And there is a nucleus called as a paraventricular nucleus, PVN. Paraventricular nucleus produces the oxytocin. Okay, see, paraventricular nucleus what it is producing, paraventricular nucleus, it produces the oxytocin and supraoptic nucleus, it produces the supraoptic nucleus, it produces the antidiuretic hormone. So, these hormones are produced in where the hormones are produced in the hypothalamus. But where they are stored, they are stored in the posterior pituitary. They will come and they are getting stored in the posterior pituitary. That's it. Okay. So, the same thing. The posterior pituitary does not produce any hormones. It stores hormones, oxytocin and ADH. Okay, and don't never ever confuse, don't say something like this, SOAP, if you write like this and say, supraoptic nucleus produces the oxytocin, blunder, no, supraoptic nucleus, what it will do, supraoptic nucleus produces the antiretic hormone, paraventricular nucleus produces the oxytocin, okay, now, the questions which you need to know is, sir, oxytocin, what are the functions of the oxytocin, many times, at least minimum of 10 times this question has been asked, what oxytocin will do? Oxytocin causes uterine contractions during delivery. Causes the uterus to contract, causes the delivery. Simple thing. What else? This oxytocin, after the delivery, after the delivery, this oxytocin acts on the breast tissue, causes the milk let out. Okay, like you know, it will cause the milk to come out of the breast. So that's the galactokinesis. Okay, galactokinesis or milk ejection. Remember, galactopoiesis is different. Galactopoiesis is because of prolactin. Okay, let me write here. Prolactin. Prolactin causes milk production, but oxytocin causes milk ejection. Oxytocin milk ejection, okay. Oxytocin also causes milk ejection or galactokinesis. Both are same. Milk ejection or galactokinesis. Milk production or galactopoiesis. They are one and the same. Okay. Next. What else I want you to know? Um, Points which I want you to know is 
question was asked okay oxytocin okay now vasopressin see this vasopressin is also called as what antidiuretic hormone vasopressin also called as antidiuretic hormone okay now this vasopressin yes it is produced by the suprotic nucleus already i have discussed this vasopressin is stored inside certain bodies vasopressin is stored inside herring bodies so vasopressin is stored in herring bodies herring bodies these are the vesicles the vesicles in which the vasopressin molecules are stored antidiuretic hormone molecules are stored now important mcq which i want you to know is sir this adh antidiuretic hormone it have how many types of receptors oxytocin complete it. forget it forget about it adh have three types of receptors what are they v1 v2 okay v1 v2 and v3 v1 v2 and v3 v3 is also called as v1b so v1 receptors v2 receptors and v3 receptors if this antidiuretic hormone if this adh if it acts on v1 receptors do you know what happens first of all where this v1 receptors are present so the v1 receptors they are present on the blood vessels v1 receptors are present on the blood vessels if you stimulate the v1 receptors there is vasoconstriction mcq that's it done v1 receptors are present on the blood vessels v1 receptors will cause vasoconstriction that's why the name vasopressin vasopressin v2 receptors where they are present v2 receptors are present in the nephrons collecting ducts so v2 receptor when you stimulate the v2 receptors on the collecting ducts nephrons now what happens water reabsorption okay i will explain this in detail in the renal physiology but for now uh, in detail in the sense i will explain this topic there also the v2 receptors are present in the collecting ducts of the nephron helps in the reabsorption of the water v1 receptors are present on the blood vessels helps in the vasoconstriction na v3 receptors v3 receptors are present on the anterior pituitary okay v3 receptors are present on the anterior pituitary it helps in secretion of the acth adrenocorticotropic hormone acth completed so v1 receptors on the blood vessel v2 receptors on the collecting ducts and v3 receptors on the uh, anterior pituitary v3 receptor activation v3 receptor stimulation will cause the release of acth v2 receptor stimulation will cause water reabsorption v1 receptor stimulation will cause vasoconstriction vasoconstriction that's why the name vasopressin okay enough enough now after this what you should know regarding the growth hormone okay uh, regarding growth hormone you know many things but my like you know questions my question is growth hormone it's an anabolic hormone okay growth hormone it's an anabolic hormone it's anabolic hormone so one important point about the growth hormone is growth hormone increases the blood glucose levels i want you to know this okay growth hormone what it will do sir it will increases the blood glucose levels okay so that's why if the patient is having see growth hormone deficiency growth hormone deficiency the patient is going to suffer with hypoglycemia okay during imagine that i am a child okay imagine that uh, there is a, there is this one child who is having no growth hormone deficiency of the growth hormone so what he is going to suffer with so during childhood during childhood the growth hormone deficiency is there the patient is not able to grow he won't to grow that will cause dwarfism so this dwarf people the point which i want you to know is this dwarf people are going to have hypoglycemia that's a one important thing so this dwarf people are going to suffer with hypoglycemia sir then now if you having growth hormone excess now imagine i am okay i am a child imagine i am a child uh, maybe i am 10 years now i am having too much amount of growth hormone see growth hormone excess too much amount of growth hormone during childhood before the closure of epiphysis now that will cause a gigantism okay you know this already you know this the patient is going to be tall he is going to be a giant but my question is here mainly is what happens if there is excessive growth hormone right now after the closure of the epiphysis i am not a child i am not in my like you know adolescent age i am not in my puberty now i am an adult now if you inject growth hormone into my body too much amount of growth hormone into my body do you think that i will grow no i am not going to grow so after the closure of epiphysis that's going to cause too much amount of growth hormone growth hormone excess is going to cause a condition called as acromegaly acromegaly okay acromegaly now this was the question image based question so this patient if, if if you inject too much amount of growth hormone into my body so what are the clinical features now because of this growth hormone the growth will happen not a linear growth not a linear growth the organ size will increase the thickness of the bones will increase so now you can see frontal bossing will be there there will be protrusion of the jaw prognathism is going to be there the tongue size increases and it will fall out like you know, like just like a dog for a log how the tongue is will be like you know there hanging so there will be frontal bossing increase hand and foot size the thickness of the bones is getting increased large fleshy beefy tongue can be there prognathism can be there 
because of hyperglycemia more growth hormone more blood glucose levels that can even lead to diabetes mellitus followed by coronary heart diseases okay the size of the heart increases cardiomyopathy all these things will be there but i don't want to go in all this in detail simple frontal bossing if you never you see such a kind of image based question with a frontal bossing programism and large beefy tongue that is acromegaly acromegaly the question which i want you to know is the treatment this is the mcq treatment how to treat how to treat this acromegaly how to treat is you can use a drug called a somatostatin analog you know somatostatin decreases the growth hormone somatostatin decreases the growth hormone so somatostatin analogs like octreotide and landreotide so octreotide and landreotide these are the drugs which are used in the treatment of acromegaly true and growth hormone receptor let's block the growth hormone receptor okay let the growth hormone be there let it be there growth hormone too much amount of growth hormone is okay let it be there you can block what you can block the receptors of growth hormone this is the mcq so growth hormone receptor blocker is called as a pegvisomant and it can be also used in the treatment of acromegaly mcq done okay so the treatment of acromegaly i want you to know at least these two things so somatostatin receptor analogs like octreotide and lantreotide or you can block the growth hormone receptors the growth hormone receptor blockers include pegvisomant you can complete it so if you know this that's more than enough now after this now what else i want you to know there are so many things but see growth hormone the next important point i want you to know is growth hormone it will go to the liver cell the growth hormone it will go to the liver in the liver the growth hormone you see when the see these are the growth hormone receptors when the growth hormone is acting on the growth hormone receptors now liver is going to produce a substance called as insulin like growth factor iglgf1 so insulin like growth factor is produced by the liver under the influence of this growth hormone growth hormone when it acts on the liver liver produces insulin like growth factor it also promotes the growth this is the one point i want you to know okay so insulin like growth factor production is produced by growth hormone only next what else you should know they are in the endocrine physiology say thyroid hormones in the thyroid topic point which i want you to know is how thyroid hormones are produced what are the steps in the production of the thyroid hormones what are the steps in the, the production of the thyroid hormones okay that's the mcq see the steps here the main important steps i am talking about see the main important steps main main there is an enzyme called as thyroid peroxidase okay this is the thyroid gland inside the thyroid gland i am talking i am showing you saying this is the thyroid gland inside the thyroid gland these are the cells this cells name is called as a follicular cells inside the thyroid gland there are follicular cells present in this follicular cells there is an enzyme present called as thyroid peroxidase this one single thyroid peroxidase do you know what it will do it will do three reactions three reactions what are they oxidation organification and coupling reaction so mcq that will come in your exam is oxidation organification and coupling reaction are done by which enzyme so all the three oxidation organification coupling reaction all these three reactions in the thyroid hormone biosynthesis are under the control of an enzyme called as thyroid peroxidase or tpo okay done sir what do you need to know for your exam especially to treat hyperthyroidism hyperthyroidism means more more thyroid hormone is there how can you treat hyperthyroidism how can you decrease the t3 t4 hormone production means see by inhibiting this thyroid peroxidase how to inhibit this thyroid peroxidase thyroid peroxidase is inhibited by propyl thiouracil ptu mcq propyl thiouracil methimazole and carbamazole these drugs so, propyl thiouracil methimazole and carbamazole these are anti thyroid drugs what they will do they will inhibit thyroid peroxidase so oxidation organification coupling reaction are inhibited when they are inhibited no t3 t4 production no t3 t4 production sir now here one more thing which i want to put into your mind is say in this follicular cell do you know what is the first step okay regarding the tpo oxidation organification coupling reaction i have discussed for the production of t3 t4 you need to have oxidation organification coupling reaction okay but um this question was asked in the neat pg exam this question was asked in the neat pg exam it might come in the fmg exam also need first you need to uptake this is the blood right this is the blood you have taken a seafood for example after the class you went and ate seafood for example if you fish now seafoods are rich in what they are rich in iodides okay iodides 
Now, first of all, you have taken this seafood, it's digested and you have got the iodides into your body and the iodides are absorbed. And where these iodides are now, they came into the blood. Now, see these iodides, now they are going into the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland will take the iodides. What is the name of this transporter, MCQ? There is this transporter on the follicular cells called as sodium iodide symporter. So, with the help of the sodium iodide symporter, okay, with the help of the sodium iodide symporter, the iodides will be absorbed. Iodides are absorbed with the help of sodium iodide symporter. That's MCQ. Okay. So, tell me, sodium iodide symporters are present where? The sodium iodide symporters are present on the follicular cells. But, see here. There are other places where the sodium iodide symporters are present. I am not going to like you know explain you. Just you need to buy heart this. So this, this is the exact question which was asked. Sodium iodide symporters are present on which cells? Except kind of questions will come. So see the sodium iodide symporters are present on the follicular cells or the thyrocytes. Yes, they are present on the thyrocytes. But not only the thyrocytes, salivary glands, glastic mucosa, placenta, okay, sporoid plexus, mammary glands, all these places also will have the sodium iodide symporters. Now, after this, what else you should know? Guys, answer my question. Answer my question. How many types of thyroid hormones do you know? Two hormones, sir. T4 and T3. T4 and T3. Who is produced in maximum quantity? T4, sir. Maximum quantity, T4. Max. T4 is max. T4 will be converted into T3 and this T3 it is the active form. This T3 is the active. Okay, this is the real one. Okay, this, oh, sorry. this is the real one. T3 is the real one. T4 and T3. Wherever it is needed in the body, okay, wherever and whenever it is needed in the body, the T4 will be converted into T3 in the tissues. So this is the MCQ. So T4 will be converted into the tissue. Uh, T4 will be converted into the T3 in the tissues with the help of an enzyme called as 5 prime T iodinase. With the help of an enzyme called as 5 prime T iodinase, which is present in the tissues, which will convert the T4 into the T3. Active form. MCQ is who will inhibit this 5 prime T iodinase? Which drugs inhibit this 5 prime T iodinase? There are certain anti-thyroid drugs which are used in the treatment of hyperthyroidism. Imagine if I am suffering with hyperthyroidism, you can use a drug called as propylthiouracil. Yes. So propylthiouracil, here I have discussed the PTU. See, uh, where is that? See, propylthiouracil, it not only inhibits the thyroid peroxidase enzyme, it not only inhibits oxidation organification coupling, but the propylthiouracil, this drug, this PTU also inhibits this process called as peripheral conversion. So this process which I am showing you T4 to T3, this process is called as a peripheral conversion which is happening at the level of tissues with the help of an enzyme called as 5 prime diiodinase. This 5 prime diiodinase is enzyme. It is inhibited with the help of a drug called as propylthiouracil. So now tell me, propylthiouracil, yes, it inhibits, it inhibits thyroid peroxidase through it also inhibits peripheral conversion. True. Both are true statements. Okay. Now, uh, apart from this, what else I want you to know? Uh, not only propylthiouracil, propylthiouracil inhibits the 5 prime diodinase. Yes, it inhibits the 5 prime diodinase, but not only P, propylthiouracil, but also drug called as propranolol. Okay. So, propranolol, again, it's starting with the letter PC. So P, propranolol and propylthiouracil. Propranolol and propylthiouracil. P for P. These two drugs, they will inhibit what? They will inhibit peripheral conversion. So propylthiouracil and propranolol are the drugs which will inhibit the enzyme called as 5' prime diiodinase. They inhibit the peripheral conversion. Okay, they will inhibit the peripheral conversion. So done. Uh, after this, what else I should teach you? Now, the points which I want you to teach you is like, you know, all the effects of the thyroid hormones. These are like, you know, these are the basic, basic things which you, like, you know, which you have studied in your regular classes also. Okay, they are not that important. Now, concentrate. Point which I want you to know is thyroid hormones, okay, T3 mainly, it increases the basal metabolic rate. Okay, T3 increases the basal metabolic rate. How? Basal metabolic rate means how many calories are required in a day. 
to maintain the homeostasis to maintain all the reactions in the bio, in the body to maintain all the biochemical reactions to keep this body alive for the next 24 hours how many calories are needed i will say i need almost 3000 kilo calories okay i need almost 3000 kilo calories to maintain all the homeostasis in the body that's my basal metabolic rate my basal metabolic rate if you ask a girl uh, if she is not doing for example active work then 2500 kilo calories are enough usually when compared to a male Females will use less calories right? because their body weight is less. A males will be doing harder work, so more BMR, more BMR. My question to you is here, the thyroid hormones, yes, it increases the basal metabolic rate. So how? How? How means? Remember, this is a very important MCQ. This is your body cell. Okay, this is your body cell. Now, this is the T3 hormone. Now, the T3 hormone, say, do you know what it will do? Before telling what it will do, look here. On this body cell, there is a universal transporter present. Universal transporter. It is taking three. Oh no. It is taking two potassium ions into the cell and throwing out three sodium ions out of the cell. Two potassium is coming into the cell. Three potassium is going out of the cell with the help of an, uh, with the help of ATP. ATP will be broken down. Two potassium comes into the cell. Three sodium goes out of the cell. This is called as sodium potassium ATPase. This is called as a sodium potassium ATPase. This channel is called as a sodium potassium ATPase. On this cell, tell me how many sodium potassium ATP is that? One sodium potassium ATP. For example, one sodium potassium ATP. Now, if I inject myself, for example, I am taking this drug, thyroid drug, I am taking this thyroid, a levothyroxine tablet. If I take too much amount of this thyroid hormones, do you know what this thyroid hormones will do? Thyroid hormones directly cross the cell membrane, remember. Thyroid hormones directly enters into the nucleus. Okay, thyroid hormone have the receptor where thyroid hormone receptor is present in the nucleus. So that's the MCQ. So thyroid hormones have intra nuclear receptor. Thyroid hormones have intra nuclear receptors. Now, when the intra nuclear receptors are activated, now they are going to activate the genes. They are going to act. They are going to do the transcription. So certain genes are activated. Transcription will happen at the end of the day. At the end of the day, see. Now what is happening on the cell, when the thyroid hormones are acting on the cell, please tell me what happened to the number of sodium potassium ATPases. So the sodium potassium ATPases on the cell are increasing. See, the number of sodium potassium ATPases are increasing. Okay. So sodium will come out, 3 sodium is coming out, potassium is coming in. Sodium will go out, potassium will come in. So the number of sodium potassium ATPases are increasing. So now tell me more ATP are getting broken down or less ATP are getting broken down. So the more ATP is getting broken down. Okay. So when the more and more ATP are getting broken down, see more calories are utilized or less calories are utilized. More calories are utilized, more ATP are being broken down. So that's how so thyroid hormones, yes, they increase the BMR, they increase the calorie usage. How? By increasing sodium, potassium, ATPases on tissues. This is the MCQ. Okay, this is the MCQ. Look here. So throughout the body and tissues, what it is doing? So increases the basal metabolic rate. How thyroid hormones increase the basal metabolic rate? By increasing number of sodium, potassium, ATPases. Neat PG MCQ. This was a neat PG MCQ. Thyroid hormones increases the basal metabolic rate in all the tissues. Except if I take a thyroid hormone, my basal metabolic rate is going to be increased. Everywhere. Except these are the exceptions. Exceptions include the testis, uterus, lymph nodes, spleen and anterior pitel. In these five places, except these five places. Uterus, testis, lymph nodes, anterior pituitary, and spleen. Except these five places, everywhere the basal metabolic rate is going to be increased. This is one point. Okay. Done. And thyroid hormones, remember, more and more ATP are getting broken down. Under the influence of the thyroid hormones, more and more ATP are getting broken down. So, more calories are being broken down. The more heat will be produced in the body. So thyroid hormones, that's why thyroid hormones are called as thermogenic hormones. Okay, they are the thermogenic hormones. Means they increase the body temperature. They are the thermogenic hormones. They increase the basal body temperature. Okay, this is the point which I want you to know. Enough. If you know this, that's more than enough. Okay. Guys, is it clear? Regarding the thyroid hormones, 
Is it clear, guys? Are you clear with the paired hormones? So don't worry about the notes. PDF, PDF will be shared in the group. Don't worry about that. Oh, like some guy is watching from Afghanistan. Yes. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Like some guy is saying, higher the afterload. Higher the propensity to develop the cardiomyopathy, especially hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Excellent. Excellent. That's a true statement. If you're having aortic stenosis, imagine aortic stenosis. Yes, afterload will be more. Whenever there is aortic stenosis, the afterload is more. The left ventricle is trying more harder to push the blood into the aorta. Yes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can happen. Yes, true. Absolutely. Excellent. Mid content. You are true. You are true. So now after this, uh, thyroid hormones, like uh, thyroid hormones, catabolic hormones, yes, I have discussed. Um, next, what you should know. All the general regular activities of the thyroid hormones, you know it. But for exam point of view, for exam point of view, I'm telling you, though I, this is not a pathology session, but say, you know about uh, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, right? I'm asking you generally, uh, mixed edema is seen in hyper or hypothyroidism? Hyper or hypothyroidism, can you tell me? Mixed edema. See, mixed edema is a feature of hyper or hypothyroidism. Mixed edema is a feature of. Watching from China. Great Gagan. Mixed edema, it's a feature of both hyper as well as hypo. Both hyper and hypothyroidism. Patients can have mixed edema. In both the patients, yes, you can have mixed edema. But highly, like, you know, this question high, can come in your exams, like, you know, highly, likely, high likely, okay? See, if they use this word, pre-TBL, pre-TBL mixed edema, then the answer is Graves' disease. Okay. Sir, there is a disease called as Graves' disease, which will cause hyperthyroidism. Okay, there is a disease called as Graves' disease, which will cause hyperthyroidism. Okay, so in this Graves' disease, they will definitely use this word pre-TBL mixed edema. So pre-TBL mixed edema means 100% uh, Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism. But if they simply say, hypo, hy if they simply use the word mixed edema, yeah, mixed edema can be seen both in hyper as well as hypothyroidism, more commonly in the hypothyroidism, more commonly in the hypothyroidism. But pre-TBL mixed edema, answer is Graves disease. That's it. Now, after this, let's talk about the pancreas and the pancreas related things. Pancreas, yeah, you know, it's a mixocrine gland. It produces both, uh, uh, like, you know, it have both the functions, exocrine functions as well as, sorry, typing mistake, it have endocrine. Okay, it produces both exocrine as well as endocrine functions. Are there. Now, from your basic biochemistry classes, I am not going in detail. You have studied alpha cells of the pancreas produces the glucagon, beta cells produces the insulin, delta cells are the D cells produces somatostatin. So yes, somatostatin is produced from the hypothalamus. True, the somatostatin is also produced from the pancreas. The D cells of the delta cells produces the somatostatin. True, F cells of the pancreas produces the pancreatic polypeptide. All these are the hormones, and epsilon cells are E cells produces the ghrelin. Super, super MCQ, which you need to know for your exam is a ghrelin. When, sir, when ghrelin is produced? Ghrelin is produced during fasting. During fasting states, this ghrelin is going to be produced from the pancreatic epsilon cells. And what is the function of this ghrelin? Hunger. When you are doing fasting, you will have the feeling of hunger, right? Why? Because of this ghrelin only. So this ghrelin, yes, it increases the hunger, the feeling of hunger. And not only that, remember, ghrelin increases the growth hormone production, FMG, MCQ. Ghrelin increases the growth hormone production. Why growth hormone? Why? Because growth hormone increases the blood glucose levels during fasting. That's why. Okay. So during fasting, ghrelin is produced. Ghrelin stimulates the release of the growth hormone. Growth hormone increases the blood glucose levels. That will be helping for you during the fasting. Okay. So damn. Now, look here. Please concentrate here. This beta cells. Beta cells, what they are producing? They are producing insulin. So not only insulin, what they are producing, amylin also, as well as C-peptide. This C-peptide is repeatedly asked MCQ. Okay, see, now imagine this is a beta cell. This is a beta cell of the pancreas. 
Now this beta cell of the pancreas, it is producing what? It is producing insulin. Now, not only insulin, the same beta cell of the pancreas, it also produces a molecule called a C peptide. C peptide. If 100 molecules of insulin are produced, it means 100 molecules of C peptide is produced. If 1000 molecules of insulin is produced, it means 1000 molecules of C peptide is produced. See, this is C peptide. It is, it comes out in the urine. It comes out in the urine. So now, imagine there is this urinary sample. I am examining the, I am doing the urine analysis. Okay, I am doing the urine analysis. Now, if there are 1000 molecules of C peptide in the urine, I can estimate by looking at the urinary C peptide levels, I can estimate how much insulin is produced in the body, how much endogenous insulin is produced in the body. Right? So that's why this is the MCQ. A C peptide, a C peptide, it is produced in equivalent concentration along with insulin. Along with insulin, C peptide is produced in equal in equal concentration. So it is considered as endogenous marker of insulin. It's considered as an endogenous marker of the insulin. That's it. MCQ completed. Okay. Now insulin, uh, some important points. Insulin is a peptide hormone. Okay. But now imagine this is a beta cell. This is a beta cell. Now this beta cell, it contains the vesicles. Now inside this vesicles, inside this vesicles, who is there? Insulin molecule. So insulin. Insulin. Here is the insulin. Now MCQ, which I want you to know is, the insulin is stored along with which ions? Sir, insulin molecules are stored along with zinc ions. Why? Why? Because this is zinc. This is zinc stabilizes the structure of insulin. Okay, zinc stabilizes the structure of insulin. That's why insulin is stored along with zinc ions. For your FMG, this question is important. Deficiency of the zinc will cause a disease. This was FMG MCQ. Deficiency of zinc will cause a disease called as anyone. Anyone, can you tell me? Deficiency of zinc will cause which disease, sir? Come on, Gagan, Naimat, Talib. Med content, can you tell me? Deficiency of zinc is going to cause a disease called as it starts with the letter A. Acro dermatitis. Acro dermatitis. Entro pathica. Okay, so acrodermatitis centropathica is a disease due to deficiency of zinc. Like you should answer man, like you know it's very important for FMG. Okay, so insulin is stored along with zinc ions and generally I am speaking, generally from the nutrition point of view, zinc deficiency will cause a disease called as acrodermatitis centropathica. Okay, now next, see in this uh, image, I am showing you this is a beta cell. Okay, this is a beta cell. Now this beta cell, it is releasing the insulin at the end of the day. See, these are the secretory granules. These are the secretory vesicles which contains the insulin. Okay, here insulin is there. Question which I want you to know is, why insulin is getting released? How insulin is getting released? Okay, to release insulin, to release insulin, what you should do? What one must do? I'm not going in detail, okay? Simple, on this cell, see, on this beta cell, on this beta cell, look at this channel, look at this channel, this green color channel. Do you know what is the name of this channel? This is called as ATP sensitive potassium channel. Okay, ATP sensitive potassium channel. Now what this ATP sensitive potassium channel is doing all the time, 24 by 7, it is causing potassium efflux, potassium efflux, potassium is going out of the cell. Okay, potassium is going out of the cell. Okay, so positive charges are going out of the cell. So cell is resting, cell is inactive. But let me tell you what happens. You eat biryani. Okay, you have taken the biryani or the like you know heavy meal, you have taken a heavy meal. The food is going to be digested. Now, when the food is digested, what happens? The blood glucose levels rises. Now blood glucose level is raising, sir. Now is it good to have high levels of glucose in the blood? No. So whenever the blood glucose level is raised, which hormone do we need? Insulin. We need the insulin. Whenever the blood glucose levels are more, we need the insulin. So see, whenever the blood glucose levels are more, see this glucose. This is glucose. Now, first it will enter where? First it will enter into the beta cells. Now, this glucose, it is entering into the beta cells. See? Okay? Glucose is entering into the beta cells. Now, do you know what is glucose will do? Glucose, it will participate in the glu glycolysis, electron transport chain, Krebs cycle. Completed. First glycolysis, a Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. At the end of the day, ATP is produced. So, you ate food. Glucose is released. Glucose is more there in the blood. Okay, glucose is more there in the blood. This glucose enters into the pancreatic beta cells. This glucose 
at the end of the day produces the atp now glucose produces the atp now do you know what this atp will do atp will go and close this channel so that's why this channel is called as atp sensitive potassium channel so this potassium channels are blocked because of atp under the influence of the atp so that's why these are called as atp sensitive potassium channels now tell me what happens sir potassium is getting accumulated inside the cell the positive charges are being accumulated inside the cell now this positive charges activating the cell depolarizing the cell membrane okay so now whenever the cell is being activated now see because of this a depolarization now first calcium will come into the cell remember mcq general physiology mcq so first because of the depolarization first calcium comes into the cell via this channel via the voltage gated calcium channel calcium will come into the cell this calcium it helps in vesicular transport calcium helps in what calcium helps in the vesicular transport so this vesicles which contains the insulin is released into the blood this is how insulin is released okay so now tell me mcqs atp sensitive potassium channels are present on beta cells on the pancreas okay so depolarization this one activation of this beta cell depolarization of this beta cell of the pancreas is dependent on which ions it is dependent on potassium okay it's dependent on the potassium ions now glucose enters see glucose enters into this beta cell glucose enters into this beta cell via which channels via glucose transporter type 2 many times this question has been asked after the food after the taking of the food the, there is a glucose spike in the blood this glucose will enter into the beta cells of the pancreas by using which channels glut 2 or glucose transporter type 2 so glucose transporter type 2 is present on the beta cells of the pancreas through shape this glucose helps in the production of ATP. ATP goes and closes the ATP sensitive potassium channels, leading to the depolarization, leading to the calcium influx. Calcium helps in exocytosis or vesicular transport of the insulin. Insulin is released. Okay, insulin is released. Now you can ask me, sir, what this insulin will do? Me mechanism of action of the insulin. Only one important MCQ. See, this insulin, this is the insulin molecule. Okay, this is the insulin molecule. Do you know where insulin will act? Sir, insulin, it is acting on which tissues? Skeletal muscles as well as adipocytes. This is the MCQs, very, very important MCQs. Insulin acts on skeletal muscles and adipocytes, very, very important MCQs. Insulin is not acting on the RBC, insulin is not acting on the blood cells, insulin is not acting on the, like, you know, the central nervous system, no. Insulin is acting on which cells? Skeletal muscles, adipocytes. Do you know what this insulin will do? Sir, insulin molecules at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I am not going in detail. Because of this insulin, see now you are having these transporters. Previously they are not there. Previously these transporters are not there. Now insulin helps in production of these transporters through which the glucose will be absorbed into the adipocytes. Previously the adipocytes and skeletal muscles, previously they are not uptaking any glucose molecules. For example, imagine, uh, this is my skeletal muscle. Now, whenever the insulin is acting on my skeletal muscles, now this is skeletal muscles. They will produce which transporters? The glucose transporters type 4. With the help of these glucose transporters, now from the blood, now from the blood, the glucose will be absorbed into the skeletal muscle. So, what happened to the blood levels of glucose? Comes down. That's it. Okay. So, tell me, the glucose transporters type 4 are present on skeletal muscles and adipocytes. And who helps the production of glucose transporters type 4? Insulin. Insulin. Completed. Okay. Now, after this, what else I should teach you? Other actions of insulin, especially this is a, a integration. This is an integration with the biochemistry. Very, very important. Insulin topic is very important. All right, guys, please tell me. What is the function of insulin? Tell me. Sir, at the end of the day, insulin have to decrease the blood glucose levels. Decrease the blood glucose levels. So, do you know what this insulin will do? Sir, insulin will activate those biochemical reactions. See, these are the biochemical reactions. They will decrease the blood glucose levels. See, if these biochemical reactions, if they happen, if these biochemical reactions like uh, glycogenesis, lipogenesis, glycolysis, what they will do? All these reactions, they will decrease the blood glucose levels. Okay? So, what insulin is doing is, insulin is stimulating these biochemical reactions. So, they will ask you, which of the following is the function of insulin except kind of questions. All of the following are the functions of insulin except kind of questions. Okay. 
So insulin stimulates glycogenesis. Glycogenesis, lipogenesis, glycolysis, they're all activated. Why? Because, because of this, the insulin level, uh, sorry, glucose level decreases. In the same way, insulin, they will inhibit these biochemical reactions. See, these biochemical reactions, they are associated with increasing the blood glucose levels. See, for example, glycogenolysis, the glycogen broken down. When the glycogen is broken down, glucose molecules are released from the liver. Blood glucose levels are increased. That's not needed now whenever the insulin is there. So what insulin is doing? Insulin inhibits glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, means glucose neogenesis, glucose neosynthesis, right? And lipolysis and ketogenesis. So these things are inhibited. So the reactions which are inhibited by insulin, the reactions which are stimulated by insulin, very important for your exam. Done, sir. Any other functions of the insulin which you should know for your exam? Yes. Insulin and relation with the potassium ions. When I inject insulin into my body, for example, when I take an insulin shot, do you know what insulin will do? Yes, it causes the movement of glucose from the blood into the tissues. But not only that, sir, this insulin, it moves the potassium ions. This is the first action. This is the first action of the insulin, actually. The potassium ions, all the potassium which is present in the extracellular space, it will go into the cell. Potassium moves into the cell. So insulin moves potassium ions into the cells yes so because of this action actually insulin can be used in the treatment of hyperkalemia so if i am having hyperkalemia more potassium just give insulin all potassium will go in packed inside the cell the so insulin moves the potassium into the cells done okay completed guys so these are the points which i want you to know and uh, many students like you know don't know this actually they will know only this thing. Insulin decreases the blood glucose levels. Yes, insulin decreases the blood glucose levels and glucagon increases the blood glucose levels. But remember, not only glucagon increases the blood glucose levels, I said you, thyroid hormones, blue, uh, like general classes also, many YouTube sessions I have taught you this. Gluco, glucagon, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, cortisol, catecholamines, all these are hyperglycemic hormones. All these are the hyperglycemic hormones. All of them, they will increase the blood glucose levels. But who will decrease the blood glucose levels? Insulin. Insulin decreases the blood glucose levels. But all other hormones increase the blood glucose levels. Okay. Now, this is also completed. Now, after this, what I should teach you? Uh, now, the MCQs which I want you to know is the last FMG exam. Like just last. But the six months back, whatever the FMG exam happened, this was the question asked. Whenever there is no insulin in your body, see, here I have taught you something. Look at this. Are insulin, what it is doing to the ketogenesis, it will prevent. See, insulin prevents the ketogenesis. So till that time, I am a healthy individual. Okay. Now till that time, I am having insulin in my body, the ketogenesis does not occur. Okay. Ketogen ketone body formation is not happening. Ketone body is there are energy rich substances. Just like glucose, there are also energy rich substances, but they are having their own, like, you know, negatives. They are the acids. They will cause acidosis. But remember, till the time insulin is there in my body, no problem. Ketone bodies are not produced. But see, whenever you are suffering with insulin deficiency, you know about the diabetes, right? Now diabetes, type 1 diabetes mellitus, insulin is not there. If you type 1 diabetes mellitus, the beta cells, the beta cells in the pancreas, they are gone. They are damaged, autoimmune damage to beta cells. Autoimmune damage, beta cells gone. Sir. So there is no insulin. Now see here, whenever there is no insulin, what will happen? What happened to the blood glucose levels? Blood glucose levels are so much, so much elevated. Okay. So whenever there is no insulin, see, what happened to the glycogenolysis? Glycogenolysis is activated. Because I have taught you, normally insulin will inhibit the glycogenolysis, glyconeogenesis. It's inhibiting. But whenever insulin is not there, Glycogenolysis is activated. Gluconeogenesis is activated. Okay. So look here. So whenever there is no insulin, insulin deficiency, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis. So because of that, what happened to the blood glucose levels? Blood glucose levels are super, super high now. So much, so much blood glucose levels are there. Now tell me. Whenever there is more glucose in your blood, more glucose is filtered in your kidneys or not? Yes, more glucose is filtered in the kidneys. All this glucose cannot be reabsorbed. So all this extra glucose will come out in the urine. Wherever glucose goes, water follows. So now if I imagine I'm a diabetic, I'm a diabetic. Okay, there is no 
crammed like no insulin is there so my blood glucose levels are super high glucose is getting filtered in my kidneys now i cannot reabsorb all this extra super high glucose so glucose is going out in the urine wherever glucose goes water follows so more glucose excretion more water excretion that's causing diuresis so the patient now is having osmotic diuresis okay i'm talking about a condition called as a diabetic ketoacidosis why what is happening i will tell you don't worry diabetic ketoacidosis there is severe deficiency of insulin whenever there is severe deficiency of insulin the blood levels of glucose increases glucose excretes out of the body water also excretes out of the body wherever glucose goes water follows there is osmotic diuresis leading to excessive urination in diabetic ketoacidosis the patient is having excessive urination the patient is having dehydration because of excessive urination the patient is having excessive thirst more and more thirst polydipsia and polyuria polydipsia polyuria polydipsia okay so these are the problems with diabetic ketoacidosis excessive see neat pg exam fmg exam last neat pg last fmg exam in last neat pg exam two mcqs were there on diabetic ketoacidosis last fmg exam one mcq was there okay so imagine i am the, uh, the person who is suffering with the diabetic ketoacidosis i am going to suffer with dehydration polyuria polydipsia okay not only that i have said you whenever insulin is not there insulin is not there lipolysis will happen and ketogenesis ketone bodies are produced okay so lipids are getting broken down from the lipids from the lipids by using this fatty acids by using this fatty acids ketone bodies are getting produced so no insulin ketogenesis ketone body formation is happening in the body okay so now mcq is sir these ketone bodies are actually good only but they are having their own negatives the problem with this ketone bodies like acetone beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate the problem with this ketone bodies is these are acids so they are causing acidosis in the body okay that's why diabetic ketoacidosis the patient is a diabetic no insulin whenever there is no insulin ketogenesis is happening the ketone bodies are acids that's why diabetic ketoacidosis okay so now let's concentrate on the mcqs mcqs so this ketone bodies are the acids they are the metabolic acids so that is causing acidosis metabolic acidosis now in your respiratory physiology you would have studied whenever you suffer with acidosis okay whenever you are suffering with acidosis what kind of breathing you are going to have imagine if i am the person who is having diabetic ketoacidosis acidosis will influence the respiration the patient is going to have hyperventilation something like that so that there's this type of breathing pattern okay the hyperventilation hyper ventilation is called as kusumal's breathing so simple kusumal's breathing is seen in diabetic ketoacidosis what is kusumal's breathing hyper ventilation deep inspiration deep expiration okay it's because of the acidosis that you will study in your respiratory physiology and so this acetone it's also a keto acid it's also a ketone body it will cause sweet breath smell okay if you stand near to a patient who is suffering with the dk diabetic ketoacidosis you will feel the sweet smell because of acetone is there in his blood acetone is coming out of his lungs so you are you are going to have a sweet smell from his body and he is suffering with uh, uh, diabetic sorry he is suffering with metabolic acidosis leading to hyperventilation called as a kusumal's breathing okay and not only that so these patients because of this acidosis i am not going in detail but because of this acidosis and because of this like you know excessive urination see the patient is losing some important ions especially the potassium especially the potassium so that's why in diabetic ketoacidosis mcq the patient is going to have potassium disturbances this is because of excessive urination the patient is losing some potassium and because of this acidosis also i'm not going to detail why potassium abnormality is happening but remember in diabetic ketoacidosis potassium disturbances are seen okay here yeah, the explanation is there but i'm not going i don't want to go it will take a lot of time so now tell me diabetic ketoacidosis patient he is not having insulin whenever he is not having insulin too much hyperglycemia 500 normal your blood glucose and my blood glucose will be somewhere around 90 100 mg per dl 90 100 or 120 maximum but this patient is going to have 500 mg per dl so much hyperglycemia so much glucose filtered so much urination dehydration polyuria and polydipsia potassium disturbances kusumal breathing is seen sweet breath is seen metabolic acidosis 
okay all these are diabetic ketoacidosis simple tell me all these problems why why is there all these problems all these problems begin because of insulin deficiency okay all these problems because of the insulin deficiency so what is the treatment the treatment for diabetic ketoacidosis is simple insulin injection insulin injection simply give insulin injection the patient is now all right the patient is absolutely all right sir. so what is the drug of choice for diabetic ketoacidosis it is insulin therapy along with the hydration with iv fluids okay iv fluids but because the dehydration is there no so you are giving the iv fluids um, and rehydrating the patient and giving the insulin and the question which was asked in the fmg exam is what is the cause of death okay what is the most common cause of death in a patient who is suffering with a diabetic ketoacidosis i'm not going in detail like that you will study in your uh, uh, medicine and the reasons are also not that much clear it is cerebral edema okay cerebral edema okay cerebral edema is the most common cause of death in dki patients like you know that's a complication of the acidosis that's a totally different thing so the cause of death in diabetic ketoacidosis is cerebral edema Now, treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis is insulin therapy and iv fluids okay in diabetic ketoacidosis what type of breathing pattern is seen hyperventilation or kusumal's breathing that's all okay so is it clear watching from almaty okay i'm good i'm good yes i'm good so after this what i should teach you what else i should teach you now let me talk you about uh, growth hormone completed thyroid hormones important, important points completed insulin important points completed now let me talk about the adrenal hormones adrenal hormones next 5 10 minutes adrenal hormones now adrenal gland is you know it's divided into adrenal cortex this is the adrenal cortex and the central most region is called as the adrenal medulla adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla right now so this adrenal cortex okay this adrenal cortex it is divided into further how many zones zona glomerulosa zona fasciculata zona reticularis you know adrenal cortex this adrenal cortex it is further divided from outside to inside outside to inside it is divided into g f r zona glomerulosa zona fasciculata and zona reticularis okay so zona glomerulosa it produces mineralocorticoids example is aldosterone zona fasciculata it produces a glucocorticoids example is cortisol glucocorticoid example is cortisol and zona reticularis it produces sex corticoids especially male sex corticoids example is dhgas dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate okay so now tell me how many how many parts are there in the adrenal gland there are two parts in the adrenal gland adrenal cortex adrenal medulla adrenal cortex is having gfr zona glomerulosa zona fasciculata zona reticularis zona glomerulosa look here zona glomerulosa is producing aldosterone zona fasciculata is producing cortisol and zona reticularis is producing dhgas dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate and adrenal medulla look here sir so this adrenal medulla the cells which are present okay, which i am showing you the cells which are present is the cell names the cell names are called as promaffin cells mcq the cells are called as the promaffin cells this promaffin cells which are present in the adrenal medulla they are producing what they are producing the catecholamines adrenaline and noradrenaline okay so adrenaline and noradrenaline which are nothing but the epinephrine norepinephrine so adrenaline noradrenaline they are produced they are the catecholamines these are called as the catecholamines because they have the catechol ring so these catecholamines are produced by the uh, promaffin cells which are present in the adrenal medulla okay now mcq mcq is which you need to know in your uh, especially for your exam point of view is aldosterone sir aldosterone where it is acting sir what is the function of aldosterone simple aldosterone is acting on nephrons it is acting on the collecting tubules it is acting on which cells it is acting on principal cell it is acting on principal cells now simple one word sir if aldosterone see if aldosterone if it is acting on the principal cell what is happening sir if aldosterone is acting on the principal cell small like in a small change the sodium okay, small type of mistake sodium is going to be reabsorbed from the urine sodium is reabsorbed potassium is secreted potassium is secreted and excreted okay so what are the functions of the aldosterone simple aldosterone acting on the nephron which part collecting tubule which is cell cell name called as a principal cell when aldosterone is acting on the principal cell sodium is reabsorbed 
potassium is secreted potassium is secreted sir but the same aldosterone see it is also acting on a cell called as intercalated cell when aldosterone is acting on the intercalated cell what is happening the intercalated cells are excreting hydrogen ions or protons protons are getting excreted so now you can say one thing aldosterone mineralocorticoid what are the functions sodium reabsorption in principal cells potassium excretion in principal cells and proton excretion in intercalated cells intercalated cells are ic cells so these are the functions of aldosterone this is the mcq what they will ask you all of the following are the functions of the aldosterone except so you should know these are the functions aldosterone acting on nephrons acting on collecting tubules sodium reabsorption potassium excretion proton excretion that's it. now look here see this is adrenal gland okay this is the medulla now there is a tumor which is present over here imagine there is a tumor okay there is a tumor this is called as what adrenal adenoma ad renal adenoma sir what is this this is adrenal adenoma so it's not a cancer just a tumor now do you know what this adrenal adenoma is producing it is producing excessive amount of aldosterone okay adrenal adenoma producing excessive amount of the aldosterone sir okay now what is the name of the syndrome called as sir adrenal adenoma producing excessive amount of aldosterone this syndrome name is called as con syndrome okay this syndrome name is called as a con syndrome now what they will ask you clinical features of con syndrome so can you tell me what are the clinical features of con syndrome simple aldosterone functions you know just exaggerate them normal aldosterone helps in reabsorption of sodium now in con syndrome see in con syndrome too much amount of aldosterone is there what will happen too much amount of sodium reabsorption see now the sodium na plus not this n plus na plus so increase sodium reabsorption whenever more and more sodium is being reabsorbed the more salt in your body causing hypertension your your mother knows if you take more salt it will cause hypertension more salt reabsorption hypertension sir con syndrome more aldosterone more aldosterone means more potassium excretion out of the body causing hypokalemia the blood levels of potassium goes down the body levels of potassium goes down sir con syndrome excessive aldosterone more and more protons will go out of the body more and more protons if they are going out of the body that will cause alkalosis okay not acidosis protons the acids are going out of the body so there is alkalosis so and the examiner definitely i will ask you this in con syndrome adrenal adenoma what are the clinical features the patient is going to suffer with hypertension hypernatremia more sodium is there in the blood hypernatremia hypokalemia with alkalosis hypokalemia with alkalosis so these are the clinical features okay then sir so these are the points which i want you to know so what is the treatment treatment for the con syndrome is aldosterone antagonist you can use the drugs like aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone it's opposite to aldosterone it's antagonizes the aldosterone but the side effect of the spironolactone is a gynecomastia okay gynecomastia is development of the breast tissue in the males okay gynecomastia and never ever forget this gynecomastia topic is also very very important okay why because from pharmacology point of view they will ask you which drugs will cause gynecomastia okay there are drugs called as a disco drugs digitalis isonia acid as for spironolactone um uh, yes c for cimetidine and o for estrogens disco drugs there are drugs called as a disco drugs which will cause which will cause gynecomastia okay spironolactone also causes gynecomastia development of the breast tissue in the male completed sir now after this aldosterone completed mineralocorticoid completed now cortisol what is cortisol cortisol is what kind of drug sir cortisol it is glucocorticoid glucocorticoid you know about the cortisol right excessive amount of cortisol will cause which syndrome so can you tell me what is the syndrome this patient is suffering with which syndrome sir is looking like a you know, lemon he is looking like a lemon which is standing on the sticks lemon on stick appearance the syndrome can you tell me what is this appearance sir so lemon on stick appearance is seen in pushing syndrome this is the pushing syndrome okay watching from nigeria right appreciated now sir actions of the cortisol okay see actions of the cortisol first of all 
let me tell you important things which you need to know for your exams i don't go, i don't want to go through the entire things at least important functions of the cortisol are say cortisol is a catabolic hormone the major catabolic hormone catabolic hormone okay cortisol is a major catabolic hormone and cortisol do you know what it will do it increases the blood glucose simple remember it's a catabolic hormone and it's also a stress hormone it's a stress hormone it's a stress hormone catabolic hormone okay it increases the blood glucose levels watching from nepal great right so uh, carbohydrate metabolism yes it increases the blood glucose levels it's a catabolic hormone right so cortisol breaks down the glycogen increases the blood glucose levels so cortisol is a catabolic hormone causes proteolysis proteolysis now older proteins whatever are there in the blood okay older proteins whatever are there in the uh, not blood whatever are there in the uh, body they will be lysed okay they will be lysed what about the fats they it causes lipolysis causes the lipolysis what about the immune system what cortisol will do to the immune system immuno activation or immuno suppression immuno suppression immuno suppression this is the mcq cortisol what it will do to the blood cells cortisol it decreases all the wbc except neutrophils neutrophils are elevated okay neutrophil count is elevated this is the mcq neutrophilia cortisol which was a neutrophilia cortisol also increases the rbc cortisol also increases the platelets but all that other wbc will go down okay so neutro neutrophils levels will be increased and monocytes are also increased but that's not the mcq important point is the neutrophils neutrophils are elevated neutrophilia is seen because of cortisol okay done and in heart cortisol increases the heart rate cortisol causes vasoconstriction means increases the bp cortisol normally increases the bp and bone cortisol causes bone resorption so why i am telling you the normal functions first is you should think you should be able to think what are the abnormalities on the other half you should be able to tell me the abnormalities sir on the connective tissue the, the connective tissues are there no which are having lot of collagen do you know what this cortisol will do breaks down collagen in the connective tissue in the gi tract increases the acid production in the reproductive system inhibits the gonadotropin releasing hormones okay that gonadotropin releasing hormones like fsh and lh levels are decreased because of this cortisol cortisol inhibits these things in the skin cortisol usually okay for example for understanding purpose let me tell you like this cortisol will causes the pigmentation pigmentation now sir here i have taught you the normal normal things now can you tell me what happens in cortisol excess if you are having excessive amount of cortisol in your blood too much cortisol in your blood that condition is called as cushing syndrome can you tell me what happens in cushing syndrome too much cortisol will cause hyper too much hyperglycemia leading to diabetes mellitus diabetes mellitus okay sir so in diabetes mellitus what happened to the blood glucose levels the blood glucose levels are elevated okay whenever you are having too much amount of glucose which hormone levels are elevated insulin okay insulin but continuously this insulin levels are elevated do you know what this insulin will do this insulin will cause adipocyte hypertrophy okay adipocyte hypertrophy this insulin will stimulate the adipocyte hypertrophy because of this adipocyte hypertrophy the patient will have see this kind of like you know because of the adipocyte hypertrophy the patient will have centripetal obesity the obesity is going to be there especially in the central axis in skeleton of the body then now if you see the patient is having moon faces adipocyte hypertrophy moon faces and like you know he is also going to have this buffalo hump adipocyte hypertrophy okay so here in asia you can look uh, like you know the patient is having obesity okay this is it so now tell me sir in cushing syndrome the patient is going to suffer with yes diabetes mellitus true he is going to have hyper high levels of glucose high levels of glucose will increase the levels of this insulin hormone this insulin will cause too much insulin continuously will cause adipocyte hypertrophy so the patient is going to have centri 
fetal obesity okay the patient is going to have a centripetal obesity that's it the proteolysis cortisol too much cortisol will cause too much proteolysis so what happened to the muscles broken down yeah so that's the reason why if you look at the patient see if you look at this patient muscles they're totally atrophied the muscles are atrophied especially in the muscles in the extremities they're gone so he will say sir my muscles are weak so there is myopathy he will say the word so these proximal muscles whenever i'm sitting they are very much painful sir so proximal myopathy is going to be seen that's the mcq proximal myopathy is going to be there okay and next what else you need to know regarding the cushing syndrome mainly i have told you about the centripetal obesity proximal myopathy just remember that one point and uh, what else see because of this uh, too much amount of cortisol the platelet count rbc count are too much elevated in the blood okay in the rbcs and the platelets are too much elevated in the cushing syndrome patients so there is hyper viscosity hyper viscosity of the blood whenever blood is hyper viscous cause hypercoagulation that increases the risk of deep venous thrombosis mcq so pushing patients are at a risk of deep venous thrombosis because of the hypercoagulable nature of the blood from where this hypercoagulable nature is coming because of the increase rbcs and increase platelets okay this is the point which i want you to know next uh cushing syndrome patients they are going to suffer with the hypertension because of like you know cortisol normally causes the vasoconstriction and increases the normal it increases the bp maintains the vascular tone maintains the bp cushing syndrome too much cortisol too much vasoconstriction suffering with hypertension um cushing syndrome patients are having excessive bone resorption leading to bone uh, sorry excessive bone resorption leading to osteoporosis okay So the patients are going to have excessive osteoporosis. Now what, Nabil? You are like you no know, typing something. You have any doubt? The patients are going to have the excessive osteoporosis. Next, in the connective tissues, see the collagen is getting broken down. Even your blood vessels are made up of collagen. So now, tell me, in Cushing syndrome, the collagen is getting broken down. So what about the blood vessels? Even for the small trauma, the blood vessels are going to broke down, and there will be internal bleeding. So the patient is going to have. bleeding into the skin okay that's the mcq key point to under to identify see moon faces buffalo hum centripetal obesity those kind of keywords they are stopped giving in your exam so they will say the patient is having proximal myopathy the patient is having bleeding into the skin bleeding into the skin like pitik and purpura okay the patient is going to have pitik i purpura or the skin bleeding skin bleeding is going to be there and because of the loss of collagen even from the skin the skin is now so much stretching causing abdominal stretch you can see here because of the loss of collagen the skin is too much getting stretched because of the uh, centripetal obesity leading to abdominal stretch abdominal okay so leading to abdominal stretch and because of excessive acid production will lead to peptic ulcer disease now because of the excessive cortisol inhibiting the fsh and lh fsh lh they are not there no cortisol inhibits the gonadotropic releasing hormones so the female especially in female the patient will suffer with amenorrhea male also the spermatogenesis will be inhibited the male will also suffer with infertility okay now mcq cortisol what i have taught you cortisol helps in pigmentation but too much cortisol what it will do so too much cortisol it will cause a hyperpigmentation this is the keyword so right here hyper pigmentation so these are the things which are going to be seen in the patient who is suffering with cushing syndrome so regarding cushing syndrome lemon on stick appearance centripetal obesity moon face buffalo hum okay abdominal stray bleeding into the skin hyperpigmentation is going to be there like you know blood levels of glucose will be elevated hyperglycemia is going to be seen okay all these are the important points about the cushing syndrome okay so with this cushing syndrome cortisol also completed okay now uh, one thing uh, this is very important especially from like you know the medicine point of view this question was repeatedly repeatedly tested um, the next adrenal hormone which i am talking is now you are having a tumor here where the tumor is there in the adrenal medulla 
Okay, now the tumor is there where in the adrenal medulla. Sir. So tumor are which cells? Promaffin cells. Now this condition, this tumor name is called as pheo promo cytoma. Someone is asking uh, homeopathic medicine leads to uh, Cushing syndromes. Yeah, maybe possibly. Like usually Cushing syndrome is atrogenic in nature. Okay, Cushing syndrome, the most common cause of Cushing syndrome is atrogenic nature. Like, you know, for example, imagine uh, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I'm 30, 35 years old. Now I'm having body pains, body pains. I'm taking steroids. Steroids are the painkillers. No. So I'm taking steroids, dexamethasone. Are a steroid is acting like a cortisol. Cortisol is also steroid. No. So taking medicines, especially painkillers, especially steroids, they will cause Cushing syndrome. So most common cause of Cushing syndrome is atrogenic, doctor induced. If you if you prescribe a patient or if you inject a patient so much cortisol or so much, sorry, not cortisol, so much steroids, steroids can cause Cushing syndrome. Okay, Why? because cortisol is a steroid, dexamethasone is also a steroid. Okay, but anyway, um, now let's come back to our uh, topic. Now what I am discussing here is pheochromocytoma. There is a tumor where the tumor is in the adrenal medulla. This tumor is called as a pheochromocytoma. What it will produce? Excessive amount of adrenaline as well as noradrenaline. Okay. Now, what is pheochromocytoma? Tumor of adrenal medulla. Yeah. What it is producing? Excessive amount of adrenaline, noradrenaline. What are the clinical features you know? Sir, this adrenaline, noradrenaline, they are sympathetic hormones. As they are sympathetic hormones, yes, they do the sympathetic features. They cause the sympathetic features like hypertension, increased heart rate, headaches, profusion, sweating, profu uh, like a profuse sweating, anxiety, weight loss, elevated blood sugar levels. All these are sympathetic symptoms, right? Tachycardia, high BP, sweating, hyperglycemia, all these things are the sympathetic features. So, pheochromocytoma, the patients are going to have sympathetic features, but that's not MC. How to identify? Yes, you can do MRI, but that kind of questions won't be asked. How to put the like you know initial diagnosis with a, with a simple test with a simple test just urine analysis see now imagine this patient is having imagine there is this one patient who is having pheochromocytoma okay he is having what he is having pheochromocytoma so he is producing what excessive amount of adrenaline or adrenaline do you know what this adrenaline or adrenaline will do normally adrenaline or adrenaline they will go to the liver in the liver they are broken down in you and me yeah in you and me this adrenaline or adrenaline, whatever are coming from the adrenal medulla, they will be broken down in the liver into substances called as metanephrins. Meta nephrins, metanephrins, and vinyl mandelic acid, VMA, VAMA, vinyl mandelic acid and metanephrins. Normally, in your urine and the normal patient's urine, this levels will be normal. But imagine the patient is having pheochromocytoma, he is having too much amount of adrenaline in the body, man. This is too much amount of adrenaline and noradrenaline. Yes, they will also go to the liver where they are getting metabolized. So whenever they are getting metabolized, what happened to the urinary metanephrin levels? They are elevated. And urinary vinyl mandelic acid levels, they are elevated. So that's the MCQ. Okay. So what are the diagnostic tests? So the diagnostic, the diagnostic test for the um, pheochromocytoma, this condition is measuring the metanephrin levels. This is the most sensitive. Most sensitive test more sensitive test also you can do the vinyl mandelic acid level test okay so checking the vinyl mandelic acid levels and metanephrins total metanephrins in the urine are the urine uh, checking uh, metanephrins is the most sensitive test for the pheochromocytoma pheochromocytoma this is the point which i want you to know for your exams okay after this what else i want you to know okay what else i want you to know my favorite topic, this is my favorite topic. Okay, so there is a condition called as congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So, how to understand this congenital adrenal hyperplasia in 5 minutes? Okay, 5 minutes, 5 important MCQs. Simple. Sir, normally, hypothalamus, what it will produce? It produces a hormone called as CRH, corticotropic releasing hormone. Sir, this corticotropic uh, releasing hormone, it will come and act on anterior pituitary. So this anterior pituitary now, it will produce ACTH. Okay, so CRH helps in the production of ACTH. Sir, ACTH where it will come, it will come and act, see, ACTH means adrenocorticotropic hormone. So this ACTH is coming and acting on the adrenal gland. Now see, in the adrenal gland, ACTH is stimulating the adrenal gland. So now the cortisol, whatever is there in the adrenal gland, the cortisol 
sorry, not cortisol. The cholesterol, whatever is there in the adrenal gland, the cholesterol will be converted into pregnenolone, pregnenolone will be converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone. All this is because of CRH. CRH stimulates ACTH, ACTH converts the cholesterol into pregnenolone, pregnenolone will be converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone. See the 17 hydroxy progesterone. Now there are 100 molecules of 17 hydroxy progesterone. Imagine. 17 molecules of 17 hydroxy progesterone they can enter into three pathways either they can be converted into yes aldosterone cortisol androgens yes so 33 molecules they can enter into the pathway of aldosterone 33 molecules will be converted into cortisol 33 molecules will be converted into the androgens like 33 33 33 like you know unequal percentages but point which i want you to know is see for the production of this mineralocorticoid aldosterone for the production of this glucocorticoid cortisol what do you need? You need to have this 21 hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase. So 21 hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase are needed for the production of a mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid, but not six corticoid. Okay. So now tell me, CRH, elephant production of ACDH, ACDH acts on the adrenal gland, converts cholesterol into 17 hydroxy progesterone. The 17 hydroxy progesterone is at the end of the day, it's getting converted into aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens in the adrenal gland in the adrenal gland now whenever you having enough amount of cortisol this is the real hero at the main function of this ACTH the main function of this ACTH is production of cortisol so once you have this cortisol okay see now what is cortisol is doing sir cortisol is giving negative feedback okay cortisol is giving negative feedback are enough amount of cortisol is there no need of further ACTH no need of further ACTH enough 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 is enough okay but now let me tell you, this is something normal, normal physiology. Let me tell you what is the problem. In this congenital adrenal hyperplasia, okay, in this congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I don't understand the dopamine medical school. I'm not very good with the um, Hindi. CVS is already completed. We have started with the CVS only. Have we done with the CVS only? You know, yes. Like, you know, this is not a complete detailed class. These are the revision classes, especially for the exam going batches. Okay, that's why. I'm mainly concentrating on the uh, important topics in a very limited period of time. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm discussing. Now, see this cortisol, it is giving the negative feedback. But let me tell you the problem. So this problem that to happening in a female fetus, female fetus. Okay. Now female is there. She is in the intrauterine period. She is in the intrauterine period. Now do you know what happens? So in this female, these enzymes are not present. These enzymes, 21 hydroxylase, 11 beta hydroxylase, these enzymes are not there. Now in this female fetus, tell me, if these enzymes are not there, now can she produce aldosterone cortisol? No, she cannot produce aldosterone cortisol this female like you know the embryo which is growing uh, in the mother's womb now this fetus cannot produces the cortisol as well as the aldosterone now tell me whenever there is no cortisol do you think negative feedback is there sir negative feedback is not there so now more and more ACTH is there now this ACTH is converting all the cholesterol into 17 hydroxy progesterone now all the 17 hydroxy progesterone now it is entering into which pathway now it is entering into the pathway of androgens. All the 17 hydroxy progesterone is now entering into the pathway of androgens. So now in this female fetus, so much androgens are there. Now do you know what these androgens will do? Now androgens will lead to the formation of male looking genitalia. Because of this androgens, now the labia majora and the labia minora in the female, the labia majora and the labia minora in this female fetus, now they are fused and now they are almost looking like a scrotum. The clitoris, because of this excessive androgens, the clitoris in the female, it is enlarged and it is almost looking like a penis. It's almost looking like a micro penis. So this is the problem in congenital lateral hyperplasia. Now tell me which sex is going to be affected mainly in congenital lateral hyperplasia. See, it can affect both males and females. In males, it's not going to be a big problem eh? because if a male is having excessive androgens, what an issue, he might be having a bigger penis or he might be having like, you know, precautious puberty, not a big problem. But if this congenital adrenal hyperplasia, if it happens in a female fetus, now she will have ambiguous genitalia or male looking genitalia. 
she is a female but looks like a female but looks like a male so this condition will lead to this congenital adrenal hyperplasia it will lead to female pseudo hermaphroditism this is the mcq okay so congenital adrenal hyperplasia yes it's a female but looking like a male falsely looking like a male that's why pseudo hermaphroditism hermaphroditism means opposite sex so female pseudo hermaphroditism can you tell me one reason congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay now why this congenital adrenal hyperplasia this congenital adrenal hyperplasia is because of deficiency of which enzymes because of the deficiency of 21 hydroxylase the most common enzyme deficiency this one the most common enzyme deficiency is 21 hydroxylase deficiency the second most common enzyme deficiency is 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency now tell me how to put the diagnosis sir how to put the diagnosis now with one one word if you want to put the diagnosis with one word the answer is this sir in this fellow female in this female Seventeen hydro. Uh, sorry, in this female congenital adrenal hyperplasia, female. Now, excess excess amount of ACTH is there. True. This ACTH is converting all this cholesterol. Is converting all this cholesterol into seventeen hydroxy progesterone levels. So now, if you look at the seventeen hydroxy progesterone levels in this female, they are elevated. And this seventeen hydroxy progesterone is now getting converted into androgens. So in a question, if you see this word. 17 hydroxy progesterone levels are elevated in which condition congenital adrenal hyperplasia that's it diagnosis is done okay now other mcqs other problems can you tell me what is her main problem in this congenital adrenal hyperplasia do you know what is her main problem the main problem for this female it is not the ambiguous genitalia she doesn't even know she's a baby she doesn't even know what her sex is that's not the main problem the main problem is this female she cannot produce she cannot produce aldosterone she cannot produce cortisol Okay, these things are not there in her body. When these things, th when these, these, when these steroids, these are the steroids, right? The mineralocorticoid and the glucocorticoid, these are the steroids. When these steroids are not there, she will die for sure. Okay, so what you need to do, the treatment as a treatment part, see, MCQ, this is the MCQ. Steroids are the lifelong treatment. What is the treatment for uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia? Lifelong steroids need to be given. You need to replace the aldosterone. Mineralocorticoid replacement, you have to give the fluorocortisone. And the glucocorticoid replacement or the cortisol replacement, you have to give it in the form of hydrocortisone. So, fluorocortisone and hydrocortisone, these are the drug of choice for this female MCQs. Okay, so these are the points which I want you to know. So, with this, this is also completed. So, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the problem with the 21 hydroxylase deficiency also completed. Now, the last topic in the endocrine physiology which I want you to know is this one, sir. The last topic which I want you to know is very, very important, especially from the gynecology point of view also and pharmacology, gynecology as well as pharmacology point of view. It's integrated. Normally, let me ask you, what is the relationship between the estrogens? Okay, what is the relationship between the estrogens? and osteoporosis okay estrogens and osteoporosis let me tell you which is something normal okay see a reproductive age group female reproductive age group female now she is having ovaries right yes sir she is having ovaries now in her ovaries what is there follicles are there so many follicles are there growing follicles are there so these growing follicles what they will produce the follicles the growing follicles the follicular cells are also called as the granulosa cells so the granulosa cells, this granulosa cells are producing the estrogens. Okay, so reproductive age group female, she's having ovaries and in her ovaries, enough amount of follicles are there. This growing follicles will produce the estrogens. Okay, this is one part of the story. Now let's look at this beautiful female with these bones. Okay, this is her bone. Okay. Now in the bone, how many types of cells are there? So the major two types of cells are, one is osteoblast. This is the osteoblast. Okay, and one more type of cell is there that's the osteoclast. Okay, now one, what is this? This is the osteoclast. Sir. Now, what are the osteoblasts? Osteo OB, osteoblasts, they are bone forming cells. They help in bone formation. What are osteoclasts? They help in bone resorption. They help in bone resorption. One is bone formation, other is the bone resorption. Now, let me tell you, actually looking from the outer, outer outside, will look like, you know, Are osteoblast is a good guy, osteoclast is a bad guy, we'll see something like this. Okay. But actually, you know, osteoblast is a real villain. 
osteoblast yes it do bone formation but osteoblast it produces a chemical this red color chemical do you know what is the name of this red color chemical it is called as a rank ligand okay rank rank it's producing a like you know chemical media it's called as a rank ligand on the osteoclast there are these receptors present do you know what is the name of this receptor this is the rank receptor this is the rank receptor now this rank ligand will come and bind with the rank receptor now rank receptors are activated now this is the time where this osteoclast is activated now it will do the bone resorption so now tell me osteoclastic activity osteoclastic activity is under the control of okay osteoclastic activity it is under the control of osteoblast osteoblast will produce rank ligand this rank ligand will produce uh, it will activate the rank receptor and osteoclasts are activated leading to the bone resorption right now let me tell you in a normal healthy female reproductive age group female do you know what happens sir this estrogens they are acting on the bone marrow stromal cells bone marrow stromal cells now the bone marrow stromal cells this bone marrow stroma the, the stroma of the bone marrow they are producing a substance called as osteo protegins sir osteoprotegins are getting produced do you know what this osteoprotegins are going to do sir osteoprotegins are like beautiful female so this rank ligand this guy after looking at this osteoprotegin he is totally inhibited sir this osteoprotegins so do you know what they will do osteoprotegins inhibit the rank ligand so now rank ligand is not available rank ligand is not available for the osteoclast so now do you think osteoclast is activated no sir now osteoclast is not activated okay now look here see osteoclast is not activated now when the osteoclast when it's not activated now do you think it's happy no it's not happy sad now do you think bone our resorption happens bone resorption is not happening bone breakdown is not happening okay so all the healthy females 20 25 30 years 40 years now they are having good ovary, good follicular count, good ovarian reserve is there, good follicles are there. They are producing the estrogens and what these estrogens are doing? Estrogens acting on the bone marrow stromal cells, helping the production of uh, osteoprotegrins. Osteoprotegrins inhibits the rank ligand. When the rank ligand is not available, the osteoclast is inhibited, not activated. But what happened during menopause? Tell me. What happens during menopause? eggs completed in a simple way in a simple terms i am telling you x means the follicles no follicles no follicles when the follicles are not there do you think estrogens are there estrogen production goes down in menopause female is not having estrogens when the estrogens are not there now tell me do you think osteoprotectins will be there osteoprotectins are not there after menopause 55 years no osteoprotectins when osteoprotectins are not there, tell me what happens. When osteoprotectins are not there, now rank ligand, now it can go and bind with the rank receptor. Now it can go and bind with the rank receptor. Now osteoclasts are activated, bone resorption. So that's why in menopause, 55 year old female, why she is saying like, you know, I'm having body pain, joint pains, why I'm having fractures, all this is because she is not having estrogen. So one point I want you to know is estrogen is osteoprotective. After menopause, no estrogen. No osteoprotegrins, osteoclast activation leading to excessive bone resorption, leading to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Now, some MCQs which I want you to know is sir, after menopause, there is more osteoporosis, right? Osteoporosis and fractures. Which fractures are most common? Vertebral compression fractures. The vertebral fractures, especially the lumbar vertebral fractures. Lumbar vertebral compression fractures. Okay, lumbar vertebral compression fractures are most common fractures in menopause. That's an MCQ, which I want you to know. Um, what is the investigation? This is from the radiology, actually. This is repeatedly asked. What is the investigation that you will do for osteoporosis? There is a scan, which is called as a DEXA scan. Dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. DEXA scan. DEXA scan is the scan done for bone mineral density. To estimate, to estimate the bone mineral density, how much the dense bones are, how much like, you know, the bones are good, how good the bones are. For estimating the bone mineral density, the scan which is done is the DEXA scan. Okay, done. And the point, last point which I want you to know is how to do the treatment. If, imagine there is a female, 
now this female is having osteoporosis menopause now she is having osteoporosis what are the drug of choice for osteoporosis mcqs very very important mcqs though i am physiology but i am literally integrating it see you need to kill the osteoclast now okay you need to kill the osteoclast inhibit the osteoclast and the drug of choice is going to be bisphosphonates bisphosphonates drugs like alendronate zolendronate ipantronate Dronate, the drugs which ends with the name alendronate, zolendronate, dipantronate, pamidronate. These are the drugs which are coming out of the family of bisphosphonates. They inhibit the osteoclast. They kill the osteoclast. So that what happens? Bone resorption decreases. If bone resorption decreases, that's good. Osteoporosis is getting like, you know, under control. Getting under control. But the problem of this bisphosphonates is... As a severe complication, it causes osteonecrosis of the jaw. This is the MCQ. Okay, bisphosphonate side effect. This is the side effect. The side effect of bisphosphonates is osteonecrosis of the jaw. The one point which I want you to know. And uh, other things, just I am highlighting. Drug of choice for uh, osteoporosis is bisphosphonates. And other drugs, any other drugs can be used for the treatment of osteoporosis. Yes, reloxifene. It's like estrogen. It's like estrogen. So, reloxifene is called as a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Yes, it is used in the treatment of osteoporosis. True. And drugs, teriparatide. It's like a parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone. It's an analog of parathyroid hormone. Yes, it is used in the treatment of osteoporosis. And a drug called as a denosumab, MCQ. Denosumab, monoclonal. See, it's ending with the word MAB. MAB means monoclonal antibody. It's an antibody. Do you know what this monoclonal antibody will do? It's like osteoprotegrin. It acts like osteoprotegrin. See, it inhibits the rank ligand. Okay. So, donosumab is used in the treatment of osteoporosis. And last but not the least, the super drug, which was tested many times in the exam, is the strontium renolate. Strontium renolate is a one drug, which will, it have, like, you know, two sleeper, like, you know, uh, two hands, I should say. With one hand, it will kill the osteoclast, with the other hand, it stimulates the osteoblast. So, tell me one drug, one drug which will stimulate the bone formation as well as inhibit the bone resorption. It's a strontium renolate. So, now tell me the kind of questions which will be asked in your exam is, which of the following drugs are used in the treatment of osteoporosis? All of the following are used except, which phosphonates are the drug of choice? Serms like reloxifene. Reloxifene is a drug, it's a serm, selective estrogen, it's an estrogen-like drug. So, uh, reloxifene is used in the treatment of osteoporosis, teriparatide, strontium renolate, and which monoclonal antibody is used? Denosumab. Denosumab is a monoclonal antibody used in the treatment of osteoporosis. So, with this, all the important endocrine topics are also done, completed. Okay. So, now, in the next class, okay, I am just trying to complete as much as possible, as many as possible. Hope you like it. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Some Kiran, we are asking something. Uh, does it happen with hysterectomy as well? What is hysterectomy? Like, like, why, why, like you know, hysterectomy is yes, removal of the uterus. Why you are like, you know, trying to uh, take it here? Sir, does it happen with hysterectomy? What will happen with hysterectomy? Oh, osteoporosis. Okay, does osteoporosis happen with hysterectomy? Are I see, hysterectomy is removal of the uterus. Oophorectomy is different. Oophorectomy is removal of the ovaries. During hysterectomy, his uterus is removed, but ovaries are there, no? Removal of the ovaries is called as ophorectomy, yes. If you remove the ovaries, for example, in a 20-year-old girl, if you remove ovaries, from where you can get the estrogen? Estrogens are not there, breast development will not happen, that will lead to osteoporosis, true, true, yes. Ophorectomy will cause, okay? Um, guys, in our last class, in the last session, we have discussed the part one of the rapid revision, part one of the rapid revision for the physiology. Uh, for this uh, June FMG, we are done with that. And in this class, let's do the part two, rapid review of the physiology. Now, in this class, uh, let's begin with that topic which I have missed from the endocrine physiology. Okay, in the last uh, session, we stopped with the endocrine, right? And in that endocrine, I just forgot to add this one important area. This area is very, very important. I have taken it from... Uh, step one book but anyway see this is a very very important mcq question what they will ask you is so these hormones the hormones like fsh lh gonadotropes fsh lh acdh adrenocorticotropic hormone tsh uh, corticotropic releasing hormone hcg that's a human chorionic gonadotropin adh all these hormones whichever i am highlighting here okay there is a mnemonic also 
Um, so these hormones, whatever I have shown here, they will use which secondary messenger? It's a CAMP. Cyclic AMP is the secondary messenger used by which hormones? At least you need to know FSH, LH, ACTH and beta HCG and ADH. ADH if it is acting on V2 receptors. Okay. ADH is the antidiuretic hormone. It have two receptors. V1 receptors, V2 receptors. ADH if it acts on V2 receptors, then which secondary messengers are going to be produced inside the cell? Then it is a CAMP. This is a very important MCQ. And not only that, then which hormone uses the CGMP as a secondary messenger? The CAGMP is used by mainly natriuretic peptides like brain natriuretic peptide, atrial natriuretic peptide as well as the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide which is also called as endothelial derived relaxing factor. So, the super important MCQ which I want you to know is the nitric oxide uses which secondary messenger for its mechanism of action? Then the answer is cyclic GMP. Okay. Now, if someone asks you antidiuretic hormone ADH, okay, antidiuretic hormone, if it is acting on the V2 receptors, then what is the secondary messenger system which is used? It's a cyclic AMP. Okay. And in the same way, IP3 DAG. IP3 means inositol triphosphate. This IP3 DAG system or simply IP3 is a secondary messenger. IP3 inositol triphosphate is used as a secondary messenger. By which hormones? See, these hormones, very important, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. See, gonadotropin releasing hormone uses IP3. But gonadotropins like FSH and LH. See, this is FSH and this is LH. FSH, LH uses CAMP. But gonadotropin releasing hormone uses IP3 DAG system. And I used to remember like all those hormones which are involved in the process of contraction of the muscles, contraction of the muscles, vasoconstriction, See, wherever there is some contraction involved, there IP3 DAG is the secondary messenger. IP3 is the secondary messenger. Okay. Now, for example, look here, oxytocin, uterine contraction, antidiuretic hormone acting on V1 receptor. What is antidiuretic hormone? Vasopressin. Means smooth muscle contraction around the blood vessels leading to vasoconstriction. Okay, so that's why vasopressin. ADH is also called as vasopressin. If, look here, if this antidiuretic hormone, if it's acting on V1 receptors, now you can get it out where these V1 receptors are present, sir. Now these V1 receptors are present on the blood vessels. See, these blood vessels, they are surrounded by smooth muscles, right? The blood vessels are surrounded by smooth muscles. Now on the smooth muscles, V1 receptors are present. Now, if you stimulate these V1 receptors, now, now inside the smooth muscle cells, the secondary messenger which is being produced is going to be IP3. Okay, that's what, that's the point which I want to put into your mind. So, GnRH, oxytocin, uterine contractant, con like so some contraction is involved. And antidiuretic hormone, if it acts on the smooth muscles, again vasoconstriction, contraction thing is getting involved. And TRH, this TRH is thyrotropin releasing hormone, histamine, histamine is a bronchoconstrictor. And angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is also a vasoconstrictor. And gastrin. Gastrin also causes the GA motility, right? Okay, gastric emptying. It promotes the gastric emptying. It increases the GA motility. So, what I'm trying to put into your mind is, sir, gastrin, antidiuretic hormone on V1 receptors, oxytocin, angiotensin 2, all these hormones uses IP3 as a secondary messenger system. And apart from that, what else is important? See, these hormones like progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, what are they? They are the sex hormones, right? So, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, wherever you see the sex hormones, the sex hormones are the steroid hormones. If it is a steroid hormone, remember, remember my point. Steroid hormones cross mm -hmm. the cell membrane. Okay? Steroid hormones crosses cell membranes. Okay, steroid hormones crosses the cell membranes. Which means the testosterone, estrogen or progesterone, these all these hormones, they will cross the bilipid layer and their receptors are present within the cell, not on the cell surface. The receptors are not present on the cell surface. Rather than these hormones, they will cross the bilipid layer and the receptors, okay, the receptors are present in, within the cell membrane. Uh, not, not within the cell membrane, within the cytoplasm. Okay, that's what I mean by. Okay, so progesterone, estrogen and testosterone, they are having intracellular receptors. Intracellular receptors not on the cell membrane. And yeah, even cortisol have the intracellular receptors. And this aldosterone, T3, T4 and vitamin D. So all these hormones are having intracellular receptor. The receptor can be in the cytoplasm or the receptor can be in the nucleus also. Intracellular means 
the receptor may be present within the cytoplasm or the receptor may be present in nucleus now one important super important mcq which you need to know for your exams very very important is sir they will ask you see this t3 t4 thyroid hormones the thyroid hormones do you know they have intranuclear receptors thyroid hormone have intranuclear receptors intracellular only but intracellular where within the nucleus so this thyroid hormones they have intranuclear receptors also for vitamin d also for vitamin d also intranuclear receptors are also there okay it and a also have the intranuclear receptors so what i'm trying to put into your mind is most important point thyroid hormones have intranuclear receptors okay and vitamin d also have the intranuclear receptors no doubt in that so some important points which i want you to know done so after this let's begin with the renal system now i will be going a little fast okay why because these are not the detailed videos these are the rapid revision videos and our target should be we should not miss any important topic okay so where the kidneys are present kidneys are present from t12 to l3 vertebra that's mcq from the anatomy point of view kidneys are present between t12 to l3 vertebra not that much important but you can remember that and where from where the renal arteries are arising mcq this is the mcq okay see so this is the abdominal aorta right this is the abdominal aorta now from the abdominal aorta see this renal artery is coming out okay this renal artery where does this renal artery go renal artery will go to the kidneys okay renal artery will go to the kidneys from which level this renal artery is arising l1 level okay so renal artery is arising from l1 level mcq and renal artery is a direct branch of abdominal aorta mcq okay so right here renal artery is a branch of abdominal aorta okay is a branch of abdominal aorta now not only that one more important point which i want you to know is especially for your exam purpose um, not only that renal artery there are these one more arteries which are coming down from the renal artery these arteries are called as the gonadal arteries gonadal arteries see these gonadal arteries they are the uh, these gonadal arteries like testicular artery or ovarian artery so the blood vessels which are going to the testis and the blood vessel which are going to the ovaries in the female now they are also the direct branches of abdominal aorta okay remember this point so gonadal arteries are also direct branches of abdominal aorta okay then after this what else you should know your nephrons okay the, the nephrons are the functional units of the kidneys right the nephrons are going to produce certain important substances what are they the erythropoietin is going to be produced by who produces erythropoietin erythropoietin it is produced by peritubular capillaries okay so your nephrons are surrounded by the blood vessels okay your nephron if this is a nephron it is surrounded by the blood vessel and that blood vessel is called as a peritubular capillary so this is a peritubular capillaries are they can change the word interstitial cells of interstitial cells of peritubular capillaries interstitial cells of peritubular capillaries they will produce hormone called as erythropoietin erythropoietin then next then who produces the renin the renin is produced by the juxta glomerular cells and what is the function of renin every student knows that the function of renin is to increase the blood pressure renin increases the blood pressure okay next in your nephrons vitamin d will be activated the vitamin d activation the final step the final step in the activation of vitamin d also happens in the proximal convoluted tubule pct means not peritubular capillary okay it's a pct means this is proximal proximal convoluted tubule okay proximal convoluted tubule so what are the important point activation of vitamin d happens in the pct okay renin is produced by the juxta glomerular cells jg cells and not only that uh, the erythropoietin is produced by the interstitial cells of the peritubular capillaries okay then after this what else you should know so here i am showing you in a simple way the process of activation of the vitamin d uh, see like you know there are many steps in the activation of vitamin d but i don't want to go in that much detail only point which i want you to know is i have said you that in the proximal convoluted tubule vitamin d activation will happen see that this is the active vitamin d so active vitamin d or activation of vitamin d happens in the proximal convoluted tubule with the help of an enzyme so what is that enzyme is the mcq the enzyme is called as the alpha 1 hydroxylase okay alpha 1 hydroxylase so this alpha 1 hydroxylase helps in the conversion of inactive vitamin d into active vitamin d okay this is the active vitamin d also called as 1 comma 2 5 dihydroxy 
cholecalciferol. So 1,25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol is the active vitamin D. And this activation happens in the proximal convoluted tubule with the help of an enzyme called as alpha-1 hydroxylase. Okay, done. And next what else you should know. So this alpha-1 hydroxylase, this enzyme, it is under certain regulation. So it is regulated by which hormone? Don't think that this alpha-1 hydroxylase is continuously inactive. No. See this alpha-1 hydroxylase activity need to be regulated. So sometimes it need to be activated, sometimes it need to be, like you know, it need to be, uh, like you know, not in the action. So what I am trying to put into your mind is, see this PTH, parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone, it is the one which regulates the activity of alpha-1 hydroxylase. So remember, alpha-1 hydroxylase is under the control of which hormone? Parathyroid hormone. So it's something like this. Parathyroid hormone activates alpha-1 hydroxylase. Once the alpha-1 hydroxylase is activated, alpha-1 hydroxylase in the proximal convoluted tubules of the nephron will convert inactive vitamin D into active form. And this active vitamin D is called as 1,25 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, which is also called as calcitriol. Calcitriol. Okay, not calcitonin. Calcitonin is different. This is calcitriol. So, what else they can ask you? What is the function of this vitamin D, sir? What is the function of vitamin D? We know vitamin D have intracellular receptors, intranuclear receptors. Okay. See, this vitamin D, it helps in the absorption of calcium and phosphorus from the GAT. From the GAT, uh, vitamin D increases the both calcium and phosphate absorption. Simple. Or I can say, vitamin D increases the blood levels of calcium and phosphates. Done. Okay, that's more than enough. And after this, what else you should know? Um, here itself, I am telling you. Uh, calcitriol. See, this is the calcitriol, right? Calcitriol. Calcitriol is vitamin D. Calcitriol is vitamin D. But what about the calcitonin? Guys, can anyone tell me what is calcitonin? See, calcitonin, uh, it is produced by, this hormone calcitonin is produced by para follicular cells, para follicular cells of thyroid gland. See, in the thyroid gland, follicular cells are there which produces the T3, T4 and parafollicular cells are there. So, in the thyroid gland, you should know there are parafollicular cells. This parafollicular cells they will produce the calcitonin. And do you know what is the function of the calcitonin? Calcitonin decreases the blood calcium levels. Okay. So, calcitonin decreases the blood calcium levels. But what vitamin D will do? Sir, vitamin D, this calcitriol, it increases the, it increases the blood levels of calcium. Okay. So, we can say calcitonin is antagonistic, it's opposite to calcitriol. Okay, so calcitonin and calcitriol are exactly opposite things. Calcitonin, it want to decrease the blood calcium levels. Calcitriol want to increase the blood calcium levels. So they are antagonistic hormones. Okay. Next, after this, what else I want to put into your mind? It's the RAS pathway. Okay, RAS pathway, you know, uh, like, let me see, make a small change, yeah, like this. So, who, who is producing the renin? So, the renin, it is produced by the juxtaglomerular cells. See, this juxtaglomerular cells produces the renin. But the point which I want you to know is, especially from the pharma point of view, they will ask you which receptors are present, okay? Now, see, on the juxtaglomerular apparatus here, beta-1 sympathetic receptors are present. Okay, beta-1 sympathetic receptors are present. For example, now, you are sympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is getting activated. Now in your body, sympathetic nervous system is getting activated. So now the sympathetic nervous system, what it will release is? It will release the sympathetic neurotransmitters like epinephrine, norepinephrine. See this epinephrine, norepinephrine, now do you know what they will do? They will come and act on the beta-1 receptors. Now that's the, like you know, process by which this juxtaglomerular cells are activated. So how juxtaglomerular cells are getting activated? Because on the juxtaglomerular cells, there is a receptor called as a beta-1 sympathetic receptor or beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And it will be stimulated by sympathetic neurotransmitters like epinephrine or epinephrine. So now, what will happen? Renin is produced. So renin, what it will do? Renin helps in the conversion of angiotensinogen, which is there in the blood. The angiotensinogen, which is there in the blood, will be converted into angiotensin 1. This angiotensin 1 in the lungs will be converted into angiotensin 2. In the lungs, angiotensin 1 will be converted into angiotensin 2 with the help of enzyme called as angiotensin converting enzyme. Now, guys, are you able to remember this angiotensin 2 uses which secondary messenger system? Angiotensin 2, vasoconstriction, so some contraction is involved. 
so it uses ip3 secondary messenger don't forget okay it uses the ip3 as a secondary messenger now what else i want you to know so this angiotensin 2 yes it causes a vasoconstriction whenever there is a vasoconstriction the bp is going to be increased bp is going to be increased so this is how ras okay this is this is the major way by which ras pathway uh, by activating uh, sorry uh, sympathetic nervous system activates the juxtaglomerular cells juxtaglomerular cells produces the renin renin converts the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 angiotensin 1 will be converted into angiotensin 2 in the lungs with the help of angiotensin converting enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme okay so whenever there is angiotensin 2 there is vasoconstriction that increases the bp now remember here here comes the here comes some important points with this angiotensin 2 they will ask you uh, which of the following is a function of angiotensin 2 the angiotensin 2 one function you know it causes vasoconstriction no doubt not only that this angiotensin 2 it acts on the adrenal gland okay it acts on the adrenal gland and what it is doing by acting on the adrenal gland which region zona glomerulosa this angiotensin 2 acts on zona glomerulosa of adrenal gland so that now what it is doing this angiotensin 2 helps in the production of aldosterone okay it helps in the production of aldosterone okay so angiotensin 2 now remember angiotensin 2 helps in the production of aldosterone true statement angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction true statement okay no doubt and not only that remember this angiotensin 2 also stimulate the thirst center these are the questions which were asked it also stimulate thirst thirst center so what will happen whenever there is a thirst center which is getting activated now you will drink more and more water so more and more water is getting entered into your body so blood volume increases bp increases okay so it angiotensin 2 stimulate the thirst center true Angiotensin 2, not only that, it helps in the production of antidiuretic hormone, ADH. Okay, angiotensin 2 stimulates the release of antidiuretic hormone. So, all these are the functions. Remember, angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, true. Angiotensin 2 causes production of aldosterone, a release of the aldosterone, true. Angiotensin 2 stimulates the thirst center, true. Angiotensin 2 helps, uh, helps in the release of the antidiuretic hormone, true. All these are the true statements. Now, after this, Okay, what else I want you to know? So this was the question which was asked in one of the exam. Stimulus for the RAS activation. When the RAS pathway is activated, when the RAS pathway is activated, see, the ultimate result of the RAS pathway is increase in the BP. RAS pathway increases the BP. So when do you need RAS pathway? Whenever there is decreased BP. So hypotension. Whenever there is, whenever there is hypotension in your body, then sympathetic nervous system is activated. That activates the RAS pathway. Okay, so hypotension stimulates the RAS pathway true. Apart from that, what else? See, beta 1 receptor activation, if you stimulate the beta 1 receptor, yes, RAS pathway is activated true. And not only that, see, whenever there is a hyponatremia in the body, means low sodium levels. So low sodium levels in your body also activates the RAS pathway. Okay, that's also MCQ. Why? Because, see, if you look here, this aldosterone, do you know what it will do? This mineralocorticoid aldosterone. So this aldosterone, see, it, what it is doing, it increases the sodium reabsorption. Means more and more sodium will be reabsorbed. So, imagine, now when I am suffering with a hypo, uh, hyponatremia, now, my body, sodium levels are very much less. So, RAS pathway is getting activated in my body. Whenever there is a RAS pathway, aldosterone is there. This aldosterone increases the sodium reabsorption. So, at least my body sodium levels are going to be maintained. So, hyponatremia will also... Okay, hyponatremia will also stimulate the RAS pathway. So now tell me, what are the stimulus for the RAS pathway? Hypotension, true. Um, hyponatremia, as well as beta-1 receptor activation. Yeah. Now after this, some important single liners. How much blood is going to the kidneys? How much is the renal blood flow? Every minute, how much blood is going to the kidneys? Renal blood flow is almost 1.2 liters, or 20% of the cardiac output. Means, we know our cardiac output is 5 liters. Out of these 5 liters, almost uh, 1.2 liters, 1200 ml, 1200 ml is going to the kidneys, that's the renal blood flow. And what is the renal plasma flow? How much plasma is going? Okay, renal blood flow is 1200, but in that blood there is only plasma, no. What is the plasma percentage? It is almost 625 ml. Okay, so 625 ml, 625 ml is the renal plasma flow. Okay, done guys. Now, 
what is a gfr direct values gfr is 125 ml every minute how much how much blood is going to be uh, sorry how much plasma is going to be filtered in the nephrons 125 ml of plasma is going to be filtered okay very much important so now repeat after me three important mcqs how much is the renal blood flow 1200 ml 1200 ml blood is going to both the kidneys every minute out of that blood how much plasma is there out of that blood sir 625 ml is the plasma so renal plasma flow is 625 and out of that 625, how much is actually getting filtered? What is the glomerular filtration rate? Filtration is happening, no? How much is getting filtered every minute? 125 ml. So, okay. So, 125 ml is getting filtered out of 625. Okay, out of 625. Sorry. Out of 625, 125 is getting filtered. So, how much percent? Own 20 percent is getting filtered. Okay, so 20 percent is getting filtered. This formula is called as a filtration fraction. So, if someone asks you, what is the filtration fraction? The filtration fraction in the kidneys, the filtration fraction is 20%, which means GFR divided by GFR over the uh, renal plasma flow will give you the value 20%. Okay. Now, some important MCQs. So, we know GFR is 125. Okay. GFR normal healthy person, new and me said it's 125. Okay. But what is the formula to calculate the GFR? The formula to calculate the GFR is U V by P. So, urinary concentration, they will give you the value uh, in the question they will give, mention. So, what is the urinary concentration of a substance? And what is the volume? V for volume of urine produced. Okay, volume of urine produced. U, V by P. So, they give you the urinary concentration of a substance. They will give you the amount of urine which is getting produced and P for plasma concentration of a particular substance. Okay, so how to calculate the GFR? So the formula for the calculation of the GFR or this is the same formula for clearance also of any particular substance. So clearance also the same formula for GFR as well as the clearance, the formula is UV by P. Now, second MCQ. What are the markers of the GFR? Okay, what are the markers of the GFR? Sir, by using which substance? See here substance I am writing, no substance. By using which substance we can actually calculate the GFR? What are the better substances? They are inulin. Okay, they are creatinine. Okay, inulin, creatinine as well as cystatin. Okay, so inulin, creatinine and cystatin, these are the substances. Okay, so these inulin, creatinine and substances, again this will be coming. Uh, everything will be in the type format, don't worry. Don't worry. So the formula for GFR calculation is UV by P. Formula for uh, GFR calculation is UV by P. Done. And what are the substances used to estimate the GFR? Inulin, creatinine as well as cystatin C. Done. Now, next MCQ. They will ask you, renal plasma flow how much? 625. Okay. But what is the marker? Which substance is used to calculate the renal plasma flow? If you want to calculate my renal plasma flow, you have to inject a substance into my body. And do you know what is that substance? P for P. Renal plasma flow. Plasma for para huperic acid. So, renal plasma flow is estimated with the help of a substance called as para amino huperic acid. PAH. Done. After this, what you should know? Types of nephrons. How many types of nephrons are there in the kidneys? Two types of nephrons are there. Okay, two types of nephrons are there. Here you can see uh, one nephron which is having, see this is the first type of nephron, which is having short loop of Henle. There is a very short loop of Henle. Okay, descending limb of loop of Henle, ascending limb of loop of Henle. And here is one type of nephron with long loop of Henle. See, it's having a long loop of Henle, which is going deep down into the middle. So now tell me how many types of nephrons are there? Two types of nephrons are there. Okay. What are these two types? First type is called as a cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons, which are majority in number 80 to 85 percent of the nephrons are the cortical nephrons. Very important MCQ. Okay, which was previously asked this question. Cortical nephrons, 85 percent. Then what is the other type of nephron? The second type with a long, deep, uh, like you know, loop of Henle. The second type is called as a juxta medullary nephron. This one. Okay, this one which I am showing you. This nephron with a long loop of Henle. This is the juxta medullary nephron. This one, the first type, it is called as a cortical nephron. Okay, cortical as well as juxta medullary nephrons. What are the differences, sir? Differences in the percentage. Extra medulla nephrons are just 15%. Okay, 15 to 20%. Particle nephrons are 80 to 85%. Okay, done. Next point is the blood supply to these nephrons. Okay, the blood supply. The cortical nephrons are surrounded by peritubular capillaries. Okay, cortical nephrons. If you look at this cortical nephron, see the nephron is surrounded by the red color blood vessel, right? See, there is this red color blood vessel. So, let's continue the topic. Um, we, are, we have already completed you know the basic part of the renal system if you have if you face any issues if you have any issues with the lagging if you have any issues with the audio you can all the time just uh, keep a message in the 
chart session okay now so what are we discussing about we are discussing about the types of nephrons there are two types of nephrons one is the juxtamedullary nephrons as well as the cortical nephrons right so look here the juxtamedullary nephrons are just 15 percent cortical nephrons are almost 80 to 85 percent that's we have already discussed and the cortical nephrons they are surrounded by the peritubular capillaries already we have discussed about them the peritubular capillaries are the interstitial cells of the peritubular capillaries which produces the erythropoietin okay already regarding this we have discussed and um, who surrounds the juxtamedullary nephron? The juxtamedullary nephron, they are surrounded by the blood vessels called as a vasa recta. So, vasa recta is present around the juxtamedullary nephrons and the cortical nephrons, they are surrounded. The cortical nephrons are surrounded by the uh, peritubular the capillaries. Now, what, is the, what are the other functions? The other functions are the cortical nephrons, they mainly help in the formation of the urine. But the juxtamedullary nephrons help in the concentration of the urine. They specifically ask you which nephrons helps in the concentration of the urine. It's the juxtamedullary nephrons and one more difference already we have discussed this the cortical nephrons have short loop of henle and the juxtamedullary nephrons have the long loop of henle Done. so different types of nephrons are also completed now after this what else we have to discuss already i have discussed with you what is the glomerular filtration rate the glomerular filtration rate is 125 ml per minute now so which substances are actually filtered okay in the uh, nephrons into the nephrons for example, let me show you. See, this is the glomerular capillary. Let's understand this is the glomerular capillary. Okay. Now, in this glomerular capillary, there are small, small holes present. Okay. There are small, small holes present called as a fenestration. These are called as a fenestrations. Now, down to it, there is glomerular basement membrane. Okay. This is the here. This is the glomerular basement membrane. Now, down to it, what do we have? Here, we are having the Bowman's capsule like this. Bowman's capsule, which are lined by the cells called as a podocytes okay these are the cells called as a podocytes now what i'm trying to put into your mind is this is the blood vessel right this is the glomerular capillary okay now see all these three structures together okay called as the glomerular filtration barrier the three structures which i am which i have shown you here are called as a glomerular filtration barrier see under this glomerular filtration barrier which structures are coming? One is this endothelial cells. See, these endothelial cells with the fenestration. The endothelial cells are there with having the holes. Endothelial cells are having these gaps called as the fenestration. So, this endothelial layer followed by glomerular basement membrane, GBM glomerular basement membrane and this podocytic cells, PC, this podocytic cells. So, this podocyte layer. So, endothelial layer, the first one, this endothelial layer, glomerular basement membrane and the podocyte layer. All these three together. Okay, see this endothelial layer, glomerular basement membrane and the podocytic food processes. All these three together constitute the filtration barrier. This is the MCQ. Okay, this is the MCQ that they will ask you in your exam. Next, sir, which substances are easily filtered? Okay, which substances, for example, if I show you, which substances are easily filtered, sir, like this to down? Substances of 4 to 8 nanometers, not mm. Substances of 4 to 8 nanometers are easily filtered. Okay. Now, what are the gaps between the endothelial capillaries? In the endothelial capillaries, I have said you, there are small, small holes present. These are called as fenestrations. Okay. And what are the gaps between the podocytes? See here, the podocytes in between them, there are gaps present. See, these gaps are called as slit pores. So, slit pores are the gaps between the podocytes. Okay. These are the MCQs. So, glomerular filtration barrier consists of three layers. What are they? Capillary endothelium, glomerular basement membrane, and the third layer is the podocytic food processes layer. Okay, now which substances are easily filtered? The substances of 4 to 8 nanometers are freely filtered. And the gaps between the endothelial capillaries, or I should say the gaps within the endothelial capillaries, they are called as the fenestrations. And the gaps between the podocytes are called as the slit pores. Now, after that, one more point which I want you to know is, so this glomerular basement membrane, this yellow color substance which I have shown you, this glomerular basement membrane is made up of type 4 collagen. Okay, before going to the exams, you should know this. The glomerular basement membrane is made up of the type 4 collagen. And this glomerular basement membrane, it is having which charge? Negative charge. The glomerular basement membrane is having negativity, negative charge. And in your exam, they will ask you, why there is this negative charge? Okay, this glomerular basement membrane negative charge is because of what? This negative charge, the glomerular basement membrane, see, GFB, glomerular filtration barrier, the glomerular basement membrane, it is having the negative charge. And this negative charge is because of very very important mcq heparin sulfate styloproteins and also proteoglycoproteins uh, 
So glomerular basement membrane negativity, the negative charge of the glomerular basement membrane is because of the aparam sulfate, siloproteins and glycoproteins. This is the point which I want you to know. And next important point is, sir, this negative charge is there, right? What is the importance of this negative charge? So because of the presence of this negative charge, the glomerular filtration barrier, the glomerular basement membrane is having this negative charge. Because of this negative charge, albumin is not filtered. Okay, albumin is not at all filtered. Why? Why? Because if you look here, this is the glomerular capillary I am showing you. One glomerular capillary. Uh, these, what are these? These are the endothelial cells, right? These are the endothelial cells. Now, what is this one? This is the glomerular basement membrane. Now, down to the glomerular basement membrane, there is Bowman's capsule. This Bowman's capsule is lined by these podocytic cells. These are the podocytes. Now, what kind of charge is present over here? Negative charge is there. See, albumin is very small molecule. Albumin is such a small molecule. It can, it's like, you know, the size of the albumin is somewhere around the 4 nanometers or even less than the 4 nanometers. It's, it's very such a small molecular weight molecule. It can be easily filtered, but it is not. It is not filtered. Why? Because albumin is also having negative charge. These plasma proteins, they are negatively charged substances. Albumin is a negatively charged substance. So, negativity will repel the negativity. So, albumin will come like this and it is repelled. The albumin is repelled because of the negativity. So now tell me, what is the importance? The importance of this negativity. The global filtration barrier is having the negative charge. This the negative charge will help in, or the negative charge will prevent, prevent the filtration of albumin. Okay. Now, after that, next what else you should know? You should know that the RBCs, WBCs, platelets, and all the plasma proteins like albumin, globulin, fibrinogen, all the plasma proteins, and the clotting factors, all the substances, they are not filtered. Okay, they are not filtered. But these substances are not filtered. Done. Right? But if they ask you, the glucose is there, right? Is it filtered into the nephrons? Most of the students will think, glucose is very much important. It's not filtered. No. Glucose is filtered, no doubt. Glucose and amino acid, these substances are freely, freely filtered, no doubt. Okay, so glucose and amino acid, these substances are freely filtered. Okay, but they are filtered, but 100% they are reabsorbed. So glucose, amino acids, they are filtered and they are reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, after that, for your exams, what else you should know? See, this is something very much important, especially from uh, both physiology as well as pathology point of view. Guys, are you getting any disturbance? Any disturbance sounds are coming? Because some work, construction work is going on. Uh, guys, are you having any some disturbance? No, is everything okay, right? Okay. Okay. Now, some construction work is going on. So, okay, 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 okay. Now, let's continue. Okay, let's continue. Now, for your exam, what you should know? Guys, please look here. These are the endothelial cells. Okay, this, this is the glomerular capillary. This is the lumen of the glomerular capillary. See, these are the endothelial cells, guys. Okay, where these endothelial cells are sitting? The endothelial cells are sitting on the glomerular basement membrane. This is the glomerular basement membrane. Now, down to the glomerular basement membrane, what do we have? These are the podocytic cells. Okay, now, between the podocytic cells, I have said you, there are gaps present. These gaps are called as the slit pores. Okay, these are called as the slit pores. Now, look here, in these gaps, in these gaps, there is this one structure present. There is this one structure present. Do you know what is the name of this structure? This structure is called as the slit diaphragm. So, what I am trying to put into your mind is, Sir, here, in between these podocytic cells, there is something called as the slit diaphragm. Okay, there is something called as the slit diaphragm. Now, the question is this. This is slit diaphragm is made up of which proteins? This slit diaphragm is made there. It is made up of podocin. It is made up of podocin and nephrine. So, podocin and nephrine, they are the proteins which are present in. Okay, mainly podocin. Remember, podocin and nephrine. So, these proteins are forming slit diaphragm. They are forming the slit diaphragm. Okay, forget about the alpha acne info. At least, podocin, nephrine. Guys, what are we discussing? Glomerular filtration is happening, right? Glomerular filtration is happening. 125 ml per minute. Why it is happening? 
See, glomerular filtration is happening because of a pressure difference of 10 mm Hg. I am not going in detail about what are the different types of pressures. There are favoring pressures and opposing pressures like hydrostatic pressure, osmotic pressure. So many things are there. No one will ask you. No one will ask you all of them. What they will ask you is, see, there are certain favoring pressures. Okay, some pressures which will favor the glomerular filtration. There are certain pressures which will oppose the glomerular filtration. There are favoring pressures and opposing pressures. Favoring, opposing. Now, in between them, there is a difference. The favoring pressure, see, the favoring pressures, for example, the favoring pressures is 60 mm Hg. That is the hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillary, it is a favoring pressure. It helps in the glomerular filtration. It is 60 mm Hg. Okay. It is 60 mm Hg. But the opposing pressures, opposing pressures, if you add, it will be 50 mm Hg. Okay, it will be 50 mm Hg. The favoring pressures are 60 mm Hg. Opposing pressures are 50 mm Hg. So, now tell me who is more? The favoring pressures are more than the opposing pressures. By how much difference? So, 60 minus 50. So, 60, 60 minus 50. 60 minus 50, how much? 10 mm Hg. Okay. So, glomerular filtration is happening with a pressure difference of 10 mm Hg. That's the MCQ. I have already discussed with you what is the formula of uh, GFR. The formula for the GFR is UV by P. Okay, GFR or the clearance formula is UV by P. Okay. Now, after that, what else you should know? How GFR is going to be altered in different, different conditions? Okay. There are certain conditions where GFR increases and there are certain conditions where GFR decreases. Okay. Now, look here. Guys, just for a basic understanding. Now, you know, this is the afferent arteriole which brings the blood, okay, which is bringing the blood. Okay, let me show you with the red color. This is the afferent arteriole which is bringing the blood. This afferent arteriole is going to divide into glomerular capillaries, many, many small, small glomerular capillaries. Now, all these glomerular capillaries also, they will fuse and forms the efferent. This is the efferent arteriole. This is afferent arteriole. This is efferent arteriole. Okay, these are the glomerular capillaries. Here are the glomerular capillaries present. Now, what is this one? This is the Bowman's capsule. Everyone knows Bowman's capsule and the proximal convoluted tubule, the first part of the nephron. Now, my question here is, sir, what happens if this afferent arteriole is dilated? If afferent arteriole is dilated, like this, look here. So, see, this is the afferent arteriole. Now, what happens to the afferent arteriole? It is dilated, sir. Now, if it is dilated, more blood will come into the glomerular capillaries. GC means glomerular capillaries. So, more blood is coming into the glomerular capillaries. If more blood is coming into the glomerular capillaries, what happens to the GFR? GFR increases. Simple. As simple as that. So, when you do afferent arteriolar dilation, when you do the afferent arteriolar dilation, more blood will come into the glomerular capillaries and more filtration will occur. More GFR will occur. Okay. So, afferent arteriolar vasodilation increases the GFR and who will cause this afferent arteriolar vasodilation? Who will cause this afferent arteriolar vasodilation? Prostaglandins. So, prostaglandins are the substances which cause the afferent arteriolar vasodilation. Not only prostaglandins, also remember atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay, this was the question asked in the exams. Atrial natriuretic peptide causes afferent arteriolar vasodilation. Okay, now anything else? Someone is messaging. What happened? Okay. Okay, everything is okay, right? That, that, that. Now, what else you should know? Now, look here, guys. Look here and tell me. What exactly is happening over here? This is the afferent arteriole. Now, afferent arteriole is getting, uh, okay, not this one. Not this one, not this one, this one. See? Yeah, here, yeah, this one. This is the afferent arteriole, right? Okay. So, this is the afferent arteriole, right? Afferent arteriole, now it is getting constricted. Now, afferent arteriole, it is getting constricted. Now, whenever afferent arteriole is getting constricted, get, getting constricted, you think logically and tell me what happened to the GFR. 
अरे इफ इट इज गेटिंग कंस्ट्रिक्टेड लेस ब्लड विल कम लेस ब्लड इज कमिंग टू द ग्लोमेरुलर कैपिलरीज राइट तो व्हाट हैपेंड टू द फिल्ट्रेशन फिल्ट्रेशन डिक्रीजेस जीएफआर डिक्रीजेस सिंपल एज सिंपल एज दैट सो नाउ व्हेन यू कंस्ट्रिक्ट द अफरेंट आर्टेरियल व्हाट हैपेंड टू द जीएफआर जीएफआर डिक्रीजेस so who will cause this afferent arteriolar constriction afferent arteriolar constriction is done by substances like adenosine so afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction what it will do it will decreases the gfr okay it decreases the gfr now next sir now look here in this example in the third example here here i am showing you this is the efferent arteriole right this is the efferent arteriole Now what I am doing to the efferent arteriole? Efferent arteriole. Now I am constricting. Okay, with the help of a substance called as angiotensin two. This is the MCQ. Angiotensin two. Okay, angiotensin two causes efferent arteriolar constriction. The efferent arteriole is now being constricted. When the efferent arteriole is constricted, tell me what happened to the GFR? Blood is coming, but it is not going out. okay blood is coming but it is not able to go out why because efferent arteriole is constricted so now blood will start to accumulate in the glomerular capillaries the congestion is happening more pressures will develop in the glomerular capillary so more filtration will occur so efferent arteriolar vasoconstriction increases the gfr okay initially increases the gfr later decreases but initially most important point is if you constrict the efferent arteriole if you constrict the efferent arteriole gfr decreases okay now next if you dilate the efferent arteriole what happens see you are dilating the efferent arteriole sir blood is coming but blood is very easily escaping it is not staying in the glomerular capillaries it is very easy for the blood to escape so what happened to the gfr gfr decreases so at the end of the day the point which i want you to know is only concentrate first let's talk about the afferents afferent arteriolar dilation if you dilate the afferent arteriole what will happen sir if you dilate the afferent arteriole more gfr if you constrict if you constrict the afferent arteriole gfr decreases done now let's talk about the efferent now if you cause the efferent arteriolar constriction constriction efferent arteriolar constriction blood is coming but not able to go out so more filtration will happen so more is the gfr if you cause efferent efferent arteriolar dilation blood is coming but easily going out easily escaping so what happened to the gfr gfr decreases that's it next after this what you should know now we have to discuss about the mesangial cell and its relationship with the gfr see here i am showing you this is the glomerular capillary okay now the red color thing which i am showing is the glomerular capillary you can say this is the glomerular capillary because lot of holes are there white white holes are there no see these are the fenestrations see this glomerular capillary imagine this is the glomerular capillary it is surrounded it is surrounded by the mesangial cells so this mesangial cells are almost like a smooth muscles they will contract they will relax so you know, now think logically and tell me if this mesangial cell if it contracts if the mesangial cell is contracting what it will do to the glomerular capillaries the glomerular capillaries are also closed now they are narrowed down so what happened to the gfr so mesangial cell contraction decreases the gfr mesangial cell relaxation increases the gfr that's it so these are also the mcqs which you need to know now after this next important mcq which i want you to know is see kidney it is having some important property it will regulate its blood flow okay it can manage its blood flow this is called as auto regulation of the blood flow as well as the kidneys will all the time want one thing they want the gfr to be 125 they want to maintain the gfr so kidneys in any condition they can manage the gfr for example if gfr is falling down gfr is falling down they will bring back the gfr to normal if the gfr is increasing they will bring down the gfr to normal this is called as auto regulation of the gfr and mcq is this auto regulation of the gfr is done with the help of a cells called as macula densa so who is involved okay who is involved in this auto regulation of the gfr and uh, this is also called as a tubular glomerular feedback the same process this auto regulation of the gfr it is because of tubular glomerular feedback and who is giving this tubular glomerular feedback macula densa so remember one point macula densa these are the cells which are giving the tubular glomerular feedback so because of this tubular glomerular feedback there will be auto regulation of the gfr 
Okay, so MacLeod and sir gives the tubular globular feedback because of which all the time the GFR is maintained or regulated. Okay, next MCQs uh, which I want you to know is so this MacLeod and sir it is sensitive to what? Sir MacLeod and sir is there? Yes, it is giving tubular globular feedback. It is maintaining the GFR. Everything is good. Okay, but this. Macular densa, it is sensitive to what? It is sensitive to the sodium chloride levels. Okay. So, macular densa, see, macular densa is all the time checking what? This macular densa, it is checking the sodium chloride levels. Guys, I am not going through the entire uh, thing. Simply remember, macular densa is sensitive to sodium chloride. Okay. Next important MCQ, which was asked in the exam. Sir, where exactly is this macular densa present? Macular densa is present on where, sir? Yes, it is sensitive to sodium chloride. It is giving tubular glomerular feedback. It is helping in the auto regulation of the GFR. All this story is okay. But where this macular densa is present? The best answer is, see, this is the uh, moment's capsule. Now, down to it, what do we have? We have the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, what is this one? This is the loop of Henle, right? Loop of Henle. Now, what is this one? This is the ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now, in the ascending limb of loop of Henle, what do we have? We are having a thick part. This is the thick part of ascending limb of loop of Henle. Okay. So, this is the thick part of ascending limb of loop of Henle. After this, what do we have? We are having this distal convoluted tubule. Distal convoluted tubule. Now, after that, what is this one? Here, you are going to have the collecting ducts and collecting tubules. Okay. Now, point which I want you to know is, see, macular densa is present where? This is the place where macular densa is present. Okay. So, this is thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So, thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So, thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is the place. Thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is the place where macular densa is present. But if you don't find this answer, okay, if you don't find this answer, then the next best answer is a junction between, this is the junction, right? Almost this is the junction. A junction between thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and distal convoluted tubule. So, Thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and distal convoluted tubular junction is the other best option to mark. So, macular densa it is present on the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. If you don't find this answer in the options, then the answer a junction between thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and distal convoluted tubule. If you even if you don't find this answer, then you can go with the distal convoluted tubule if this is there. Okay, so I have given you the priority, the order which you need to know. Okay, next, what else I should teach you? Uh, these are the general things which you already know, which substances are filtered, the proximal convoluted tubule, see, the proximal, after the moment's capsule, you have the proximal convoluted tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule, yes, maximum reabsorption of the substances, maximum reabsorption of the substances happens in the PCT, the starting part, okay, and the proximal convoluted tubule is having the brush border, you know it, like, you know, so many, uh, so much brush border is there. It increases the surface area so that more and more reabsorption will happen in the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, as it is reabsorbing most of the substances, yes, it is highly metabolically active. More number of mitochondria is there. More ATP is being used in that uh, proximal convoluted tubule. And proximal convoluted tubule is highly susceptible to hypoxia. It requires a lot and lot of oxygen. It is doing so much of uh, duty. If there is no oxygen, definitely, yes, susceptible to hypoxia. Okay, done. Uh, one more point which I want you to know. See here. The most of the substances are reabsorbed in the PCT, true statement, except, except magnesium. Okay, so most of the substances are reabsorbed back into the blood uh, in the PCT, except what? Except magnesium, except the magnesium. Sir. Now, after this, in the proximal convoluted tubule, what I should teach you? What, what, should, what, what I should teach you? See, the point which I want you to know is, look here. Uh, let me show you in a simple diagram first. See, this is the glomerular capillary. Here is the glomerular capillary. Now, down to the glomerular capillary, what do we have? This is the Bowman's capsule. Down to the Bowman's capsule, what is this one? This is the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron. Okay. Now, here is the loop of it. Now, see, this is the proximal convoluted tubular epithelial cell. These are the proximal convoluted tubular epithelial cells. Now, here, in this area, in the proximal convoluted tubule, MCQ, 100% of the glucose is reabsorbed and 100% of the amino acids are reabsorbed. Okay, 100% of the glucose, 100% of the amino acids, they are reabsorbed in the PCT itself. See here, glucose is being reabsorbed. 
along with this is mcq so glucose is reabsorbed along with which ion glucose is reabsorbed along with the sodium ions this is the mcq so in the proximal convoluted tubule in the pct glucose is reabsorbed with sodium also amino acids also the same thing amino acids are also reabsorbed with sodium so sodium amino acid co-transport sodium glucose co-transport now mcq is sir this is an example of what kind of transport so glucose is being reabsorbed amino acids are being reabsorbed but along with the sodium so it's a co-transport remember all co-transporters are examples of secondary active transport so this is sglt sodium s for sodium glucose transporter see this transporter name see this transporter whatever is present over here it is the transporting glucose molecules as well as sodium molecules so this is an example of sodium glucose co-transporter which is an example of secondary active transport remember so look here see glucose molecule is going along with the sodium molecule okay so this is sodium glucose co-transporter which is an example of secondary active transport okay answer completed this is the one point which i want you to know next in the proximal convoluted tubule if you look here in the proximal convoluted tubule i have shown you how much water is being reabsorbed 70 percent of the water will be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule 70 percent water is reabsorbed now look here see in the prox this is the bowman's capsule okay this is the bowman's capsule okay how much water is being reabsorbed 70 percent of the water is being reabsorbed how much sodium chloride is being reabsorbed 70 percent of the sodium chloride is being reabsorbed now i am asking you what is the concentration of urine here in this area in the proximal convoluted tubule whatever the urine is there what is this urine osmolarity what is the urine osmolarity in the proximal convoluted tubule See, i can tell you one thing in the blood okay in the plasma the plasma osmolarity <coughs> osmolarity is 300 milli osmoles okay 300 milli osmoles in the pct okay in the proximal convoluted tubule what happened to the plasma osmolarity increases or decreases what do you think is going to be increases or decreases the plasma osmolarity will remain same 300 only why why because it's the same amount of solvent and same amount of solute the major solute is the salt sodium chloride so the solutes and solvents they are reabsorbed in the same proportion solutes and solvents are being reabsorbed in the same proportion so that's why in the proximal convoluted tubule the urinary osmolarity is isotonic isotonic to plasma in the plasma also the osmolarity is 300 and in the proximal convoluted tubule also it is 300 okay done so here see urinary ultrafiltrate in the proximal convoluted tubule is isotonic to plasma that is 300 milli osmoles okay now see try to understand like this 70 percent sodium is re reabsorbed 70 percent water is reabsorbed wherever sodium goes water follows so sodium is getting reabsorbed water is also getting reabsorbed so this type of transport or this type of reabsorption is called as obligatory water reabsorption okay so the water reabsorption which happens in the pct the water reabsorption again the water reabsorption which happens in the pct is called as a obligatory water reabsorption which means no need of any hormones no need of any hormonal control sodium reabsorbs as water reabsorbs okay sodium is being reabsorbed water is also getting reabsorbed simple this is ty this type of water reabsorption is called as obligatory water reabsorption done after this what i should know uh, already I have explained to you uh, it's an example of sodium glucose co-transporter the sodium glucose co-transporter is an example of secondary active transport this is also discussed now in your pharmacology this question uh, this question like you know will be integrated for, with the pharmacology see this sodium glucose sglt is the right sodium glucose transporter it's actually sodium glucose transporter type 2 in the nephrons in the kidneys in the proximal convoluted tubule which type of sglts are there type 2 sodium glucose co-transporter type 2 actually this sodium glucose co-transporter type 2 they can be inhibited by certain drugs they can be blocked by certain drugs what are these drugs uh, so the sglt2 inhibitors they are canagliflozin dapagliflozin and empagliflozin so canagliflozin dapagliflozin and empagliflozin 
okay these drugs canagliflozin dapagliflozin and epagliflozin these drugs okay these drugs they will block they will block what they will block the uh, sgld2s okay is it clear everything is clear ah okay so canagliflozin dapagliflozin and epagliflozin these drugs they are the sgld2 blockers and if you use these drugs, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, epagliflozin, the glucose will not be reabsorbed. Glucose reabsorption does not happen. Okay, glucose reabsorption does not happen. All the glucose will go out in the urine, which will cause urinary tract infections, which will cause the urinary tract infections, UTIs. Okay. Then, after this, what else you should know? See, the two important MCQs, which you should never ever miss for your exam is, in you and me okay in you and me guys we, we, we are absolutely healthy right the plasma glucose the plasma glucose will be somewhere around 100 okay round figure i'm taking you 100 90 or 100 milligrams per deciliter 90 to 100 grams per deciliter and in healthy person's urine do you find glucose molecules do you think a healthy person is going to leak the glucose no definitely not 100 percent of the glucose will be reabsorbed in the pct itself okay so, what I'm trying to put into your mind is, now understand, if you increase, you see, the, if you increase the plasma glucose concentration to 200, this value is important. If the plasma glucose concentration, if it becomes 200, then for the first time, what happens? Glucose will appear in the urine. See, glucose will start to appear in the urine. So, at which, at which plasma glucose concentration Glucose will start to appear in the urine 200 milligrams per deciliter. At 200 milligrams per deciliter, if you increase the plasma glucose levels to 200 milligrams per deciliter, this some amount of glucose will start to come out in the urine. So this value is called as renal threshold for glucose. Okay, so direct value. Renal threshold for glucose is 200 milligrams per deciliter. Done. Done. Next. Next MCQ. The next MCQ is called as a T max for glucose. Transport maximum for glucose. What is this transport maximum for glucose? Now, uh, to make you understand this, see, and right now I am not talking about the plasma concentration. I am not talking about the plasma concentration. Forget about the plasma concentration. Now I am talking about the filtered load. The filtered load. How much glucose is getting into the nephrons? Now if it is 375. Okay, if the value becomes 375, if the filtered load of the glucose, okay, uh, I don't want to go into the calculations, like, you know, how to find out the filtered load, I'm not going into that area. If the filtered load, if it becomes more than 375 value, then no glucose, no further glucose reabsorption happens in the PCT. The PCT cannot reabsorb any more glucose. So, if the filtered load of the glucose, look here, if the filtered load of glucose, if it becomes more than 375 milligrams per deciliter, then there is, see, if the filtered load of glucose, if it is becoming more than 375 milligrams per, uh, not deciliter, sorry, minute, yeah. Uh, if you put this much amount of glucose into the nephrons, further glucose reabsorption, see, further glucose reabsorption will not occur. So, this value is called as the transport maximum of the glucose. So, okay, guys, simple. Two values, T max for the glucose, transport maximum value for the glucose is 375 and renal threshold for the glucose or urinary, uh, urinary threshold for the glucose is 200 milligrams per deciliter plasma. Okay. So these are the two important MCQ. Renal threshold or the urinary threshold, renal threshold or the urinary threshold value is 200. T max value, T max value, uh, value for the glucose is 375. Done. Now, after this, uh, anything you should know uh, regarding uh, any other things which you should know regarding uh, the kidney part is, look here, this is the descending limb of loop of Henle, right? Right now I am showing you, descending limb of loop of Henle and what is this one? This is ascending limb of loop of Henle, descending limb, ascending limb, okay? See, in the descending limb, you can clearly see water is being reabsorbed, water reabsorption happens. So, remember, descending limb of loop of Henle, right? Descending limb of loop of Henle is permeable only to water. Okay, anyway, I have written over here. See, descending limb of loop of Henle is only permeable to water. 
in the descending limb of loop of henle no ions are reabsorbed no ions are reabsorbed only 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 water is reabsorbed that's it okay so descending limb of loop of henle is also called as a concentrating segment of the urine the water is being reabsorbed from the urine all the water is being reabsorbed so what happened to the urine now urine is getting concentrated so that's why descending limb of loop of henle descending limb of loop of henle is called as the concentrating segment in the descending limb of loop of henle only solutes are sorry only water is being reabsorbed no solutes are reabsorbed that's it done completed now after this what else you should know very important mcq this is ascending limb of loop of henle right yes in the ascending limb of loop of henle look here there is a transporter present what is the name of this transporter sodium potassium 2 chloride sodium potassium 2 chloride is important it is absorbing sodium potassium chloride and two chloride ions especially okay two chloride ions so this transporter sodium potassium two chloride is important it is present in ascending limb of loop of henle i'm saying and it is blocked with the help of a diuretic a drug will block this can you tell me what is this drug can you at least think yourself a, a drug is going to block the sodium potassium two chloride supporter what is that drug called as that is called as loop diuretics okay so loop diuretics is go are going to block sodium potassium two chloride supporter and the example of loop diuretic is furosemide so furosemide is a loop diuretics which block the sodium potassium two chloride supporter now tell me sodium potassium two chloride supporter sodium potassium two chloride supporter it is present on ascending limb of loop of henle it can be blocked it can be blocked with the help of a drug called as a loop diuretics like furosemide furosemide done now any thing else which you should know regarding the loop diuretics here itself let me write loop diuretics okay loop diuretics come on guys i'm going a little fast i know but anyway this is how it should be can you tell me what is the side effect of the loop diuretics sir if you use loop diuretic if i am the person who is using the loop diuretic okay can you tell me what happened to the calcium what happened to the calcium sir the loop diuretics loop out the calcium from the body loop diuretics increases the calcium excretion loop diuretics increases the calcium excretion no doubt So if I am taking the loop diuretic, more and more calcium goes out of the body. Remember that one point. It's a side effect. Okay. Next thing, uh, what else? Uh, what else I should teach you? See, this is ascending limb of loop of Henle. Okay, everyone knows this ascending limb of loop of Henle. It is having which charge? The ascending limb of loop of Henle. Look here, it is having which charge? Positive charge. So ascending limb of loop of Henle. It is having lumen. Positivity or negativity? Lumen. positivity so the ascending limb of loop of henle is having the luminal positivity and they will ask you so this luminal positivity in the ascending limb of loop of henle it is because of which ions why it is positive it is because see the potassium is going to leak this potassium from the cells it will leak potassium will leak into the ascending limb of loop of henle potassium is a positive ion so because of the potassium ascending limb of loop of henle is having luminal positivity the luminal positivity again i am repeating the luminal positivity in the ascending limb of loop of henle it is because of the leakage of which ions potassium ions okay well and good next time see you that will come is sir what is the importance of this positivity ascending uh, the luminal positivity in ascending limb of loop of henle it helps in see here uh, everywhere positivity is there right See, because of this positivity, the calcium and magnesium they cannot escape. They cannot go into the urine. So this luminal positivity it helps in reabsorption of calcium and magnesium. So this these are the divalent cations. Calcium, magnesium they are having positive charge. The positive charge. So calcium and magnesium they cannot enter into the ascending limb of loop of Henle because more positivity is there. Luminal positivity is there. Okay. So now some important MCQs. Ascending limb of loop of Henle. Which transporter is present? See here. In ascending limb of loop of Henle, please look here and tell me which which transporter is present. Sodium potassium two chloride supporter. This sodium potassium two chloride supporter. It is blocked with with the help of which drugs? Loop diuretics. When you use loop diuretics, what is the side effect? 
calcium excretion calcium excretion in the ascending limb of loop of henle which charge is there positive charge is there this positive charge is because of which ion potassium ion because of the leakage of the potassium ion this positive charge is helping in what the positive charge it is helping in the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium okay then next important mcq are right, look here and tell me sir what is this transporter in the ascending limb of loop of henle sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter right the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter see if it is mutated by birth itself by birth itself it is mutated gaya okay this is gone by birth itself it's gone then it will cause which syndrome then see let me write here um yeah see the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter it is mutated by birth then it's going to cause a syndrome called as barter syndrome so barter syndrome is due to mutation of sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter and also i have explained to you loop diuretics furosemide see furosemide it blocks which receptor uh, sorry which uh, transporters the loop diuretics like furosemide yes they also block sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter so that is the reason why i will tell you a word now okay i will tell you a statement sir barter syndrome it resembles what loop diuretic over usage okay so barter syndrome it resembles barter syndrome looks like loop diuretic over usage why because in barter syndrome sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter is defective if you use the loop diuretics loop diuretics will block sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter so the clinical manifestation or the clinical features are going to be the same okay so these are the points which i wanted to now next what i should teach you so in this slide okay forget about this in this slide i let me write here see for example i am showing you one renal pyramid see this renal pyramid is divided into cortex outer cortex and inner medulla you know it so the outer part is called as a cortex inner part is called as a medulla okay, you know this right now i hope you have studied this from your regular classes when you are going deep into the medulla when you are going deep into the medulla what happened to the osmolarity in the cortex the osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles in the cortex the osmolarity is 300 milliosmoles but when you are going deep into the medulla the osmolarity what happens increases okay so there is medullary right medullary hyper osmolarity how much the medullary hyper osmolarity of 1200 milli osmoles maximum 1200 milli osmoles in the deep part of the medulla the medullary hyper osmolarity is 1200 milli osmoles okay who created this this is the question who created this medullary hyper osmolarity okay there is very uh, the importance i haven't i'm not discussing here why why do we need this medullary hyper osmolarity this is not the time who created this medullary hyper osmolarity this medullary hyper osmolarity it is created by right medullary hyper hyper osmolarity medullary hyper osmolarity created by a, a system called as counter current multiplier system so counter current multiplier system mcq so counter current multiplier system which includes ascending limb of loop of henle descending limb of loop of henle okay and hairpin turn like it's like a turn right hairpin turn okay descending limb hairpin turn ascending limb and hairpin turn so ascending limb of loop of henle descending limb of loop of henle hairpin turn they are all a part of okay they are all part of something called as counter current multiplier system this counter current multiplier system is responsible for the generation or creation of medullary hyperosmolarity done but once it is created it need to be maintained okay continuously see there is a gradient cortico papillary gradient means 300 outside it is how much 300 little in 600 little more in 800 1000 1200 there is this gradient right and someone should maintain this creation is okay but someone have to maintain it so who maintains this is the mcq so 
medullary hyperosmolarity created by completed created by mcq i have given so medullary hyperosmolarity is maintained by maintained by counter current exchanger system okay counter current exchanger so who is involved in this counter current exchanger system it is vasa recta okay so vasa recta okay done so the point which i want here also say the same thing medullary hyperosmolarity it is maintained by counter current exchanger it's a typing mistake here it is exchanger okay so counter current exchanger system with the help of vasa recta with the help of vasa recta then so this is also completed guys do you have any uh, questions do you have any questions now in the next 10 minutes let's complete the renal and let's directly jump into the next system okay let's take uh, a break of five minutes and let's start a, a new system okay now see let's talk about the digital convoluted tubule now Sir, in the digital convoluted tubule, when I am talking about the digital convoluted tubule, the one MCQ which I want you to know is, sir, there is a transporter called as sodium chloride co-transporter. Sodium, potassium, two chlorides importer. Sodium, potassium, two chlorides importer is present on ascending limb of loop of Henle. No doubt. But sodium chloride co-transporter, sodium chloride co-transporter is present on digital convoluted tubule MCQ. Okay, sodium chloride, this is the question. Sodium chloride co-transport is present on the distal convoluted tubule and do you know it will be blocked with the help of a drug it is blocked with the help of a drug called as thiazide diuretics thiazide diuretics so thiazide diuretics so thiazide diuretics blocks which transporter sodium chloride co-transporter now important point about the thiazide diuretics is if you use thiazide diuretics what is the relationship with the calcium Thiazide diuretics increases the calcium reabsorption, not excretion. Loop diuretics increase the calcium excretion. But thiazide diuretics increase the calcium reabsorption. Completed. Okay, these are the points which I want you to know regarding the transporter. Sodium chloride, co-transporter is present on the digital convoluted tubule. It will be blocked with the help of a drug called as thiazide diuretic. Thiazide diuretic, these drugs, they will increase the calcium reabsorption increase the calcium reabsorption next point is sir what if this transporter is mutated what if this transporter is mutated by birth itself by birth itself it is mutated then it is going to cause a syndrome called as little man syndrome little man syndrome so little man syndrome tell me little man syndrome it is because of the mutation of sodium chloride symporta who blocks the sodium chloride uh, co-transporter? Who blocks this transporter with the help of a drug? Who is the drug? Has a diuretics. So that's why we say Gittelman syndrome, it resembles what? Resembles. It resembles thiazide diuretic. Thiazide diuretic over usage there's a diuretic over usage why why because in gittelman syndrome same transporter is affected and thiazide diuretics are also blocking the same transporter in both the conditions same transport is being affected so that's why we say gittelman syndrome resembles thiazide diuretic over usage and barter syndrome see barter syndrome it resembles loop diuretic over usage barter syndrome it is affecting ascending limb of loop of henley gittelman syndrome is affecting distal convoluted tubule Okay, so don't forget these points. Now, after this, what I should teach you? So regarding the aldosterone, in yesterday's class itself, in endocrine itself, I have discussed about the aldosterone. You know better about the aldosterone. Now, uh, aldosterone, everything is, uh, you know, about the aldosterone. Now, here, I want to discuss about little syndrome. Okay, just a uh, two minutes topic. See, okay, let me draw here itself. After distal convoluted tubule, what do we have? After the distal convoluted tubule, you have the collecting tubules or collecting ducts. Okay, now we are having the collecting ducts. Yeah. See, what are these cells? 
these are the collecting dabs so we have cells called as a principal cells these cells are called as a principal cells in between the principal cells what do we have we have the intercalated cells these are the ic cells intercalated cells okay here are the intercalated cells now remember guys this is the aldosterone okay here is the aldosterone aldosterone see it acts on the principal cells when aldosterone see only when aldosterone acts on the principal cells then this principal cells they will start to do what they will start to reabsorb the sodium okay they will start to reabsorb the sodium and potassium is going to be excreted potassium will be excreted sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion potassium excretion then this aldosterone the same aldosterone when it acts on the intercalated cells aldosterone acting on the intercalated cells now do you know what this intercalated cells will do intercalated cells they will excrete the protons intercalated cells are excreting the protons so aldosterone tell me what are the three functions of aldosterone aldosterone helps in sodium reabsorption potassium excretion and a proton excretion excretions now for example see aldosterone is not there okay first of all now i am going to talk about a condition where aldosterone is not there but do you know where is the problem sir this channel the first channel which i am showing you okay this channel is doing over action even without aldosterone it is continuously working do you know what is the name of this channel this channel is called as enac epithelial sodium channel so this epithelial sodium channels they are under the control of aldosterone okay, they are they are under the control of aldosterone whenever aldosterone is not there then automatically inactive activity should go down epithelial sodium channel activity should go down but now do you know what is the problem sir aldosterone is not there first of all there is no aldosterone but there is over activity of epithelial sodium channels Okay, there is overactivity of the epithelial sodium channels. Now tell me what happens. Whenever this epithelial sodium channels, whenever they are acting too much, okay, whenever they are acting so much, what happens? More and more sodium is going to be reabsorbed. The sodium, more and more sodium reabsorption happens. That causes hypernatremia in the body. Hypernatremia and hypertension. More sodium means more tension. Okay, so this syndrome is called as a little syndrome. Okay, let me show you here. One point which I want you to know is sir, there is a syndrome called say overactivity. Epithelial sodium channels, the epithelial sodium channel activity, it's under the control of aldosterone. But overactivity of this epithelial sodium channels, inact channels, will cause a syndrome called as little syndrome. Now done. So why, why I'm telling you this? Because see this little syndrome, your patient is going to have hypertension as well as hypernatremia hypertension and hypernatremia is there now whenever the more and more sodium is being reabsorbed in an exchange for sodium more potassium will go out okay so normally if you look here see this is the collecting duct this is the principal cell on the in the principal cell what is happening sodium reabsorption happens when sodium when this positive charge when the sodium is being reabsorbed that is exchanged for the potassium okay that is exchanged for the potassium so when more sodium reabsorption happens, more potassium excretion will also happen. No, so that's why due to loss of this potassium, due to loss of this excessive potassium, that will cause hypokalemia. Hypokalemia, sir. Okay. So these are some important points about the Liddell syndrome. So Liddell syndrome means simple. Epithelial sodium channels are overacting. So they are reabsorbing more sodium. So there is hypernatremia in the body as well as hypertension. And there is also hypokalemia in the body. The potassium levels are going down. Hypokalemia is there, and the patient will also have alkalosis. The patient will also going, are going to have the metabolic alkalosis. If just by heart depth, that's more than enough. Okay, with this, little syndrome is also completed. Now let's take a small break of five minutes. After the break, let's continue a, a small important topic uh, in the last renal physiology. After that, we'll start a new system. So we have discussed about the. Aldosterone. We have discussed about the aldosterone, how aldosterone is acting on the principal cells. So here you have clearly seen that how aldosterone is acting on the principal cells. When aldosterone is acting on the principal cells, you know about the things. What will happen? Uh, sodium reabsorption happens, potassium excretion as well as the proton excretion in the intercalated cells. This is what happens with the aldosterone. You, you know, in yesterday's like last repetition class also we have discussed about that. Now, after aldosterone, now let's discuss about the antidiuretic hormone. Aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, they are absolutely different. Okay, they are not at all related. Now, this antidiuretic hormone, which is produced, uh, which is released from the posterior pituitary, 
okay <coughs> which is released from the posterior pituitary it is acting on which receptors antidiuretic hormone is acting on the v2 receptors don't forget when antidiuretic hormone is acting on the v2 receptors it uses which secondary messenger it uses camp okay don't forget about that next when the antidiuretic hormone is acting on this principal cells these are the principal cells okay now not aldosterone again i am repeating now it is antidiuretic hormone when antidiuretic hormone is acting on this principal cells it's not about the sodium reabsorption or potassium excretion. Now, water will be reabsorbed. So, under the hormonal influence, okay, under the hormonal influence, water is being reabsorbed with the help of aquaporin 2 channels. This channel name is called as aquaporin 2 channel. So, with the help of aquaporin 2 channels, water is being reabsorbed in the principal cells under the influence of the antidiuretic hormone. So, this type of water reabsorption is called as facultative. Facultative water reabsorption. So, facultative water reabsorption is seen in collecting ducts. Okay. Next, what else you need to know regarding the antidiuretic hormone? So, this antidiuretic hormone, for example, it will be produced in excessive quantities in certain conditions like oat cell cancer of the lung, oat cell cancer or the small cell cancer of the lung. See, this is a type of a lung cancer where it will produce excessive amount of the antidiuretic anti hormone. Okay, more and more antidiuretic hormone is getting produced from this cancer. You see, you can clearly see here there is a cancer which is present over here and it is producing excessive amount of antidiuretic hormone. And there are certain tumors like Kulchitsky cell tumor, okay, Kulchitsky cell tumor or the carcinoid syndrome. See, in all this condition, one thing is very, very much clear. More and more antidiuretic hormone is there. So, the, now because of the excessive amount of the antidiuretic hormone, see, there is increase, hyper increase antidiuretic hormone okay see there is a syndrome in which the antidiuretic hormone is increased and that is called as siadh syndrome where antidiuretic hormone is increased the actual name is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone synthesis but for easy understanding siadh syndrome of increased adh now why there is more adh who is producing the excessive adh by lung cancer, by lung cancer called as a oat cell cancer of the lung or small cell cancer of the lung or carcinoid syndrome or Kulchitsky cell tumor. In all these conditions, the antidiuretic hormone levels are going to be more. So what happens? It causes SIADH. What happens in SIADH? See, this antidiuretic hormone is excessively stimulating the V2 receptor. When this V2 receptor is excessively stimulated, see what is happening to the water reabsorption? More and more water is being reabsorbed. Okay, more and more water is being reabsorbed. So when more and more water reabsorption happens, say reabsorption, what happened to the urine? Less urine, more water is being reabsorbed, so less urine formation or the concentrated urine formation. Now urine is going to be more and more concentrated, not watery urine, concentrated urine. So this is called as SIADH. So in SIADH, the patient is going to have less urine volume, oligouria will be there. Is the urine, is the urine is going to be in a concentrated form and his urine concentration increases, the urine osmolarity increases. But what about the plasma osmolarity decreases, more and more water is being reabsorbed. So, blood is like more liquidy water, right? So, the point which I want you to know is, so in the condition of SIDH, if you look at the urine osmolarity, urine is more concentrated, urine osmolarity increases. If you look at the plasma osmolarity, plasma, how the plasma is? You are putting more water back into your body. So, plasma osmolarity decreases. The plasma concentration decreases. Okay. And as more and more water is being reabsorbed into the body, what happened to the salts in our, in our body? What happened to the salts in our body? They are diluted. So, there is dilutional hyponatremia. Now, my blood is getting diluted away. The salts in my blood are getting diluted away. So, there is a dilutional hyponatremia. So, the important point which I want you to know in, uh, for your exam is, sir, in SIADH. Urine osmolarity increases, plasma osmolarity decreases, and there is a dilutional hyponatremia. Okay, dilutional hyponatremia. That enough. And what is the treatment, sir? What you need to do? Now, as a management, medical management, you can block these receptors. The V2 receptors, you can block them. The V2 receptor blockers like Vaptans are used. So the drug of choice for SIDH is the Vaptans. V2 blockers, Stol Vapton, Kuni Vapton. SIDH is also completed. Okay, in medicine, you will study much more about it, like, you know, investigation of choices, water loading test, I don't want to go in detail about them. In medicine, you can study. If you want to know one point, investigation of choice in SADH is water loading test. Even if you load the water, you ask the person, 
to admit in the hospital you are giving the water you are asking him to drink as much water as possible but even after drinking so much amount of water still he will produce concentrated urine so even after water loading test still he will produce concentrated urine because he is having excessive anti diuretic hormone in her, in his her, her, her body okay so it is causing water reabsorption dilutional hyponatremia plasma osmolarity decreases but urine osmolarity increases okay then sir so the last thing which i want you to know the last uh, like you know a disease which i want you to know is diabetes insipidus what is diabetes insipidus no adh adh simple in a simple way i am telling you okay so anti diuretic hormone is not there why anti diuretic hormone is not there maybe the posterior pituitary posterior pituitary it produces anti diuretic hormone right the posterior pituitary produces anti diuretic hormone it is gone damage to posterior pituitary no anti diuretic hormone if no anti diuretic hormone do you think this v2 receptor is stimulated no v2 receptor is not stimulated if v2 receptor is not stimulated do you think aquaporin 2 channel still function now no the aquaporin 2 channels are not there first of all they are not synthesized okay now whenever the aquaporin 2 channels are not there do you think water reabsorption will happen water reabsorption does not happen all this water is lost in the urine so now the patient is producing more and more urine sir now patient is producing more and more urine understood so in siadh there is no urine in diabetes insipidus there is more urine now please tell me see more and more water is going out into the urine sir so what happened to the urine osmolarity in this condition urine osmolarity decreases okay urine osmolarity decreases it means urine concentration urine concentration decreases why because urine is totally diluted away urine osmolarity decreases but what happened to the plasma osmolarity what happened to the plasma concentration you are losing the fluids out of the body so plasma is getting concentrated so plasma osmolarity increases okay now what about the sodium concentration in the body the patient is losing the water the patient is losing the fluid out of the body so what happened to the plasma plasma is getting concentrated so the salts in our blood the salts in our blood are also getting concentrated so there is increased sodium concentration okay actually sodium is not getting increased relatively the fluids are going out no so relatively the plasma is getting concentrated okay there is hypernatremia blood osmolarity increases urine osmolarity decreases okay so these are the points which i want you to know and uh, here the types of types of diabetes insipidus already i have uh, explained you one type the one type where see which is called as a central diabetes insipidus what is central central means something related to the brain so in central diabetes insipidus the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland the posterior pituitary they are gone okay they are damaged so no anti diuretic hormone simple when no anti diuretic hormone no v2 receptor stimulation no v2 receptor stimulation no anti uh, no aquaporin 2 no aquaporin 2 no water reabsorption all water into the urine more urine diluted urine the patient is having like almost like a diarrhea but not from the jat but from the urinary tract okay so kind of similar to like you know more and more water is going out of the body that's happening in the diabetes insipidus next problem is uh, here let me tell you here itself this was the question asked if i am the person imagine uh, my hypothalamus is damaged or my posterior pituitary is damaged so no anti diuretic hormone in my body so more and more diuresis more and more urine loss so now tell me what is the treatment the treatment is replace anti diuretic hormone with the desmopressin inhalational so inhalational desmopressin puffs will come so desmopressin is the drug of choice for the treatment of central diabetes insipidus okay central diabetes insipidus the next type is are anti diuretic hormone is there no problem with the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland anti diuretic hormone is there but there is some problem at the level of the kidneys the v2 receptors are gone the v2 receptors are mutated okay now gone v2 receptors are gone so there is v2 receptor resistance so yes adh is there but it is not functional now it is no longer useful because v2 receptor is gone so the second type of diabetes insipidus is called as a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus where the problem lies in the nephrons Okay, where the problem lies at the level of the nephrons. Now, they will ask you, taking which drug? There is this one antipsychotic drug called as the lithium, which is a it's, which is a mood stabilizer. Okay, it is used in the bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. So, this lithium, if you take this lithium, the mood stabilizer, it can result in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. It will cause damage to the V2 receptors, so the patient will have diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and even drugs like amphotericin B. 
can cause an effervescent diabetes insipidus that will lead to a V2 receptor resistance. Now, what is the treatment, sir? MCQ. The treatment is MC, uh, like you know, the treatment is the MCQ thing. So, central diabetes insipidus, the treatment is done with the desmopressin. Okay, central diabetes insipidus, the treatment is done with the desmopressin. But for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the treatment is done with the help of drugs like thiazide diuretics. Okay, so thiazide diuretics are used in the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And don't forget, thiazide diuretics acts on which part of the nephron? Thiazide diuretics are used, okay, thiazide diuretics, they are used uh, to block the sodium chloride symporter. They are used to block the they are used to block the sodium chloride symporter on the distal convoluted tubule. Okay. Next. So this is also completed. Next. What I want you to know. Sir, in the real physiology, uh, the next place where you can expect an MCQ is from the acid base balance. Okay, acid base balance. Every time this question will come. Now let me directly show you the question, first of all. The kidneys, your beautiful kidneys, they play a role in maintenance of the acid base balance. They play a very important role in the maintenance of the acid base balance. Okay. My, my point is, see guys, now my point is, whenever you suffer with acidosis, and right now you are suffering with acidosis, acidosis means what? The pH in your body, normal, a normal body pH is how much? 7.35 to 7.45 is your normal pH. Okay, this is your normal pH. If your pH is becoming less than 7.35, then it is called as acidosis, acidosis. Now, your pH is becoming more than 7.45, then it is called as alkalosis. Simple, first keep this point in your mind. Normal pH range is 7.35 to 7.45. If your pH is becoming less than 7.35, then it is called as acidosis. If your pH is becoming more than 7.45, then it is called as alkalosis. Acidosis as well as the alkalosis. Okay. Now, right now imagine yourself in acidosis. Right now you are having acidosis. Huh? Your kidneys have to help you know in maintenance of the acid base balance. Acidosis is not good. That can actually kill you. So whenever you suffer with acidosis, now this intercalated cells, this IC cells, intercalated cells, do you know what they will do? So during acidosis, the intercalated cell type is called as the alpha intercalated cell. Now this alpha intercalated cell, see here what it is doing. It is excreting the acids out of the body. This is the urine side. Okay. So into the urine, more and more acids are excreting. So alpha intercalated cells are called as the acid excreting cells. During acidosis, we don't want the acids in our body. We don't want the protons. Get rid of the protons. Okay. And during alkalosis, okay, see, the, now the intercalated cell type is going to switch to beta configuration. Now this is the beta intercalated cell. These are the beta intercalated cells. So beta intercalated cells during alkalosis. What they will do now? They are excreting. See into the urine, they are excreting the bases. So beta intercalated cells, they are base excreting cells. So the point which I want to put into your mind is, sir, alpha intercalated cell type is seen during acidosis. Alpha intercalated cells are acid excreting cells. During alkalosis, okay, during alkalosis, the type of intercalated cell that one you can see is the beta intercalated cell. The beta intercalated cells are base excreting cells, are bicarbonate excreting cells. Okay, during alkalosis, we don't want any bases. Already we are having alkalosis. So, get rid of the bases. Okay, this is the one important point I want you to know. Intercalated cells excrete acids as well as bases. Okay, based on the situation, whether it is alkalosis or acidosis. Now, after this, what I want you to know is, next thing is anion gap. Okay, anion gap. Then what is this, what is the concept of anion gap? Simple, remember, in your body, positive charges are there? Yes, sir. Negative charges are there? Yes, sir. Actually, the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges are equal in number. Okay? So, the major positive charge is represented in the form of sodium. Okay? The positive charges are represented in the form of sodium. And negative charges, the major negative charges are two. One is bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, and a chloride. Okay? The major things, major things. See, sodium concentration in your body is 140. Minus, so positive, 140 is positive value. Okay, sodium is positive charge. So, 140 minus, HCO3 how much? HCO3 is 25. And chloride, 105. Milliequivalents per liter. 
105 means 105 milli equivalents per liter, uh, 25 milli equivalents per, per liter, 140 milli equivalents per liter, something like that. So 140 minus 25 plus 105. How much? 25 plus 105. It is 130. And 140. So 140 minus 130 is 10 milli equivalents per liter. This is a one single hard value. Now, but the usual range will be 8 to 16 milli equivalents per liter. So there is a gap. This gap is coming, right? What I have taught you, I have taught you in the beginning. Okay, I have taught you in the beginning that the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges are equal. But when you do the calculation, when you do the calculation, sodium minus the positive charges minus the negative charges, there is this gap coming. This gap is called as anion gap. Now they will ask you, sir, positive charges and negative charges, their value is same, no. But why here it is showing that the positive charges are more in number, like 10, 10 units more, no. Why it is showing more in number? It is because this anion gap, see normal anion gap according to most of the Indian books, it is 8 to 16 milli equivalents liter. But according to like, you know, some other like, you know, international books, it is 8 to 12 milli equivalents per liter. But anything is the same thing. Okay. 8 to 16, 8 to 12 milli equivalents per liter is a normal anion gap. It should be considered as a normal anion gap. Okay. Now, they will ask you why this anion gap is because of what? Simply remember, like, you know, these points. The anion gap is because of unmeasured anions. Certain anions you cannot measure in your body. Like HCO3 minus, like chloride. You cannot measure certain negative charges in your body. So, anion gap is because of unmeasurable anions, like plasma proteins. So, plasma proteins are negative charges, but you can count them. No, you cannot count them. So, because of the unmeasured anions, there is this anion gap and lactate, keto acids, which are produced in the body, the keto acid, like, you know, keto acids production during ketoacidosis and lactic acid production during anaerobic glycolysis. So because of the, these are all negative things. These are all anions. Anion means negative charges. Because of this unmeasured anions, you are having a normal anion gap of 8 to 16 milli equivalents per liter or uh, uh, 8 to 12 milli equivalents per liter. 8 to 16 according to Indian books, 8 to 12 according to the fun books. Now, the reason why I am discussing about this anion gap is because every time, this uh, one question is like, you know, kept on, they will ask you. Okay, this is an internet, I have taken this from an international book, that's why, see here it was given 8 to 12 milli equivalents per liter, but Indian books, 8 to 16, 16 milli equivalents per liter, that's okay. See, this normal anion gap, it's divided into two, uh, like, you know, this metabolic acidosis, look here. Metabolic acidosis, the acidosis in our body, it was actually divided into two types. Okay, acidosis, not about the alkalosis. Metabolic acidosis is divided into two types. See, normal anion gap acidosis, high anion gap acidosis, high anion gap. Increase means high. Okay, high anion gap metabolic acidosis. High anion gap metabolic acidosis. And what is this one? This is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So, metabolic acidosis is how many types? Two types. Normal anion gap, high anion gap. Egma, nagma. So, only here, I am not going in detail. Why? Remember these examples. These examples is ultimate. So, what are the examples of normal anion gap acidosis? Okay. So, especially here I want you to know, renal tubular acidosis in your medicine you would have studied. Sir, RTA, renal tubular acidosis is an example of normal anion gap acidosis, sir. If the patient is suffering with diarrhea or vomitings, okay, diarrhea or vomitings, he will have normal anion gap acidosis. At least these two I want you to know. Okay, but in which conditions the anion gap increases, the patient is suffering with acidosis, okay. Not only the patient is suffering with acidosis, but the anion gap is also increased. Which conditions, at least, at least I want you to know, if the patient is suffering with lactic acidosis or diabetic ketoacidosis, okay, uh, renal failure, uh, methanol poisoning, okay, these things, uh, glycol, like, you know, glycols, uh, this ethylene glycol, polypropylene glycol, see, if the, the patient consumes, like, you know, by mistake, the accidentally, something like that. So, lactic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, renal failure, uh, this glycols, all of them, they will cause high anion gap metabolic acidosis, nagma. But what are the examples of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, nagma? It is simple, sir. Two things, vomitings, diarrhea. Okay, sorry, vomitings, diarrhea, as well as RTA, renal tubular acidosis. If you can remember other things, yes, excellent. If you can remember, you can remember. Okay. And 
in some of the exams okay in some of the indian exams they will give you this uh, like you know this uh, uh, chart okay this is called as a davenport's diagram see this davenport's diagram first concentrate on the x axis okay concentrate on the x axis see this is the median 7.35 to 7.45 this is the normal range the 7.4 here i am giving this is the normal ph after 7.4 you know it is alkalosis so that's why you see here also alkalosis here also alkalosis everywhere it is alkalosis only after 7.45 it is alkalosis before that before that 7.45 or i should say before 7.35 the values are all acidosis if you move towards this side it's all acidosis 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 first make sure if you, they will simply make a mark like this what is happening in this area they will ask you so that's why first what you should know what you should see is after 7.4 5 there is alkalosis after 7.45 there is alkalosis before 7.35 there is acidosis remember uh, like you know there is this uh, mnemonic like rima mere okay see here re ma like you know girl name right h is mine h is mera something like right so re ma you just keep rima here also mera or mere okay so what i'm trying to put into your mind is if you simply take a graph like this let's take this as a median point okay 7.4 okay 7.4 in your exam they will give you an x something like this or an x something like this okay they will ask you what is happening here or what is happening here what is happening here or what is happening here they will ask you now you know after 7.4 what you should write alkalosis uh, here here also alkalosis alk yeah, but here it is acidosis acidosis what is the mnemonic i have given you re ma me re something like this so now if they ask you what is happening in this x area now you know it is a metabolic alkalosis if they ask you what is happening in this area it is respiratory right so respiratory alkalosis now here it is respiratory acidosis and here it is metabolic acidosis okay i'm just giving you a simple way to like you know uh, answer the mcqs okay so this one so this is the davenport diagram which is the needed very much important for your exam what is the normal anion gap 8 to 16 mi 8 to 16 milli equivalents per liter okay and anion gap is because of unmeasured anions like plasma proteins keto acids lactic acids how many types of uh, metabolic acidosis is there two types normal anion gap metabolic acidosis and high anion gap metabolic acidosis normal anion gap metabolic acidosis examples are renal tubular acidosis vomiting diarrhea high anion gap metabolic acidosis are glycols intake of the glycols uh, lactic acidosis diabetic ketoacidosis okay at least those things i want you to know and the renal failure many things are there okay renal failure lactates so many things so is that okay guys is it okay so with this this is done remember barter syndrome and gridelman syndrome even in medicine also they will be integrated and pediatrics also they will be integrated okay barter and gridelman syndromes both are causing severe dehydration in the baby both barter and gridelman they will cause severe dehydration severe uh, how to say hypotension but little syndrome little syndrome it is causing hypertension we have discussed about the little syndrome right i don't again here i have shown you uh this one little syndrome little syndrome over action over activity i have shown you little syndrome means over activity okay so here anyway see epithelial sodium channel activity is under the control of aldosterone but over activity of the epithelial sodium channels will cause little syndrome more sodium reabsorption that will cause hypertension so little syndrome is a disorder of hypertension but barter and gitelman see barter and gitelman they are the syndromes of hypertension okay so with this it is completed and i forgot to mention how to treat this uh, little syndrome little syndrome is treated with the help of a drug called as amyloride amyloride okay what is this amyloride simply are right, look here normally what is this channel this is the epithelial sodium channel right enac the epithelial sodium channel it's under the control of which hormone aldosterone okay aldosterone so now with this epithelial sodium channel enac if it is working too much if it is working too much it will cause little syndrome it is going to cause little syndrome so now you can block this 
in little syndrome you can block these channels with the help of a drug called as amyloride so amyloride is a drug which will block the epithelial sodium channels so sodium reabsorption decreases okay yeah, simple like that so with this all the important topics which i want you to know completed now so just as a revision just 5 minutes revision okay just check yourself medullary hyperosmolarity is created by whom who created the medullary hyperosmolarity can you tell me who created the medullary hyperosmolarity sir the medullary hyperosmolarity is created by counter current multiplier system who maintains the medullary hyperosmolarity counter current exchanger system with the help of vasa recta okay vasa recta loop diuretics acts on which part of the nephron ascending limb of loop of henle loop diuretics blocks which transporter sodium potassium two chloride symporter loop diuretics relationship with the calcium loop diuretics increases the calcium excretion okay loop diuretics increases the calcium excretion but what about the thiazide diuretics thiazide diuretics decreases the calcium excretion rather increases the calcium absorption thiazide diuretics acts on which part of the nephron distal convoluted tubule okay distal convoluted tubule blocks the sodium chloride symporter can you guys tell me what is the drug of choice for central diabetes insipidus? Central diabetes insipidus, the drug of choice is desmopressin. For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, the drug of choice is thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics. Which antipsychotic drug? Which antipsychotic drug will cause a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Lithium. Lithium. A mood stabilizer which will lead to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Next. Guys, can you tell me where exactly the macula densa is located? The macula densa. The macula densa, sir, it is located in the thick ascending limb of, thick part of the ascending limb of loop of Henle. If you don't find that answer, thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, then you can answer the best part is a junction between a thick ascending limb of loop of Henle as well as the digital convoluted tubule, digital convoluted tubule. Okay. So, these are the points which I want you to know. Done. See, someone is asking water reabsorption in the PCT, how much, sir? Water reabsorption in the PCT is 70%. 70% sodium, sodium chloride reabsorption, 70% water reabsorption. Okay? Now, in the next half an hour, this is a very small topic. The gastrointestinal system is a very, very small topic. In the next half an hour, let's do the gastrointestinal system physiology. Now, please tell me, how many layers are there in the JAT? There are four layers, sir. Even small children know there are four layers. Four layers are there in the JAT. What are they? Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis and serosa. There are four layers in the JAT. Which layer is the strongest layer? Submucosa is strongest layer. Okay, the submucosa is the strongest layer in the JAT. Okay, next. Serosa, it is absent in. Serosa is absent in which layer? Serosa is absent in esophagus. Okay, serosa is absent in the esophagus. Done, sir. Now, in the muscular layer, there is a nerve plexus present. Okay, in muscular layer, there is a nerve plexus present. Okay, if you if you want me to show, see, see these, these are the muscles, right? These are the muscles. Now, in this muscular layer, are you able to appreciate all these nerves? Nerves are there, right? So, what is the name of this nerve plexus called as? This nerve plexus, here you can see, it's called as the myentric plexus or the arbex plexus. And even in the submucosa, this whitish area is the submucosa. Even in the submucosa, you can see this nerve network. This nerve network is called as, let me write here, in the submucosa, there is a nerve network called as Meissner's plexus. Okay. In the muscular layer, there is myenteric plexus. Okay, myenteric plexus. Myenteric plexus helps in GI motility. Okay, GAT motility, GAT contractions. Okay, GAT contractions. This Meissner's plexus, this Meissner's plexus, it is helped in what? GAT contractions. So the Meissner's plexus also called as the submucosal plexus. It is present in the submucosa, right? So it's also called as the submucosal plexus. It helps in GI secretions. So now tell me, Meissner's plexus is present in submucosa. So that's why it is also called as the submucosal plexus. Meissner's plexus helps in GI secretions. 
in the muscular layer which plexus is present or back plexus or myentric plexus is present okay so this myentric plexus is helping in what so this myentric plexus is helping in the GIT motility or GA contractions or peristalsis Erosa, it is absent in the esophagus and the strongest layer is submucosa. Okay. Then here is trunk disease. See, now normally, uh, let me uh, tell you, this is a very important thing. When you are an embryo, when you are an embryo, so the neural tube is forming. Okay. When you are at an embryo state, okay. When you are a developing fetus, you are having a neural tube. Surrounding this neural tube, there are cells called as a neural crest cells. Okay. Neural crest cells. These are the neural crest cells. Neural crest. Okay. Neural crest cells. So, these are the neural crest cells. They are migrated to the GIT. Now, in the GIT, okay, in the GIT, they form the my myentric plexus. Okay. Myentric plexus as well as the mesmer's plexus. So, the point which I want you to know is the neural crest cells, the neural crest cells, they will undergo migration, neural crest cell migration. So, because of this neural crest cell migration into the GIT, myentric plexus and mesonous plexus are formed. Okay, both myentric and mesonous plexus are formed. Now, what if this migration does not happen? So, right here, defect. Defect in neural Crest cell migration will lead to a disease called as Hirschsprung disease. Okay, so if this defect is there, do you think now the myentric plexus and mesonous plexus are present in that part of the GIT? No. So you are going to have a ganglionic segment. Means in that particular part of GIT, no mesonous plexus, no myentric plexus. So if you look under the microscope, you cannot see any myentric plexus and mesonous plexus. So that is called as a ganglionic segment are you getting so neural crest cell migration doesn't happen so mesonous plexus myentric plexus are not formed not formed so leading to what a ganglionic segment now in this uh, uh, this his disease this GAT abnormality okay this GAT abnormality it is associated with which chromosomal abnormality it is associated with a condition called as downs in Rome. Okay. So, if a patient is suffering with a Down syndrome, that is a trisomy 21. Okay. The Down syndrome is trisomy 21, right? So, this the Down's babies, they are at a risk of developing Hirschsprung disease where the patient is having defect in the neural crystal migration leading to a ganglionic segment. A ganglionic segment. Okay. So, these are some important points which I want you to know. Next, after this, what else you should know? Say, some basic important points are in your GIT, in your throughout GIT, the most acidic secretion, the most acidic secretion in your GIT is HCL in the stomach. HCL in your stomach is the most acidic secretion. And what's the most basic secretion? The most basic secretion in your body is most of the students will think that it's a bile or it's a pancreatic juice. No, the most basic secretion is Brunner gland secretions. Okay, now you will get it out. What are these Brunner glands, sir? Brunner glands, see here, Brunner glands, they are the mucus producing glands in the duodenum. In the duodenum, these Brunner glands will produce the mucus, which is rich in the bicarbonates. So, they are more alkaline. The more alkaline secretion or most basic secretion is a Brunner gland secretion. Most acidic secretion, the most acidic secretion is the HCL, gastric secretion. Okay, completed. And some basic important things, maximum water reabsorption. The maximum water reabsorption happens in which part of the nephron? Most of the students will think like uh, it's in the colon. Yes, in colon, water reabsorption happens, no doubt. But in the jejunum, maximum water reabsorption, maximum absorption, maximum digestion happens in the jejunum. Okay, and done. So after this, some important points about the salivary glands. Okay, only like go through whatever I'm highlighting. There are so many points. I don't want you to remember all these things. Only remember those points which are needed for your exams. Okay, I'm touching only those points which are needed for your exams. What is the major salivary gland? Saliva is produced by the salivary glands. Okay, what is the major salivary gland? Submandibular. It's not the parotid. Most of the students will think parotid gland is the major salivary gland. No, submandibular salivary gland is the major salivary gland. Okay, next. Uh, in the saliva, which enzymes are present? 
in the saliva the two types of enzymes are present okay not three types only two types of enzymes are present one enzyme for the carbohydrate digestion so carbohydrate digesting enzymes are present and lipid digesting enzymes are present but protein digesting enzymes are not there in the saliva mcq in the saliva which digestive enzymes are not there proteases are the protein digesting enzymes are not there in the saliva and if you are like you know if you are not a, a big uh, like you know if you are not a beginner if you have gone through a previous fmg attempts you know how much important this question is sir what is salivary amylase or thialin thialin or salivary amylase is carbohydrate digesting enzyme okay so in your saliva there is something called as a thialin which will help in the digestion of the carbohydrates and in your saliva there is something called as a lingual lipase okay lingual lipase who produces this lingual lipase there is a gland called as ebner's gland Okay, Ebner's gland. Now you will get it out, sir. What are these Ebner's glands? These are minor. These are minor salivary glands. Okay, not the major salivary glands like parotid, submandibular, sublingual. These are the major things, right? So there are small, small salivary glands are also, which are called the minor salivary glands or Ebner's gland. So this Ebner's gland produces the lingual lipase, helps in the digestion of lipids. Completed. Next, after this, what else you should know? Parotid gland. Parotid gland. It is producing saliva, okay, but this parotid gland is innervated by we write p something like this so reverse the p reverse the p it will become nine so ninth cranial nerve the glossopharyngeal nerve is the motor innervation so parotid salivary gland is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve okay done next other salivary glands other major salivary glands that's a submandibular salivary gland and sublingual salivary gland they are surrounded they are innervated by which cranial nerves s for s so submandibular and sublingual salivary glands they are innervated by the seventh Okay, they are innervated by the seventh cranial nerve. Simple. Parotid gland is innervated by the ninth cranial nerve. Sublingual and submandibular salivary glands are innervated by the ninth cranial nerve. Okay. And one more important point which I want you to know is salivary glands. We are talking about the salivary glands. Which virus affects the salivary glands? The paramyxovirus or the mumps virus. Mumps virus belonging to the paramyxoviridae family. So this mumps virus is going to affect your salivary glands. Salivary glands. Not only the salivary glands will be affected because of this paramyxovirus. In boys, testis. In boys, testis and in females, ovaries. So that's why a male can suffer with. If I am, uh, imagine there is a, this one person, one person who is suffering with mumps. Especially children will suffer with all this. So there is this one boy who is having inflammation in his cheek. Okay, the patient is having perotitis. Perotitis, inflammation in the cheek, painful cheeks. And the boy is also going to present to the clinic with the pain in the testis. That's the architis. Or the female, that is the ophritis. So, the patient can have testicular involvement and the ovarian involvement. That is the architis, inflammation of the testis. Architis or ophritis. Okay, architis or ophritis, inflammation of testis. Next, sir, what is? So, in the saliva, you should know which antibody is present in saliva. There is IgA antibody present, MCQ. And some basic points. See in the saliva, S for S, maximum potassium secretion, maximum potassium is being secreted into which body fluid? Saliva, S for S, saliva for secretion. And, but if they ask you, maximum potassium is present, maximum potassium concentration, C for C, maximum potassium concentration is present in which bodily fluids? Colonic, like you know, fluids. So in the colonic fluids, you are having the maximum potassium concentration but maximum potassium secretion into which body fluid saliva Done. okay after this sir now this is your beautiful stomach okay look at your stomach this is your beautiful stomach now if i take a small biopsy from the stomach and i'm showing you and this is how your stomach looks like okay so what you are able to appreciate here sir you are having glands you are having this beautiful glands sir. okay you are having this beautiful glands so these are called as the gastric glands Okay, these are called as the gastric glands. The point which I want you to know is, sir, see, different, different color cells are present, different, different type cells are present. Okay, am I right or not? So, in a gastric gland, there are different types of cells. Right now, I am talking about the stomach. In your stomach, okay, there are these gastric glands present. The gastric glands are made up of different types of cells. So, different, different cells produce different, different substances. Okay, as simple as that. So, look here. In your gastric gland, there is a mucus next cell present. What it will produce? Sir, first I should write one, one is missing over here. That is called as a surface mucus cell. Surface mucus. 
cell. Okay, surface mucus cell. Surface mucus cell means this cell. You see on the top, on the topmost area, the surface mucus cell. So this surface mucus cell is going to produce what? Mucus, no doubt. The surface mucus cell is also called as foveolar cell. Foveolar cell. Okay, done. Surface mucus cell, also called as a foveolar cell, helps in production of mucus in the stomach. So remember, lifetime, remember, in your stomach, Mucus is not produced by goblet cells. 90% of the students will think, ah, goblet cells are producing the mucus, sir. No. Goblet cells are producing the mucus in the intestines, not in the stomach. Who produces the mucus in the stomach? It's the foveolar cells or the surface mucus cells. And even the neck mucus cells, this will also, neck mucus cell, he will also produce the mucus. But this neck mucus cell, it acts like a stem cell. This is the MCQ. What is the stem cell in the gastric mucosa? This is a mucus and neck cell, mucus neck cell. Uh, okay, now look here, parietal cells. Parietal cells produces what? Parietal cells produces the acid. Parietal cells are also called as oxyntic cells. Okay, so parietal cells are oxyntic cells produces the acid as well as the vitamin, oh, sorry, not vitamin. So it produces the intrinsic factor. So this intrinsic factor helps in absorption of vitamin B12. In which region? Terminal ileum. Okay, terminal ileum. So, parietal cells, they produce the intrinsic factor, helps in the absorption of vitamin B12. The vitamin B12 is absorbed in the terminal ileum. Important point about the vitamin B12, vitamin B12 is only having, from biochemistry, very, very important. It's the only vitamin which have only animal source. Means you can get only vitamin B12 from the animal sources only, from milk, curd, ghee or meat, kind of. Next, uh, the interchromaffin like cells. The interchromaffin like cells in the gastric gland, they produce something called as histamine. So this histamine, it will go and again act on the parietal cells. This histamine will go and act on the parietal cells. See, this histamine will go and act on the parietal cells. So now parietal cells will produce the HCL. Okay. Next, teeth cells. Teeth cells produces what? Two substances. Teeth cells produces anyone? Think, think. Teeth cells. What will produce, sir? Pepti. No, gen. Okay, chief cells produces pepsinogen as well as gastric lipase. Okay, pepsinogen as well as the gastric lipase are going to be produced by the chief cells. And D cells produces the somatostatin. Somatostatin. And what is the function of the somatostatin? Somatostatin decreases the acid production. Wherever you see somatostatin, it decreases everything. Okay, and last one, G cells. G cells in the gastric gland. G cells in the gastric gland. They produce this gastrin. Okay. So what this gastrin will do? Gastrin will act on the parietal cells. So parietal cells will produce the acid. Okay. So I understood. So now I am highlighting this. Histamine, it acts on the parietal cells. Gastrin acts on the parietal cells. Helps in the production of acid. So if this is the parietal cell. Now look here. This, see I am showing you. This is a parietal cell. So who is stimulating the parietal cell to produce the acid? See, first of all, this is the parietal cell. How can we say this is the parietal cell? See, it is producing the acid here. Okay, it is producing the acid. So what are the stimulations for the parietal cell? See, one, I have already taught you gastrin from G cells. It's a stimulus. And histamine from enterochromaffin like cells. Okay, see, histamine from enterochromaffin like cells and gastrin from G cells, they are the stimulus for the acid release. Okay, but one more thing is there. One more stimulus is acetylcholine, parasympathetic neurotransmitter. So acetylcholine, histamine and gastrin, they are all the stimulus for the parietal cells to release the acid. Okay, you got it? So these are the points which I want you to know, sir. Okay, so now... If you want to decrease acid, for example, right now I am suffering with acidity, okay, gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, okay, I am suffering with gastroesophageal reflux disease, or I am having ulcers in my stomach, okay, that is a peptic ulcer disease, PUD. Now, what you need to do, you need to decrease the acid, you need to decrease the acid, how can you decrease the acid, sir? How can you decrease the acid? See, you can block these receptors, histamine receptors, one of the powerful stimulus, right? So, you can block these histamine receptors. So if you decrease, if you block the histamine receptors, acid production decreases. So histamine receptor blockers, look here. Histamine receptor blockers are H2 blockers. H2 means receptor. This name of this receptor, see, the name of this receptor is H2 receptor. Histamine H2 receptor. You can block this H2 receptor. So drugs like ranitidine and cimetidine, they are the H2 blockers. What they will do, sir? They will decrease the acid. They will decrease the acid production. 
Okay, done. Next point is the look here. This parietal cell it is producing acid. Okay, this parietal cell is producing the acid. Okay, acid. But from which pump? There is this pump called as a proton pump. So with via the proton pump, acid is being released. You can block this proton pump so that acid release decreases. So if for most of this acid related problems like gastric esophageal reflux disease or peptic ulcer disease or a condition called as Zollinger Ellison syndrome. I hope you have shared this in your medicine, which is called as Zollinger Ellison syndrome, where more acid will be produced in the stomach because of a gastrinoma. Because of a gastrinoma, more acid will be produced. So in all these conditions, the drug of choice is proton pump inhibitors. So proton pump inhibitors are the drug of choice for conditions like peptic ulcer disease, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, what are the examples of proton pump inhibitors? Omeprazole, pantaprazole, and ismoprazole. Okay, omeprazole, pantaprazole, and ismoprazole. These are the proton pump inhibitors. Okay, these are the proton pump inhibitors. Okay. Is that clear, guys? Now, after that, this is the image-based question. Guys, can you tell me what is this image-based question? Here, I'm showing you the stomach. This is the stomach. I'm just cut, cutting, open, uh, cutting, open, uh, cutting open the stomach and I'm showing you. Can you tell me? Okay, can you tell me? What is the problem with this? This image-based question. So this disease is called as anyone? Start with the letter M. Anyone? Guys, have you ever seen this image? This is a very important image, especially for the exams. This disease is called as many triads disease. Okay, this disease is called as a many triads disease. Image based question. Why I am taking about this here in physiology is because, sir, we have said about the foveolar cells, the mucus producing cells in the stomach, so the foveolar cells. If this foveolar cells, they undergo hyperplasia, foveolar cell hyperplasia. Okay, so foveolar cell hyperplasia that will cause a disease called as many triads disease. Okay, in my, for example, imagine I am having so much acid production. So what happened to the foveolar cells? They will undergo hyperplasia to produce more mucus. So when the foveolar cells, when they undergo hyperplasia, they, because of this foveolar cell hyperplasia, now you will have brainy appearance or we will say the word cerebriform appearance of the gastric mucosa. Now the gastric mucosa is appearing like a brain. Okay. So this is called as cerebriform. <laughs> Now, this is called as a cerebriform appearance, okay, cerebriform appearance of the gastric mucosa, which is called as a mini disease, okay. See here. Next, sir. What else you should know? Uh, I'm just trying to integrate. This is the parietal cell, right? This is the parietal cell, which produces the acid. Now, you should know that this parietal cell not only produces the acid, okay, this parietal cell, it not only produces the acid, it also produces the intrinsic factor. Okay. Now, there is a condition where the patient is producing antibodies. See, the patient is producing antibodies means autoimmune disease. These parietal cells at the end of the day are getting damaged. The parietal cells are neutralized. Okay, gone. Damaged. Can you tell me what is an, uh, what is this disease called as? So this disease is called as pernicious anemia. What is this pernicious anemia? Pernicious anemia means autoimmune disease where the antibodies are directed against the parietal cells. The parietal cells gone. Yeah, parietal cells are gone. When the parietal cells are gone, do you think acid production will be there? No, sir. There is decreased acid production, decrease HCL. When the parietal cells are gone, do you think intrinsic factor will be there? Intrinsic factor is also not there. Whenever intrinsic factor is not there, do you think vitamin B12 will be absorbed? Vitamin B12 absorption decreases. When vitamin B12 is not there, what will happen? That will cause megaloblastic anemia. Okay, the patient is going to now suffer with the megaloblastic anemia. So, this is the MCQ. Okay, pernicious anemia characterized by severe lack of intrinsic factor. The patient is going to have the megaloblastic anemia. Okay, and in one of the exams, this question has been asked. Uh, this pernicious anemia, we don't know the reason why. The pernicious anemia is especially seen in blood group A persons. Okay, blood group A persons. Now, one more thing. Are, okay, even if it takes some time, but it is uh, worth uh, knowing. Or imagine, I am the person who is suffering with Okay, uh, pernicious anemia. Okay, right now I am suffering with pernicious anemia. What happens? I am producing antibodies. These antibodies are coming and destroying my parietal cells. Parietal cells gone. No acid. Whenever there is no acid in my body, what happened to my gastric levels? 
gastrin levels are raising are no acid like the g cells are producing more and more gastrin so that at least gastrin will come and stimulate the parietal cells but parietal cells are gone so what happened to the gastrin levels gastrin level increases okay body want to produce the acid somehow so body is releasing more and more gastrin but there are no parietal cells so in a patient who is suffering with pernicious anemia if you look at the gastrin the serum gastrin levels are elevated okay the serum gastrin levels are very much high okay now after this what else you should know for your exams sir in the stomach which enzymes are getting produced sir in the stomach gastric lipases are there okay gastric lipases are there okay so in the stomach yeah in the in the stomach gastric lipases are there which will help in the digestion of the lipids okay which will help in the digestion of the lipids and pepsinogen is there who is producing pepsinogen you, we know we have discussed that the chief cells chief cells produces the pepsinogen pepsinogen helps pe pepsinogen later will be converted into pepsin helps in the digestion of proteins okay pepsinogen is there so pepsinogen helps in the digestion of proteins done but re remember in saliva there is no enzyme for protein digestion in the same way in the stomach there is no enzyme for uh, in the, there is no enzyme for carbohydrate digestion true so there are no amylases okay so in the stomach no enzyme for carbohydrate digestion mcq gone like no done next you can ask me sir pepsinogen okay pepsinogen is produced by the chief cells in the gastric uh, glands chief cells produce the pepsinogen pepsinogen ogen it's an inactive form pepsinogen need to be converted into pepsin who converts pepsinogen to pepsin it's cl So pepsinogen is converted into pepsin. Uh, pepsinogen is converted into pepsin by HCl. Yeah. Next, next important area which you need to know. Now uh, we can eat these things like carbohydrate-rich food. As Indians, uh, we can eat the carbohydrate-rich food, especially South Indians. What do we eat? Idli. See, you just try yourself. Try eating carbohydrate-rich food like idli, and try eating protein-rich food like meat, and try eating uh, fat-rich food like pizza. like you know which is with the, with the full of cheese okay now which substances do you think will stay in your stomach for a long time idli is a very soft thing so carbohydrate rich things are carbohydrate rich foods will have fast gastric emptying the food will move from stomach into the duodenum very quickly within just 2 hours the food will move from the stomach into the duodenum so that's the gastric emptying the moment of the food from the stomach into the duodenum is called as a gastric emptying so carbohydrate rich foods have fast gastric emptying okay followed by proteins followed by fats okay if you eat proteins they are going to stay in your stomach for a long time if you take fats they are going to stay in your uh, in your stomach for almost half the day okay so the gastric emptying time is very less for if they ask you gastric emptying time is i should say uh, i should say in this way gastric emptying is fastest for carbohydrates okay so gastric emptying time is very less for carbohydrates gastric emptying time is more for lipids okay so with this the topic is also completed next what else you should know regarding the gastric secretions see the acid which is getting produced in my stomach it is not happening just like that in one in, during one particular period most of the students will think whenever you eat, whenever you eat then only acid will be produced no it's not something like that even if you think about the food right now i am thinking about some delicious food acid production have started so whenever something happening in your brain that is a cephalic phase whenever you think about the food whenever you smell the food whenever you look at the food yes 10 uh, sorry 30% of the acid going is going to be produced in the stomach okay 30% of the acid is going to be produced in your stomach just with the thought of food or smell of food or looking at the food okay so vagus nerve will be activated the parasympathetic nerve on the vagus nerve will be activated okay that produces the 30% of the acid and when you actually eat the food you have gone to the restaurant and now you are eating or you went to your home home and you are you are eating so whenever you eat the food then in the stomach gastrin will be produced and this gastrin mainly will help in the production of acid gastrin is of course gastrin histamine acetylcholine all but mainly gastrin so gastrin will help in the production of more acid 60% of the acid when you eat the food 60% of acid is produced when you think about the food 30% of the acid is produced so even after see even after the food is going into the intestines some amount of acid will be produced 10 10% so that is called as intestinal phase of gastric acid secretion so how much 10% okay so you should know 
30, 60, 10. Cephalic phase, gastric phase, intestinal phase. 30%, 60%, 10%. Completed. Now, after this, next important MCQs. Absorption, absorption of substances and their important sites. Iron. Where it is absorbed, sir? Iron is absorbed in duodenum. Where B9 is absorbed? Vitamin B9 is absorbed in jejunum. Okay. Where vitamin B12 is absorbed? Vitamin B12 is absorbed in terminal ileum. Okay. Terminal ileum. So, iron in the duodenum. Vitamin B9 is absorbed in the jejunum. Vitamin B12, it is absorbed in the terminal ileum. Now, from microbiology, this was the question which was asked in the 2019 June FMG exam. They have simply asked, Diphilobothrium latum, which of the following is a fish tape form? This is the question asked. Diphilobothrium latum, which is a fish tape form, do you know where it will live? It lives in the terminal ileum. Now, whenever it is living in the terminal ileum, it will cause inflammation over there. It decreases the absorption. It decreases the absorption of its substance. In the terminal ileum, vitamin B12 is absorbed. So, the patient is now going to have vitamin B12 malabsorption, leading to Bothriocephalus anemia. Whenever vitamin B12 is not there, that will cause megaloblastic anemia, right? So, this megaloblastic anemia, because of B12 deficiency, seen due to a parasitic infection like, like you know, fish, uh, fish tape bomb infection, is called as Botryocephalus anemia. Diphilobotrium latum, right? So, that's a Botryocephalus anemia, okay? So, now tell me, Botryocephalus anemia is due to deficiency of vitamin B12. Botryocephalus anemia. Where is the problem? The terminal ileum. This fish tape form is living over there. Okay. Next, sir, there is a parasite called as the ankylostoma duodenal. The name itself is a duodenal. Ankylostoma duodenal. So, if, if it is living in the duodenum, it causes what? It causes iron deficiency. Whenever there is iron deficiency, that will cause us iron deficiency anemia. It's a type of microcytic anemia. Microcytic anemia, MCQ, which you need to know. Okay. Done, sir. After this, I want you to know a few important points about the iron absorption. Okay. Where iron absorption happens, you know it, duodenum. Okay. Iron absorption happens in the duodenum. Iron absorption happens in which form? Which form? Only Fe2 plus form. Okay. I'm not going in detail. Only important points. Only iron is absorbed in Fe2 plus form. But imagine me being a vegetarian. I'm a pure vegetarian. Now, if I'm taking the plant, like, you know, products, if I'm taking a plant products, I will get which form of iron? Fe3 plus form of iron. So, I am getting Fe3 plus form of iron right now. Okay. I am getting Fe3 plus form of iron. But do you think Fe3 plus form of iron is absorbable? No. Fe3 plus form of iron is not absorbable. But I don't have any problem because this Fe3 plus form of iron is converted into Fe2 plus form with the help of acid. The acid which is present in my stomach. So the acid which is present in my stomach will convert the Fe3 plus form of iron into Fe2 plus form of iron. Ferric iron will be converted into ferrous iron. So now this ferrous iron will be absorbed into the duodenal introcytes, into the duodenum, with the help of a transporter called as DMT1. Okay, DMT1, which is called as a divalent metal ion transporter 1. Okay, divalent metal ion transporter 1. No need to remember the full name. Simple DMT1. Transporter helps in iron absorption. Fe2 plus form. Fe3 to Fe2 plus by HCl. Okay, if you don't find HCl in the option, then you can also answer this as vitamin C. Vitamin C, that's the ascorbic again acid. Okay, ascorbic acid. So, vitamin C, also called as the ascorbic acid, will help in conversion of Fe3 plus form of iron into Fe2 plus form of iron. So, iron absorption is increased by acids, vitamin C. But if someone asks you, who decreases the iron absorption? The iron absorption is going to be decreased by milk. Remember, iron absorption is decreased by milk. Okay. So, at the end of the day, iron is absorbed. But where iron is, see, now, at the end of the day, iron is going to come into your blood. Absorbed. Absorbed. Iron is absorbed. In the blood, iron is now bounded with a plasma protein. There is a plasma protein which is bound, binding with the iron. What is the name of this plasma protein? MCQ, transferrin. So, transferrin is a plasma protein which is binding with the iron. Transferrin is a plasma protein. Again, I am telling you, in the blood, iron is not allowed in free form. No, you should not allow the iron in a free form. In the blood, iron is bound with a plasma protein called as a transferrin. Okay. So, this transferrin, what it will do? It will transfer the iron to liver. So, in the liver, iron is stored in which form? Fe3 plus form. So, the storage form of iron is called as ferritin. Ferritin. Okay. So, ferritin is Fe3 plus. 
we store our liver uh, sorry we store iron in which form fe3 plus form okay fe3 plus form not fe2 plus form but fe2 plus form of iron is absorbable fe2 plus form of iron is absorbable where iron is getting stored iron is getting stored in the liver as well as iron is stored in the bone marrow also bone marrow macrophages in the bone marrow macrophages iron is stored now in your exams, especially your SMG exams, when you have seen, when you have sufficient amount of iron in your body, I am having enough amount of iron in my body. Is there is any further need to absorb any extra iron? No, iron is not a good thing, to be frank. Okay, so once if iron enters into your body, it will never come out. Iron doesn't have any specific mechanism or we humans does not have any specific mechanism to excrete the iron. Once iron enters into the body, it will stay lifelong, no doubt. So, when you already have enough amount of iron, you should not absorb any other iron. So that's why whenever you have sufficient iron stores, the liver will produce a molecule called as MCQ, hepcidin. Hepcidin, what it will do? It will inhibit the iron absorption. Okay, right? Let me write here. Hepcidin inhibits iron absorption. Okay, hepcidin inhibits iron absorption. So regarding iron, please answer my questions. Iron is absorbed in which form? Fe2 plus form. Who will convert Fe3 plus form of iron into Fe2 plus form of iron? Acid or ascorbic acid. Who will decrease the iron absorption? Milk. Which transporter is helping in the iron absorption? Divalent metal ion transporter 1, which is present on the duodenum. In the blood, iron is bound with which plasma protein? Transferrin. Iron is stored in which organs? Liver and bone marrow. In which form? Fe3 plus form, which is called as ferritin. Ferritin. When you have sufficient stores of uh, when you have sufficient stores of iron in your body, liver will produce which molecule? Hepcidin. Hepcidin inhibits the iron absorption. Done. Now after this, some important points about the pancreas. Pan. See the name itself is there. Pancreas. Pan. Pan means complete. It will completely. It will produce enzymes which will completely helps in digestion of proteins, carbohydrates as well as fats. See what are the pancreatic enzymes? Simple. Pancreatic amylase helps in digestion of carbohydrates. Now, what is the enzyme for protein digestion? Tripsinogen chemotripsinogen, chemotripsinogen and procarboxy peptidase. So, trypsinogen, chemotrypsinogen, procarboxy peptidase, they help in the digestion of proteins. Done, and what is the enzyme which is produced by the pancreas, which is produced by the pancreas to digest the lipids? It's the pancreatic lipase, pancreatic lipase and co-lipase. So, pancreatic lipase and co-lipase, these are the enzymes which will help in the digestion of lipids. Done. This will help in the digestion of the lipids, sir. So, Pancreas, pan, pan means complete, complete digestion. Pancreatic enzymes digest carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Carbohydrates, proteins and fats, all of them will be digested away. Next, my point which I want you to know is, sir, this is a trypsinogen, chemotrypsinogen, the ogens, trypsinogen, chemotrypsinogen. What are they? These are the gymogens. Because these are the zymogens, which are inactive in nature. See, so this trypsinogen need to be converted into trypsin. Trypsin is the active form. Chemotrypsin is the active form. So, who will convert trypsinogen into trypsin? Its the answer is enterokinase. So, enterokinase which is present in the intestinal juice, just remember, pepsinogen is converted into pepsin with the help of acid, HCl. But, trypsinogen is converted into trypsin with the help of enterokinase. With the help of enterokinase. Now, one more question which I want you to know is, see, can you answer this? Pancreatic enzymes are produced like trypsinogen, Chemotrypsinogen are produced in inactive form. Why inactive form? Why? Why? Because to prevent auto digestion of pancreas. Okay, so to prevent the auto digestion of the pancreas, these enzymes are produced in inactive form. Okay, these enzymes are produced in inactive form. Now, after this, what else you should know in the GIT? Regarding duodenum, Two hormones are there which I want you to know. Only two hormones. See, in the duodenum, there is a cell called as SSL and I cell. Duodenum have SSLs and I cells. 
First, let's talk about the SSL. When you eat the food, the acid is getting produced in the stomach. Now, this acid, it will enter into the duodenum. See, now acidic chyme, partially digested for the food, which is mixed with the acid. Now, it is entering. Okay, now this is entering into the duodenum. It is stimulating which cell? SSL. Now, do you know what this SSL will do? SSL helps in the production of something called as secretin. This secretin is the first hormone discovered in humans. Okay, secretin is the first hormone discovered in the human cell. Now, the secretin, what it will do? Sir, secretin acts on pancreas. Okay, secretin is acting on pancreas. Now, do you know what pancreas will do? Sir, pancreas, it will produce this bicarbonate rich here. To neutralize the acid. Now, pancreas is releasing more and more bicarbonate rich pancreatic juices. Okay, simple. This is the problem. Acid is the problem. So, in order to neutralize the acid, bicarbonate rich pancreatic juices are released. So, now, See, this is what happens. You take the food, food is mixed with the acid. This acidic time enters into the duodenum, stimulate the S cells, S cells produce secretin. Secretin will come to the pancreas. Pancreas now it is producing more bicarbonates to neutralize the acid in the duodenum, not in the stomach, in the duodenum. Completed, sir. Now, other thing. This other cell is called as the I cell. Sir, what is this I cell? When you eat fat rich food, Okay, when you eat rich, fat rich food, mainly I'm talking about. So, when you take fat rich food, these fatty acids, they will stimulate the eye cells. Okay, fat rich food, these things, they will stimulate the eye cells in the duodenum. Now, these eye cells, they are going to produce something called as cholecystokinin, pancreozyme in full form, cholecystokinin. So, this cholecystokinin, see, this cholecystokinin, it acts on the pancreas. Yes, cholecystokinin acts on the pancreas. And cholecystokinin also acts on the gallbladder. Now think logically and tell me, what, now what's the problem? You have taken the fat rich food, that's the, that's, let's consider it as a problem. You are eating fats, these fats need to be digested, no, somehow. Who will digest the fats? Bile. Bile actually does not have any enzymes for fat digestion, but it does something called as emulsification. We, we need the bile, whenever you take the fat rich food, you need to have a process called as emulsification of fats. So bile should be there. So that's why whenever you eat fat rich food, the fat rich food will stimulate the eye cells. Eye cells produces the cholecystokinin. Okay. Eye cells produces the cholecystokinin. Now this cholecystokinin, pancreozyme, it acts on the pan, uh, it acts on the gallbladder as well as it acts on the pancreas. Bo in both the places it will act. So now see, whenever the gallbladder is getting stimulated by CCK, now what will happen? Gallbladder will start to contract, sir. So what it will do? Contraction of the gallbladder releases the bile. So that's why this cholecystokinin is called as Cholegogue. Cole okay. Cholegogue Cole means the one which causes the contraction of the gallbladder. The one which causes the contraction of the gallbladder is called as the cholegogue. And the cholegogue is cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is an example of cholegogue. Okay. So, bile is released. Done, sir. Completed. Not only that, see this cholecystokinin and pancreas. I mean, know what it is doing. This cholecystokinin and pancreas. I mean, it is acting on the pancreas. Now, are you fat? Now you are eating fat. No, no, this fat need to be digested. So that's why now pancreas, it is producing what? See, now the pancreas is producing pancreatic juices rich in pancreatic lipase, co-lipase. So pancreatic juices are released with rich in enzymes. Okay, to digest the fats. Okay. Then a simple way, please answer my questions. Sir, in the duodenum, how many types of cells are there? Two types of cells are there. S cells, I cells. What is the stimulus for the S cell? Acidic kine, SL is going to produce secretin or you can say what is the stimulus for the release of secretin? Acidic kine. What secretin will do? Secretin acts on the pancreas. So the pancreas produces more bicarbonate rich pancreatic juices. Next thing, when you eat fat rich food, the fat rich food is going to stimulate what? I cells. The I cells are going to produce something called as a cholecystokinin. The cholecystokinin will cause the contraction of the gallbladder. One thing, releases the bile. And the cholecystokinin also acts on the pancreas so that now pancreas will produce enzyme rich pancreatic juices. Okay. So, with this, the two important hormones are also completed. Okay. Now, after this, directly what I want you to know is the one J hormone. Okay. One J hormone, oh, sorry, not one, two J hormones which I want you to know regarding motilin as well as ghrelin. Who produces this motilin in the intestines? This motilin is produced by M0 cells or MO cells. Okay, motilin is produced by MOSs. cells. In the name itself is there, motilin. See, motilin helps in the motility, GID contractions. Okay, motilin helps in GID contractions. 
Okay. My question here is, the motilin increases the JT motility, no doubt. Motilin is acting on which receptor? Motilin acting on motilin receptors. Motilin it is acting on its receptors, own receptors called as the motilin receptors. But see, imagine this is the JT. Okay, this is the JT. Interesting, interesting. Here are the motilin receptors. Imagine these are the motilin receptors. Now, these motilin receptors are stimulated by what? Motilin. Motilin stimulate the motilin receptors. But not only that, see, there is something called as erythromycin. Not ejithro, erythro. Okay, this is called as erythromycin. But this erythromycin, it can also come and stimulate the motilin receptors. It can also stimulate the motilin receptors. So, what happens? Whenever the motilin receptors are stimulated, what happens? That increases the GAT contractions or GA motility. So, the point which I want you to know is the motilin receptors is also stimulated by, this motilin receptors are stimulated by erythromycin, a drug called as not myelin, erythromycin. So, what is the side effect of erythromycin? I am having some fever. I am having some infection. I came to you. You gave me erythromycin. Yes, erythromycin is an antibiotic. It's an antibacterial. Okay. But erythromycin also go and stimulate the motilin receptors. When motilin receptors are stimulated, more JAT contractions, diarrhea. So side effect is diarrhea. Okay. So that's the one important MCQ which I want you to know. And if I suffer with, for example, imagine I'm a diabetic and my GAT motilities are very less. That is called as a diabetic gastric paralysis. Okay. So diabetic gastric paralysis. My GAT motilities are very, very less. So what you need to do as a doctor, you need to increase the GAT motility. How can you increase the GAT motility? By stimulating the motilin receptors. By stimulating the motilin receptors, you can increase the GAT motility. So the point which I want you to know is, sir, how can you stimulate the motilin receptors? Again, see, this erythromycin, it is used. Erythromycin is used in the treatment of gastric paralysis. Erythromycin, stimulate the motilin receptors, GAT motility increases. Simple, simple. Next, next thing which I want you to know is ghrelin. Okay, sir, ghrelin in yesterday's class in uh, endocrinology also I have discussed. Ghrelin is produced by epsilon cells. Okay, epsilon cells in pancreas. Sir, epsilon cells in pancreas produces something called as a ghrelin. When, during fasting, during fasting, ghrelin is going to be produced. Sir, what this ghrelin will do? Sir, ghrelin no, increases the hunger. Sorry, it's a typing mistake. Ghrelin increases the hunger, the feeling of hunger. Okay, I'm like having hungry, right? Whenever you're fasting, you'll have the hunger. So who will give that hunger feeling? It's because of the ghrelin. And this ghrelin not only increases the feeling of hunger, it also increases the growth hormone production. Just go and like, you know, check the endocrinology. Same thing I have taught you there. Ghrelin is produced during fasting state. Increases the feeling of hunger. It also increases the growth hormone level. Okay, so these are the points which I want you to know. At least these two things. These three things are important. Okay, now after this, what else I should teach you? See, in the J motility, uh, the points which I want you to know is the last, we are at the end almost. The next 10 minutes, we will we can complete this. So, what is a pacemaker? Your JAT is contracting like this. Okay, your JAT is contracting. What is the pacemaker cell of the JAT contraction? Is say what is the pacemaker of the heart? Okay. And what is the pacemaker of the JAT contraction? The pacemaker of the JAT contraction is interstitial cell of the kajal. Okay, the pacemaker in the GA motility is interstitial cell of the causal cell, MCQ. Okay, MCQ. So, this interstitial cell of causal, there are many interstitial cells of the causal, like, you know, many, many interstitial cells of causal are there. Okay. SA node is only one in the heart, but there are many interstitial cells of causal. Now, point which, see, this interstitial cell of causal, they are extending from the body of the stomach. Okay, they are extending from the body of the stomach till to the colon, till to the colon, these interstitial cells of causal are there. No doubt. Guys, in the entire JT, the most important area is this one. Okay, this is the most, most important area. Questions will come from this area only. Okay, especially in FMG exams and PG exams, this is the most important area. Now I am showing you, see, this is the interstitial cell of the kajal. Okay, now in this interstitial cell of kajal, there is some electrical fluctuation happening all the time. Okay, some electrical fluctuation from negativity to coming towards the positivity, it's again going back. Negativity to positivity, again going back. So this electrical alteration is happening all the time. 24 by 7 it is happening. So this is called as basal electrical rhythm, BR. Electrical alteration, just voltage, voltage of the cell is now fluctuating like this. 
Okay, so this is called as a basal electrical rhythm. So this basal electrical rhythm MCQ, they are not action potentials. They are not action potentials, and they are not causing. See, not causing JET contractions. They are not responsible for JET contractions. Okay, now right now, in my interstitial cell of Kajal, there is this electrical fluctuation going on. Okay, but now I am thinking about the foot. My parasympathetic nervous system is getting activated. Now I'm thinking about the food. I'm looking at the food. I'm smelling the food. Now do you know what happens? Vagus nerve is releasing the acetylcholine on this interstitial cell of Kajal. See, now this is the vagus nerve. What it is releasing? It is releasing acetylcholine. When it is releasing the acetylcholine, now look and tell me what happens. See, now it's coming like this. It's having some spikes. Now this is not just the basal electrical rhythm now. Now it is having some extra spikes. These are called as the spike potentials. Okay, these are called as the spike potentials. So this the spike potentials are the action potentials. They are the real action potentials. Okay, these are the real action potentials. Now they are responsible for these action potentials. This is spikes. They are responsible for JT contractions. Okay, this is the MCQ. Okay, so the same thing look here. Now initially what do you have? You are having the basal electrical rhythm. Simple basal electrical rhythm. But see when the acetylcholine is acting. Okay, when the acetylcholine is acting. See now, you are having spike potentials, two spikes, three spikes, more than number of spikes. You can ask me, what is the difference between the spikes are one spike, two spike, three spike. Now look at here. Here I am talking about the electrical recording, electrical fluctuation. But here I am talking about the mechanical recording, contraction. Whenever there is a basal electrical rhythm, there is no contraction in the JT. Okay, the, the JT, there is no contraction, sir. Okay, see, but whenever spike potentials are coming, one spike potential, little contraction. Two spike potentials, see the strength of contractions are increasing. Okay, after action potential, the strength, more the number of action potentials, more powerful contractions are coming. More the number of contractions are coming. Okay. So this is what I want to put into your mind. So acetylcholine is responsible for this spike potentials. But sympathetic nervous systems, you are sympathetically activated. You are in a hurry. You are about to fight. At that time, do you want any GAT contractions? All right, so that's why you see epinephrine what it is doing sympathetic neurotransmitter it is decreasing see from 3 to 2 2 to 1 1 to again back to basal electrical rhythm so what is happening to all JT contractions it's also coming back to 0 so basal electrical rhythm no contraction so this is what I want to put into your mind so please tell me sir what are these electrical fluctuations which are happening in the interstitial cell of God so these electrical fluctuations are called as the basal electrical rhythm are the action potentials? No, they are not action potentials. Are they causing any JT contractions? No JT contractions. Then what are the JT? Then what is responsible for JT contraction? It's the spike potential, SP. The spike potential. They are the real action potentials. They are responsible for JT contraction. And who is causing the spike potentials? It's the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine. See, one more MCQ. I have said you. I have so many interstitial cells of Kajal. So many interstitial cells of Kajal are there. Okay, so many interstitial cells of Kajal. So, there is an interstitial cell of Kajal in the duodenum. There is an interstitial cell of Kajal in the cecum. Now, let me show you. Very small, uh, important thing. This is the interstitial cell of Kajal in the duodenum. There is an interstitial cell of Kajal in the cecum. Okay, now see. In the duodenum, see, what are the, these are the basal electrical rhythms, you know. So, within a time, see how many basal electrical rhythms are there? More or less? More. But in the CECAM, if you see, how many basal electrical rhythms are there? Less. So, this is the MCQ, sir. So, in the duodenum, more the basal electrical rhythm. Every minute you can have these 12 waves. Okay. So, 12 fluctuations are coming. 12 slow waves. See, this basal electrical rhythm is also called as a slow waves. So, 12 slow waves are coming. The highest frequency, this is the MCQ, highest frequency of the basal electrical rhythm is present in duodenum. Least frequency, least frequency of the basal electrical rhythm is present in cecum. Done. These are the two MCQs completed. Highest frequency in duodenum, least frequency in the cecum. Done, sir. And the last thing for gastrointestinal system is simple, peristalsis versus segmentation. Most of the student knows about the peristalsis, but no one knows about the segmentation. What is the difference? The type of motility. Both are JD motility only. Both are JD contractions. But they differ in the way they are happening. See, peristalsis means one side it is contraction. One side of the JT is contracting. 
okay you have taken the food you have taken the food food is there in the intestine to prevent the regurgitation back to prevent the regurgitation back this proximal segment is undergoing contraction and the distal segment is undergoing relaxation to welcome the food so what is happening with the time food is moving forward the proximal segment is getting contracted and the distal segment is relaxing so the food propulsion is happening okay so mcqs which they will ask you in exam is sir the proximal segment is getting contracted because of which neurotransmitter acetylcholine and substance p mcqs so which neurotransmitters are responsible for the contraction of the proximal segment that neurotransmitters mcq is acetylcholine and substance p then what which neurotransmitter is responsible for relaxation of the distal segment is getting relaxed no to welcome the food which neurotransmitters the neurotransmitters are nitric oxide and vasoactive intestinal peptide okay so they are causing relaxation okay relaxation of the distal segment they are causing contraction okay these are the mcqs now if you look at the segmentation part see in the segmentation part the, the proximal segment is contracting as well as the distal segment both are getting contracted so both proximal segment and the distal segment both are getting contracted so now the food is divided into small small boluses okay now the food is getting divided into small small pockets and now what is happening is not just the propulsion now here the food is mixed with the digestive enzymes the food is getting digested away so both proximal segment distal segment both are contracting helping in the food digestion is called as segment station and this is the major j motility this is major okay so most of the people will think only one thing peristalsis is the j motility no peristalsis is not just a j motility segmentation is the major j motility when compared to the peristalsis now i am asking you one question tell me both peristalsis as well as segmentation okay both peristalsis as well as segmentation both of them are happening when during fed state or unfed state both of them are happening during unfed sorry both of them are happening during fed state only means yes there is a food see here there is a food here there is food okay here both these places there is food is there in both the type of motility one is helping for the propulsion of food peristalsis for propulsion of the food segmentation is for digestion okay segmentation is for the digestion of the food okay you got my point but sir now you haven't eaten anything now for example imagine right now you are sitting you are not eating anything still your jt will undergo contractions even without food your jt will contract that is called as migratory motor complex so migratory motor complex okay it is seen during fasting state so which j t motility is seen during fasting state it is the migratory motor complex so a powerful wave of contraction it is starting from the stomach okay see a wave of contraction a contraction wave is going to start from the stomach and it is going till to the colon okay this contraction is going even without the food we even without eating the food why to clean any residues if there is any leftover material it need to be cleaned it need to be cleaned right so this migratory motor complex it cleans the jt so that's why it's called as the broomstick or sweeper okay broomstick or sweeper of the jt migratory motor complex seen during fasting state it is called as a broomstick or sweeper of the jt why because it cleans the jt what it is doing sir actually it is cleaning and preparing our jt for next meal so it prepares the jt for the next meal and do you know who mediates this migratory motor complex m for m migratory motor complex it is maintained or it is mediated by motilin don't forget about the motilin motilin receptors are stimulated by erythromycin okay remember that point so motilin is mediating the migratory motor complex and If if you are fasting, if you are not eating anything, one migratory motor complex is going to be seen in every ninety minutes. One migratory motor complex will start. It will move from the stomach till to the colon. It will clean the jet. Okay. Okay. Good evening, guys. Now in this class, okay, uh, we are going to mainly concentrate on the general topics. Okay, the general topics which are important for the exam for the next two hours will be mainly concentrating on the general topics. Okay. So having said that, one this is the part three of our session. now let me do it a little fast why because these are the general topics which you can understand very easily okay i won't go too much fast you can understand them okay if you find any difficulty you can let me know in the comment sections okay having said that uh, the first topic which i want to take now is the 
transport across the cellular membrane transport of the substances in the cell okay now how many types of transport are there you just tell me there are two types of transports are the basic types of transport the active transport as well as the passive transport okay now first of all let me write about the let me talk about the active transport what is this active transport sir See, there is transport of substances the substances are getting transported why it is called as active transport what is the word active mean here active means atp is utilized so if atp is utilized in the process of transport of substances then it is called as active transport simple okay so active transport means atp is utilized sir. now this active transport is of how many types See, this active transport is further divided into two types primary active transport secondary active transport okay look here primary active transport is there and there is one more type which is called as a secondary active transport primary active and secondary active what is the difference between primary active transport and secondary active transport remember for your entire life wherever atp is directly utilized in the transport of substances okay wherever the transport of substances are happening if at that particular site if atp is directly involved if the direct usage of atp happens then it is called as primary active transport Okay, so what exactly I mean by primary active transport? Primary active transport means the direct use of ATP. They will ask you in your exam, which of the following is an example of primary active transport? Which transporter is an example of primary active transport? They will ask you. See, if any transporter or if any protein, if it is ending with the word A's, ATP A's, okay, see for example, sodium potassium ATP A's, proton ATP A's, okay, calcium ATP A's, if a transporter or if a protein, if it is ending with the word ATPase, then it is 100% example of primary active transport. And I have already taught you what exactly is primary active transport. Primary active transport are the transport where there is a direct use of ATP. And what are the examples? Sodium potassium ATPase is an example and proton ATPase as well as calcium ATPase. Okay, calcium ATPase. So these are the examples of primary active transport. Now, here we need to discuss important points about the sodium potassium ATPs. Okay, a lot of times question has been asked about the sodium potassium ATPs. Now, let me show you for example, right, this is the cell membrane guys. Okay, imagine this is the cell membrane. Okay, now this is the cell membrane. Look here. Imagine this is the sodium potassium ATPs. Okay, imagine this is the so display. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. So, here is a sodium potassium ATPs. Normally, what the sodium potassium ATPs will do? Sodium potassium ATPs will bring 3 sodium into the cell and takes out 2 potassium out of the cell. Will bring 3 sodium into the cell, will take out 2 potassium out of the cell. We know it. So, the sodium potassium ATPs by using ATP, okay, by using ATP, will bring 3, will help in the transport of the substances. Which substances? Sodium as well as potassium. So, sodium potassium ATP is an example of active transport because ATP is directly used okay, in the transport of substances. Now, you tell me, how many subunits are there in this sodium potassium ATPs? Sir, there is alpha subunit, for example, alpha subunit, beta subunit. Two subunits are there. And what is the coupling ratio they will ask you? So, the coupling ratio is 3 is to 2. Okay, 3 is to 2. 3 sodium ions. Oh, sorry. Just uh, I made a small like mistake here. No. 3 sodium ions are going out of the cell two potassiums will come into the cell. Okay, that's a small mistake. So, what is the coupling ratio? The coupling ratio is 3 is to 2. 3 sodium ions are going to go out of the cell and two potassium are going, uh, two potassium ion ions are going to come into the cell with the use of ATP. So, now some MCQs. Sodium potassium ATPs, sodium potassium ATPs, is it an example of primary active transport? Okay, is it a channel protein or is it a carrier protein? Guys, uh, I hope you have already studied this in your regular classes. Normally, proteins are actually two types, carrier proteins, channel proteins. See, the sodium potassium ATPs, just for now, trust me, it is an example of a carrier protein. Okay, MCQ. It's an example of carrier protein. It changes its shape. Okay, it changes its shape and helps in the movement of sodium as well as potassium. Sodium potassium. So, sodium potassium ATPs, it's not a channel. It's not an ion channel. It's a carrier protein which changes its, which modulates its shape to help in the transport of the substances. Okay. It's a carrier protein, sir. MCQ done. Second MCQ. 
What is the coupling ratio of the sodium potassium ATPase? The coupling ratio is it throws three sodium out of the cell and brings two potassium into the cell. So the coupling ratio is three is to two. Done, sir. I have already asked you how many subunits are there in the sodium potassium ATPase. If you look here, it's a carrier protein. Okay. How many subunits are there? Two subunits. Alpha subunit, beta subunit. Even books there are there is also something called as a gamma subunit, but I don't want you to remember that. There are two subunits, sir. Alpha subunit, beta subunit. Okay, now out of this alpha subunit, beta subunit, the most important one, the regulatory one, in the movement of the substances, sodium, potassium movement, which subunit is important, is alpha subunit. So, the alpha subunit is the one which is helping in the movement of the sodium as well as potassium. Okay, for your understanding purpose, okay, let me show you here, imagine this is a cell membrane, okay, let's take this as a cell membrane, sir. Now, imagine this is your alpha subunit, this is your beta subunit, alpha subunit, beta subunit. See, this alpha subunit, it is having extracellular, like, you know, it's having extracellular site as well as intracellular site. There is an extracellular site, there is an intracellular site. Okay, extracellular domain as well as intracellular domain. It is, which substances will bind to the intracellular domain? Which substances will bind to the extracellular domain? That's the question which was tested. So this ATP fellow, okay, ATP and sodium, they are going to bind to the alpha subunit only. Yes, alpha subunit only, but where? Intracellularly, which means you look here, a sodium molecule along with the ATP. Okay, sodium and ATP, they are going to think, is everything okay? Okay, so sodium as well as ATP, they are going to bind towards the intracellular side. And who is going to bind to the extracellular side? Potassium is going to bind to the extracellular side. Okay, so this is the point which I want you to know. Now, sir, tell me. Sodium potassium ATPase is an example of primary active transport. It's an example of carrier protein. What is the coupling ratio? 3 is to 2. How many uh, sites are there? Or how many like, you know, subunits are there? Alpha subunit as well as beta subunit. What is the regulatory subunit? The most important subunit is the alpha subunit. So alpha subunit have how many domains? Extracellular domain as well as intracellular domain. So the intracellular domain, who is going to bind? Sodium as well as ATP are going to bind to the intracellular domain. Potassium is going to bound to the extracellular domain. Okay, these are the points which I want you to know. And if you ask me, sir, what are the important points about the beta subunit? See, the beta subunit is a site for glycosylation. See, in the beta subunit, glycosylation will happen. There are three sites for the glycosylation. Just remember, beta subunit is a site of glycosylation. Alpha subunit is the subunit which is the regulating the movement of sodium potassium. ATP will bind to the alpha subunit intracellularly. Done. Okay, done, sir. Guys, is it everything is clear? Is everything clear, guys? Shall I go forward? <laughs> okay. Next. What are the other points which I want you to know regarding the sodium potassium ATPase? Is see the sodium potassium ATPase, which is present on the cells. Okay, it's present on all our body cells. We know it's an example of primary active transport. See the sodium potassium ATPase, it's activated because of certain hormones like thyroid hormones, the T3, T4. So, the T3 and T4, the thyroid hormones, actually they will activate the sodium potassium ATPase. By activating the sodium potassium ATPase, this is actually a question. The T3 and T4, the thyroid hormones activate the sodium potassium ATPase and increases the basal metabolic rate. This was the question tested in many exams. Thyroid hormones increase the basal metabolic rate. Every student knows how thyroid hormones increases the number of sodium potassium ATPases by increasing in the number of sodium potassium ATPases, more ATP are going to get broken down. So, basal metabolic rate increases and even heat production increases. Okay. So, thyroid hormones, one point, activates the sodium potassium ATPase channels. Next, drugs like digitalis, obein and dopamine. Remember like DOD, D-O-D. Okay. Digitalis, obein and dopamine. See, the first two drugs, the digitalis and obein, these are considered as the cardiac glycosides. What they will do? On the myocardium, in the heart, this digitalis obein and this, uh, these substances, they will block, see, negative. Negative means inhibit. They will inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase. 
Whenever they inhibit the sodium potassium ATP, do you know what happens? At the end of the day, because of these drugs, okay, these are the cardiac glycoside drugs. I hope you have shared this in pharmacology. Because of these drugs, intracellular calcium concentration increases. Whenever the intracellular calcium concentration increases, the inotropic effect. Inotropy or the heart contractility, the power of contraction is going to increase. Okay, so simple point, sodium potassium ATPs are going to be activated by thyroid hormones, the sodium potassium ATPs are going to be inhibited by digitalis, like digoxin, digitoxin kind of drugs, digitalis group of drugs and obey as well as dopamine. What they will do, they increase the inotropy of the myocardium. So, next, primary active transport is completed. What is the mnemonic I have asked you to remember? If any transporter is ending with the word, ATP is then it is an example of primary active transporter, no doubt. Next, let us discuss about secondary active transport. In secondary active transport, see energy is involved, so that is why we are calling it as active transport. Energy is involved, no doubt, but indirect usage of energy, not direct but indirectly. Okay, so indirect use of ATP will happen. And who is providing the energy here? See, the energy for the secondary active transport is actually provided by the sodium potassium ATP is. The sodium potassium ATPases by themselves they are example of primary active transport, no doubt. But the sodium potassium ATPases they indirectly give the energy for secondary active transport. Okay, so in secondary active transport, what is the keyword? Indirect usage of ATP. Now, in your exam, they will ask you what are the examples of secondary active transport? Remember, all co-transporters, symporters, anti uh, antiporters are exchangers. Wherever you see these words, symporters are co-transporters. For example, see sodium glucose co-transporter SGLT, sodium glucose co-transporter, sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter, sodium chloride symporter, see all are ending with the word symporters or co-transporters. So, SGLT means already you know from biochemistry, sodium glucose co-transporter, sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter, they are all going together. So, symporters are co-transporters and sodium chloride symporters. Okay, uh, let me take some time and let me see how good you are. This SGLT, sodium glucose transporters are there, no? Okay, already here I have written, but anyway, this SGLT, it's of two types, SGLT type 1, SGLT type 2, very important in your exam. This is SGLT type 1, where it is present? Yes, sir, it's present in the intestines. Okay, SGLT type 1 it is present in the intestines. SGLT type 2, it is present in the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron. Very, very important. See, sodium glucose co-transporter type 2. In your nephrons, glucose is reabsorbed along with the sodium MCQ. Glucose is reabsorbed along with the sodium. Okay, so that's why sodium glucose co-transporter type 2, it is present in PCT. Okay, so sodium glucose type, uh, transporter type 2, it's mainly present in the PCT. And in pharmacology, they will integrate with the pharmacology and they will ask you, so, what are the drugs which will block this? Simple. Array, very simple. What are the examples of secondary active transport? So, the examples of secondary active transport are the SGLTs, sodium glucose transporters. How many types of SGLT, uh, SGLTs are there? So, there is SGLT type 1, SGLT type 2. Okay. Now, SGLT type 1, where it is present? In the intestine. In the intestine, it helps in the absorption of the glucose, SGLT type 1. And SGLT type 2, where it is present? SGLT type 2 is present in the proximal convoluted tubule. How to block this? Is the MCQ. So there are drugs called as canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, dapagliflozin. They are SGLT type 2 blockers. Okay. What are they? They are SGLT type 2 blockers. What they will do? They block the sodium glucose type 2 transporter in the PCT. So do you think glucose reabsorption will happen in the PCT? Glucose reabsorption in the kidneys, the PCD does not happen now eh? because SGLT type 2 is blocked because of canagliflozin, dapagliflozin. So there will be glycosuria or glucosuria. Okay, glucosuria is going to happen uh, because of the usage of these drugs. The glucose is going out in the urine. So in the urine, microorganisms uh, can grow because of by utilizing this glucose. So that can lead to urinary tract infections. So, UTIs are a common side effect, okay, UTIs are the common side effect because of the canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, okay, they are glycosuric drugs. Is it clear, guys? Is it clear? Come on, answer my question. What is the coupling ratio of sodium potassium ATPase? The coupling ratio of sodium potassium ATPase is 3 is to 2. 
Sodium potassium ADP is an example of primary active transport. Sodium glucose, sodium glucose co-transporter. The sodium glucose co-transporter SGLT is an example of secondary active transport. SGLT type 1 is present in intestines. SGLT type 2 is present in the nephrons. That is the proximal convoluted tubules. How to block SGLT type 2? SGLT type 2 is blocked with the help of drugs like canagliflozin as well as dapagliflozin. Okay. And okay. Let me see how good you are. Have you ever heard about the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter? It is an example of secondary active transport. No doubt. It is an example of secondary active transport. Co-transporter, symporter. Where exactly it is present? The sodium potassium 2 chloride symporters they are present in ascending limb of loop of Henle. Okay. They are present in the ascending limb of thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now the sodium chloride symporters, sodium chloride symporters, it is a transporter which is present in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, these are two MCQs. Sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter is present in the ascending limb of loop of Henle. Sodium chloride symporter is present in the distal convoluted tubule. If you can uh, remember, uh, if you can integrate. See this uh, sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter, it is going to be blocked with the help of loop diuretics. Okay, it is. Okay, loop diuretics. Excellent, excellent. Okay, metroid. Yeah, it is in the loop of Henle and it is going to be blocked with loop diuretics. Can you tell me this sodium chloride symporter is going to be blocked with the help of which uh, drug? The sodium chloride symporters which are present in the distal convoluted tubule are going to be blocked by? Thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics. Okay, that's the important point which I want you to know. Okay, so loop diuretics as well as thiazide diuretics. Next. And whenever you hear this, all these antiporters as well as exchanges, most of the time, even not only symporters, this antiporters, antiporters means one substance is moving in one direction, other substance is moving in opposite direction. So there is antiport, opposite movement of the substances. One is going out, other substance is coming in. This is not a co-transport, they are not going together, but antiporters. Okay. So even these antiporters, okay, like sodium calcium exchanger. Okay, this uh, sodium calcium exchanger, which is present in the myocytes, it's present in the myocytes as well as it's present in the digital convoluted tubule of the nephron. Okay, see wherever you see this word, exchanges are antiporters. Again, the example of secondary active transport. Okay. And don't forget the sodium calcium exchanger is an example of antiporter or exchanger. So done, sir. With this, active transport topic is completed. Primary active transport, secondary active transport. ATPases are example of primary active transport. All symporters and antiporters, then uh, all symporters, antiporters, exchangers, they are example of secondary active transport. Who will provide the energy for secondary active transport? Sodium potassium ATPases, they provide indirect energy for the secondary active transport. That. Now, after this, let's talk about the passive transport. Okay, now let's talk about the passive transport. So, this passive transport, there are uh, three types actually. But mainly, the two important types which I want you to know is uh, simple diffusion as well as facilitated diffusion. But wait, passive diffusion, uh, sorry, passive transport. Why you are calling it as a passive transport? Passive means no energy is involved, no ATP is utilized. Directly, indirectly, no. No energy is involved. Okay, no ATP involved. Why no energy is involved, sir? Why? Why energy is not getting involved? Because the substances are moving from high concentration to low concentration. So, whenever a substance is moving from high concentration to low concentration, you no need to give energy. Just by law, by nature's law, it will, it will just move like that. Okay. So, if a substance is moving from higher concentration to lower concentration across the cell, there is no need of any energy. There is no, no need to give any energy. So, so, substances are moving according to the concentration gradient in passive transport. Now, the first type of passive transport which I want you to know is simple diffusion, sir. Okay. Look at this simple diffusion. What is simple diffusion? Simple diffusion is very simple. Example, gases. Okay, so gases like carbon dioxide, oxygen, the gases are getting transported in our body, right? So gases will move from high concentration to low concentration, from high partial pressure to low partial pressure. So gases are moving in our body. So what is the transport which is used by the gases? Simple diffusion. Okay, simply a carbon dioxide molecule it is moving from higher concentration to the lower concentration. Or an oxygen molecule, it is moving from higher concentration to the lower concentration. So, gaseous exchange or gaseous transport is an example of simple diffusion. That's it. Okay, oxygen transport as well as carbon dioxide transport. Next, simple diffusion. 
okay next facilitated diffusion the, the second type of diffusion is a facilitated diffusion but what exactly is facilitated diffusion it is also diffusion which means it is also passive no need of energy substances are moving from higher concentration to lower concentration no doubt but why we are using the word facilitated okay why we are using the word facilitated can anyone tell me why we are using the word facilitated why because yeah substances are moving man but when the substance is moving from higher concentration to lower concentration a carrier protein is involved a carrier molecule is involved okay so if there is a carrier protein or a channel protein if it is involved in transport of substances then it is called as facilitated diffusion so for example look here a carrier protein is involved example is glut okay glut so glucose transporter now it is a glucose transporter not sglt remember anything which ends with the word atps primary active transport sglt is sodium glucose see sodium glucose the co transporters example of secondary active transport now i am talking about gluts glut so glucose transporters are example of facilitated diffusion okay which means yeah glucose molecules also move from high concentration to low concentration okay glucose molecules also move from high concentration to low concentration but for the movement of this glucose okay normal glucose cannot cross the cell membrane a glucose molecule is a very big molecule it cannot cross the cell membrane you need to have or you need to use a protein like a carrier protein for the movement of glucose okay so that's why this gluts this glucose transporters in biochemistry you would have studied glut1 is present in rbc and central nervous system glut2 glut3 glut4 something like that so glucose transporters are present uh, sorry uh, the glucose transporters are examples they are examples of facilitated diffusion one important physiology point of view i wanted to know in skeletal muscles and adipocytes okay my question to you you should answer okay please answer in the comment section in skeletal muscles as well as adipocytes which type of glut is present which type of glut is present in skeletal muscles as well as in the adipocytes which type of glut, uh, glucose transporter is present anyone can anyone tell me there is a little lag but that's okay which type is it one two three or four it is glut excellent it is glut glut 4 okay there is glut 4 okay glucose transporter type 4 now one more important point see this glucose transporter type 4 it is dependent on what it is actually this glucose transporter type 4 it is dependent on a hormone okay so glucose transporter type 4 is dependent on which hormone it is insulin dependent insulin excellent 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 insulin dependent okay insulin dependent okay sir done so now tell me how many types of diffusion are there uh, simple diffusion as well as facilitated diffusion simple diffusion means substances are moving from higher concentration to lower concentration just like that okay higher concentration to lower concentration just like that. no need of any carrier protein no need of any channel protein simply substances are moving so that's an example of simple diffusion what is facilitated diffusion facilitated diffusion means okay so facilitated diffusion means substances are is again moving from the higher concentration to lower concentration no doubt but a carrier protein is involved next one more type of diffusion which i want you to know only one important point the third type of diffusion is non-ionic diffusion okay non-ionic diffusion so this non-ionic diffusion is happening where it happens in the nephrons okay non-ionic diffusion happens in the nephrons and what is an example one example i want you to know it's the excretion of ammonium ion okay see when the ammonium when it is having some charge charge for example like nh4 it is not going to cross the cell membrane but whenever it is nh3 it can cross the cell membrane okay so i don't want you to go in that that detail simply remember one thing man there are three types of diffusion simple diffusion facilitated diffusion non ionic diffusion non ionic diffusion is happening in the nephrons okay non ionic diffusion example is excretion of ammonium ion excretion of ammonium ion is an example of non ionic diffusion that 
that's and like you know, that will be much more than enough for the rapid revision if you remember that enough okay so active transports completed passive transports completed now after this let me discuss about osmosis okay see osmosis it's a special type of transport for the larger substances yes here also atp is involved no doubt osmosis is an example of active transport only okay atp is involved osmosis yes it's an active transport but a bigger substances okay are getting transported in the form of vesicles now vesicles are getting formed and these vesicles are moving, moving out of the cell and they are coming into the cell so osmosis sir now question is osmosis is for what mainly okay. oh sorry uh sorry sorry guys like i just confused the vesicular transport with osmosis sorry 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 osmosis it is also passive transport i am extremely sorry i just confused it with the vesicular transport yeah vesicular transport vesicles are going to be involved and that's an active transport vesicular transport is an example of active transport here the point which i want you to know is osmosis osmosis is also like you know uh, passive transport passive transport especially for the water okay especially for the water see the moment of water gases are are getting transported with an example of what gases are getting transported and the example is simple diffusion gases are moving and this gaseous movement is an example of simple diffusion from high concentration to low concentration gases are moving from high to low concentration that's an example of simple diffusion but when i am talking about solvents okay when i am talking about solvents like water we all know water will move from a low osmolarity okay low osmolarity to high osmolarity that's one thing you need to know waters especially the solvents the liquids liquids are going to move from low osmolarity to high osmolarity okay that's the point which you need to know which means low osmolarity means what are a low osmolarity means pure water for example imagine there is a beaker okay you should understand this okay some students will have a confusion imagine you are having a beaker in it pure water is there pure water okay now there is one more beaker i have kept water inside it but along with water now i am adding sodium okay sodium potassium magnesium calcium chlorine all these ions i am adding now what happens in the beaker number b okay in the beaker number b what happened to the osmolarity osmolarity increases now the water is getting concentrated now b is an example of the beaker number b is an example of high solute concentration there is high solute concentration there is high osmolarity now the solutes what they will do the sodium wherever there is sodium it attracts the water okay so water will move from beaker number a to beaker number b there is a connection okay if you establish a connection between them okay like this because of this osmolarity because of this osmolar gradient it will attract the water particles so now tell me solvents are going to move according to osmosis okay solvents are moving and that movement is called as the osmosis so osmosis is going to happen from low osmolarity to high osmolarity okay wherever there is high solute concentration see in the b wherever there is high solute concentration it attracts the water okay done sir so osmolarity is also completed remember uh, sorry uh, osmosis is also completed osmosis is also an example of passive transport okay passive transport Done. Now after this, let's discuss about the vesicular transport, which I just uh, got confused. Okay, so vesicular transport is an example of active transport. Okay, ATP is involved, <laughs> but the bigger, bigger substances, the bigger substances are going to be transported in the form of vesicles. Here now vesicles are getting formed. Okay, now for example, look here. See, there is formation of the vesicles. Okay. Now question to you is, how many types of vesicular transports are there? So there are <coughs> mainly. Two types of vesicular transport. First type of vesicular transport is endocytosis. The second type of vesicular transport is exocytosis. Endocytosis means the cell is taking something into it. The cell is some taking something into it. For example, look here. Different types of endocytosis. For example, a cell can eat a solid particle like bacteria. A cell, a macrophage, can eat a bacteria by extending its pseudopods. it can engulf a bacteria that's an example of phagocytosis so phagocytosis is an example of endocytosis it's a type of endocytosis phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis right and there is a, one more thing for example when the cell is getting dehydrated 
it can take certain fluids into it from the surrounding from the extracellular environment it can take certain fluids into it this is an example of pinocytosis it means cell is drinking water previously cell is eating phagocytosis is cell eating pinocytosis is cellular drinking okay now you can clearly see here this is a pinocytosis that's the cellular drinking from the extracellular fluids are being taken into the cell pinocytosis answer so look here this endocytosis how many types are there phagocytosis which is nothing but cellular eating okay cellular eating and what is the pinocytosis pinocytosis is cellular drinking okay cellular eating as well as cellular drinking and there is a special type of endocytosis look at the third one there is a special type of endocytosis where specially the receptors which are present on the cell membrane okay whenever there is no need or whenever you whenever the cell doesn't want see whenever the cell doesn't want or whenever the cell want to down regulate the down regulate its activity now what the cell is doing is please try to understand these cell surface receptors now they are getting internalized by forming a vesicle see now a, a vesicle is going to form now this vesicle is going to remove the cell surface receptors from the cell surface the receptors are going to be taken into the cell and in this process in this process see the cell is not eating anything the cell is not eating anything from outside the cell is not drinking anything from outside but the cell surface receptors whenever they are not needed they will be taken into the cell okay and during this process are you able to appreciate this important like oh certain important uh, substances are getting involved okay so these substances are called as a clathrins okay the third type of endocytosis the third type of endocytosis here discussing here i am discussing is called as the receptor mediated endocytosis okay receptor mediated endocytosis and in receptor mediated endocytosis which proteins are getting involved clathrins so come on guys now tell me how many types of endocytosis are there sir three types of endocytosis phagocytosis cell eating solid substances are getting into the cell cellular drinking the fluids are getting entering into the cell from the extracellular environment and receptor mediated endocytosis receptors are going to be engulfed into the cell and the substances which are involved in this process the receptor mediated endocytosis are clathrin mediated endocytosis are clathrins clathrins so done sir after this now look here this is which apparatus you can very clearly say this is the golgi apparatus okay golgi apparatus <coughs> guys is everything clear i could not able to engage with you because there is a little lag there is a four a four five minutes lag is there i think uh, but anyway if you have if you are facing any issue you can like you know directly post it in the comment section now this is a golgi apparatus you know and this golgi apparatus what it is doing so usually we know uh in the endoplasmic reticulum see in the endoplasmic reticulum proteins are going to be synthesized these proteins now they will undergo post translational modifications in the endoplasmic uh, sorry they will undergo post translational modifications and they will undergo certain foldings in the golgi complex now after the golgi complex see these proteins now they are packed into the vesicles okay now they are getting packed into the vesicles now these vesicles see they are example of vesicular transport or not yeah they are example of vesicular transport no doubt so these vesicles they are going to directly see now these vesicles whatever the proteins they are which are getting produced whatever the neurotransmitters they are getting produced see these are getting exocytosed out they are going out okay immediately they are going out is such a type of exocytosis is called as constitutive exocytosis constitutive exocytosis means very simple there is no storage okay the cell is not storing these proteins proteins are getting synthesized in endoplasmic reticulum they are going into golgi apparatus from the golgi apparatus now these proteins are getting packed into the vesicles these vesicles are throwing the proteins out so this type of exocytosis is called as constitutive exocytosis okay constitutive which is also called as unregulated exocytosis and the other type is if you look at this now the proteins whatever they are getting synthesized yes they are stored in the secretory vesicles and they are going to stay in the cell for little amount of time they are getting stored whenever there is an appropriate signal see whenever there is a signal coming that are you are now needed whenever there is signal coming from outside 
now the signal is going to let the release of this vesicle so signal is coming and because of the signal now exocytosis is happening so this is a type of exocytosis and the second type of exocytosis which i am discussing right now is called as non constitutive exocytosis so now simply tell me guys how many types of exocytosis are there there are two types of exocytosis okay one is constitutive other is non constitutive two types of exocytosis in which type of exocytosis the proteins are going to be stored in non constitutive or regulated in non constitutive or regulative exocytosis proteins are going to be stored okay don't worry the pdf will be shared in the group and certain questions which were asked in the previous exam clathrins remember clathrins are involved in exocytosis or endocytosis clathrins receptor mediated endocytosis is an example of endocytosis the third type of endocytosis now which proteins or which substances are involved in exocytosis yeah you should remember x x is like a snake snake right x x boyfriend or something like that okay x girlfriend that like snakes okay that's why you just get rid of, get rid of them so x something reminds me of a snake okay snake so which proteins okay which proteins are i should say proteins which molecules are involved in uh, this exocytosis are snare proteins the snare proteins include synaptobromins and syntaxins so synaptobromins and syntaxins they are involved in exocytosis x x for snake snake for synaptobromin syntaxin snare proteins these two are snare proteins actually there are four snare proteins but for your exam you need to know two snare proteins that is synaptobromin syntaxins okay next after this uh with this the uh, transport across the membranes is completed okay now after this very quickly in the next 15 minutes let's complete what are the important points which you should know regarding the cell membrane simple the cell membrane it is made up of what sir cell membrane is like a bilipid layer every student knows like right, it's like like a bilipid layer okay it's a bilipid layer okay so it's a bilipid layer sir and there is this Uh, scientists who are singer and nicholson these fellows okay singer and nicholson these guys they have given a model okay they said that the cell membrane the cell membrane is like fluid and mosaics it's like a sea of lipids okay they saw the cell membrane like and it's like a full of lipids like a sea of lipids now in the sea of lipids here and there here and there protein icebergs are floating proteins are like icebergs which are floating in the sea of lipids so there is a sea of lipid in the sea of lipid these proteins are floating sir like icebergs so that model which they have given is called as a fluid mosaic model so tell me fluid mosaic model is given by singer and nicholson okay now according to this model there is a bile uh, bilipid layer okay lipid lipid c and the icebergs are the proteins now now from here let's go a little fast now tell me cell membrane is made up of what is it made up of proteins lipids or carbohydrates cell membranes are made up of all the three so in the cell membrane proteins are present lipids are present as well as carbohydrates are present okay cell membrane is made up of proteins lipids as well as carbohydrates mcq is how much percent proteins most of the cell membrane the majority of the cell membrane i should say is proteins only 55% 55% of the cell membrane is actually proteins proteins lipids are just 45% 45% lipids 55% proteins but what about the carbohydrate percentage only 3 to 5% sir very little amount of carbohydrates are there okay so proteins are 55% lipids are 45% and carbohydrate composition okay the composition within the cell membrane the cell membrane is made up of what protein lipid as well as carbohydrate now look at the protein some important points about the proteins okay proteins are maximum in cell membrane which cell membrane yeah, in all the body cell membranes proteins are maximum but the highest concentration of proteins okay more than 55% the maximum concentration of proteins are going to be seen in inner mitochondrial membrane that's the best answer in the inner mitochondrial membrane the highest concentration how proteins is going to be seen if you don't find this inner mitochondrial membrane then the next best answer is going to be the presynaptic membrane so inner mitochondrial membrane and the presynaptic membrane they contains the highest concentration of proteins okay but what is an exception exception is 
everywhere in all the cell membranes the protein concentration is maximum no doubt ma okay protein concentration is maximum but in which cell membranes in which area of the cell the lipid composition in which cell membrane lipid composition is greater than the protein composition it is a schwann cell membrane okay there are these cells called as a schwann cells okay see there are these cells called as schwann cells is schwann cells if you can remember they will cause myelination in the peripheral nervous system this schwann cells are the cells which will cause myelination in central nervous system in central nervous system they will cause the myelination schwann cells will cause the myelination in the central nervous system now in the schwann cell membrane if you look at the schwann cell membrane what it is doing it's causing myelination right myelination is nothing but the lipids so in schwann cell membrane there is highest concentration of lipid when compared to proteins everywhere it is proteins but in schwann cell membrane lipids are greater 80% is lipids only 20% is proteins 80 is to 20 okay 80 is to 20 so exceptions are also completed highest concentration of proteins is going to be seen in the intermitochondrial membrane the intermitochondrial membrane if not intermitochondrial membrane preseptic membrane then the least concentration of the proteins is going to be seen in the schwann cell membrane schwann cells are the myelinating cells for the peripheral nervous system peripheral nervous system done sir now after this let's talk about the lipids okay lipids now the lipids are divided into how many types okay so these lipids in the cell membrane are there no yes they are 55 percent okay but these lipids they are divided into phospholipids glycolipids cholesterol they are different types of lipids but majority type of lipid mcq which type of lipid is present in the cell membrane maximum majority it is the phospholipids phospholipids are the major lipids even glycolipids are there cholesterol is there but not the triglycerides in the cell membranes triglycerides are absent mcq in the cell membrane triglycerides are absent the major lipid in the cell membrane is a phospholipid there are different types of phospholipids uh, phosphatidylcholine phosphatidyl uh, inositol different types fingos fingomyelin different types are there but remember phospholipids are the major lipids triglycerides are absent one type of lipid which is called as a cholesterol even cholesterol is a lipid right the cholesterol which is present in the cell membrane acts like a fluidity buffer mcq which substance in the cell membrane acts like a fluidity fluidity means a flexibility of the cell membrane remember it like that okay the cell membrane is not getting tough like a flexibility or the fluidity fluidity nature the fluidity nature of the cell membrane it will be controlled by it's going to be buffered by which molecule cholesterol so cholesterols are considered as the fluidity buffers okay and last carbohydrates carbohydrate concentration within the cell membrane is very least just 3 to 5 percent 3 to 5 percent is a carbohydrates okay then so these are some basic points about the cell membrane now after this let's talk about the proteins in the cell membrane so what are the different types of proteins take a deep breath we are going a little fast so your brain needs some oxygen okay to synthesize the atp and to make you uh, to keep you awake okay this is actually time you will go to sleep right yeah of course we had uh, these classes in some little odd time uh, now proteins the proteins in the cell membrane first point proteins composition of how much 55 percent of the cell membrane is proteins sir. 55 percent of the cell membranes are uh, proteins the proteins in the cell membrane are divided into integral proteins integral proteins peripheral proteins are lipid anchored proteins integral proteins peripheral proteins and lipid anchored proteins three types of proteins are there you can ask me what the hell are these sir what is the integral protein like look here okay the membrane proteins here i am showing you are a simple if you are having a protein see it is spanning this uh, this protein it is spanning from in to out from outside imagine okay this is the outside this is the inside okay outside as well as inside if a protein is present or it's penetrating it's penetrating through the cell membrane okay partially or completely then it is called as integral protein okay integral proteins are present within the cell membrane they are penetrating the cell membrane if it penetrates from outside to inside outside to inside then it is called as a transmembrane protein means a transmembrane means throughout the membrane okay transmembrane protein so the point which i want you to know is look here there is this protein it's an example of integral protein 
and it is going from out to in. So I can call it as a transmembrane protein. Okay. But look here, there is one more protein. It is penetrating the cell membrane. Yes, it is penetrating. But this is an integral protein, but not a transmembrane protein. Okay, image based questions you might get in upcoming next exams. Okay. But for this batch, okay, I hope you should never see the next exam. Okay, whoever are watching for the upcoming FMG exam, I don't want you to uh, like, you know, have an experience of the next exam. Why unnecessary to take the risks? So, now, now, so integral proteins, yeah, they can be transmembrane or they can be just integral proteins, but not the transmembrane. Okay, now other proteins, which I want you to know is, for example, look here, there is a protein which is attached on one side, either outside or it can be either inside. It can be present on either sides. But here I am showing, for example, outside, there is a protein which is present only on the outside. It is not penetrating. It's not penetrating. Okay. So this is an example of peripheral membrane proteins. So how many types of proteins do you know? There is an integral protein, peripheral protein, integral, peripheral. And there is one more protein. See, look here. It is also like looking like peripheral, but it is having bonds. Okay. It's having bonds. Like, you know, covalent bonds are going to be present. Okay. So this is having bonds with the lipids tightly. So these are called as lipid anchored proteins, lipid anchored proteins. Okay. So now, come on guys, tell me how many types of proteins do you know? Integral proteins, peripheral membrane proteins, as well as the lipid anchored proteins. Now, the question which was asked in one of the exam is, integral protein, okay, integral protein or transmembrane protein, you know it. See, imagine this is the cell membrane. Okay, this is the cell membrane. Now this is the protein. It is present outside as well as inside. Surrounding it's the lipids, everywhere there are lipids and here is a protein like this. So what is the kind of forces? How this protein is actually staying here? There should be some force, right, to keep it there. So what are the forces? The forces with which this integral proteins are existing with the surrounding lipids. The, what are the kind of forces which is present between the, uh, the integral protein as well as the lipids? It is hydrophobic forces. Okay, that's the question. So, hydrophobic forces as well as the Van der Waals forces, so this hydrophobic forces and Van der Waals forces are there for the integral proteins, the in between the integral proteins as well as the lipids. That's the MCQ, hydrophobic forces as well as the Van der Waals forces. And what are the kinds of forces which are there for peripheral proteins and lipid anchored proteins? No need. There will be covalent bonds, electrostatic forces will be there, non covalent forces will be there. I don't want you to remember all that. Hydrogen bonds will be there. Simple. This is the MCQ. Okay. Integral proteins and lipids in between. For okay, let me show you here. This is an integral protein. No, this is an integral protein. In between the integral protein and the surrounding lipids, what kind of forces are there? Hydrophobic forces. Okay, as well as Van der Waals forces are present. Then, after this, classically in your exam, what they will ask you? Which of the following are example of integral proteins? The examples of integral proteins are in the seven pass receptor, serpentine receptors. You know, right? There is this one receptor which is passing through the cell membrane seven times so the seven pass receptors or serpentine receptors are example of their example of transmembrane receptors are integral receptors and all the channels okay all the channels even the carrier proteins okay don't forget about the carrier sodium potassium atpas channels like sodium potassium, uh, so, uh, voltage gated sodium channel, voltage gated calcium channel, all the channels. So channels are example of integral proteins, transmembrane proteins. Carriers like sodium potassium ATPs, they're example of integral proteins or transmembrane proteins. Done, sir. After this, what are the examples of peripheral proteins? Peripheral proteins, they are either present outside or they are present inside. That's it. Okay. So these peripheral proteins, three important peripheral proteins which I want you to know. In SN, especially in RBC, there is a protein called as pectin and anchorin. See, this pectin and anchorin, they are responsible for biconcave. Okay, they are responsible for what? They are responsible for biconcave shape of RBC. They are giving biconcave shape to the RBC. Okay. But whenever there is a mutation in this pectin or anchorin, pectin gaya. Because of some, like you know, gene mutation, spectrin is not there. Whenever there is spectrin not present, do you think RBC is going to maintain its uh, biconcave shape? No. So RBC now will become elliptical. So there will be 
hereditary elliptocytosis the patient is going to have hereditary elliptocytosis so spectrin defect will cause hereditary elliptocytosis ankyrin defect is going to cause hereditary spherocytosis hereditary elliptocytosis hereditary spherocytosis the answer and one more peripheral protein remember this is a peripheral protein you should know it's not an integral protein it's not a lipid anchored protein it's a peripheral protein what is this dystrophin where it is present it's present in the skeletal muscles it's present in skeletal muscles see this dystrophin which is present in the skeletal muscles whenever it is defective it's going to cause a condition called as a dmd duchenne's muscular dystrophy duchenne's muscular dystrophy okay see this duchenne's muscular dystrophy is due to a defect i shouldn't say defect absent complete absence this is mcq the complete absence of this protein which is called as a dystrophin this dystrophin absence can lead to a this is called as a duchenne's muscular dystrophy okay, let me tell you this dystrophin is there it where it is present it's present in the skeletal muscle it actually gives the tensile strength to the myocyte it it's actually present in the cell membrane it gives the tensile strength to the myocytes but whenever this dystrophin is gone do you think muscles will work normally do you think proper muscle contraction the muscles are going to be like you know working normally definitely not the muscles are going to be weak because of that if you ask this fellow for example here right now i am showing you this guy who is suffering with the duchenne's muscular dystrophy dystrophin gone dystrophin is not there he cannot have a proper muscular activity his muscles are very weak so if you ask this person to squat down and if you ask this person to just raise his body he cannot do it just with his thigh muscles or leg muscles he will take the supports of the upper extremities like this like a frog and he will stand up okay so the sign is called as a gover sign the gover sign is going to be positive this is the exact question which was asked in the previous fmg exam okay in the previous fmg exam this question is gover sign is positive in duchenne's muscular dystrophy which protein is the defective this was the question asked they gave the symptom gover sign and they asked which protein is defective peripheral protein is defective which peripheral protein dystrophin is defective okay and just i'm trying to integrate whenever a person is having this uh, uh, duchenne's muscular dystrophy gover sign is positive you know you have seen the gover sign and not only that these patients will have the pseudo calf hypertrophy if you look at their calf muscles it's going to be very big in size it's actually not a calf muscle it's the fat accumulation that's why pseudo we use the word pseudo calf hypertrophy why because the muscles are getting totally damaged and in the place of muscles fat is getting accumulated so that's why pseudo calf hypertrophy okay and what is the most common cause of death the most common cause of death is going to be respiratory distress the skeletal muscle the diaphragm is not going to work properly that can lead to that can lead to respiratory distress these patients will die okay so gover sign is going to be positive pseudo calf hypertrophy is going to be seen and most common cause of death is going to be respiratory distress and one more thing especially it will come in physiology as well as biochemistry see dystrophin have the largest gene okay the largest gene in the human genome the largest gene in the human genome is there for dystrophin Answer. Now, what is the third type of protein? The third type of protein which I want you to know is a lipid anchored protein. And the example of this is the GPI. GPI is a protein which is an example of lipid anchored protein. Okay, GPI is a lipid anchored protein. Remember, GPI is a lipid anchored protein. If there is absence of this lipid anchored protein, gone. This lipid anchored protein is gone. It is going to cause which disease? if this lipid anchored protein if this gpi is not present on your cells especially rbcs wbcs platelets if it is not there then it is going to cause a condition called as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria okay, i don't want to go in detail if, if i go it will take a lot of time simple absence of a lipid anchored protein called as a gpi will cause pnh paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria so with that cell membrane uh, the basic things what and all you need to know about the lipids as well as the proteins are completed after that let's talk about this case cytoskeleton okay now take a deep breath okay so hope you can uh, understand everything your well, exam is also coming closer yeah excellent uh, 
Atixon, then yes, it's a CD55 as well as CD59, which are called as a DAF and MIRL. Okay, DAF and MIRL, which are actually present on the cell membrane surface, they are not present because GPA is not present. So, DAF and MIRL are not present. So, whenever the complements are activated, that will cause paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. I don't want to go into that pathological aspect now. Simple, GPA absent causes paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. That's it. That's it. After that, let's talk about the cytoskeleton. What is the function of cytoskeleton? The cytoskeleton maintains the shape, shape and structure. Okay. Yes, pygogen. Yes, you are absolutely true. Okay, you are true. So, cytoskeleton is the one which helps in shape of the cell, maintenance of the shape of the, uh, of the cell. What are coming under the cytoskeleton? Okay, which things, which molecules are coming under the cytoskeleton? See, the cytoskeleton includes microtubules, microfilaments, okay, microtubules, microfilaments as well as intermediate filaments. So, microtubules, microfilaments as well as the intermediate filaments. Now, remember, this microtubules and microfilaments, they are considered as dynamic cytoskeleton. Okay, they are considered as a dynamic cytoskeleton why? because they will change. Okay, they will change. Ah, okay, so they will change the shape uh, with the time. With the time, they will undergo polymerization. They will undergo depolymerization. So the length of microtubules and microfilaments is not going to be constant. They will change with the time. So that's why dynamic, dynamic cytoskeleton means dynamic means change, right? So microtubules and microfilaments are example of dynamic cytoskeleton. And this intermediary filaments, once they are there, they are not going to grow. So it's an example of static cytoskeleton. Okay, static. With the time, it won't grow. So now come, just tell me, cytoskeleton, it includes microtubules, microfilaments, as well as intermediary filaments. Answer. Next. Out of this microtubules, microfilaments and intermediate filaments, what are the strongest? The strongest cytoskeleton is microtubules. Okay, strongest is the microtubules. This microtubules consist of what? This microtubules made up of what? Look here, this microtubules are actually made up of dynins, okay, dynin, kinesin and the tubulins. So, dynins, kinesins and the tubulins they are a part of, okay, they are all a part of microtubules. You look here, for example, here, I am showing you. See, these are all tubulin molecules. Okay, these are all tubulin molecules. Now, all these tubulin molecules, they are arranging, okay, they are arranging in concentric rings and they are forming a microtubule. So, microtubule is made up of this tubulins, okay. And not only that, are you able to appreciate this kinesin? as well as this dynein, so dynein, kinesin, as well as this a tubulin, okay, this tubulins. So, this a tubulin, dynein and kinesin, all of them together, they forms the microtubules, okay. Now, here, what are the important points I want you to know is regarding this dynein and kinesin, okay, dynein and kinesin. I say, especially this is something important in a neurons, nerves, okay. I have already taught you, okay, I have already taught you, this microtubules, microtubules an example of a dynamic cytoskeleton, which means they will grow or they will shrink. This tubule can grow or it can shrink. So, whenever, for example, imagine this is a microtubule, okay, this is a microtubule made up of tubulin. Whenever new tubulin molecules, new tubulin molecules are getting added, so this is called as polymerization, right? Whenever the new tubulin molecules are getting added, the polymerization is happening. So, growth is happening. So, this end is considered as a positive terminus. Okay, this end is called as a positive terminus where polymerization of new tubulin molecules are happening and growth is happening. Positive side. Okay. And the other end is called as a negative end. Okay, positive as well as a negative end. So, now you know, see there is a positive side as well as a negative side. Now, you look here. Let's take this as a neuron. Okay. Now, let's consider this as a neuron. And what is this? This is an axon. Okay, here is a nerve terminal. Now, look here. Here is tubulin. For example, microtubule is there. Okay, here is a microtubule. Now, one side is considered as a positive side. 
other side is considered as a negative side. Okay. Now here the neurotransmitters are getting synthesized. The neurotransmitters are synthesized. Okay, I'm getting a little. I'm going a little fast now. See, the neurotransmitters are going to be synthesized in the cell body. This is the cell body, right? Cell body is the area where the neurotransmitters are going to be synthesized. So all these neurotransmitters are going to be captured in a vesicle. They are going to be filled in a vesicle. Now you should know very interesting thing. Look at this dynein. So what this dynein will do is dynein it will help in retrograde cargo. Dynein will help in retrograde cargo. And this kinesin it will help in anterograde cargo. Anterograde cargo and retrograde cargo. What exactly are this anterograde and retrograde cargo? Normally see. Okay, see this is a dynein molecule. It is helping in what? It is helping in anterograde movement, which means the vesicle. See the vesicle, it is moving from positive side to negative side. Okay, so if a vesicle with the help of this dynein, actually imagine I am a dynein. Okay, I am a dynein. I am holding this. Okay, I am holding this. I am taking this vesicle. Okay. The vesicle is containing the neurotransmitter. So the vesicular transport is happening with the help of this dynein from plus side to minus side. Okay, from plus side to minus side. This is called as the anterograde cargo. Okay, anterograde cargo. Only what they will ask in the exam is simple anterograde cargo. Which molecule is getting involved? Which microtubular molecule is getting involved? Dynein. And kinesin. Okay, so kinesin, it is involved in retrograde cargo so kinesin involved in the retrograde cargo dynein involved in retrograde cargo kinesin involved in retrograde cargo the point which i want you to know is see if you have infection with this rabies virus okay if you have infection with this rabies virus or polio virus if this tetanus a clostridium tetany enter into your body and it is producing a toxin called as tetanus toxin see these fellows okay these guys they will use this dynein molecule, okay? Okay, not here. It's just a typing mistake. They will use kinesin. Okay, they will use kinesin and they are getting transported. Now, imagine polio it enters into my body. Now, once polio enters into my body, Okay, when polio enters into your body, this polio virus, it uses this reverse axonal transport. It uses the reverse axonal transport to enter into the central nervous system. Okay. So, the point which I want you to know is simple, sir. Microtubules are the strongest. Microtubules are the strongest. Okay. Microtubules are made up of dynein, kinesin, as well as tubulin. Dynein, kinesin, as well as tubulin. So, dynein is involved in the anterograde moment kinesin is involved in the retrograde transport anterograde transport as well as a retrograde transport next microfilaments microfilaments examples what are the examples of the microfilaments the examples of the microfilaments include f actin f actin f actin means filamentous actin so filamentous actin it's a see actin which is present in the muscles that's a Okay, that's the, it's the same actin, but not only that, what I'm trying to put into your mind is imagine there is a cell. Imagine there is a cell. Even in the cell, there are these actin molecules, filamentous actin molecules, which are giving the shape, shape and structure of a cell. So, this filamentous actin molecules are examples of microfilaments. Okay, microfilaments. And remember, this, oh, it's a timing mistake. Okay, so F actin molecules are examples of microfilaments, and the last fellow which I want to discuss here the intermediary filaments. So this intermediary filaments already I have taught you. Intermediary filaments are the most abundant cytoskeletal proteins, and they are examples of static cytoskeletal. Okay, they are examples of a static cytoskeletal. This intermediary filaments are different types. There are different types of intermediary filaments, and different different types of intermediary filaments are present in different different types of cells. So, based on the intermediary filaments, you can actually identify what is the cell type. Okay. Now, let me give you a better example. See, 
intermediary filaments they are the most abundant cytoskeleton keratin is an example of intermediary filament keratin where this keratin is present keratin intermediary filament static cytoskeleton it is present mainly in the epithelial cells okay so keratin is considered as tumor marker it's a marker for the squamous cell carcinomas so tell me what is the marker for the squamous cell car carcinoma the marker for the squamous cell carcinomas are the keratin keratin is an example of intermediary filament keratin molecules are present in epithelial cells so for squamous cell carcinomas which are coming from the epithelial cells squamous cell carcinomas the tumor marker is keratin done next desmin where is this desmin present desmin it's just like dystrophin it is also present in the skeletal muscles okay so it acts like a marker of rhabdomyosarcomas the rhabdomyosarcomas are the cancers of the muscles right skeletal muscles so the, what is the tumor marker of rhabdomyosarcoma desmin what is the tumor marker of squamous cell carcinoma keratin symbol and gfap glial fibrillary acidic protein okay glial fibrillary acidic protein so this gfap glial fibrillary acidic protein is something present in the astrocytes is mainly present in the astrocytes so in astrocytomas tumors of the astrocytes in astrocytomas what is the tumor marker gfap glial fibrillary acidic protein is a tumor marker in the astrocytomas and vimentin vimentin yes again intermediate filament where it is present it is present in the mesenchymal cells like fibroblast okay so in all the mesenchymal tumors okay mesenchymal tumors are the tumors which are originating from the connective tissues connective tissues right so mainly this vimentin it is present in which connective tissue cell fibroblasts so vimentin is a tumor marker of cancers arising from the mesenchymal cells so right here the vimentin it's a tumor marker for the cancers arising from the connective tissues are uh, from the mesenchymal cells okay and last important intermediary filament is a lamin okay last okay oh what i meant and did i say something wrong yeah dynein retrograde canisin anterograde yes have i said something wrong okay 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 oh my god see why when i'm going fast when i'm going fast i made a small mistake okay yeah which means you are listening good okay you are paying attention yes dynein sorry guys it's my mistake it's a dynein is the one which helps in okay this is small small thing the concept is one and the same okay let me write it clear here dynein okay dynein it is helping in retrograde simple okay okay yes yes you are true dynein helps in retrograde kinesin helps in antro great that's it it's the same thing retrograde anterograde you know it so who is helping in uh, di uh, dynein helps in retrograde transport yes true and kinesin it is helping in the anterograde transport that's a small change which you can make now let's come back laminin this lamin again it's a intermediary filament where it is present it is present in the nucleus and whenever this lamin it is mutated this is integration with the pathology whenever this lamin which is a present within the nucleus okay it's actually present in the nucleus whenever it is mutated it's going to cause a disease called as a progeria okay so it's going to cause a disease called as progeria one such example of progeroid syndrome is a werner syndrome okay werner syndrome what is this werner syndrome the patients are getting age very quickly okay premature aging okay yeah here i have written there is a premature aging you can uh, have like you know i hope you have already seen such kind of uh, like you know cases so the point which i want you to know is the lamin is an intermediary protein it is present in the nucleus a mutation okay mutation of this lamin is going to cause a progeroid syndromes one of the example of the progeroid syndrome is vermus where premature aging is happening so just as a recap now tell me keratin it's present in the epithelial cells marker of squamous cell carcinomas keratin pearls are the markers of squamous cell carcinomas desmin present in the skeletal muscles marker of rhabdomyosarcomas gfap 
glial fibrillary acidic protein is going to be present in the astrocytes marker of astrocytomas and vimentin vimentin is present in the mesenchymal cells like fibroblasts or the connective tissue cells so this vimentin is a marker of tumors which are arising from the mesenchymal cells and the lamin lamin it is present in the nucleus defect of this lamin is going to cause a progeroid syndromes like vermo syndrome where premature aging is going to be seen and again i am correcting dynamin is helping in the retrograde transport no doubt yes dynamin is helping in the retrograde transport and the retrograde transport is the used by the tetanus toxin retrograde transport is used by the a polio virus polio virus as well as the tetanus toxin as well as uh, one more fellow that is a uh, rabies virus okay now they will use this retrograde transport please uh, make uh, yeah here it was very clear yeah dynein this dynein molecule this is true okay dynein molecule yes helps in the reverse axonal transport or retrograde okay, retrograde transport yeah true okay guys uh, now let me integrate a few things with the pharmacology the points which i want you to know is this is a tubulin tubulin is what it's a tubulin is it a part of microtubule is it a part of microfilament or is it a part of uh, intermediate filament you know tubulin is a part of microtubule the strongest one okay the strongest one with the bigger diameter is a microtubules remember so this is a tubulin okay tubulin it helps in the mitotic spindle formation okay the tubulin look here this one a tubulin all these are the tubulin monomers see each molecule is a tubulin okay alpha tubulin beta tubulin gamma tubulin different types of tubulins are there but point is tubulin during cell division you have this mitotic spindle right the mitotic spindles which will separate the chromosomes so that the mitotic spindle it is forming with the help of tubulin so this there are these drugs like vinca alkaloids like vincristin vinblastin a uh, colchicin and a <clears throat> taxin group of drugs like pla pla placitaxel there are different group of drugs which will inhibit the microtubules so what are the examples of microtubule formation inhibitors microtubule inhibitors include vincristin vinblastin and colchicin are you think logically and tell me normally cell division if you want to have a cell division there should be mitotic spindle formation the chromosomes need to be separated but whenever you use these drugs like vinblastin vincristin colchicin placitaxel these drugs what they will do they are microtubule inhibitors whenever the microtubules are getting inhibited do you think cell division will occur now do you think cell division will occur now no the cell division is not going to occur now no not possible whenever there is no cell division it's going to be good in which conditions in the treatment of cancers so these drugs like vincristin vin, uh, vincristin vinblastin as well as placitaxel they are used in the treatment of cancers so remember vincristin vinblastin they are examples of anti cancer drugs they are microtubule inhibitors even the colchicin okay colchicin this colchicin is also microtubule inhibitor used in the treatment of acute gout okay acute gout okay gout because of hyperuricemia because of accumulation of uh, uh, crystals okay crystals the uric acid crystals in the joints okay crystal arthropathy it causes the crystal arthropathy right the patient is going to have podagra the things okay that's all so with this intermediate filaments are also completed okay now take a deep breath <sighs> cytoskeleton is also completed now after the cytoskeleton okay after the cytoskeleton let's discuss about one more important topic which is the cellular fluids okay now let's discuss about the cellular fluids in the cellular fluid topic for your exam i'm just teaching for the exam going batch are before going to the exam at least what should what you should know right how much water okay imagine i am an adult male out of my body weight how much percent is actually water see 60% of my total body weight okay if i am 75 kilos 60% of that is going to be water so 60% of the total body weight that is for example if you take adult as a 70 kg okay imagine i am a 70 kg definitely i am not 70 kg anyway i am little lower weight but if you take an adult male as 70 kg out of 70 60% is 42 okay so 60% of the total body weight is water that is 42 liters 
this is a little different for males as well as females. Adult males, yes, 60% of the total body weight is water. But in females, when compared to what, females are little obese, like you know, they are having little bit more adipose tissue, okay, in the breast tissue, in the abdomen, in the buttocks. Females are having more fat when compared to males, okay. So, in females, as there is extra fat, the water, like you know, quota is coming down, okay. So, the females have 50% of water. Okay, in the total body weight, 50% of it means female is a 50% water, 50% of the remaining. Okay, half of the female is water in the simple way, but 60% of the male is water. Okay, next children in children, this is little different. Children, 75% of the children are nothing but the water. If you have a child, 75% of the baby is water only. So, male 60%, female 50%, and 75% of the children, the total body weight is water. Next, sir, you already know total body weight, uh, total body water is 42 liters. Now let's divide the entire total body waters into two parts. Okay. <laughs> See total body total body water is 42 liters. If we divide the entire water which is present in the body into two major things, that is the intracellular water, like a, the fluid which is present within the cells in the, in the form of cytoplasm. Okay, in the cell cytoplasm is there, no, that's also a water. You should you should consider it as a water. So total body water is mainly divided into two types. Okay, that is the intracellular fluid as well as the extracellular fluid. Intracellular as well as extracellular means within the cells, outside the cells. Within the cells is the cytoplasm, outside the cells is the extracellular fluid. Now question is, who is more? Intracellular fluid is more or extracellular fluid is more? The intracellular fluid, it is two-thirds. Okay, most of the students will think extracellular fluid, sir, extracellular fluid is plasma, no, so much plasma is there, so much blood is there, so extracellular fluid is more. No. Intracellular fluid, okay, intracellular fluid is a more, sir. okay, intracellular fluid is more, 28 liters, okay, 28 liters, out of this 42, out of the 42, that is two-thirds, okay, two-thirds, that is 28 liters is intracellular fluid, then how much is extracellular fluid, extracellular fluid is only one-third, okay, so extracellular fluid, it is one-third, how much is one-third, 14, okay, 14 liters, so now tell me, total body water is 42 liters. In a male, I am talking about a male, okay. In male, 42 liters. In this 42 liters, how much is intracellular? Sir, intracellular is 28. That is within the cytoplasm, within the cells. And extracellular, outside the cell. Extracellular is just 14 liters. 14, 14, 14. 14 plus 14, 28. 28 plus 14 is 42. Simple. Done, sir. Now, let's, uh, let's divide this extracellular fluid. Okay, extracellular fluid into different parts. Outside the cell, where do we have fluid? You know, plasma, you know this one thing, plasma. But in between the cells, imagine, there is this one cell, there is this one other cell. Inside the cell, there is intracellular water, okay, intracellular. But in between the cells also, there is little amount of fluid present. That is called as interstitial fluid, okay. Interstitial fluid is the major extracellular fluid, remember. It is not the plasma again. Plasma is just only one-fourth. Extracellular fluids are divided into interstitial fluid, which means the fluid which is present between the cells. So, interstitial fluid, okay, as well as the plasma. Interstitial fluid as well as the plasma, okay. So, how much is the interstitial fluid? Interstitial fluid is three-fourth, sir. Three-fourth. Now, just think logically, man. Just think logically. Say, extracellular fluid, how much total? Are extracellular fluid is one-third of the total body water, one third means 14 liters, out of this 14 liters, see, now I am dividing, the, the extracellular fluid is divided into intracellular, uh, interstitial fluid, how much interstitial fluid is, three fourth, so out of this 14, three fourth is the interstitial fluid, okay, you can just calculate, you can divide it, okay, plasma is one fourth, okay, plasma is one fourth. So, these are the major things. So, now tell me, extracellular fluids, only whatever I am teaching, only concentrate on those. Extracellular fluid is divided into, extracellular fluid, 14 liters, it is divided into interstitial fluid, that is 3 fourth, and the plasma, which is 1 fourth. Not only this, there is a special type of fluid, which is not coming, actually, most of the books, it, it won't consider this transcellular fluid under the extracellular fluid, it is a total separate different entity together, but 
anyway it is also present outside the cell right okay let's consider it as an extracellular fluid see there is fluid also present in the pericardial cavity pericardial cavity that is called as a pericardial fluid how much almost 50 ml 50 ml of pericardial fluid is there mcq in between our pleura between parietal pleura as well as visceral pleura some amount of fluid is there that is called as a pleural fluid into 20 ml will be there that's also an extracellular fluid outside the cells okay and csf mcq 150 ml of fluid csf okay cerebrospinal fluid which is not present within the cells but outside the cells so now what i'm trying to put into your mind is sir the total body water is divided into intracellular extracellular okay intracellular is majority two thirds are intracellular one third is extracellular the extracellular is further divided into interstitial plasma as well as a transcellular out of this who is the major one is the interstitial fluid okay so two thirds sorry three fourths three fourths is the interstitial fluid one fourth is the plasma okay and there is some amount of transcellular fluid which is present in some body cavities that's it after this what you should know is how to calculate the total body water or how to calculate it man like you know all these things are for physiology only like you know when they are doing experiments as a doctors you don't need to know all these things as a doctor in your clinical practice it won't help you but physiologists while they are doing experiments conducting like you know experiments then these things are important how to measure the total body water is there is a method called as indicator dilution principle or stuart hamilton method okay this is there is a method called as stuart hamilton method like so it works on it works on it works on indicator dilution principle okay which means you are going to inject an indicator and based on how much it is getting diluted based on how much it is getting diluted you can estimate you can estimate so now tell me total body water is going to be measured with which method stuart hamilton method stuart hamilton method is going to work on which principle indicator dilution indicator dilution principle now there are different different body fluids right intracellular extracellular transcellular fluid interstitial fluid plasma so many things are there so there are different different indicators which are used to measure different different compartments for example if you want to measure the total body water then what is the indicator used deuterium oxide mcq many times was asked in pg exams so deuterium oxide is the best indicator to measure the total body water like if you want to measure the extracellular fluid outside the cells extracellular fluid then the indicators are going to be inulin mannitol and sucrose inulin mannitol sucrose are the indicators of the extracellular fluid indicators of the plasma the best indicators are radio labeled albumin and evans blue dye so radio labeled albumin or evans blue dye, and evans blue dye they are the indicators for measuring the plasma and <coughs> blood volume okay not the total body water total body water is deuterium oxide blood volume how much is the blood volume 4 liters 5 liters 6 liters something like that so blood volume is going to be measured with the chromium tagged rbc now it is used as an indicator okay as a doctor no like you know you will never are going to have these things in your life but for example purpose you should know this indicators what they will measure Ra <coughs> chromium tagged rbc are going to measure the blood volume radio labeled albumin is going to measure the plasma and deuterium oxide used to measure the total body water <coughs> so these are the different indicators measuring the different different volumes after this what else you should know is in one of the exam in the recent exam this question was asked blood volume they will give you certain values in the question and they will ask you to calculate the blood volume how to calculate the blood volume what is the formula the formula for calculating the blood volume is in the question definitely they will mention you plasma how much is the plasma 3 liters 4 liters they will give you the plasma okay so plasma divided by <laughs> plasma divided by 1 minus hematocrit plasma divided by 1 minus hematocrit is a plasma divided by 1 minus hematocrit is the formula to calculate the blood volume so blood volume is calculated by this formula mcq okay hematocrit value also they will give you hematocrit 40 percent 30 percent or 50 percent okay percent means for example if it is 50 percent 0 0.5 1 minus 0 0.5 you can take something like that okay so plasma value they will give you hematocrit value they will give you so plasma divided by 1 minus hematocrit will give you will tell you the blood volume but what is the indicator used to measure the blood volume the indicator is chromium tagged rbc's don't forget okay now one more important question with aging from birth imagine there is a baby 
okay time passing one year two year three year four year five year something like that with increasing in age with increasing in age which fluids will increase which fluids will decrease which body fluids will increase which body fluids will decrease is you should know that with age total body water will actually decrease extracellular fluid will decrease but intracellular fluid is a one which increases mcq okay with aging okay when while you're coming into the adult from birth to adult with aging total body water decreases simple no in the baby i have already taught you 75 percent of the baby is water so total body water will gradually come down when you age okay so total body water decreases extracellular fluids decreases but intracellular fluids increases with aging next there is something important at three months at three months three to four months okay three to four months when you check extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid normally extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid they are not the same things who is more intracellular fluids are more than compared to the extracellular fluids that what i have already taught you okay here i have taught you the extracellular fluids are less than the intracellular fluids i have taught you intracellular fluids are more when compared to the extracellular fluids but at what time in the life at what time in the life the extracellular fluids and intracellular fluids are equal in one is to one composition is three to four months at three to at three to four months the extracellular and intracellular fluids are going to be equal in composition okay so with this the total body water topic is also completed okay welcome back guys now this is the last session for the rapid revision of the physiology now in this class let's do the leftover topics so many students are asking me about the nerve and muscle physiology what are the important topics which you should know for the nerve and muscle physiology that will be discussed in this last session okay if you have any doubts you can all the time keep it in the chat box okay i will uh, try to answer as many as possible so in this class whatever the leftover topics the muscle physiology and nerve physiology the mainly we are going to concentrate on the nerve physiology and muscle physiology also important mcqs okay which were asked from the respiratory physiology as well as the central nervous system whatever the leftover things are there that will be discussed okay just stay for the next 3 hours 100% i can assure you from muscle physiology one question nerve physiology one question central nervous system respiratory at least four to five questions will be coming at least least to least you will get four mcqs for sure in the upcoming fmg exam no doubt in that okay so stay with me and let's complete the topics okay guys let's begin the show now let's begin with the muscle physiology okay the muscles which are helping in the contraction the first type of muscle which i'm going to discuss here is a skeletal muscle why is skeletal see we know there are skeletal muscles uh, smooth muscles as well as a cardiac muscle there are three types of muscles why is skeletal muscle is called as skeletal muscle simple you know because the muscles are attached to the skeletons right now in this skeletal muscle ah uh, okay i will try to be a little slow um if you have any doubt you can all the time ask me in the uh, chat box i will try to be slow see this skeletal muscle you are looking the skeletal muscle over here now the muscle okay i am showing you the muscle inside the muscle see there are lot of this bundles present what exactly are there so inside a muscle you are having fascicles okay fascicles are present within the muscle okay lot of fascicles are there now inside this fascicles even you look into the fascicle even there are lot of these bundles present so what exactly are these these are the muscle fibers so inside a fascicle there are muscle fibers actually these are the muscle cells the real muscle cells are this muscle fibers okay the myocytes the muscle fibers are the real cells okay now inside this muscle fiber okay this is the muscle fiber no okay this is the muscle fiber inside the muscle fiber what do you have you have the myofibrils okay you have the myofibrils so what is the order muscle fascicle muscle fiber and myofibril see i am showing you one myofibril here you know this is the skeletal muscle inside the skeletal muscle what do we have fascicles are there inside the fascicles what do we have the myofibers are there inside the myofibers we have myofibrils now if you look here see this is the myofibril now in this myofibrils sir uh, i should say sir what exactly are this myofibrils okay what exactly are this myofibrils see this myofibrils are nothing but the actin and myosin 
okay inside a muscle fiber inside a muscle fiber okay look here inside a muscle fiber you have myofibrils what are these myofibrils sir myofibrils are nothing but actin and myosin okay so this is just for your understanding purpose no, no questions will come simple muscle fascicle myofibers myofibrils myofibrils are nothing but the actin as well as the myosin okay now after this what you should know here the same thing was given muscle fascicle myofibers and myofibrils what are this myofibril there are two type of myofibrils are this myo this myofibers yeah myofibers have the myofibrils there are two type of myofibrils present which are called as the myofilaments okay these are the intermediary filaments which are nothing but the actin as well as the myosin okay no one will ask you in that detail simple what they will ask you is look here the in this myofibril in this myofibril actin and myosin are there no if you look here there is a z line okay let me show you here there is a z line and there is a, a z line so in between these two z lines whatever the area is present with the actin and myosin center here is, is the myosin this is the myosin and here the blue color things are the actins this is an actin okay the blue color things are the actin and whatever i am highlighting here this is the myosin so myosin and actin are there no so this area which is present between okay so this is one z line and this is the other z line so this area in between the two z lines is called as a sarcomere okay sarcomere and that sarcomere first mcq the functional unit of a muscle is called as a sarcomere mcq so what is the functional unit of a muscle the functional unit of a muscle is called as a sarcomere and where exactly is the sarcomere present sir sir the sarcomere is present between two z lines two z lines okay it's between the two z lines done now these are the questions which were asked previously what is the thick filament in the sarcomere there is a thin filament there is a thick filament so what is the thick filament the thick filament is called as the myosin okay in the center i have shown you right so these are the myosins now whatever i am highlighting these are the myosins so myosins are considered as a thick filaments and what are the thin filaments the thin filaments say these red color things which are there here here okay these actin filaments are considered as thin filaments these actin filaments okay so thin filament is actin okay done sir now in the previous exam this question has been asked are if if you want to contract a muscle yeah the actin and myosin they should interact there is something called as a sliding filament theory you know right so what is the energy it's a active process muscle contraction is an active process so who is giving energy atp is giving energy atp is being utilized so that's why it's called as a active process muscle contraction where this atp is getting hydrolyzed where the adp is getting broken down into adp and inorganic phosphate where the myosin heads later i will show you in the myosin there is a head region myosin heads the myosin head is containing this atp as activity so in the myosin head atp will be broken down into adp okay done sir now here okay guys is it everything clear arun kk yeah cns and respiratory system will also be done okay cns and respiratory system all the important mcqs will be done mean this this is the final class okay now tell me come on guys is it everything clear shall i go forward <coughs> okay now look here concentrate on this okay concentrate on this for a minute here you already know but let me tell you the central things here are the myosin these are the thick filaments okay these are the thick filaments myosin thick filament is a myosin now what is this red color thing this is the actin okay actin as well as myosin okay every student knows this but the question what they will ask you is so this is the z line no doubt see this actin is attached to the z line okay actin is attached to the z line with the help of which protein that one thing they will ask you second thing are you able to appreciate this uh, like you know little uh, yellow color thing which i have which i am highlighting here okay which is shown there as little blue color bluish color okay so this one okay so what exactly is this which is present along the length of the actin there is something which is present along the length of the actin 
that you should know what is that third one which i want you to know is sir look here the myosin the central things myosin it is getting attached this myosin it is attached to two places one thing the myosin is attached to this m band in the center okay and the myosin is also attached to this myosin with the help of this blue color substance it is attached to z lines so what is this blue color thing we'll discuss one by one okay now first fellow which i want you to know is the actin actin molecule attachment to the z line actin molecule attachment to the z line is with the help of a protein called as alpha actinin alpha actinin binds the actin thin filaments to the z line that okay second fellow sir what the hell is this a titan okay titan see titan regarding titan even recently the question has been asked titan is considered as a spring muscle spring it is the one which gives the elasticity to the muscle the elasticity okay recurring back the elasticity to the muscle is because of elastic properties are because of titan titan is the largest protein in the human beings and the one more point about the titan is myosin is there right myosin in the center myosin is there this myosin is attached to the z lines is with the help of this titan okay the blue color thing which i have shown here look um where is it see here a titan is there see this a titan molecules on one side they are attaching to the myosin this titan is attaching the myosin to the z line okay titan elastic properties titan the largest protein in the humans titan attaches the myosin to the z lines okay what is alpha actinin alpha actinin it attaches actin to the z line done sir okay next guys is it clear shall i go forward come on arun jenny kk <clears throat> shall i go forward am i going fast do you feel am i going fast do you feel so please let me know okay titan it's the largest protein the largest gene is a dystrophin gene okay largest gene in the human genome is the dystrophin gene but what is the largest protein the largest protein is the titan okay now titan is the one which gives the elastic properties to the skeletal muscle and it is considered as a muscle spring muscle spring okay now what this titan is doing already taught you titan it attaches the myosin to the z lines then sir that now the opposite thing sir myosin is there the myosin is attached to the m line what is that look here see this myosin in the center it's there no look here guys this green color fellow it is attaching to this m okay see this myosin is attached to the m line myosin to m m to m simple it start with the letter myomycin m same letter so myosin it is attached myosin attachment to the m line in the center is with the help of myomycin okay i have discussed about the alpha actinin okay alpha actinin i have discussed about the titan i have discussed about the myomycin myomycin attaches the myosin to the m band or the m line okay i should i am it's a m line okay next then what is this a nebulin sir something looking like a nebula from the avengers no see this a nebulin what is the importance i have already taught you there is something which is present along the actin okay there is something here i have shown you see this one this one okay this guy which is present along the length of the actin see this guy is nothing but nebulin so what is the importance of this nebulin sir okay students some students might confuse it as sir actin it's having the troponin tropomyosin yeah this is not the troponin or tropomyosin this is something different now this is called as a nebulin it is present along the actin it is present along the actin what is the function it regulates the length of the actin the length of the actin filaments okay after the contraction the length of the actin filaments is regulated by nebulin alpha actin for completed myomycin is completed next titan completed now nebulin is also completed then sir done next desmin in the muscle not only those proteins which ever i have discussed <clears throat> there are certain other proteins okay which are present in the muscle membrane okay like dystrophin these things are there in your exam this uh, like you know repeatedly asked i'm just getting little deviated see there is a protein in your muscle membrane in the sarcolemma okay in the sarcolemma in the muscle there is a muscle cell myocyte or my muscle fiber is there okay myofiber myofiber is there 
Now, these myofibers are also having the cell membrane, right? Now, in this cell membrane, there is a very important protein. This I am highlighting even in the last classes, which was the question asked in the last FMG exam, 2022 FMG exam. Okay, this question was asked. See, there is a protein called as the dystrophin. It is a peripheral protein. In the general physiology also, I have discussed this. This is not an integral protein. This is a peripheral protein called as the dystrophin. What is this importance? The dystrophin, it gives the tensile strength to the cell membrane. It gives the tensile strength to the cell membranes. If the dystrophin, if it is a defective, it is going to cause Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Okay, sorry, the word I should use is absent, complete absence, not just defective. If it is defective, it will cause, it will cause Becker's muscular dystrophy. If, the, if this protein, if this dystrophin, I will show you the image also. If this dystrophin, if it is completely absent, then it is going to cause a disease called as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Next, one more protein is there, which is called as a desmin. Okay, desmin. What is this desmin? See, this desmin is an intermediary filament. Okay, desmin, it's an intermediary filament. It's an intermediary filament. You know, right, in, in last class, in the cytoskeleton topic, in the cytoskeleton we have discussed, there are <coughs> microfilament, intermediary filaments. Okay, in that topic, in the topic of intermediary filaments, there also I have discussed it, desmin. Where it is present, sir, this desmin, it is present in the skeletal muscles. It is mean it's, it's an intermediary filament present in the skeletal muscles. Okay. Now, this desmin is considered as questions asked from pathology and physiology as well. This desmin, it is considered as a marker of rhabdomyosarcomas. Okay. Rhabdomyosarcomas means what? Rhabdomyo means skeletal muscle. Sarcoma means the cancer. So, rhabdomyosarcomas. For the rhabdomyosarcomas, the tumor marker is desmin. What is desmin, sir? Desmin is an intermediary filament present in the skeletal muscles. Okay? Okay. Now, <clears throat> is everything clear? Okay. Come on, guys. Whatever we have discussed, we have discussed about desmin as well as dystrophin. Okay? Now, let me discuss about the dystrophin a little in detail. Okay, why? Because this is a very, very important question, okay, which was tested in the PG exams. This is going to be the last FMG exam. You should not take it, like, you know, like, you should not take it granted. You should not go to your exam without preparing. So, listen, this area is very, very important. Now, what is this area, sir? Now, here I am talking, whatever I am showing you, look at this. This is the membrane. This is the membrane, cell membrane, also called as a sarcolemma, sarcolemma, the muscle cell membrane. Okay. Now, in this muscle cell membrane, are you able to appreciate some integral proteins are present? Means throughout the cell membrane, some proteins are present. Some integral present. Some integral proteins are present. Some peripheral proteins are present. See, this is a peripheral protein. This is one peripheral protein. So, what are these integral proteins and what are the peripheral proteins? Simple, simple. Look here. First protein which I am discussing is are you able to appreciate this violet color one? See, alpha subunit, beta subunit is there. Alpha subunit, beta subunit of what? What is the name of this integral protein? This integral protein is called as a dystroglycans. Aha, okay. Dystroglycan is a one integral protein. Okay, sir. Next. See, there are these blue color integral proteins, which I am highlighting here. These are called as a sarcoglycans. Okay, there is a dystroglycan as well as sarcoglycan. Okay, sir. So, the same thing which I have shown here. See, in the muscle cell membrane, the sarcolemma, there is dystrophin. Sorry, uh, first, first, uh, first, let's come from here. There is a dystroglycan. See, it is a IP. IP means integral protein. First, I am talking about the integral protein, means which is passing through the cell membrane, integral protein. And there is sarcoglycan. Okay, dystroglycan is a sarcoglycan is there. Next. What are the peripheral proteins? See, attached to this dystroglycan, are you able to appreciate this dystrophin? See, this red color thing. This red color thing, okay, let me show you with the red color only. See, this fellow. This fellow is a dystrophin. It is getting attached to dystroglycan. Okay. And there is this green color thing, which is a peripheral protein. Again, it's present only on one side of the cell membrane. It's present only on the one side of the cell membrane. That's why it's called as a peripheral protein. 
So this is called as the syntropins. Okay. Syntropin as well as dystropin. So syntropin and dystropin, they are peripheral proteins which are present inside the cell membrane. And what are the two integral proteins? The two integral proteins are dystroglycan, sarcoglycan. Okay. So these are the points which I want you to know. There is one more protein which is also uh, which is called as a sarcospan. Here the last fellow is there. No, this is called as sarcospan. Not that important. Not that important. Okay. So at least I want you to know. Are sir two integral proteins are there? What are the two integral proteins? <coughs> Dystroglycan as well as sarcoglycan. There are two peripheral proteins present. What are the two peripheral proteins? Dystrophin as well as syntropin. That's it. Question which was asked in one of the Central Institute exams is if there is any problem with dystrophin, you already know the disease. If there is absence of this dystrophin, dystrophin absence is going to cause a Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Okay. Next, if there is any defect with the sarcoglycan complex, okay, here there is sarcoglycan, so this, these fellows, okay, this integral protein. If there is any defect in the sarcoglycan, then it is going to cause limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, previously asked MCQ, limb girdle muscular dystrophy is due to problem in where? Sarcoglycans. Sarcoglycans are integral proteins. Done, sir. Completed. Okay. Next, what else you should know? See, direct questions, which I want you to know are, normally, during resting state, during resting state, muscle, muscle is not contracting. Okay. So, actin and myosin, they are not interacting. Why? Why? Because, on the surface of actin, what do you have? For example, imagine this is actin. Actin contains the active sites. Okay, actin contains active sites. But these active sites, during resting state, they are closed. They are closed. The active sites on actin, they are closed, sir. By whom? By whom? By tropomyosin. So, the number one MCQ point which I want you to know is there is a regulatory protein. Okay, this is a regulatory protein which is called as a tropomyosin. What this tropomyosin is doing? When the muscle is not contracting, when the muscle is in resting state or in active state, this tropomyosin, it blocks the active sites on actin. Okay? Next important regulatory protein. The next important regulatory protein is called as a troponin. Okay, troponin. There are different types of troponins. But here I am talking about the troponin C. C for calcium. What I want you to know is C. Array, look, understand. Here I am showing you actin. Okay, imagine actin is actually made up of uh, globular actins. But here I am showing you, imagine this is actin. Okay, actin. So on the surface of actin, what do we have? See, on the surface of actin, we have active sites. Okay, active sites are there. To which the myosin heads will go. See, the myosin heads will go and bind with the active sites. Okay. Now, these active sites, they are closed by what? The active sites, they are closed by tropomyosin. For your understanding purpose, I am showing you like this. Okay, these are, this is not anatomically correct, but understanding purpose, it is easy. There is something called as tropomyosin. Tropomyosin, what it is doing? It is covering the active sites. Okay, sir. Now, there is one more thing, one more protein which is present is called as troponin. Okay, imagine this is the troponin C. Okay. See, what is this troponin C is doing? See, this troponin C, what it will do is, it will bind with the calcium. Okay, whenever calcium binds with the troponin C, the calcium is binding with the troponin C. Now, do you know what this troponin will do? Troponin will bring the change in the tropomyosin. Whenever the calcium is coming and binding with the troponin C, now this troponin will move away will, or will bring the conformational change in the tropomyosin. So now tropomyosin is moving away from the active sites. So the active sites are going to be exposed. Simple point is calcium binds with what? Calcium binds with tropomyosin. Sorry, a troponin. Calcium binds with the troponin. Active sites are blocked by the active sites on the actin are blocked by tropomyosin. Calcium binds with troponin. Done, sir. Okay. Now, after this, what else should you should know? For the next five minutes, please be very attentive. This area is a little tricky, but very high yielding. Okay, very high yielding. If they want to integrate, if they want to test you, 
really whether you are good or not they will give the question from this area okay here are, this membrane is sarcolemma sarcolemma that's the muscle membrane this muscle membrane okay now i am talking about one muscle cell okay myofiber look here now i am talking about what this one okay now i am talking about this one muscle fiber now in this one muscle fiber i am showing you look this is one muscle fiber now this muscle fiber it is covered by what it is covered by this sarcolemma now this sarcolemma look it is having this imaginations the sarcolemma is having imaginations this imagination whatever i am pointing here this is called as t tubule so now tell me mcq so t tubules are the imaginations of sarcolemma there is one more tubule called as the l tubule so t tubule you know mcq completed what is the l tubule okay the l tubule this is longitudinal in nature no this is longitudinal so that's why it's called as the l tubule sir what exactly is this l tubule this l tubule is nothing but sarco plasmic reticulum a okay, sarco plasmic reticulum aha okay in a muscle fiber in a muscle fiber there is a t tubule present there is a l tubule present t tubule l tubule present t tubule is nothing but the imagination of the sarcolemma and this l tubule is nothing but the sarcoplasmic reticulum sarcoplasmic reticulum very very important mcq is sarcoplasmic reticulum it stores what what is getting stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum sir if you look inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum what is present it's a storehouse of calcium okay mcq so sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium okay sir then now let me tell you the story this is your neuron okay this is your alpha motor neuron okay alpha motor neuron means that neuron which will cause contraction of the muscles okay then the muscles are innervated by the neuron no that neuron is called as the alpha motor neuron it is simple from your spinal cord alpha motor neuron from your spinal cord alpha motor neuron is coming to your muscles now this alpha motor neuron is activated it is getting depolarized action potentials are happening now what what will happen sir this alpha motor neuron it is releasing which neurotransmitter sir it is releasing acetylcholine mcq so what is the neurotransmitter in neuromuscular junction see this is a neuron okay this is a muscle okay this is a muscle fiber no so in between a neuron and muscle fiber there is a junction there is a synapse so this is synapse is nothing but the neuro muscular junction so mcq is what is the neurotransmitter in neuromuscular junction sir it is acetylcholine acetylcholine okay now this acetylcholine look now this acetylcholine it is acting where sir it is acting on this receptor there is a receptor in the neuromuscular junction so what is the name of this receptor this is called as nicotinic receptor okay it is nm n m type of nicotinic receptor nicotinic receptor so mcq is what alpha motor neurons are releasing which neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction completed see this acetylcholine it is coming and it helps in the muscle contraction true but how this acetylcholine it is coming and binding to which receptor nicotinic receptor nm type of nicotinic receptor okay sir now look here whenever this acetylcholine is binding here what happens the nm type of receptor is activated and now sodium influx is happening into the cell okay sodium is coming into the cell now you know when sodium comes into the cell positive charges are coming into the cell now the cell will start to undergo depolarization okay so that's why whenever acetylcholine okay whenever this acetylcholine is coming into the muscles uh, sorry whenever it's acting on the nicotinic m receptor nm type of receptor the sodium influx will happen into the cell now because of the sodium influx see there is depolarization activation the cell membrane the sarcolemma is getting activated getting positivity now mcqs you should know what happens how exactly muscle contraction happens is whenever 
this depolarization happens what happens is before knowing that i should uh, actually teach you two more things look on this t tubule i have already taught you what is the t tubule imagination t tubule on the t tubule have you appreciated this green color thing okay this green color thing have you appreciated this what is this channel the channel which is present on the t tubule sir the channel which is present on the t tubule this is called as dhpr dihydropyridine calcium channel okay this dihydropyridine calcium channel it is present where it is present on t tubule okay okay sir now look at the sarcoplasmic reticulum look on the sarcoplasmic reticulum are you able to appreciate this blue color channel which i am highlighting right now the blue color channel is called as rhinodine receptor rhinodine receptor so two mcqs completed on the t tubule what is present dhpr dihydropyridine calcium channel is present on the t tubule okay on the l tubule on the sarcoplasmic reticulum which channel is present rhinodine receptor is present now you will have a story sir why we need to know all this now you will understand see first step neuron is activated neuron depolarization happened okay this neuron depolarization is releasing what acetylcholine okay now what this acetylcholine is doing acting on which receptor nm type of nicotinic receptor okay because of this what happens sodium comes into the cell sodium influx happens completed sir now because of the sodium influx the muscle membrane the sarcolemmal membrane undergoing the depolarization now see depolarization this depolarization is doing what it is activating the dihydropyridine <coughs> receptor now it's activating what dihydropyridine receptor okay which is also called as see this pav 1.1 Okay, you no need to remember the CAV 1.1 for FMG exam. It's not that important. At least remember this dihydropyridine calcium channel is activated. Now see this dihydropyridine receptor. Now do you know what it is doing? It will activate. It will further activate mechanically. Okay, mechanically it will further activate this rhinodine receptor. Okay, if your if your friend is activated, he will activate you. Okay, try to understand like this. so once the dihydropyridine receptor is activated it activates what it further activates rhinodine receptor now sir see once this rhinodine receptor is opened because of the dhpr dhpr is causing the conformational change in the rhinodine receptor once the rhinodine receptor is opened do you know what happens the calcium all this calcium which is present okay in the sarco and sarcoplasmic reticulum it will start to come out now you know this calcium is a one which helps in the contraction of the muscle so which ion is needed for the contraction of the muscle calcium okay so important topics are completed now the important topics regarding this topic uh, uh, this particular area so now tell me for the muscle skeletal muscle contraction which type of neurons are needed alpha motor neurons or gamma motor neurons which neurons alpha motor neurons okay alpha motor neurons are needed for the skeletal muscle contraction next thing what is a neurotransmitter in neuromuscular junction in the neuromuscular junction the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine acetylcholine is acting on which receptor nm type of nicotinic receptor on the t tubule okay on the t tubule which channel is present dihydropyridine receptor or dihydropyridine calcium channel is present okay dhpr is present on the t tubule once dhpr is activated it will activate what it will activate the rhinodine receptor rhinodine calcium channel okay but this rhinodine uh, receptor where it is present so the rhinodine receptors are present on the l tubule nothing but sarcoplasmic reticulum once the rvr is activated calcium will come out of the rvr helps in the contraction helps in the contraction of the muscle or helps in the sliding of actin over the myosin next what else are needed one single liner question is there what is the motor unit it was a single liner question uh, which i want you to know just simple guys is it clear am i going fast is it clear or am i going fast guys love from botswana right mori khami you are from botswana if you have any questions you can all the time ask here come on arun kk is it okay or am i going fast
Okay. Hope everything is clear. Now, now see what is a motor unit? It's a singular equation. Motor unit means nothing. Very simple. There is this alpha motor neuron. You know it. Alpha motor neuron. See this one alpha motor neuron. It's like a naughty guy. It's not satisfied with one muscle fiber. It's not satisfied. It's like a naughty guy. Okay, it's like a playboy. He is not satisfied with one muscle fiber. So what he is doing is he is innervating multiple muscle fibers. See, they, this is one muscle fiber. This is the other muscle fiber. This is the other muscle fiber. This is the other muscle fiber. So even in your muscles, one alpha motor neuron, whatever is going, this alpha motor neuron, it innervates multiple muscle fibers or multiple myocytes. Okay. So this is called as motor unit. Motor unit. One motor unit. So you should know what is a motor unit, sir. One motor unit consists of one alpha motor neuron with many muscle fibers. With many muscle fibers. Then these questions already you know. Uh, no need for me to explain again. What is the storage site of calcium in the muscle? The storage site of calcium in the muscle is sarcoplasmic reticulum. You already know. Dihydropyridine receptors. Dihydropyridine receptors are present where? On the L tubule or T tubule? They are present on the T tubule. Good. Next, RYR, rhinodine receptors, rhinodine calcium channels. Sir, the rhinodine calcium channels are present where? Sir, they are present on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, they are present, he, see he, here I have written, they are present on cisterna. Okay, they are present on the cisterna of sarcoplasmic reticulum. You will have it out. Sir, what is this cisterna, sir? Simple man, it's nothing. But, look here, these bulge dents are there, right? These bulge dents, they are nothing but cisterna. Okay, so on this cisterna, you have the RYR channels okay so this rhinodine receptors are present on cisterna of sarcoplasmic reticulum okay in your the exam going students okay next month 31st i think at 30 you are having this uh, exam right have you studied your anesthesia now in your anesthesia you have studied properly certain inhalational anesthetic agents like halothane desflurane Okay, and depolarizing muscle contractants like succinylcholine, sorry, not muscle contractants, muscle relaxants, sorry. Okay, same, there are certain inhalational and uh, anesthetic agents like halothane, okay, halothane, uh, desflurane, succinylcholine, sorry, muscle relaxants, succinylcholine. See, whenever you, you use these things, do you know what happens? Okay, do you know what happens? It causes a condition called as a malignant hyperthermia. Okay, so malignant hyperthermia. Tell me, it is because of usage of which inhalational anesthetics, halothane, desflurane, okay, isoflurane. Now, the point which I want you to know is in certain individuals, okay, in certain individuals, this rhinodine receptor is having overactivity. Okay, gain of activity because of mutation, gain of, gain of mutation, gain, overactivity. So, whenever this rhinodine receptor is overacting, tell me what happens. So, rhinodine receptor is kept on working. This rhinodine calcium channel is kept on opening. So, calcium will be releasing out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, this calcium will cause what? Sustained muscle contractions. Sustained muscle contractions are going to be there. Whenever muscle is contracting, ATP will be broken down, energy will be released, temperature will be released, you know, right? So, malignant hyperthermia, okay, if this rhinodine receptor, remember, you know, where is this rhinodine receptor, but if this rhinodine receptor, if it is having gain of mutation, okay, gain of mutation in the rhinodine receptor gene, then it will cause a condition called as malignant hyperthermia, okay, in these fellows, in these fellows, Using of these drugs like halothane, desflurane and succinylcholine, in this particular fellows, if you use these drugs, Okay, halothane, desflurane or succinylcholine, then they will develop malignant hyperthermia. Or if, for example, in normal person like me, if you use this inhalation anesthetic agents, nothing will happen. Okay, not a big deal. But if I am having some problem with the rhinodine receptor, gain of mutation with the rhinodine receptor activity, if you use this anesthetic agent, that will cause malignant hyperthermia. Now, what is the treatment? MCQ. The treatment for this malignant hyper Thermia is a dantrolene sodium. Okay, dantrolene sodium is the drug of choice for malignant hyperthermia. Okay, it's a ranodine receptor blocker. Okay, it's a ranodine receptor blocker. Dantrolene sodium is a ranodine receptor blocker used in the treatment of malignant hyperthermia. Completed, sir. 
okay now let me tell you certain questions which were asked in the pg exams okay not just the fmg exams these questions were previously tested in the neat pg exams and the inict exams i don't want to take any risk if you know this it's better okay there is no chance that you can miss a question see this calcium 1.1 okay cav 1.1 mutation sir what is the cav 1.1 this is nothing but dhpr dihydropyridine receptor okay d h p r so dihydropyridine receptor if we here you some students might have it out again they will be confused see d h p r is also called as cav 1.1 this fellow which is present on the ttp which will be activated upon depolarization okay see this d h p r if it is gone if it is damaged then it is going to cause a condition called as okay hypokalemic periodic paralysis d h p r is not working RYR do not function. If RYR do not function, calcium is not getting released. That will cause paralysis. Simple. Okay. So DHPR mutation or calcium 1.1 channel mutation is going to cause hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Next, this sodium. Okay, sodium channel. If this sodium channel, if it is mutated, now we will get it out, sir. What is this sodium channel, sir? Here I have written NA. NA means sodium. what is this v stands for voltage gated sodium channel okay type 1.4 now you'll get it out sir what is this voltage gated sodium channel are simple re here look here see here there is the sodium channel no this sodium channel this is a sodium channel okay now this sodium channel once the nicotinic receptors are activated they will allow the influx of sodium okay they will allow the influx of sodium so if that sodium channel okay this voltage gated sodium channel if it is mutated it is causing what hyperkalemic periodic paralysis so sodium channel defect will cause hyperkalemic periodic paralysis dhpr channel mutation will cause hypokalemic periodic paralysis okay sir so done next these are see, if if you know them it's better if you can't remember just leave it okay no force next cerca so what is this cerca and where it is present okay let me tell you cerca means first you should know cerca means sarco endoplasmic reticulum sarco plasmic endoplasmic reticulum what is the sarco plasmic endoplasmic reticulum sir simple this fellow okay this fellow is the sarco plasmic reticulum okay here if you look i have shown you cerca sir what is this cerca what it is doing whatever the calcium that is coming out see this calcium is coming out right the calcium is coming out and that calcium is helping in contraction after contraction what should happen relaxation should happen okay the muscle should relax during relaxation we don't want calcium we don't want calcium all the calcium should go back okay all the calcium should be again getting back or it should be uh, like you know it should be uh, getting back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by whom who will do that job it will be done by cerca pump the cerca pump sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum atps okay sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium atps okay it's a pump it's a pump what it will do it will help in the relaxation of muscles it will take the calcium back into the it will take all the calcium from the sarcoplasm from the muscle it will again all concentrate back into the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum okay that is cerca now if this cerca very very important don't forget cerca is present on the endoplasmic reticulum what cerca will do it will decrease the calcium levels within the cell okay all the calcium will be taken back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum don't forget now if such a cerca if it is gone means if it is damaged means it will cause brodis myopathy okay it will cause brodis myopathy or brodis sorry brodis or brodis okay someone will say brodi or brodi uh, this brodis myopathy it is because of what it is because of defect in cerca pump this cerca pump it is like you know, it's a protein which is coded by this gene atp2a1 if this atp2a1 if it is a mutated if it is mutated the gene the gene is mutated then cerca protein is going to be the cerca pump is going to be defective that causes brodis myopathy then so now one by one guys tell me ranodine receptor mutation gain of ranodine receptor function will cause malignant hyperthermia okay malignant hyperthermia it is precipitated by 
halothane, succinyl choline, desflurane. What is the treatment of malignant hyperthermia? Dantrolene sodium. Okay. So defect in DPH, uh, dihydropyridine receptor channel, DHPR mutation. DHPR mutation is going to cause hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Sodium channel defect. Okay, voltage gated sodium channel defect. It is going to cause hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. This Brudis myopathy, this Brudis myopathy is due to defect in cerca. Okay, cerca pump. Cerca, what it is doing? Cerca is present on the LTPU. Cerca is present on the sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum. It will take all the calcium back. It will pump all the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum. Helps in the relaxation of the muscle. Okay, is it clear? Uh, Bill, Shishala Bill. Okay, you want me to talk about the mass in your gravis? Definitely, I will talk about the mass in your gravis when I am doing the nerve. Okay, when I am doing the nerve, I will discuss about the mass in your gravis as well as the lambert eaton syndrome and botulism. The three integrations will be done in the nerve, nerve part, which will be coming in the next 15 minutes. Okay, so till here, is it clear, guys? Shall I go forward? Now, there is this question which was asked in the last FMG exam. This question was asked, okay, which will be coming in the next five minutes. 100% I am telling you, see, one question will be pakka coming from the muscle physiology. No doubt in that. One question from nerve and one question from the muscle. One question from the central nervous system, one question from the respiratory. At least four questions will come just from this one session, okay? Next, let's talk about the muscle contraction. Okay. See, in this muscle contraction topic, you know, there is something called a sliding filament theory. What is the sliding filament theory, sir? According to the sliding filament theory, as this is the rapid revision, this is the rapid revision, right? I'm not going in detail. MCQs I will concentrate. Okay. First, there will be an actin filament. Okay, there is an actin filament. There is a myosin filament. Actin and myosin. Okay, actin and myosin. The myosin have what? The myosin is having the heads. Myosin heads will be there. This myosin heads, they will go and bind with the active sites on the actin and will cause power stroke. Okay, and will cause a power stroke. Okay. So that will cause the contraction. That will cause the contraction of the muscles. You can very well see here. See, now first ATP is getting attached. ATP will be broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. So this myosin head, look here, the myosin head is going to go and bind with the actin, okay? After this, what happens? See, there is a power stroke, okay? There is a power stroke, means the myosin head, it will bend and it will cause sliding. It will cause a sliding of the actin filaments. It will cause the movement of the actin filaments onto the myosin. So that will cause contraction of the muscle, okay? Two MCQ points, which you should know for your exam. It doesn't matter whatever is the exam, FMG, NEET, PG, NST, same question will be asked. Two questions. What are these? Say, for power stroke. Power stroke means bending of the myosin heads. The myosin heads, they will go and bind with that actin. They are already binding. Okay? They will bend like this, causing the power stroke. What causes the power stroke? It's the release. Not the binding of the ATP. Most of the people will think uh, binding of the ATP is causing the power stroke. No. It's the release of ADP and PI that will cause the power stroke. So, release of the ADP, it's causing the power stroke. Okay, the same thing. Look here. See, the, during the power stroke, the myosin head bends and the ADP and phosphate are getting released. So, during power stroke, what happens? ADP and inorganic phosphate are released. Okay. First MCQ completed. Next. After this, see, one thing. Now, the myosin heads. The myosin heads, they have to go and bind on the active sites on the actin. They have to do the power stroke. After that, what should happen? This cross bridge, whatever is there, this is the cross bridge. The myosin head, it is going and binding to the active site on actin. See, this, like, you know, link is called as a cross bridge. Now, this cross bridge have to detach and the myosin head have to go and bind with the other active site, other active site. So, this cross bridge breakdown, this was the question. For the breakdown of this cross linkage, for the breakdown of this, like you know, cross bridge, what you need? New ATP, binding of the ATP, remember, 
binding of the atp will cross the will cause the breakdown or detachment of the cross bridge or myosin head detachment myosin head detachment from where from actin active site so what is needed it's the binding of new atp molecule see when the new atp molecule is binded now detachment will happen okay see the new molecule of atp attaches to the myosin head causing the cross bridge detachment okay so now tell me during power stroke or when power stroke happens when the adp and inorganic phosphate whenever they are released power stroke will happen next important mcq for the detachment of the cross bridges for the detachment of the myosin head from the actin what do you need binding of the new atp done these are the two mcqs which you should never ever forget in a basic way we can say thick filament thin filament the thick filament myosin it have myosin heads okay this myosin heads this myosin heads will go and bind with the actin causes the power stroke causing sliding of the thin filaments over the thick filaments that's a muscle contraction okay completed after this what's the next important area especially for the exam fmg exam need pg exam this is a most important area during muscle contraction there are different different lines you know there is a band i band h band so many things are there in a sarcomere if you concentrate concentrate here guys there is something called as m band <coughs> yeah look here there is something called as m band or m line is there z lines are there these are the z lines okay <coughs> now what happens to them okay i hope you have, most of you guys have already studied okay what happens during muscle contraction both the z lines the sarcomere length decreases the both the z lines are approaching each other so the distance between the z lines decreases okay so the question which they will or they will ask you is during muscle contraction what happens z lines approaches each other okay sir and h i h band and i band whatever is there in the sarcomere in the sarcomere there is h band as well as i band okay now this h band and i band i used to remember something like this hi when i like know some person for example i know this person okay so for example i know this person what i will say hi i will say hi so when i say hi i will go and meet him right so or he will come and meet me so the distance between us what happens whenever we are meeting what happens the distance between us decreases so simple remember in the same way so h and i hi during muscle contraction the h band size decreases and i band size decreases just like when i say hi the distance between the two people decreases okay we will meet together and we'll talk so in the same way the h band size decreases because of the sliding of the filaments these zones the size of these zones will decrease so h band decreases and i band decreases h band and i band they are decreasing okay next there is this a band a for anisotropic region so this a band what happens to this a band so a band there is no change there is no change in this a band okay so direct single liner questions i don't want to go in detail explaining about this simple z lines approaches each other each other h and i the length of the h band and i band decreases and what about the a is a band length is going to be constant there is no change no change or constant okay so done now after this the main point which i want you to know is yeah now muscle contraction integration integrated topics okay for the next 10 minutes please listen these are integrated with the medicines integrated with the pharma okay pharma as well as patho so how this muscle contraction it is integrated look here what is this this is alpha motor neuron you know it this alpha motor neuron what it is releasing sir it is releasing acetylcholine okay see this acetylcholine it is acting on when it is acting on the acetylcholine receptor which is nm type nm type of nicotinic receptor that's the acetylcholine receptor the point which i want you to know is see this is a alpha motor neuron okay once this alpha motor neuron it is getting depolarized okay, it's activating no in the last region in the last part okay this is a nerve terminal right this is the no terminal what happens is 
when the neuron is getting depolarized when the neuron is getting depolarized see these calcium channels okay these are the voltage gated calcium channels these voltage gated calcium channels they are opened mcq even this will come in the nerve physiology okay there i won't teach you here, here itself i am teaching you when the nerve is getting depolarized at the end part in the terminal region in the nerve terminal this voltage gated calcium channels they will open and what happens see the calcium it is coming into the cell okay calcium will come into the cell we know calcium helps in exocytosis calcium it will come and bind with this vesicles which contains the acetylcholine okay so this vesicles will come and fuse here leading to release of the acetylcholine so acetylcholine is going to be released itself okay acetylcholine is going to be released right now what is the integration there is a disease where this receptors look here what is this not receptor sorry these are the calcium channels right voltage gated calcium channels which are activated during action potential when the action potential is coming they will be activated causes the influx of the calcium there it is a disease where see antibodies are getting produced antibody production again is the voltage gated calcium channels which are present on the alpha motor neurons okay little complicated right i will explain you again it's a autoimmune condition there is an autoimmune condition where the antibodies are produced again is the voltage gated calcium channels which are present on the uh, nerve terminal of the alpha motor neurons it's a disease is called as lems okay Leb lambert eaton masthenic syndrome lems so what is this condition sir lems look there is a disease which is called as lambert eaton syndrome or lambert eaton masthenic syndrome what is happening in this condition antibodies are getting produced against what voltage gated calcium channel against the voltage gated calcium channel antibodies are getting produced so now do you think calcium influx will happen no calcium influx will happen do you think acetyl choline will be released no acetyl choline is not released so do you think muscle contraction will happen no muscle contraction so weakness of the muscles paralysis of the muscles will happen so that is the lambert eaton myasthenic myasthenia means weakness of the muscles so lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome okay one singular mcq in lems lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome auto antibodies are produced against the voltage gated calcium channels on the neurons next there is one more autoimmune disease so like you no know, some guy is asking the bill okay bill you are discussing about the masthenia gravis right what exactly is masthenia gravis is it is also an autoimmune condition okay autoimmune condition where antibodies are now produced against what they are produced against the nicotinic receptors or the acetylcholine receptors these receptors now antibodies are produced against the uh, nicotinic receptors on the muscle okay so now these nicotinic receptors are gone yeah gone so now do you think muscle contraction will happen muscle contraction is not going to happen okay so that condition is called as a myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis so what is the problem with the myasthenia gravis the problem with the myasthenia gravis is antibodies are produced against the nicotinic receptors what is the problem with lambert eaton syndrome the problem with the lambert eaton syndrome is antibodies are produced against the voltage gated calcium channels on the neurons okay so that's the difference this myasthenia gravis is very important for the indian exams mainly this question not only just indian exams all over the world this question will be asked three four important questions are there first of all how to identify a case on myasthenia gravis is see in the question what they will tell you is sir in the morning <coughs> the patient is okay initially the muscle contraction okay or i should say like you know in a better way with the more activity okay with the more activity the person is in the morning it's okay with the more activity more the activity okay activity is increasing with more the activity the muscle weakness is increasing for example in the beginning of the lecture Okay, my muscles are like you know I am having a proper muscle contraction. Everything is okay, but with the time, with more work, the more I am walking, the more I am running, the more I am doing the work, the muscle weakness increases, and I cannot use my muscles. 
if you have such kind of a case they are talking about myasthenia gravis okay so with more muscle activity with more muscle activity the muscle weakness increases the muscle worse, weakness worsens this is a classical case of myasthenia gravis and tell me myasthenia gravis it's having a test there is a diagnostic test okay there is a diagnostic test which is called as a tensilon test pharmacology tensilon test is the test for myasthenia gravis and the drug used is the edrophonium okay so edrophonium is used in the tensilon test and the test done for the myasthenia gravis is tensilon tensilon test is a test done for the myasthenia gravis completed sir okay done second integration is also completed first integration is lambert eaton syndrome the second integration is a myasthenia gravis what is the test done for the myasthenia gravis tensilon test what is the drug used it's the edrophonium okay antibodies again is the voltage gated calcium channels lambert eaton syndrome antibodies again is the nicotinic receptors are the acetylcholine receptors is myasthenia gravis okay next what you should know guys what is this vesicle i am right now talking about a nerve very important you see this is a nerve okay this is the end part of the nerve where i am showing you this vesicles this is a vesicle what is it containing see it is containing acetylcholine aha okay this is a acetylcholine containing vesicle okay in the alpha motor neuron this is a alpha motor neuron these are the vesicles synaptic vesicles which contains the synaptic vesicles it contain acetylcholine okay remember on this vesicle there is this blue color protein present this blue color protein which i am showing you here is called as a synaptobrevin okay this is a synaptobrevin this is the presynaptic membrane this is the nerve terminus this is the presynaptic membrane right that's the last membrane presynaptic membrane actually on this presynaptic membrane there are proteins which are called as a snare proteins the proteins which are called very important don't take them as light like you know sir we should have to know yes you have to know them without doubt see there are proteins called as snare proteins which includes syntaxins okay synaptobrevin here it is there synaptobrevin as well as syntaxins syntaxins as well as snap syntaxin snap complex so now tell me whenever the action potential is coming see whenever imagine this is the neuron whenever the action potential is coming to the nerve terminus this vesicle which is contain the acetylcholine now look here this vesicle what it is doing it is coming and fusing the synaptobrevin it is going to fuse with the syntaxin as well as snap so synaptobrevin is going to fuse with the syntaxins as well as snap this fusion is very very important for the exocytosis because of this fusion only the neurotransmitter is going to be released okay because of this fusion neurotransmitter is released okay sir now why we have to know this synaptobrevin syntaxin why unnecessary things no important because microbiology this is integration there is a bacteria called as clostridium botulinum now this clostridium botulinum it is going to produce a toxin called as botulin okay this botulin how you will get this uh, like you know botulin toxin into you how you will get this clostridium botulinum into your bodies so if you take the canned foods preserved foods canned foods canned beans canned things will be there no so if you if you if, a, if an adult person okay imagine i am the person who is taking the canned food so taking canned foods or in infants infants usually infants will be given the honey okay so if an infant is taking the sporulated honey or contaminated honey with this clostridium botulinum if you have any one of them canned food poisoning or spore related honey ingestion now in your body this clostridium botulinum is going to produce a toxin called as botulin this botulin it will destroy the synaptobrevins synaptobrevin this fellow the synaptobrevin which is present on the vesicle this synaptobrevin is now yeah got so whenever the synaptobrevin is destroyed do you think acetylcholine will be released now no the synaptobrevin syntaxin complex cannot happen so acetylcholine release cannot happen acetylcholine release will decrease so whenever there is no acetylcholine what will happen the baby or the person is going to have paralysis no acetylcholine no muscle contraction so the patient is going to have flaccid paralysis 
classically what they will use is the word descending okay from upper extremities paralysis will start from the upper extremities and it will go down to the body so there is descending flaccid paralysis okay so descending flaccid paralysis is seen in botulism the toxin is a botulin damages synaptobrevins so synaptobrevin syntax in complex do not happen okay so acetylcholine release is not going to happen no acetylcholine no contraction leading to descending flaccid paralysis if you ever hear the word ascending flaccid paralysis ascending flaccid paralysis then the answer is gullian bar syndrome gullian bar syndrome okay so in gullian bar syndrome there is ascending flaccid paralysis I, I don't want to go into that detail now here descending flaccid paralysis is seen in botulism so with this the integration integration is also completed okay hope it's clear all the important points in the muscle physiology are completed okay important points in the muscle physiology for your fmg for your fmg whatever you need to know are done so shall we go to the next thing the nerve physiology okay what are the important points in the nerve physiology after that 50 important mcqs in the respiratory 50 important mcq just question answer question answer question answer okay so we'll take a break of just five minutes five minutes break we'll take just have a refreshment after five minutes we will do no physiology and important points important 50 mcqs in respiratory physiology important 50 mcqs in the say cns also now after the muscle physiology now let's discuss about the important points in the no physiology Okay, what you should know before going to the exam, okay? Secret facts, mission, do you have any doubts? <clears throat> so, in nerve physiology, what are the important points which you should know? In the nervous system, what are the different types of cells are there? The neurons are there as well as some connective tissue cells are there. Some, like, you know, connective tissue cells that are the supporting cells, right? So, the supporting cells in the central nervous system are called as the glial cells. Okay, the glial cells are the supporting cells. Now from Thailand, okay, supporting cells. I love to visit Thailand one day. Okay, we'll meet once I come there. Okay. Now the glial cells are the supporting cells. Now what are the different types of glial cells? Okay, the different types of glial cells are astrocytes. Quickly, say astrocytes, what they are helping in? Astrocytes are the cells which are forming the blood brain barrier. So, the blood brain barrier is found by the astrocytes. Important point in yesterday's class I have discussed. In astrocytes, there is a type of intermediary filament present. What is the intermediary filament present in astrocytes? The intermediary filament is called as the glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP. Glial fibrillary acidic protein. It's an intermediary filament which is present in the astrocytes. So, for astrocytomas, in last class also, if you go back to the previous video and see, in astrocytomas, the tumor marker is GFAP. Okay, simple astrocytes forming the blood brain barrier. Inside the astrocytes, what is the intermediary filament which is present? The intermediate which is present, the intermediate filament which is present is a glial fibrillary stick protein. Next, don't forget. From pathology, from pathology point of view, if you are having a tumor of astrocytes, then it is called as what? Astrocytomas. In astrocytoma, one pathological finding is seen under the microscope, the astrocytomas. One pathological finding is very important for the exams. Rosenthal fibers, don't forget, okay? Rosenthal fibers are seen in astrocytomas. Don't forget about it. Now, ependymal cells. What are these ependymal cells? 2000. 19 fmg mcq ependymal cells are the lining cells of the ventricles inside our brain the fluids fill spaces are there right uh, with the csf the csf fill spaces are there which are called as the ventricles even in the spinal cord there is central canal present now this for example imagine this is one ventricle now these ventricles they are lined by cells these cells are called as ependymal cells okay, they are lining the ventricles in the brain and central canal in the spinal cord. Done. Oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes, what are they? They are the myelinating cells. They cause the myelination around the nerves. 
Okay, so oligodendrocytes they will cause myelination where? Oligodendrocytes cause the myelination in the central nervous system. But Schwann cells, Schwann cells, they will cause myelination in the peripheral nervous system. Very important, Schwann cells cause myelination in the peripheral nervous system. Oligodendroglial cells cause myelination in the central nervous system. Central nervous system means brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system means what? Spinal nerves and cranial nerves. 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 12 pairs of cranial nerves. They are a part of peripheral nervous system. In peripheral nervous system, who is doing the myelination? Schwann cells. Okay. And microglial cells. Sir, what are these microglial cells? Microglial cells are nothing but the phagocytic cells. They are nothing but the macrophages in the central nervous system. In the central nervous system, the macrophages are the phagocytic cells are called as the microglial cells. So, basic points. Astrocytes, forms the blood barrier. Ependymal cells are the lining cells of the ventricles. Oligodendrocytes are the myelinating cells in the central nervous system. Schwann cells are the myelinating cells in the peripheral nervous system. And microglial cells are the phagocytes. Okay. Never forget, astrocytes contain glial fibrillary acetic protein, which is an intermediary filament. It is a tumor marker of astrocytomas and in astrocytomas there are rosenthal fibers present okay in here itself astrocytomas under pathology under microscopy what you will find out rosenthal fibers rf okay rosenthal fibers are present next types of neurons types of neurons see there are uh, unipolar neurons pseudo unipolar neurons bipolar neurons multipolar neurons Four different types of neurons are there. In for your exam, two types of neurons are very important. Pseudo unipolar neuron. Okay, pseudo unipolar neuron. See the pseudo unipolar neurons present where? They are present where? They are present in the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, I will later show you what exactly is this the dorsal root ganglion. So in the DRG, dorsal root ganglion, which type of neurons are present? Pseudo unipolar neurons are present. Okay. Then bipolar neurons are present where? Bipolar neurons are present in the retina as well as the olfactory epithelium. Okay, in the retina, in our eye retina, as well as the olfactory epithelium, bipolar neurons are present. So, pseudo unipolar neurons are present in the dorsal root ganglion, bipolar neurons are present in the retinal olfactory epithelium as well as the retina. Next, after this, the very important, the heart of the nerve physiology is the action potentials. Okay, action potential in a neuron. Before that, let me tell you. See, this is the the neuron, the basic neuron, it's a multipolar neuron. Okay, basic multipolar neuron. Now tell me what is this area? This is called as a cell body, sir. What is this part? See, this is the part of cell body, the, uh, the tubular area. This is a part of cell body, which is now going to form the axon. This area is called as the axon hillock. Okay, this area is called as the axon hillock. And the first part, the first part of the axon is called as the initial segment. Okay, axon hillock and initial segment. These are the important points which I want you to know. Okay, next sir. In this neuron, have you identified this like you know myelinated areas? These are the myelinated areas. Okay, Schwann cell is a myelinating these areas. In between these myelinated areas, there are these unmyelinated areas present. These are called as nodes of Ranvier. Okay, which later I have written everything. Just I am explaining. These are the nodes of Ranvier. Okay, nodes of Ranvier. Now, look, MCQs. What are nizzle bodies? Okay, what are these nizzle bodies? Where are they present? See, these nizzle bodies are nothing but the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In the neuron, in the neuron, okay, lots and lots of neurotransmitters, proteins are going to be synthesized, right? See, these endoplasmic reticulum, which is present in the cell body, these are nothing but the nizzle bodies. Okay, so what are these nizzle bodies? They are nothing but the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You know the axon hillock. What is the axon hillock? Axon hillock is the site of action potential generation. Later I will tell you in which neurons, whether in sensory neurons or motor neurons, later I will tell you. But just remember what is axon hillock. Axon hillock is a part of cell body. It's not a part of axon, it's parts of cell body. Okay, it's a part of the cell body of the neuron. And actually that's the site of action potential generation. And what are the nodes of Ranvier? Let me go a little fast. Uh, nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier are the unmyelinated areas. See, these nodes of Ranvier. These are the unmyelinated areas. In this nodes of Ranvier, we have lots and lots of sodium channels. Okay, so 
sodium channels voltage gated sodium channels are present where the maximum number of sodium channels are present in roots of ranvier okay next topic let's enter into the topic that's the action potential generation normally imagine this is the neuron it is sleeping okay it is sleeping now how the action potential is going to be generated what are the phases of the action potential first of all how many types of neurons are there see according to the function there are two types sensory neurons as well as the motor neurons in a motor neuron see in a motor neuron where the action potential is going to be originating action potential the first depolarization action potential action potential originates from the axon of hillock as well as the initial segment both from this areas from the junction of the axon hillock and the initial segment from this area action potential arises in the motor neurons but if i am talking about the sensory neurons where action potential is originated activation where it is originated it's from the first node of ranvier first space will be there right from the first node of ranvier the action potential is going to be originated so this is a little difference action potential origin in a motor neuron is from axon hillock and the initial segment action potential generation in a sensory neuron it is coming from the first node of ranvier done now see this is a neuron okay this is a neuron doesn't matter whether it's a alpha motor neuron or it's a sensory neuron motor neuron or sensory neuron doesn't matter it is sleeping it is resting it is not activating it's sleeping when it is sleeping what is the resting membrane potential okay inside this nerve what is the voltage so first mcq the resting membrane potential of a neuron is minus 70 millivolts many times question was asked okay so the same was shown over here minus 70 it is sleeping okay whenever an impulse is coming from the surrounding neuron or whenever you give the impulse what happens is this resting membrane potential from minus 70 from minus 70 excellent yashank you are true from minus 70 c it is reaching the threshold for example you give a little stimulus now if this stimulus is powerful enough for example you are giving a light stimulus that's not enough if you are giving enough stimulus now this is a neuron okay the resting membrane potential now where it is going from minus 70 it is reaching minus 55 okay it is reaching minus 55 now what is this 55 this 55 is considered as the threshold potential aha uh -huh. what first happens every now it is sleeping whenever stimulus is coming if this stimulus if the stimulus is bringing the resting membrane potential to minus 55 minus 55 is known as threshold potential from minus 70 minus 55 is getting attained okay now do you know what happens once the threshold potential once it is attained action potential will start depolarization will start 100% depolarization is inevitable once the threshold potential is attained immediately do you know what happens on this neuron on this neuron suddenly the voltage gated calcium sorry voltage gated sodium channels will open this voltage gated sodium channels will cause influx of the sodium into the cell will cause influx of the sodium into the neurons sodium goes into the neurons positive ions are going into the neurons so neuron is activated so that's why see there is a depolarization from minus 55 from negativity the neuron potential is becoming positive excellent excellent uh, ashank you are true from minus 55 see it is going towards the positivity now tell me what is this phase called as this phase is called as a depolarization okay now tell me depolarization is because of what depolarization is because of influx of sodium so it's a depolarization in a nerve is dependent on the sodium influx during depolarization sodium influx happens yeah. after activation you know okay nerve is activated now what happens again it have to go back to its original resting membrane potential okay depolarization happened the depolarization will spread now what what should happen again it have to come back no so now repolarization should happen then now now what happens is on the now potassium channels will open okay potassium channels will open on this nerve membrane potassium channels will open and the potassium will start to go out of the cell 
potassium is positive ion it is going out of the cell when positive ions potassium is going out of the cell repolarization means see the membrane potential is now again coming back okay and not only it will just coming come back to its resting membrane potential sometimes it can even go below that resting membrane potential so first you are having repolarization because of the efflux of potassium so efflux of potassium will cause the repolarization this repolarization just doesn't stop with the resting membrane potential sometimes it can even go into the hyperpolarization means inactivation complete inactivation see the cell is going into full negativity minus 100 or minus 90 means going down this is called as hyperpolarization and it is also because of potassium efflux okay potassium efflux not only that mcq chloride influx chloride influx chloride ions negative ions chloride ions are coming in chloride ions are coming into the neuron making it hyperpolarized so now tell me guys first resting membrane potential minus 70 threshold potential minus 55 once threshold potential is attained all are non phenomena 100% depolarization will happen sodium channels are opened sodium comes into the cell voltage gated sodium channels are open sodium comes into the neurons causing the depolarization of the membrane depolarization of the neurons now after depolarization repolarization depolarization is followed by the repolarization repolarization is due to potassium efflux after repolarization there is a small period of hyperpolarization which is also due to potassium efflux as well as chloride influx hyperpolarization means inactivation complete inactivation okay so these are the points i want you to know see here phase 1 now you should tell me what is the phase 1 from 70 to minus 55 this is depolarization phase 2 ah sorry not depolarization uh, sorry little confusion no so what is the phase 1 phase 1 is attainment okay first stimulus first stimulus phase 1 is minus 70 to minus 55 means threshold potential is reaching okay first threshold potential is reaching next what once the threshold potential is reach next phase 2 phase 2 is depolarization after depolarization what do we have repolarization because of potassium efflux after that what happens hyperpolarization because of potassium efflux as well as chloride influx now after hyperpolarization see after hyperpolarization again the neuron is coming back to its resting membrane potential that is the phase 5 okay that's the phase 5 okay so <laughs> these are the five phases which i want you to know first threshold potential depolarization repolarization hyperpolarization coming back to resting membrane potential these are the points which i want you to know now after this many times in your fmg exam this question has been asked like no general question what is absolute refractory period as well as relative refractory period okay absolute refractory period as well as a relative refractory period simple absolute refractory period means see look here this is the threshold no this is the point of threshold here is the rest this is the resting membrane potential this is the point of firing okay right away from the point of firing see now this is you know this is the depolarization after that what happens repolarization this is the area okay one third okay that's a one third of the repolarization now what is the point which i am trying, trying to put in your mind is see in this time okay during this time during this period for example here you are giving the one more stimulation during this time or during this time here or at this level you are giving the stimulation to the neuron again okay now imagine this is the neuron now it is undergoing depolarization and now it's slowly repolarizing again if you stimulate this neuron powerfully so much powerfully do you think that it will generate one more action potential now never so during this period which i have highlighted during this area you give how hard the stimulus is doesn't matter no new action potential generation so point is absolute refractory period during this absolute refractory period initiation of new action potential is not possible at all it doesn't matter how strong the stimulus is doesn't matter how strong the stimulus is no action potential is going to be generated no new action potential why the reason what they will ask you is the why why 
it is due to inactivation of voltage gated sodium channels during this absolute refractory period during that period the voltage gated calcium channels this uh, sorry not calcium channels sorry correction voltage gated sodium channels these voltage gated sodium channels are closed they are inactivated as they are inactivated there is no chance of new action potential okay so absolute refractory period no action potential due to inactivation due to inactivation of the voltage gated sodium channels done sir now let's talk about the relative refractory period then what is relative refractory period look here same from this area okay still repolarization as well as hyperpolarization and coming back to resting membrane potential okay this during this period if you give one more stimulus with the normal stimulus new action potential is not going to be generated with the powerful stimulus if you give powerful stimulus then a new action potential will be generated by the neuron okay so this period is the relative refractory period okay even here say this area is the relative refractory period from where to where this area okay relative refractory period during the relative refractory period initiation of the new action potential is possible but what you need to do not just the normal stimulus you need to give the powerful stimulus you need to give a higher stimulus mcq okay that higher stimulus can actually open the <coughs> sodium channels okay so anyway by that time sodium channels will be open that mechanism is a little different I, I don't want to go into that detail now absolute refractory period relative refractory period absolute refractory period no action potential relative refractory period yes action potential will be produced but you need to give the higher stimulus in absolute refractory period why there is no action potential because the sodium channels are closed okay voltage gated sodium channels are inactivated now see 99 percent of the time if i am the examiner or whoever the examiner they will give question from this area only whatever like you know the rapid revision course or whatever like you know the coaching institute you go without this there is no nerve physiology 100 percent question will come from here only this area only this area is the classification of nerve fibers the classification of the nerve fibers the nerve fibers are classified into different different types okay based on what sir for example you look here there is a alpha type a beta a gamma a delta okay b, b type of fiber c type of fibers type 1a fibers 1b 2 3 4 different types of nerve fibers are there these fibers are classified into different different types based on what based on myelination okay so classification of nerve fibers is based on the myelination so you should understand here think logically and tell me for example this is a neuron okay if it is having more myelination if this nerve fiber if it's having more myelination is it, is it good or bad it's good okay, because more the myelination more insulation is there so with very fast speed the conduction will happen okay the conduction of the impulses will happen with a very fast speed so more the myelination tell me what is the importance of this myelination more the myelination more the speed of the conduction along the neurons okay and one more thing is the diameter okay more the diameter of the neurons if the imagine this is a neuron the cross section the diameter more the diameter again more speed of conduction so the speed of conduction is determined by two parameters what are the two parameters that determine the speed of conduction one is a myelination and other is the diameter of the neurons mcq so based on these two things only mainly the based on the myelination the neurons are classified into different types first classification is called as the erlanger grassy classification okay so what is this erlanger grassy classification according to the scientists they classified imagine these are the friends okay what they have classified is they are seeing different different types of neurons okay they are uh, sorry they are seeing the different different types of nerve fibers now one nerve fiber is highly myelinated other type of nerve fiber is having little myelination the other thing is having no myelination so based on the myelination they have categorized the nerve fibers into a b and c so when you are moving from a look when you are moving from a to c what happens to the myelination see myelination decreases so a fibers are highly myelinated 
C fibers are unmyelinated. Okay, so that's the point which I want you to know. So now tell me, when you are moving from A to C, what happens with the myelination? A is having heavy myelination. B is having little myelination. C is having no myelination. Done. Okay. So according to Erlanger and Grassi, there are A fibers, B fibers as well as C fibers. Now there is one more classification, one more fellow, Hunt. There is one more scientist. He is also saying this no fibers. He don't want to call them ABC. He doesn't like ABCs. Okay. He say, he's saying he's a mathematician. Imagine he's in love with numbers. Okay. Right. I'm just, he's not a mathematician anyway. He loves the numbers and he's saying this is one, two and three. So it's the same thing, same nerves only. But according to one fellow, it is ABC. One classification is saying A fiber, B fiber, C fiber. The other guy is saying type 1 fiber, type 2 fiber, type 3 fiber and type 4 fiber. Okay. So here, look here, according to Edlanger Grassi classification. Okay. We have A fibers. This A fibers are further divided into A alpha, A beta, A gamma, A delta. B fibers as well as C fibers. According to the numerical system, it is divided into 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, 1, 2 and 3 and 4. What are the important points which you need to know? Okay, super important points sir. See, A fibers already I have taught you. Okay, they are having more the diameter, they are having more myelination. Okay, they are having more myelination. These are the large neurons, large myelinated neurons. They are having more diameter. Conduction velocity is super high. Okay, why? Because more myelination. So, let's look at the important points. A alpha fiber. Yes, it is highly myelinated when you are moving from A to C, myelination decreases. So, A is highly myelinated. That too, A alpha is the highly, highly myelinated than A beta or A gamma. So, highly myelinated. They are the, they are having highest diameter, highest diameter true. And they are the thickest and fastest. Highest conduction velocity is going to be seen in MCQ. Okay. And what are these A fibers? We know no alpha motor neurons causing the muscle contraction. These alpha motor neurons are what? A alpha, that's the thing. A alpha, they are the motor neurons which are helping in the muscle contraction. Okay. In the spinal cord, A alpha motor neurons, they are originating and they are coming and innervating the skeletal muscles. So, A alpha are the motor neurons. So, the same thing, look here. A alpha are the somatic motor, which means they innervate the skeletal muscles. They innervate the skeletal muscles. And not only that, see, this A alpha... It is also doing one more function, proprioception. Proprioception. Proprioception is a sense, right? It's not a motor activity. Proprioception is a sense of the joints. Sense about the body parts in the three-dimensional space. So, proprioception is a sensory thing. So, now tell me, this A alpha, is it a motor neuron or is it a mixed neuron? The A alpha is a sensory as well as a motor. The alpha motor neuron, as well as see, it is also doing which functions? The proprioceptive function. Very, very important. Put 10 star marks. The proprioceptive function is done by A alpha. Okay, A alpha. Proprioceptive fibers. From where this proprioception is coming? The proprioception is coming from the muscle spindles as well as the Golgi tendon organs. From the muscle spindles and from the Golgi tendon from the Golgi tendon organs, its A alpha fibers are taking the information, proprioceptive information into the central nervous system. Okay. So, now please tell me important points. A alpha. They are the large, myelinated, thickest fibers with the highest conduction velocity. A alpha are both sensory as well as motor. They are the alpha motor neurons. What is the sensory function? Proprioception from the muscle spindles from the Golgi tendon organs, from the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs, the information, that's a proprioceptive information is going to the central nervous system via the A alpha. Okay. So, done sir. Next, A beta. So, A beta, they are the pure sensory. Okay. They are the sensory fibers. What they are doing? They are taking which type of information? They are taking the fine touch. They are taking the fine touch information. Fine touch information is carried by A beta fibers. Pure sensory. And A gamma, alpha, beta completed, now gamma, A gamma fibers, gamma, gamma, the gamma motor neurons, like just like alpha motor neuron, this is the gamma motor neuron. So gamma motor neurons, where they are going? Gamma motor neurons are going to muscle spindle. So muscle spindles are having, yes, sensory supply is there. Now if you see here, this muscle spindle, 
it is having sensory supply from a alpha this muscle spindles are also having motor supply motor supply is coming from where a gamma fibers so super important mcq if i am the examiner definitely i will give you this question muscle spindles are innervated by the gamma motor neurons gamma motor is nothing but a gamma a gamma okay a gamma fiber is nothing but the gamma motor neurons going to the muscle spindles so now just recap a alpha both sensory as well as motor a alpha alpha motor neurons a alpha proprioception highest conduction velocity thickest and largest highly myelinated next a beta a beta is fine touch a gamma a gamma is a gamma motor neuron for the muscle spindle it's a pure motor it's a mere it's a motor neuron it's a pure motor okay now a delta what do you need to know regarding the a delta fibers see this a delta fibers they are the ones which are going to cause the paresthesias okay so this a delta fibers they are the ones which will which are responsible see damage to this a delta fibers okay whenever this a delta fiber if it is damaged that's going to cause the tickling sen sensation like you know numbness so those are the paresthesias like you know shock like sensations see these are the paresthesias mcq paresthesias are due to damage to which fibers damage to a delta fibers okay damage to a delta fibers and this a delta fibers are the uh, ones which also carry cold sensation cold temperature as well as the fast pain many many times this question has been asked okay many many times this question has been asked as the fast pain fast pain not a dull pain dull and diffuse pain no fastest speed of conduction okay for example someone comes and prick you fastest speed of connection is with the a delta a delta fibers are damaged leading to paresthesias a delta fibers are the ones which carries the cold temperature fine touch is carried by a beta gamma motor neurons to the muscle spindles a gamma fibers okay so a is completed a alpha a beta a gamma a delta okay so what we have completed this one now tell me cold sensations are carried by a delta cold sensations fast pain sharp pain fast pain epicratic pain sharp with a pin prick is going to be a delta now b what are these b fibers sir b fibers where they are present in our body where they are present in your <coughs> pharmacology autonomic nervous system you have studied right okay see b also myelinated only but not heavily myelinated b also myelinated okay but a is highly myelinated a alpha is a highly highly myelinated now this b fellow this b fiber these are the preganglionic fibers okay these are the preganglionic fibers in autonomic nervous system you have studied preganglionic fibers ganglia sympathetic ganglia will be there post ganglionic fibers will be there preganglionic ganglionic post ganglia okay preganglionic fibers there is sympathetic ganglia there post ganglionic fibers so all the preganglionic fibers are a beta sorry not a beta it's a b fibers okay not a beta sorry it's a b fibers b fibers are the preganglionic it answer and the c fibers many many times this question has been asked c fibers you are going from a b and c you are coming to the c no myelination they are small small fibers no big diameter so do you think conduction velocity is fast no slow conduction velocity so what they will like you know what type of pain they will carry slow pain dull and diffuse pain so the c fibers they are unmyelinated okay they will carry slow pain super important mcq and where they are present they are the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers okay post ganglionic sympathetic fibers okay so c fibers are unmyelinated post ganglionic sympathetic fibers they carry the slow pain dull or diffuse pain visceral pain protopathic pain slow pain okay now they carry which type of temperature hot temperatures hot temperature so cold temperature is carried by a delta a delta cold temperature c fiber hot temperature or warm temperature okay see this c fiber already i have written c fiber yes they are post ganglionic fibers they carry slow pain and they carry hot temperature cold temperature by delta hot temperature by so with this if you know this 100% one question will come okay based on the classification of fibers one question will come simple paresthesias tell me paresthesias are you do any doubt paresthesias guys do you have any doubt 
if you are like you know feeling that i'm going little slow you can say sir you are getting it you can go fast or if you feel like sir you are going fast you can say sir go little slow okay i'm a student friendly teacher i will act according to you so what i'm asking proprioception uh, sorry parasitias the parasitias are due to damage to a delta okay now after this a very much controversial uh, controversial area <laughs> yes yes thank you are true say delta a very much controversial area which we are going to discuss is if you use local anesthetics anesthesia from anesthesia if you inject local anesthesia okay the local anesthetic agents like lidocaine or xylocaine okay these local anesthetics will knock out will knock out which fiber first the local anesthetics just follow this don't like you know go into any contradictions like you know in simple just follow this lifelong just remember this okay local anesthetics will first knock out a gamma fibers so a gamma fibers are the most sensitive which means they will be inhibited when you inject local anesthetics they will go into sleep okay so a gamma are the most sensitive to the local anesthetics followed by b followed by c okay next whenever there is a pressure okay pressure pressure will knock out so whenever there is a pressure that pressure will knock out which type of nerve fibers a alpha okay first a fibers will be affected even in the a fibers a alpha okay so pressure will knock out a alpha followed by b followed by c okay next hypoxia which fibers are more sensitive to hypoxia whenever there is hypoxia it's gone if there is any persistent hypoxia this fiber will be damaged so hypoxia sensitive i used to remember like hypoxia is it a good thing definitely hypoxia is not good so we'll say hypoxia okay let me take my step back hypoxia back so b a c i used to remember something like that okay so which fibers are most sensitive to hypoxia b fibers remember b what b fibers are doing b fibers they are the preganglionic don't forget b fibers they are the preganglionic sympathetic fibers so they are myelinated or preganglionic sympathetic fibers now b a c now tell me local anesthetics first a gamma next uh, pressure with pressure a alpha fibers are going to be damaged and hypoxia b a c b a c okay never ever forget alpha motor neurons are a alpha gamma motor neurons are a gamma parasitias are a delta okay parasitias are a delta cold temperature a delta warm temperature c fibers fast pain a delta slow pain c fibers unmyelinated c fibers okay now with this important topics which you should know in the nerve physiology for the exam okay if you know this much it's good okay, important points in the nerve physiology is also done now let's do the respiratory physiology okay now the respiratory physiology we should complete just in maximum to maximum 15 20 minutes in the next 15 20 minutes we should be able to complete the respiratory physiology okay so shall we do the respiratory physiology guys yashank shiksha Ishank, Bill, Jenny, shall we go forward? Secret facts, shall we go forward? Is it okay? Okay. Nice. So, respiratory physiology, you just try, try to answer yourself, okay? See, lung airway generations. how many lung airway generations are there see the respiratory tract it's divided into many many generation small small segments and these segments are called as the generations okay just to make our life more complicated some guy have divided this into many many segments and they call it as generations and how many generations are there 23 generations are there starting from zero if you consider zero there will be 24 generations okay so there are 23 generations are there okay what is the generation zero see the generation zero what is that so trachea so generation zero is trachea okay sir so conducting zone the entire respiratory tract it is divided into okay let me show you here itself 
the entire respiratory tract the respiratory tract is divided into two zones the conducting zone and the respiratory zone in the conducting zone no gaseous exchange no gaseous exchange happens in the conducting zone in the respiratory zone this down area see this is the respiratory zone conduction happens exchange of gases exchange okay gases exchange present here no gas exchange okay so conducting zone as well as a respiratory zone now tell me what is the last part of the conducting zone conducting zone ends with the terminal bronchioles mcq okay that's the point which i want you to know conducting zone ends with terminal bronchioles okay yes yes uh, samantha friendly doc yes so terminal bronchioles they are the last part of the conducting zone can you tell me maximum airflow resistance in the respiratory tract where will the maximum airflow resistance is seen it's the maximum airflow resistance is not is is shown by the bronchi okay the medium sized bronchi now let me directly show here itself okay now the maximum airflow resistance is shown by the medium sized bronchi okay not the bronchiole bronchi like you know which are like low bar and segmental bronchi okay so the low bar and segmental bronchi so the questions are here answers will also are already written over there there is no problem for you you can get the entire pdf so tell me in which part of the respiratory tree maximum airflow resistance is going to be seen the maximum airflow resistance is seen not in the bronchioles not in the trachea not in the respiratory zone it's in the bronchi or bronchus which bronchus low bar and segmental bronchus show maximum resistance okay low bar and segmental bronchus that's it conducting zone is lined by general basic mcqs the conducting zone the respiratory tree is lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium check yourself answer was given anyway so pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium is present in the conducting zone but which epithelium is present in the respiratory zone in the respiratory zone the down area where gas exchange happens what is epithelium simple squamous epithelium okay so conducting zone okay now here itself let me write the, the respiratory zone lined by simple squamous epithelium so simple squamous epithelium is the epithelium of the respiratory zone next there is a syndrome okay there is a, a pulmonary pathology which is called as a cartagener syndrome what is the defect in cartagener syndrome what is the problem can you tell me come on friendly doc the bill Well, yeah, we haven't discussed about the smooth pill contraction mainly because, like you know, in our exams, like you know, we we don't have enough time to discuss about everything, right? Mainly, I'm talking about the most important areas. Okay, so after this, we are going to plan a physiology classes, like you know, total system. Okay, total system wise physiology classes we are planning. Uh, means total system wise every system. There we will cover entire things and system wise pathology also we are planning. There we will discuss in detail. Okay. uh now so cartagener syndrome what is the defect in the cartagener syndrome the dynein arms okay dynein arms is defect you imagine this is cilia okay inside the cilia there is a protein called as the dynein dynein okay dynein this the dynein is defective when the dynein is defective do you think the cilia will beat no the cilia is not going to beat when the cilia is not beating in the respiratory tract the mucus plugging will happen mucus will start to accumulate that will cause respiratory problems okay that's the cartagener syndrome so now look here in cartagener syndrome see there is a defect defect is in the dynein arms so a triad of symptoms are going to be seen so what are the triad of symptoms the triad of symptoms in the body the cilia are not beating okay don't see all the mcqs the cilia are not beating because the cilia are not beating in the respiratory tract the patient will have respiratory tract infection leading to bronchiectasis okay necrotizing inflammation of the bronchi leading to the permanent dilation of the bronchi bronchiectasis is going to be seen mucus plugging followed by infection followed by inflammation necrotizing inflammation leading to bronchiectasis okay so first triad of symptom which i want you to know the first triad of symptom is the bronchiectasis what else sir normally cilia 
are also helping in the proper positioning of the organs. Okay, cilia are very much important for the proper position of the organs because the cilia are not beating properly from birth itself. The heart, which was supposed to be placed towards the left side, now the heart will be placed, uh, the apex will be facing towards the right side. Normally, during embryogenesis, it's the beating of the cilia will actually help in the positioning of the heart more towards the left side. Cilia are not beating. Heart positioning is not happening properly. So, heart will be towards the right side. That is a situs inverses. Okay, situs inverses. Or dextrocardia. Means right side placement of the heart. Okay, so that is the problem. So, now look here. Now, in Cartagenar syndrome, there is sinusitis. Inflammation because of the mucus accumulation, cilia in the mucus, uh, sorry, cilia in the sinuses are not beating properly. So, mucus drainage, mucus drainage is not happening properly. Mucus plugging will happen that will lead to infection in the sinuses. That's the sinusitis. Sinusitis in the respiratory system, there will be bronchiectasis as well as situs inversus. This is the triad. Okay. Infertility is not in the triad, but the triad is sinus, uh, sinusitis, bronchiectasis as well as situs inversus. Infertility will be there because the cilia, uh, the flagella, the flagella of the sperms do not fit properly. Okay, that's a problem. Next, let's look. What are the stem cells in the airway? In the airway, there are three types of stem cells present. One is the type 2 pneumocytes. So, the type 2 pneumocytes, what, are the, what is the importance? They will produce a surfactant. Clara cell, there is a cell called as Clara cell. And there is one more cell called as a basal cell. See, these three cells are the stem cells in the airway. So, stem cells in the airway are the type 2 pneumocytes which produces the surfactant, clara cells as well as the basal cells. Next, what is the most potent bronchoconstrictor? During asthma, bronchoconstriction will happen, right? What is the most potent bronchoconstrictor? Is it histamine? Is it prostaglandin? Is it, or, uh, is it a leukotriene? What? So, the most potent bronchoconstrictor is leukotrienes. Okay, leukotriene, especially leukotrienes, LTP4, are the most potent bronchoconstrictors. Done. In the respiratory tract, in the respiratory tree, from trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, this entire thing is there, right? Which part have the maximum smooth muscles? The maximum smooth muscles are present around trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, where? Terminal bronchioles. The maximum smooth muscles are present around the, the terminal bronchioles. Okay, terminal bronchioles. Just think, in the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular system, maximum smooth muscles are present around what? Iota? Arteries? Arterioles, remember. Maximum amount of smooth muscles are present around the arterioles. That's why arterioles are called as resistance blood vessels. Here in the respiratory tract, the maximum amount of smooth muscles are present around the terminal bronchioles. Okay? Done. Surfactant is produced by, you already know, surfactant is produced by type 2 pneumocytes. And what is the function of the surfactant? What is the function of the surfactant? Makes you beautiful. No, surfactant decreases the surface tension in your alveoli. Prevents the collapse of the lungs. MCQ. So, surfactant, it is produced by type 2 pneumocytes. Type 2 alveolar cells. Type 2 pneumocytes. That, uh, that was anyway given over here. See, surfactant is produced by the type 2 pneumocytes and their function is to decrease the surface tension. Surface tension prevents the pulmonary edema as well as prevents the collapse, alveolar collapse. Next, the surfactant is made up of what? Surfactant is made up of lipids, sir. What is the major lipid in the surfactant MCQ? What is the major lipid in the surfactant? There is a major lipid, there is a minor lipid. Major lipid is called as DPPC, dipalmethyl phosphatidylcholine. Okay, dipalmethyl phosphatidylcholine also called as lecithin. So, but dipalmethyl phosphatidylcholine or lecithin is a major lipid in the surfactant. Can you tell me what is the minor lipid? Shashank, can you tell me? Jenny, Shashank, Siksha. Can you tell me guys, what is the minor lipid? It is start with the letter S. Sphing, go... Myelin. Okay, sphingomyelin is a minor lipid. Okay, don't forget, major lipid is DPPC or lecithin. So, what is the indicator of fetal lung maturity? How can we know that the fetal lungs are matured or not? Okay, the period of gestation is maybe uh, 33 uh, weeks or 34 weeks. Now, you want to know whether the fetal lungs are matured or not. Okay, this lady is going into the preterm labor. You are little worried whether the fetal lungs are matured or not. If you want to know whether the fetal lungs are matured or not, then you can 
<coughs> go for lecithin sphingomyelin ratio the ratio of lecithin to sphingomyelin if the lecithin sphingomyelin ratio if it is greater than 2 it indicates fetal lung maturity done so first group of mcqs completed these are the direct mcqs Weebles age by generations 23, generation number 0 is trachea, conducting zone ends with the terminal bronchioles, maximum resistance to the airflow is seen in the low bar and segmental bronchus, which are the medium sized bronchus, and the conducting zone is lined by pseudostratified ciliated column reptilium, but the respiratory zone is lined by the simple squamous epithelium. In Cartagena syndrome, there is a defect in the dynein arms, because of that, the patient is going to have a triad of symptoms. What are they? Bronchiectasis, sinusitis, as well as situs inverses. That's the dextrocardia, right side replacement of the heart. Even the males or females are going to be also infertile. Okay, because the flagella of the sperm is not beating properly. And the cilia inside the fallopian tubes also don't beat properly. That will cause infertility. Most potent bronchoconstrictor is the leukotrienes. Maximum amount of smooth muscles in the respiratory tract is around the terminal bronchioles. Other things, you know it. You know it. Okay. Now, pacemaker of the respiration. Can you tell me what is the pacemaker of the respiration? Come on, dude. Come on, doctors. What is the pacemaker of the respiration? Every student knows that the pacemaker of the heart is, sir, uh, uh, SA node. SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. What is the pacemaker of the GAT? Interstitial cell of Kajal. We have already discussed there. The migratory motor complex. Okay, the basal electrical rhythms. Okay, the spike potentials. We have discussed in the previous videos. Okay, go and check there. What is the pacemaker of the respiration? The pacemaker of the respiration is pre bought Zinger complex. Okay, pre bought Zinger complex. Now, if you look over here, see, there are multiple centers which are regulating the respiratory activity. Look here, there is something called as a pre bought Zinger complex. Actually, it is present in the medulla. Okay, so the pre bought Zinger complex which is present in the medulla is considered as a pacemaker of the respiration. There is a gene called as CFTR gene. If the CFTR gene is mutated, gone. Yeah. Okay, CFTR gene, go on. Whenever the CFTR gene is mutated, it's going to cause, okay, it's going to cause a condition which is called as cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis. Why the cystic fibrosis? CFTR gene is mutated. So the chloride channels, the chloride channels are going to be defective. Because these chloride channels are defective, I'm just briefing it up. The chloride channels are not functional. So, the secretions which are happening in the entire body, not only in the respiratory tract, everywhere in the body, the secretions are going to be thicker. Okay, the secretions are going to be thick secretions that will block the respiratory tract, leading to bronchiectasis, pulmonary infections. Okay, that's the problem. So, CFTR gene mutation is the one which causes a condition called as a cystic fibrosis. In this cystic fibrosis, the chloride channels are going to be defective. Because of this, the secretions are going to be thick, thick secretions. The thick secretions will block the respiratory tract, will block the respiratory tract, leading to the pulmonary infections, mucus plugging. Next, the disease, which I want you to know is, see, there is a deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay, there is this enzyme called as alpha-1 antitrypsin. When this alpha-1 antitrypsin, excellent, Mir Ahmad, yes, cystic fibrosis. If alpha-1, now, Mir, could you answer this? If alpha-1 antitrypsin, if it is deficient, it will cause which pulmonary condition? Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is going to cause chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, bronchitis, bronchiectasis. No, it is going to cause, yes, a COPD, but which, what is that example? It is emphysema. It's going to cause emphysema, sir. Which type of emphysema? If I imagine I'm the person who is having alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. If I am the person who is having alpha-1 antitrypsin, anti, uh, alpha antitrypsin deficiency, yes, I will suffer with emphysema, no doubt. Okay, I will suffer with emphysema. But which type of emphysema? pan SNR emphysema. Very, very important. Don't forget. pan SNR emphysema. pan SNR emphysema. In smokers also, there will be emphysema. In smoker fellows, okay, they will also develop emphysema. But which type of emphysema? Just remember, sentry SNR emphysema. This was the question asked in the recent FMG exam. So smokers, 
are going to develop emphysematur what which type centrisinar alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency okay alpha 1 x s mode in life you are true alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is going to cause emphysema but which type of emphysema panisinar emphysema and what is the prebotzinger complex the prebotzinger complex is the pacemaker the pacemaker of the respiration done okay mm -hmm. Now, after this, let's continue. Surfactant is stored where? You know, surfactant is produced by the type 2 pneumocytes. The type 2 pneumocytes are the type 2 alveolar cells produce the surfactant. Uh, surfactant decreases the surface tension, prevents the collapse of the alveolus. Everything good. Surfactant it is stored where? In which vesicles? Lamellar bodies. Lamellar bodies. That's the MCQ which was asked. See, imagine this is a type 2 pneumocyte. Okay, this is type 2 pneumocyte. Inside this type 2 pneumocytes, there are these vesicles called as the lamellar bodies. Inside this lamellar bodies, guys, see, inside this lamellar bodies, surfactant is going to be stored. Okay, very important. Now, what is this hyaline membrane disease, sir? Why hyaline membrane disease? This hyaline membrane disease is due to deficiency of surfactant. So, deficiency of surfactant is going to cause the hyaline membrane disease. Done. Okay, now trachea. See, trachea is lined by which type of epithelium? Very simple. See, trachea is a part of conducting zone. It's a part of conducting zone. No. So, it is lined by what? Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. No doubt. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium only. But the bronchioles, here one important uh, like you know, exception is that the bronchioles. Bronchioles are lined by ciliated cuboidal epithelium. The alveoli, which are a part of respiratory zone, alveoli, the respiratory zone, already I have discussed with you, they are lined by the simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so trachea are lined by, simple so trachea are lined by pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, conducting zone. Bronchioles is little different. Okay, certain part of the bronchioles they are lined by the ciliated cuboidal epithelium, but the respiratory zone, respiratory zone where gas exchange will happen, lined by simple squamous epithelium. Completed. Next, this is also done, done, done. See, there is a non ciliated MCQ. I'll ask long, long back in need page and FMG exams. There is a non ciliated cuboidal epithelial cell in the respiratory tract. In the respiratory tract, there is a one cell which is a non ciliated but cuboidal. The cell is called as a Clara cell. Okay. Clara cell, sir. And what is the important point about the Clara cell? Already we have discussed. Clara cell is a stem cell. It helps in the detoxification, actually. It helps in the detox detoxification. Next, what is the Boyle's law states us? Entire respiration depends on the Boyle's law, right? What is Boyle's law stating us? Boyle's law states us, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. When you increase the volume, pressure decreases. When you decrease the volume, pressure increases. Simple. Imagine, let's take a balloon. Let's take a balloon. Okay. Imagine it's your birthday. Now someone gave you a balloon. Now you take this balloon and let's try to compress it. What exactly you are doing? You are trying to compress it. So you are decreasing the volume. Whenever you decreases the volume, what happened to the pressure inside the balloon? Increases. So decreasing in the volume increases the pressure. So Boyle's law states says volume and pressure are inversely proportional. Okay. What is the intrapleural pressure set rest? Can you tell me? I'm at rest. I'm not inspiring. I'm not expiring. I'm at rest. What is the intrapleural pressure? The intrapleural pressure is going to be minus 2 mm of Hg. Okay. Minus 2 millimeters of mercury. Minus 2. Intrapleural pressures are always, always negative. Don't forget. Intrapleural in between the pleura. There is a vacuum, sir. This minus 2 is actually vacuum. Intrapleural pressures are always negative. Why it is always negative? Now we can't discuss because of something called as dynamic harmonious antagonism. It will be always negative. Why? Uh, because always lung want to collapse, chest wall want to expand. So there are two different opposite forces. I don't want to discuss now. Simple. Intrapleural pressure in between the pleura, the pressure is always negative during rest. During rest, okay. During rest, it's always negative. And how much? Minus two point. Sorry, minus two mm of Hg. Now, what is the <coughs> intraalveolar pressure? I am like this. I am not inspiring. I am not expiring. I am like this. What is intraalveolar pressure? Zero. Outside, inside, it is equal. It is zero. During inspiration, it becomes minus one. See. I am inspiring. Inside it becomes minus 1. Outside it is 0. So 0 is higher than minus 1. During inspiration, see, during inspiration, do you know what happens to the intraalveolar pressure in my lungs? The intraalveolar pressure becomes minus 1. Means getting negative. 
So outside zero, inside minus one. So from high to low, air enters. So remember, intra-alveolar pressure IAP during inspiration is minus one. During expiration, during expiration inside it will become plus one. So air will come out. Yeah. Now transpulmonary pressure, sir. Very important. What is this transpulmonary pressure? Look, very simple. Imagine. This is your alveolus and this is the pleura. See, imagine this is this is your intrapleural space. Intrapleural space. In the intrapleural space, see, the entire lung I am showing as an alveoli. Okay, alveoli. See, inside the alveoli, the pressure is zero. Intraalveolar pressure is zero at rest. Here it is how much? Minus 2 mm Hg. So, what is the difference? Intraalveolar pressure zero minus of minus 2 point <coughs> zero minus minus of 2. How much? is plus 2 mm Hg. Okay, so that's the transpulmonary pressure. So what is the transpulmonary pressure? It's the intraalveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. Intraalveolar minus intrapleural pressure is the transpulmonary pressure. How much it is? It is plus. It's a distending pressure. It actually, this is the pressure which is keeping my alveolus open. It's a transpulmonary pressure which is keeping my alveolus open. So simply tell me what are the important MCQs. Just a recap. Surfactant is stored in lamellar bodies. High in membrane disease in newborn. It is because of deficiency of surfactant. Trachea is lined by pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Bronchioles are lined by, this is one exception, they are lined by ciliated cuboidal epithelium. Alveolar are lined by simple squamous epithelium. Non ciliated cuboidal epithelial cell in your respiratory tract is a clara cell, which is a stem cell, helps in the detoxification. Okay. And Boyle's law. Boyle's law is volume and pressure are inversely proportional. Intrapleural pressure is always negative, minus 2 mm Hg. Intraalveolar pressure during rest it is 0. During inspiration minus 1. During expiration it is plus 1. Transpulmonary pressure is plus 2 mm Hg. It is the difference between, okay, it's a difference between intraalveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. It's a difference, 0 minus of minus 2. It's a plus 2, okay. <coughs> Next. Come on guys. Guys, is it okay? Shall I go forward? Shall I go forward? Hello buddies, shall I go forward? Simple, trust me. You go through all these rapid revisions. Okay, yes, it will be somewhere around 10 hours to 11 hours. But worth watching. Not only just from physio, we have integrated all the questions will be done. Okay. Next, if you are if you are really good students, by this time you should have answered these questions by yourself. Can you tell me what is the major inspiratory muscle? Diaphragm, sir. Now, if you are really good with your anatomy, okay, can you tell me what is the nerve innervating the diaphragm? The nerve innervating the diaphragm is the phrenic nerve. What is the root value of the phrenic nerve? Phrenic nerve is coming from which segments of the spinal cord? Phrenic nerve, the root value is going to be C3, C4 and C5. C3, C4 and C5. Major inspiratory muscle is okay diaphragm. There are other axillary muscles at this point of time, you don't need to remember. There are other axillary muscles like sternocleidomastoid, scalene muscles, sectional intercostals. Right now, not needed. Remember, major inspiratory muscle is the diaphragm. Inspiration is the active process. During like you know, forceful inspiration. There are muscles like sternocleidomastoid, scalene muscles, external intercostals. They will also help in inspiration, but they are accessory, not major. Accessory. Okay. <coughs> Phrenic nerve. What is the root value of Phrenic nerve? C3, C4, C5. Expression is it active or passive? Expression is passive. Expression is passive process. For forceful expression, something like that. Forceful. Like when you will be doing forceful expression, for example, today is your birthday. You, are, you have to blow. You have to blow out the candles. Okay. Or while blowing the balloons, your friend birthday, you are blowing the balloons. So forceful expression, sir. So forceful expression is active. Okay. Forceful expression is active. But normal expression is passive. MCQ is during forceful expression. Which muscle is most important? It's the rectus abdominis. <clears throat> it's a rectus abdominis, a six pack muscle. The rectus abdominis is inverts, a major muscle in the forceful expression. Forceful expression. 
<coughs> what are the collapsing forces of lung? Simple. Which forces are restricting the lung expansion? What is lung expansion? The stretching of the lungs, the distension of the lungs is called as compliance, you know. The stretching of the lungs is measured with the compliance. Simple lung is stretching. Who is opposing it? What are the two forces who are opposing the lung expansion? Two forces are there. One is surface tension. It is a collapsing force. Second one is elastic recoil. The lung is made up of elastin fibers and collagen fibers. So the collagen fibers and elastin fibers, one, as well as the surface tension because of surfac, uh, surface tension which is there inside your alveoli. Surface tension is all the time there because of the air water interference. They are the collapsing forces. So now in the 90 answer, look here. Very, very important. The opposing forces for the lung expansion, one is the surface tension. We will try to collapse the alveolus. The second one is the elastic recoil because of elastin fibers and collagen. If your lung is made up of elastin collagen, they will cause the collapsing of the alveolus. Next, complaints of the lung. Okay, complaints of the lung. Are how complaints is in a simple word? Stretching. How much easily stretchable your lung is? If you give little amount of pressure, for example, one centimeter of water. Okay, one centimeter of water pressure. I am talking about the centimeters of water here, not mm of Hg, centimeters of water. If you give this much amount of pressure, one centimeter of water pressure, lungs will expand, lungs will stretch, lungs will distend by 200 ml, 200 ml. So with one centimeter of water pressure, the compliance of the lungs, the stretchability of the lungs is 200 ml or 0.2 liters. Okay, 200 ml is nothing but 0.2 liters, right? So that's how compliant my lungs are and your lungs are in a healthy individual. Okay. Then compliance of the lung already we have completed. Next, what are the other MCQs? So 90 completed. Compliance of the lung is also completed. Okay. Volumes which are not measured by spirometry. You know, right? There are different types of volumes. Tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume. Uh, residual volume and there are certain capacities also okay here I am talking about both volumes as well as capacities volumes plus capacities which are not measured there is a study called a spirometry with the spirometry which volumes you cannot measure this is MCQ see with spirometry you cannot measure three three things what are they are first thing you cannot measure the residual volume you cannot measure the functional residual <coughs> Capacity. Let me show you here. See, for lung volumes which are not measured are first one residual volume you cannot measure. Whatever you do it for first of all, what is residual volume? I hope you already know this. Whatever the force you do, whatever the effect you effort effort you give, certain amount of gas, certain amount of air will never come out of your lungs. It will never ever come out of your lungs. Whatever you try, it will only come out if you simply. Just lie down your back, ask a big elephant to come and have, like you know, it is standing on your chest, then only it will come, then only your lungs will be compressed, then only residual volume will come, otherwise it will never come out, okay, so residual volume it will never come out sir, without knowing the residual volume you cannot calculate the FRC, without knowing the residual volume you cannot calculate the total lung capacity. So, which volume you cannot calculate, residual volume you cannot calculate and which capacities you cannot calculate, functional residual capacity and the total lung capacity, they are not calculated, then sir. Now, resting lung functions at resting lung, right now see, I am not inspiring, I am not expiring, I am just like this. What is the volume of air that is present inside my lungs? A volume of air that is present in my lungs, now it is called as functional residual capacity. Okay, functional residual capacity. So, this functional residual capacity, what is the formula? See, the functional residual capacity, the formula is residual volume, it cannot come out, it will be all the time there. And expiratory reserve volume. Okay, this expiratory reserve volume and residual volume. Okay, expiratory reserve volume and residual volume, if you add them both, they will give you FRC. So simply tell me, I am like this, at rest. What is the volume of air that is present in my lungs? It is functional residual capacity. So during rest, my lungs are working at functional residual capacity. 
What is functional residual capacity? It includes residual volume and expired reserve volume. Done. Now, many times this question has been asked, very, very important, especially for FMG as well as PG. How to calculate this FRCC, functional residual capacity, and even this residual volume also, functional residual capacity and this residual volume, how to calculate is helium dilution technique. Okay, helium dilution technique and body plethysmography. Here also see helium dilution technique, helium dilution technique, body plethysmography, both for both same things and multiple nitrogen washout method. See, they are the ones here I have already given you. See, these are the methods, helium dilution technique, the best method, the best method to calculate the functional residual capacity is body plethysmography, previously asked in EPG MCQ. Body plethysmography is the best test to measure functional residual capacity. And even to residual, uh, even to measure the residual volume, single breath nitrogen washout method, helium dilution technique, body plethysmography, they are used to measure residual volume, residual volume. Done. So with this, completed. Okay, guys, is it clear? Mountain life, Vijay Kumar. Is it okay? Shall I go forward? Already this I have discussed. What, what is causing the collapsing of the lungs or the recoiling of the lungs? The two collapsing forces already I have discussed. Is the surface tension as well as the elastic recoil. Surface tension and the elastic recoil because of the collagen as well as the elastic. Okay, this is done. Now, look here. If I am the examiner, if I am the examiner, I will give a question from here, definitely. See, here I am discussing about the complaints. Okay, here I am discussing about the complaints. Compliance of the lungs. This graph is called as the pressure volume loop. Now, if I go in detail, you'll, now you will definitely get confusion. No doubt. Because you don't know. I hope you have already know this. Simple, I will ask you two questions. When the lung is more compliant, this is the compliance curve. This is the compliance. This curve or this graph is showing the compliance of a lung. This is the compliance of the lung during inspiration. This is the compliance of the lung during expiration. First tell me the complaints of the lung during inspiration and expiration are the same? Are the same? No. There is a difference in the path. Okay, there is a difference. So complaints of the lung during inspiration and during expiration. The same lungs we have. We are having the same lungs. But the compliant nature of the lungs during inspiration and during expiration is absolutely different. Okay. Now tell me. When lungs are more compliant, right? Lungs are more compliant during expiration. Okay. Lungs are more compliant during respiration. First of all, this graph is a compliant graph. You should, whenever you see this, you should know. Why we are saying it is a compliant graph? Because the compliance formula is Delta V, change in volume. See, here I am talking about the volume must change. Here I am talking about the pressure change. So, Delta V by Delta P. Why I am telling you this like Delta V and Delta P now? Why? Because later we will understand the next slide. So, Delta V by Delta P. See, whenever you see this formula, Delta V by Delta P, it will give you which graph? It will tell you about the compliance. Now, look here. The compliance during inspiration is towards the lower side. And the compliance during expression is towards the higher side. So, mostly students will think, ah, sir, lungs are stretching during inspiration. So, lungs are more compliant during inspiration. No. The lungs are more compliant during expiration. And lungs are less compliant during inspiration. So, there is a difference, right? In the compliance, there is a difference. This difference is called as what? This difference is called as hysteresis. So the difference in the compliance of the lung during inspiration and expiration is called as a hysteresis. And this hysteresis is due to what? Why? Why the compliance is changing, sir, during inspiration and expiration? If you ask me, the difference is because of surface tension. Surface tension. Surface tension. 
So, let me write here, during inspiration, do you know what happens in lung? Surface tension increases during inspiration. See, I'm doing inspiration now. Do you know what happens in my lung? During inspiration, surface tension is more. Why more? This is not the time. During inspiration, the surface tension is more. Whenever the surface tension, surface tension is a collapsing force. Whenever surface tension is more, the compliance is less. So, less complaint. During expiration, okay, during expiration, whenever there is expiration, the surface tension decreases. Okay, surface tension decreases, lungs are going to be more compliant. Okay, during inspiration, expiration, compliance changes. Expiration more compliant, inspiration less compliant. The difference between these pathways is called as a hysteresis. And the hysteresis is the due to surface tension. The surface tension during inspiration and expiration differs. Like, you know, it's different. Why? Here is the explanation when I share the PDF. Okay, when I share the PDF, you can study. Okay? Now, after this, the three graphs which I want you to know. Very, very important, sir. And the examiner, I will definitely give. Especially this is a little integrated with the medicine also as well as inter uh, medicine as well as path also. Now, let's take this blue color dotted line as Average complaints are the normal complaints. Normal healthy person complaints. See, this pink color graph, what is happening? The complaints is increasing or not? When compared to the normal complaints, now in this person, the complaints is increasing. The graph is shifting towards the, like, you know, upper side or to the left side. So the complaints is increasing. The slope of the graph is increasing. Compliance increases. In which condition? In emphysema, sir. In emphysema, compliance increases. Okay. Hope you have already studied. In emphysema, the patient is having large voluminous lungs, barrel shaped chest, hyper resonance is seen. Big, big lungs are seen. So that's why more compliant lungs, bigger lungs. Okay. So emphysema patients have increased complaints. Now, in the second example, see the compliance is falling down. The slope is decreasing. In which condition compliance decreases? Compliance is going to be decreased in the pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary fibrosis in atelectasis. Oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve, Jenny, we'll discuss about that within a minute, okay? Oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve, yeah, we'll discuss about that, okay? Now, I just want to don't uh, deviate from the topic, we'll discuss oxygen association dissociation curves, yeah, here it is there, we'll discuss, okay? Now, where I am, yes, so emphysema, the compliance increases. In pulmonary fibrosis, see lungs are fibrotic lungs. Now small, small lungs, fibrotic lungs. Now they are not stretchable. So compliance or stretchability decreases. Next MCQ is, this is the one. If your lungs are filled with the saline, see saline filled lungs. If your lungs are filled with the saline, what happens? Saline filled lungs, theoretical. Okay, not um, a practical thing. If you fill your lungs with saline, what happened to the complaints of the lungs? Look here. This is the normal person complaints during inspiration, during expiration, the compliance curves. And the difference between them is called as a hysteresis, we know. See, this blue color thing. What happens? Increases, sir. The complaints in saline filled lung increases. Why? Why? Because your entire lungs are now filled with the saline. There is no air entering into your lungs. There is no air water interference. Whenever the air is going into your lungs, whenever there is air and water interference in lungs or alveoli, surface tension develops. But now when your lungs are filled totally with the saline, there is no such thing as air and water meeting point, air and water interference is not there. Whenever there is no air water interference, there is no surface tension. Whenever surface tension collapsing force, whenever it is not there, whenever see, whenever it is not there, now it is e very easy to stretch the lungs. Collapsing force is not there. Now it is easy to stretch the lungs. So, see the compliance increases. Not only compliance increases, I have taught you. Surface tension is not there. So, this difference, hysteresis is also now very minimal. So, whenever you see such a graph, graph is indicating the compliance of lung in saline filled patient. In saline filled lungs, compliance curve is having more slope. Compliance increases. And hysteresis, hysteresis, the difference is also less. Okay, now, after this, 
if your time is bad okay then such kind of questions will come like you know uh, the calculated questions one calculation i want you to know i have already taught you delta v by delta p delta v means what change in volume by change in pressure for a given pressure see try to understand like this i am giving a little pressure more volume is changing which means more compliance i am giving more pressure but only little volume change only little volume change not compliant sir so delta v change in volume according to the change in pressure delta p will give you tell you what will tell you the compliance of a lung or compliance of any particular substance so delta v by delta p is a formula for compliance now in a question they will give you the tidal volume that the patient is taking is 500 ml okay we know this and the intrapleural pressure that's changing during inspiration okay during inspiration the intrapleural pressure changes the intrapleural pressure it is a changing from maybe from minus 4 the intrapleural pressure is minus 4 cm of water always it's minus minus 4 cm of water it is changing to minus 8 cm of water for example so what is the volume change volume change is 500 ml of lungs are expanded 500 ml volume air into the enters into the lungs for how much change in the pressure the change in pressure is 4 cm of water so 4 divided by 500 how much 4 divided by 500 is 125 okay 125 okay so that's the compliance okay for which means for every 1 cm of water pressure for every 1 cm of water pressure this much volume of the lungs are expanded okay this is the compliance so simply tell me what is the compliance formula the formula for the compliance is delta v by delta p when the lungs are more compliant during inspiration or during expiration during expiration lungs are more compliant in a saline filled lungs if you fill your lungs with saline compliance increases or compliance decreases compliance increases okay compliance increases this is the graph okay more slope will be there hysteresis is the difference okay see this difference here more difference is there because of surface tension to here there is there is no surface tension if you fill the lungs with cell lines surface tension is not there so hysteresis also decreases in emphysema more compliant or less compliant lungs will become more compliant in pulmonary fibrosis what happened to the compliance of lung compliance of the lung decreases okay next question is i have removed my lungs out of my thoracic cavity out of my chest cavity i have removed my lungs now i am keeping my lungs here now what happened to the lung volume lung volume is going to increase after taking the lungs out of my chest the lung volume increases or lungs will collapse lung volume decreases what do you think lung volume increases or lung volume decreases see normally your lungs with the help of pleura they are attached to chest wall your lungs see now this is the lung your lung is attached to chest wall your chest wall all the time want to expand the lungs now my right now i am at rest right say i am at rest my chest wall it all the time want to expand out it all the time want to expand out so this chest wall from all the sides from all the sides it is stretching the lungs okay it is stretching the lungs it's keeping the lungs open it's stretching the lungs but the moment you take the lungs out of my thoracic cavity from my chest wall what happens now lungs because of elastin fibers now the chest wall is no longer expanding okay chest wall is no longer expanding the lungs so what happens now is lungs will start to collapse so lung volume decreases mcq this was the mcq so this kind of hypothetical questions will also be asked so if the lungs are removed out of the thoracic cavity what happened to the lung volume lung volume decreases okay lung volume is going to be decrease to do some uh, direct single layer kind of questions now what's the partial pressure of oxygen in the environment these are basic direct single layer questions uh, yeah it will be better if you know this what's the partial pressure of oxygen in the environment it is 104 mm hg in the oxygen sorry in the environment oxygen is there no so this oxygen entire pressure of the atmosphere is 760 mm of hg we know it what is the partial pressure of oxygen oxygen pressure is 104 mm hg what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli oh sorry 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 
this is not 104 mm hg it will be 160 okay here yeah directly i will show you here see it's 160 that's a, that's my mistake yeah i got a little confused so partial pressure of oxygen in the environment is 160 mm hg okay so what is partial pressure the pressure exerted by an individual gas like oxygen nitrogen carbon dioxide so what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the environment is uh, 160 mm of hg the partial pressure of oxygen p capital a o2 the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus in the alveolus it is 104 mm hg okay these are the constant values round figure remember 100 mm hg now in a normal healthy individual physiological dead space is equivalent to i am a healthy individual i hope i am in a normal healthy individual there is something called as physiological dead space anatomical dead space see in a healthy individual the physiological dead space is equal to anatomical anatomical dead space see anatomical dead space is nothing but you know the conducting zone is there right the first like you know this areas where there is no exchange of gases so the conducting zone is the area where there is no exchange of the gases so it's considered as a dead space how much ml 150 ml 150 ml in a healthy individual the same anatomical dead space is the physiological dead space so anatomical dead space and physiological dead space they are just 150 ml okay there is no such thing as pathological dead space okay next ventilation perfusion ratio favorite favorite question okay See, the ventilation perfusion ratio of the lung is how much? Direct one single value if you want to say. So, the ventilation perfusion ratio of a lung is 0 0.8. That's it. Ventilation perfusion ratio is 0 0.8. But the ventilation perfusion ratio is different in the apex of the lung, in the base of the lung. Ventilation perfusion ratio is a maximum in the apex. How much value? 3.2. Some books mention 3.3, 3.4. The ventilation perfusion ratio in the apex of the lung is 3.2. In the base, how much, sir? In the base, it is a minimum. In the base, it's going to be 0 0.6. Okay. In the apex, it is 3.2. In the base, it is 0 0.6. But generally, if someone asks you, ventilation perfusion ratio, V by Q, ventilation means V, Q means the perfusion. V by Q ratio, ventilation perfusion ratio is going to be 0 0.8. Okay. In the apex, it is 3.2. Maximum, maximum in the apex, least in the base. Okay, least in the base. Then, sir. See, perfusion is maximum in. I am showing you my lung. Okay, in this lung, apex, middle lobes as well as base. Where do you think more blood supply will be there? Maximum perfusion. Base are in the apex. Remember, the base of the lung is having maximum ventilation as well as a maximum perfusion. Maximum ventilation and perfusion. Okay, perfusion plus ventilation also. Are maximum in the base. Okay, the base, both ventilation as well as perfusion, both are maximum. No doubt. Measurement of diffusion of gases. Diffusion of the gases. Oxygen diffusion, carbon dioxide diffusion, carbon monoxide diffusion. The diffusion of these gases is measured by using a study. Do you know what is a study called as? A study is called as a DLCO. Diffusion lung capacity using carbon monoxide. Diffusion in the lung measured by carbon monoxide, DLCO. Which gas we are using? Carbon monoxide. Why? Because carbon monoxide have more affinity with the hemoglobin. So what is the study for diffusion? DLCO. Question is, in which condition DLCO is going to be decreased? And in which condition DLCO? Diffusion. Diffusion in the lungs. In which condition diffusion increases, sir? In which condition diffusion decreases, sir? See? Diffusion first. Decrease in DLCO. Diffusion is decreasing. In which condition? Emphysema. Okay, in emphysema. in emphysema, the alveolar septa, because of excessive uh, protease activity, because of the excessive protease activity, the alveolar septa are going to be damaged. As alveolar septa are damaged, the surface area decreases. In emphysema, the surface area of the alveoli decreases. Because of that, diffusion decreases. So, DLCO, or the diffusion is decreased in which disease? Emphysema. As well as pulmonary fibrosis lungs are fibrotic alveoli are fibrotic now when the alveoli are fibrotic the alveolar basement membrane is now thick thick fibrotic alveoli do you think diffusion will happen properly now 
diffusion decreases. So DLCO, it is decreased in which conditions? Emphysema as well as fibrosis. But in which conditions, under which conditions, more and more diffusion will happen? Diffusion, uh, let me add one more thing, decreased diffusion is going to be seen in anemia. Okay, anemia. Anemia means what? No hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, not enough amount of hemoglobin is going to the lungs. Hemoglobin is the one which binds with the carbon monoxide. If hemoglobin is not going, diffusion decreases. So in anemia, diffusion decreases. Emphysema diffusion decreases. Pulmonary fibrosis, DLCO decreases. But in which condition diffusion increases? Is polycythemia. Okay, polycythemia. Means polycythemia means what? More RBC, more hemoglobin, more hemoglobin is going there to the lungs. So it will rapidly, rapidly take the carbon monoxide. So more diffusion will happen because of the gradient. More and more diffusion will happen. Next, exercise. Okay, exercise means there will be vasodilation, more blood will be going to the uh, lungs for the purpose of oxygenation. More oxygen demand is there, right, whenever you are doing exercise. So, during exercise and during polycythemia, DLCO increases. Okay. Next step. The anatomical dead space I have already discussed with you. Anatomical dead space is equivalent to physiological dead space. Anatomical dead space is measured by lots of times question asked. FMG exam, NEET PG exam, INACTX, all exams. How to calculate anatomical dead space? Remember one word, Fowler's method, also called as single breath nitrogen method. Single breath nitrogen method. See, now let me show you. Residual volume, also we have discussed. See, residual volume, it is a multiple breath nitrogen washout method. Okay, multiple breath, same thing. Here it is a multiple breath nitrogen washout method it is used to measure residual volume. But for the calculation of anatomical dead space, there is a single breath nitrogen washout method which is used, which is also called as Fowler's method. And what is the formula used for the calculation of physiological dead space? Physiology, boring subjects or something like that. You saying? So, Bohr's equation. So, physiological, remember, physiological dead space, it is measured with Bohr's equation. Okay, Bohr's equation. The formula for Bohr's equation is VD by VT. VD by VT, dead space, the dead space calculation. VD by VT is equal to PACO2 minus PACO2 by PACO2. PACO2 minus PACO2 by PACO2. I used to remember something like that. Okay, PACO2, something like PACO2. Okay, PACO2, PACO2. So, PACO2 minus PACO2 by PACO2 will give you, this is the formula. If you time bad, there's such kind of questions, such kind of calculations will come in your exam. But, don't worry. Okay, most of the time FMG exam, they won't ask you to do simple. Bohr's equation is used to calculate the physiological dead space. <coughs> and anatomical dead space is calculated by Fowler's method. Last. We came last. <coughs> this completed. All these questions are also completed. Now, here, I want you to know one thing. One. See, this is the apex of the lung. This is the apex lobe of the lung. Okay. This is the middle lobes of the lung. Okay. And this is the base of the lung. Okay, where maximum blood flow is there, maximum perfusion, see, in the base of the lung, concentrate, there is a continuous blood flow, only this one point I want you to know, why there is continuous blood flow, there is a reason, okay, why, because the arterial pressure, pulmonary artery pressure is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure, than the alveolar pressure, there is a reason, but I don't want you to go now in that detail, base of the lung, there is continuous blood flow. Continuously base of the lung is getting perfused. More and more blood is going there. Because more pulmonary artery pressure. The pulmonary artery pressure in the base is more. So the continuous blood is going. In the apex of the lung, topmost areas of the lung, there is least blood flow, almost nil. In the apex of the lung, there is least blood flow, MCQ. Why? Because the alveolar pressure, the alveoli are having more pressure. This alveoli is actually compressing the blood vessels. See. In the apex of the lung, if you look here, the alveolar, because of the more alveolar pressure, it's actually compressing the pulmonary capillaries and the pulmonary arteries. So, the alveolar pressure, P capital A, means alveolar pressure is more. But in the base of the lung, the arterial pressure is more, P small a. But in the middle lobe of the lung, this is called as the watershed area. Okay? This, sorry, this is called as the... Uh, the uh, waterfall effect where sometimes blood flow happens, sometimes doesn't happen. Intermittent blood flow. Okay. A medium range thing. Okay. So, the middle lobe is the <coughs> intermittent blood flow area. Why? Why? Because see here, yes, pulmonary artery pressure is more. 
than okay see pulmonary artery pressure is more than pulmonary sorry pulmonary artery pressure is more than the alveolar pressure okay pulmonary artery pressure is more than the alveolar pressure but compare compare the base as well as the middle if you compare the base as well as the middle see in the base of the lung pulmonary artery pressure is more than the pulmonary venous pressure even this pulmonary venous pressure even the venous pressure is greater than the pulmonary artery pressure so here the not artery alveolar pressure so here the alveolar pressure is least least but in the middle lobes yeah pulmonary uh, this alveolar pressure okay this al capital a means alveolus alveolar pressure is little more than the venous pressure so simple man no need to remember in that much detail simple mcq in the apex of the lung least blood flow okay why because the alveolar pressure alveolar pressure is more compressing the blood vessels in the base of the lung there is continuous blood flow okay there is continuous blood flow because pulmonary artery pressure is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure greater than the alveolar pressure the middle lobes are called as the intermittent areas zones of inter, uh, intermittent blood flow okay this is called as a waterfall effect here in the middle lobes pulmonary artery pressure yes it is greater than the alveolar pressure but the alveolar pressure is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure okay if you can remember you can remember it that's good okay and already i have taught you the ventilation perfusion ratio in the lung the ventilation perfusion ratio v by p the ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.8 in the apex it is 3.2 in the base it is 0.6 okay already i have discussed two important mcqs which i want you to know is are look here and tell me this is the lung in the lung please tell me the alveoli which are present in the apex they are bigger in size right so larger alveoli is present where in the apex so in the apex the alveoli size is more and in the base okay if you look at the base of the lung what about the alveolar size in the base they are small small alveoli are present in the base of the lung remember that thing. one one difference so apex contains the larger alveoli base contains the smaller alveoli apex already i have taught you the ventilation perfusion ratio is 3.2 in the base theory uh, the ventilation perfusion ratio is 0.6 okay just only know these things uh, other things i don't want you to remember okay main areas i am concentrating main areas and next important point is this with this if you know this enough respiratory physiology all the important points are completed will be completed what is this graph sir first point number 1 this is oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve okay oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve now the blue color thing whatever is there in the middle this fellow the blue color one this is normal okay there are certain conditions where there will be right shift right shift the curve is shifting towards right and there are certain conditions where the curve is going to shift towards the left there will be a right shift there will be a left shift first number one question especially in the board exams indian exams like in you know, usml exams they will ask you what is the shape of this graph oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve the shape is going to be sigmoid in shape it's not a straight line like this it's a sigmoid why because of a phenomena called as positive cooperativity okay there is something phenomena called as a positive cooperativity uh, I, i don't want to go into the phenomena the hemoglobin have four sides of oxygen binding binding of one oxygen molecule will cooperate the binding of the other oxygen molecule simple i don't want to go there simple the oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve the shape of this curve is sigmoid because of a phenomena called as positive cooperativity okay next step. how many changes can happen there will be a right shift there will be a left shift okay so what is this right shift and left shift let me tell you in a simple way let i will also give you a little like an explanation for you to understand at the level of tissues see normally at the level of tissues at the level of lungs the oxygen saturation see the oxygen saturation is 100% okay the oxygen saturation is 100% okay at the level of lungs the not oxygen saturation the hemoglobin saturation hemoglobin is having all four molecules of oxygen attached let me tell you look at the blue one at 40 okay look here in your tissues the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 now tell me when the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues when it is 40 hemoglobin is how much percent saturated hemoglobin is 75% saturated okay now think logically 75% saturated means 
only one oxygen molecule is delivered. Normally, four oxygen molecules should be there with the hemoglobin. Four oxygen molecules. When the four molecules are there, you can say it is 100% saturated. Normally, in a normal resting man, like me, for example, I am resting. Now, at the level of my tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 mm Hg. When the partial pressure of oxygen at my tissues is 40 mm Hg, hemoglobin will release one oxygen. It will release one oxygen to the tissues. So, hemoglobin will become 75% saturated now. Why, why? Because one oxygen molecule is delivered. Now, imagine after the class, I am going onto the streets and I am running. Okay, I am running. When I am doing exercise or when I am like, you know, sprinting. When I am doing exercise, what hemoglobin should do? My metabolic demands are more. My muscles need more oxygen. So, hemoglobin have to deliver more oxygen. Instead of delivering one oxygen, now hemoglobin very good molecule, it will deliver two oxygen molecules. So, that is called as a right shift. So, under certain conditions, like exercise, when body temperature increases during exercise, when carbon dioxide levels increases during exercise, when the pH increases during exercise, all these things will bring the change in the nature of hemoglobin in such a way, now it will become a good donor. Instead of delivering one oxygen molecule, it is delivering two oxygen molecules. Now, same thing, see in the graph. Now, for the same 40 mm Hg pressure, okay, for the same 40 mm Hg pressure, look, what is happening on the green? What is happening to the hemoglobin uh, saturation? It is coming to 50. Hemoglobin saturation from 75, it came to 50, which means instead of one molecule being delivered to the tissues, now two molecules are getting delivered. Means more oxygen is getting released. More oxygen is available to the tissues. Okay, that's it. So whenever you are not doing any work, for example, now you are hibernating. Your tissues doesn't need any oxygen. Then hemoglobin will say, if you don't want any oxygen, I don't feel, I won't deliver any oxygen. So there will be right shift. Okay, so under certain conditions, like when your body temperature decreases, your metabolic activity decreases, whenever there is alkalosis. There are certain conditions which can cause left shift in the oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve. Now look for the same 40 mm Hg pressure. Okay, now look here. At the same 40 mm Hg pressure, now in this individual, how much is hemoglobin saturated? Hemoglobin is now almost maybe 90% saturated. 90% saturated, which means not even one molecule is delivered. Not even one molecule is delivered. Why? Because tissues are not asking for oxygen. Tissues are not having any metabolic activity. The body temperature is less. The pH is more. Okay. The carbon dioxide levels are less. Now in this condition, the oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve shift to right. Okay. So now, at the end of the day, even if you understand the concept, doesn't understand the concept, simply by heart this thing. What is that? Right shift means during exercise, more oxygen is getting delivered. Which means it's a low affinity state. Hemoglobin is not loving to bind with oxygen. Now, hemoglobin is, doesn't want oxygen. Hemoglobin is delivering the oxygen. So, low affinity. So, right shift is considered as a low affinity state. See in which condition? In exercising conditions. Whenever there is hypercarbia, more carbon dioxide in the body. Whenever there is hypoxia, acidosis, low pH or more proton concentration. Whenever the body temperature increases or whenever there is production of this 2,3 BPG, 2,3 bisphosphoglycerate, the, the production of this 2,3 bisphosphoglycerate molecules in the RBC can also cause right shift. So simple, right shift, low affinity state. More oxygen delivering to the tissues. Which conditions? Exercising muscle, hypercarbia, more temperature, low pH, more, uh, more proton concentration, 2,3 BPG, more temperature. Right shift. Exact opposite thing is left shift. Left shift means hibernating. Okay, simple, no activity in the body. Low temperature. Now hemoglobin will say, tissues don't want oxygen, I won't deliver oxygen. Simple. So, left shift is a high affinity state, which means the hemoglobin is totally binding with the oxygen. In which conditions? Whenever the temperature, body temperature decreases and the conditions like alkalosis, alkalosis means the proton concentration is less, the carbon dioxide concentration, all these are the low metabolic activities. Okay, seen in the low metabolic activities, carbon dioxide less, proton less, alkalosis, body temperature decreases and fetal hemoglobin, especially in the fetus, in the fetus, there will be this fetal hemoglobin. This fetal hemoglobin is an example of high affinity state. It tightly binds, it tightly binds with the oxygen. Okay, why? Because fetal lungs are not mature. 
this uh, the kind of hemoglobin which is present in the fetal RPCs is this fetal hemoglobin with the gamma chains. They will tightly go and bind with the oxygen in the placenta. Okay. So now tell me, left shift is seen in low temperature, low sorry high body pH or low proton concentration or alkalosis or fetal hemoglobin. Okay. So these are the things which I want you to know. So tell me. Oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve have two shifts, right shift as well as left shift. So these are the important points. And so the last slide in the respiratory thing. Most of the oxygen is transport. Most of the oxygen is transported in the which form? Okay, you have taken the oxygen. Now this oxygen, where it have to go? It have to go to the tissues. Most of the oxygen is transported in which form? In dissolved form? No. Most of the oxygen is, is transferred in the form of oxyhemoglobin. So, oxyhemoglobin is the major form of oxygen transport. What is the most important form of carbon dioxide transport? The most important form of the carbon dioxide transport is bicarbonate ions, HCO3 minus ions. So, HCO3 minus ions are the form of carbon dioxide transport. Already I have discussed with, uh, this with you. Oxygen hemoglobin association dissociation curve is a sigmoid. It's not straight. It's sigmoid. Why it is sigmoid? Sigmoid it is due to something called as a positive cooperativity. It's due to the positive cooperativity. Factors causing the right shift already I have discussed with you. And factors causing the left shift also I have discussed with you. Okay. So there is something called as a chloride shift. Okay. There is something called as a chloride shift or a hamburger's phenomena. See this chloride shift or Hamburger's phenomena, what exactly is it is, see, imagine this is your RBC, okay, let me give you a simple example, these are your tissues, okay, these are your tissues, tissues are producing what carbon dioxide, now this carbon dioxide where it will go, it will come into the RBC, in the RBC the carbon dioxide will react with the water, helps in the production of H2CO3 carbonic acid. This carbonic acid, it will split into HCO3 minus ions as well as H plus. This HCO3 minus ions, see this is nothing but the carbon dioxide, right? The carbon dioxide have changed its form to HCO3. Now this HCO3, now where it will come? It will come into the plasma. Okay, carbon dioxide, now it is going to the lungs through the plasma in the form of which ion? HCO3 minus ion. That's why I have shown you here. So what is the, most of the carbon dioxide is transported in which form? HCO3. Where? In plasma. In the form of, uh, in the in the form, in the plasma. See, when this HCO3 minus, if you want to send this HCO3 minus into the plasma, one HCO3 minus, one negative charge, it is going out of the cell. If you want to send one negative charge out of the cell, in order to maintain the electron neutrality, you have to bring one negative charge into the cell. So, in exchange for bicarbonate, chloride came into the cell. This is called as chloride shift. So chloride shift. So chloride shift or hamburger phenomena is seen at the level of capillaries in the tissues. Okay. So these are the important points which I want you to know. So with this, respiratory physiology is also completed. All the important uh, topics whichever are needed are completed. So guys, in the next 20 minutes, okay, in the next 20 minutes, please wait will complete the central nervous system also so that it will be completed. So in central nervous system, okay, in central nervous system, first number thing, uh, num uh, number one thing which you need to know, see, what you need to keep in your mind, what are the important areas, what are the important areas, see, number one important area is the different types of touch receptors, different types of touch receptors. In the nerve physiology, the number one area which you need to know is the classification of nerve fibers. Erlanger Grassi classification, A fibers, B fibers, C fibers. Okay, that is the number one area. In the muscle, in the muscle, you need to know power stroke and the detachment of the myosin heads. You need to know about the titan, desmin, dihydropyridine. They are important. Here in central nervous system, the number one area which you need to know is the types of touch receptors. Okay. Now, how many types of touch receptors are there? The mnemonic is MMRP, like maximum retail price is there, right? Like MMRP. In our skin, there are four types of touch receptors. 
what are they mesinous carpocils merkel cells pacinian carpocils and ruffini sending see in our skin there are four different types of touch receptors present okay four different types of touch receptors present now these touch receptors they will detect different different forms of touch what are they for example mesinous carpocils miss there miss miss means female with a female how you have to talk rudely or gently you have to talk very gentle with a miss so this mesinous carpocils will be activated with a gentle tap gentle tapping will activate the mesinous carpocils gentle tapping one thing so with the female how you have to talk with high frequency or low frequency gentle with low frequency so low frequency vibrations vibrations are nothing but a form of touch right so low frequency vibrations gentle tapping is going to stimulate the mesinous carpocils and this mesinous carpocils are going to be maximum in lips and fingertips in lips and in the fingertip areas this mesinous carpocils are going to be more than next type of touch receptor is merkel cells important point about the merkel cells is see this merkel cells they are sensitive to edges and corners now see now i am able to sense this edge right edge of the table okay edge of the table corners okay so which receptors are sensitive to edges and corners elevations and depressions is going to be the merkel cells these are also type of touch receptors and in your exam they will ask you for reading braille script braille script means that elevation depressions will be there right it's a form of script which is used by the blind people okay so for braille script which receptors will be helpful again it's a merkel cells so braille script reading edges and corners sensitivity is there for the merkel cells next pacinian carpocils they are the largest capsulated now if you look here these fellows see they are having a capsule they are having like you know multi layered capsule is there and they are present where they are present deep inside the skin okay they are present deep inside the skin so deep pressure high frequency vibrations will stimulate the pacinian carpocils they are largest they are capsulated they are present deep inside the skin so who will stimulate it deep pressure deep touch high frequency vibrations are going to stimulate the pacinian carpocils okay capsulate largest deepest and deep touch and high frequency vibrations so these are the points which i want you to know three at least three ruffini sending is i don't want you to know so mesinous merkels as well as pacinians okay now after this what you should know is this attracts every time in your exam they will ask you especially from physio as well as anat okay they, they will be in this question there is something called as here this is the tract can you tell me what is this tract which is going in the lateral column from the spinal cord this tract is going to the thalamus and from there it is going to the cortex this is lateral lateral spino thalamic tract lateral spinothalamic tract so this lateral spinothalamic tract it is going to carry which type of information mcq the lateral spinothalamic tract sir come on guys anyone bill gajendra yadav mountain life jenny samantha mir can you tell me the lateral spinothalamic tract okay check your anatomy knowledge the lateral spinothalamic tract is going to carry temperature okay temperature as well as pain pain and temperature will be carried by the lateral spinothalamic tract okay mcq and here appreciate there is this tract which is going in the anterior column of the spinal cord not in the lateral column but in the anterior column it is going from the spinal cord to thalamus so this is anterior spino thalamic anterior spinothalamic tract this anterior spinothalamic tract is going to carry which type of information which type of sensations to the central nervous system it's going to carry crude touch and pressure the crude touch and pressure no this both lateral spinothalamic tract as well as anterior spinothalamic tract see both of them are crossing they will they will cross to the opposite side they are ipsilateral see they are not traveling on the ipsilateral side they are they are crossing to the opposite side so they are contralateral they are traveling in the contralateral side so both the, this spinothalamic tract the lateral spinothalamic tract as well as the anterior spinothalamic tract they are crossed tracts the crossing is happening at the level of spinal cord 
they are traveling in their contralateral sides. Lateral spinothalamic tract is going to carry the temperature as well as pain. The anterior spinothalamic tract is going to carry the crude touch as well as the pressure. Okay. Now, this kind of questions that will come in your exams. Okay, this is the kind of question which was asked even in the recent neat PG exam. Cardiotomy of left lateral spinothalamic tract. Okay. See, left side, lateral spinothalamic tract is gone. What will happen? If a lateral, see, if lateral spinothalamic tract is damaged, mm -hmm. Okay, if lateral spinothalamic tract is damaged, temperature and pain will be lost. If left-sided tract is damaged, then right-sided the sensations will be lost. Why? Because the sensations from the right side of the body, the sensations from the right side of the body, they will cross to the opposite side. So, if left lateral spinothalamic tract is damaged, right-sided sensations will be lost. Okay, so pain and temperature sensations lost from right side. Okay, that's the point which I want you to know. So, spinothalamic tracts are completed. Okay. Now, there is one more type of sensory tract. Do you know what is that? It's a dorsal column tracts, dorsal column pathways. Hope you have shared this in anatomy also. It will come in physio as well as anat. Dorsal column tracts, which means, see, this is the dorsal column of the spinal cord. Here, these tracts are going. Dorsal column tracts, which includes fasciculus gracilis, fasciculus cuneatus. This, this tract is the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus. Gracilis and cuneatus. The only point which I want you to know is, sir, this dorsal column tracts, they are carrying which type of sensation? They are also going, they are also taking the information to the brain. But which type of sensation? Fine touch uh, or crude touch? See, advanced sensations. See, now here I am talking about the advanced sensations like fine touch. Okay, very fine touch, a feather, like a feathery touch, fine touch, vibration, vibratory sense, proprioception, stereognosis, two-point discrimination. All these senses are considered as the advanced sensations. Okay? Now, you know about the stereognosis. I, I hope you have already know about the stereognosis. Stereognosis means ability to identify the object without looking, ability to identify the object just with tactile sensation. Ah, it's looking like a pen. It's looking like a water bottle. It's looking like a book. That's a stereognosis. So, these are the advanced sensations. What are they? Fine touch, vibration, proprioception, conscious proprioception. That's a word is important. Conscious proprioception, stereognosis, and two-point discrimination. These are the advanced sensations carried by the dorsal column pathways. Next, see, look here, these primitive sensations, like, these are the primitive sensations, right, touch, pain, temperature, pressure, touch, pain, temperature, pressure, touch, pain, temperature, pressure, these are the primitive sensations. All these primitive sensations, see, they are going to nucleus, no doubt, they are going to the nucleus. And even these advanced sensations, even these advanced sensations are also, see, they are coming and even they are going to the nucleus. Sorry, they are going to the thalamus, or not nucleus. They are going to the thalamus. Okay. So, both primitive sensations, advanced sensations, touch, pain, temperature, pressure, fine touch, vibration, uh, conscious proprioception, stereognosis, all they are going into thalamus, no doubt. But which nucleus of the thalamus is important? To which nucleus, sir? See, the thalamus is considered as a relay station. All the sensations, doesn't matter, advanced sensations or primitive sensations. All the sensations have to come to the thalamus, so it is considered as a relay station. From the thalamus, third order neurons will start. Okay, actually, see these are the neurons which I am showing you. These are the third order neurons. See, this is the third order neuron. Okay, this is the first order neuron. This is the second order neuron. Okay, there are three orders of neurons. From thalamus, always third order neuron will start. Okay, third order neurons will start. So, from the thalamus, third order neurons are starting. So, which nucleus of thalamus is receiving all the sensations, touch pain, temperature, pressure, and all the advanced sensations are coming to which nucleus of the thalamus? It is ventroposterolateral VPN. So, ventroposterolateral nucleus of thalamus is receiving all the primitive as well as advanced sensations. Done. Next step. Here, what you are seeing is a famous question. Doesn't matter, FMG. Need PG, INICT, USMLE, LAP, doesn't matter. Every exam, they will concentrate on this. What is this? Is brown sequad syndrome. See, half of the spinal cord is gone. Gone. 
means half of the spinal cord is damaged because of a stab injury or because of a bullet injury half of the spinal cord is torn now what happens the patient is going to lose which type of sensations only remember two things whenever this hemisection this is called as a hemisection of the spinal cord half of the spinal cord is gone whenever this happens see this dorsal column pathways are affected advanced sensations are lost as well as this primitive sensations anterior spinothalamic tract lateral spinothalamic tract both are gone so advanced sensations are lost as well as the primitive sensations they are also lost both advanced sensations primitive sensations are lost but important is in this brown sequard syndrome which is the called as a hemisection of spinal cord on the same side of the region for example this is the right side this is the left side okay ipsilateral means same side there is ipsilateral loss of dorsal column sensations okay on the same side of the lesion for example if i have a lesion on this right side or if i have a lesion on the left side on that particular side the dorsal column sensations the advanced sensations are going to be lost below the level of lesion below the level of lesion advanced sensations are lost but on the opposite side of the body the primitive sensations are lost okay so this is the point i want you to know in brown sequard syndrome both primitive sensations gone advanced sensations gone primitive sensations are lost from the opposite side of the body see anterolateral column sensations means primitive sensations touch pain temperature pressure anterolateral column sensations the primitive sensations are lost from the contralateral side of the body the dorsal column sensations which are the advanced sensations are lost from the same side of the body only remember these two at least okay so now just tell me questions in brown sequard syndrome tell me in brown sequard syndrome sir there is ipsilateral loss of advanced sensations like dorsal column sensations advanced sensations lost on ipsilateral side contralateral loss of primitive sensations or contralateral loss of anterolateral column sensations that's a touch pain temperature pressure next in syringomyelia question will be asked if there is a cavity if there is a cavity which is developing in the spinal cord okay if you have a, such a cavity then it is called as a syringomyelia even you can see here in the spinal cord this is an mri which is showing you the syring syring means a cavity cavity developed in the spinal cord whenever there is there there will be dissociative sensory loss okay dissociative sensory loss will be there dissociative if whenever you see this word one single word dissociative sensory loss dissociative sensory loss means see the dorsal column sensations are not affected there is no problem with the dorsal column sensations this crossing tracks are the primitive sensations are going to be damaged so there is a loss of touch pain temperature pressure primitive sensations are lost but the dorsal column sensations are spared advanced sensations are spared only one point uh, syringomyelia there is a cavity within the spinal cord in the center okay in the center of the spinal cord there is a cavity okay if the cavity enlarges more and more problems will add up but initially there will be dissociative sensory loss the patient is going to lose touch pain temperature pressure but the patient is having fine touch but crude touch is gone vibration is there but pressure is gone okay so that is a dissociative anesthesia now after that what else you should know look at this brain here the central region which i am highlighting in this brain this is called as a central sulcus this is called as a central sulcus now back to the central sulcus okay back to the central sulcus there is this pink color area is there no this is called as a post central gyrus the sulcus is a depression now here is a gyrus elevation so this is called as a post central gyrus that is the primary sensory cortex okay in your body that's a, that's the primary sensory cortex it's a sensory cortex all your sensations touch pain temperature pressure vibration all the sensations whatever you are feeling your sensations where they are processing all the sensations are processed in the post central gyrus the area number broadman's area number is 312 mcq broadman's area number is 312 now this blue color area this is called as a pre central gyrus this pre central gyrus is considered as a primary motor cortex motor it will control the motor movements movements of the body okay so the primary motor cortex is present in the pre central gyrus the broadman's area number 4 and 6 
precentral gyrus as well as the postcentral gyrus. One is the somatosensory cortex, other is the motor cortex. Next, other famous MCQ which you need to know is the law of projection. What is law of projection? It explains what? Law of projection explains the phantom limb phenomena. Okay, phantom limb phenomena. It is experience, sorry, it is <coughs> phantom limb phenomena. It is explained by law of projection. What is law of projection in a simple way? Let me tell you. I, I will give you the explanation. For example, now imagine you just cut open my cranium. You have cut open my the cranium, skull vault. Now there is somatosensory cortex. There is this post central gyrus called as a somatosensory cortex. With this electrode, with this electrode, you are stimulating different parts of the somatosensory cortex. Now, where I will feel the sensation? I do not feel the sensation here. I will feel the sensations from my hand. I will feel like someone is touching my hand. Or I will feel that someone is touching my leg. I will feel like that. Okay? No one is touching my hand. But if you stimulate any part in the somatosensory cortex, or if you can stimulate, not, you are not even stimulating the receptors. You are not even stimulating any touch receptors. Nothing. You are simply stimulating maybe the first order neuron you are stimulating. Or the second order neuron. Or the third order neuron. Or the somatosensory cortex. Anywhere in this pathway if you stimulate, I will feel that the sensations are coming from the receptor level. I will feel that someone is actually touching my hand. This is called as law of projection. Anywhere in this pathway, first order neuron, second order neuron, third order neuron, somatosensory cortex, anywhere in this pathway, if you stimulate, the person will feel the sensations from the receptor level. This is the law of projection. It is explaining what it is helpful in understanding something called as a phantom limb phenomena. What is phantom limb phenomena? See, after your graduation, whenever you are working in the clinics, you will understand this. Imagine in the trauma unit, there is this one person who is having a severe crash injury. Now, you are amputing his, for example, lower limb. His lower limbs are absolutely crushed in an injury. Now, you are removing his lower limb. You have removed, amputee. Now, he is an amputee. Lower limb is not there. He is only having one limb. One lower limb is there. The right limb is gone. Okay. After 10 days or 15 days, he is going to come to the clinic. He will say, you, doctor, it sounds weird, but... You know, I am feeling the sensations, itching sensations, pain sensations from my foot. From my foot. But foot, foot itself is not there. There is no foot. There is no lower limb. But he can feel the sensations from the foot, pain sensations from the foot. Many patients who are amputees will say this. 70% of the patients will say this. How? How this is explained? There is no foot, but how he is feeling? Because still pathway is there, right? Foot is gone. But... The second order neuron, third order neuron, still the somatosensory cortex is still intact. If there is any electrical activity in this pathway, okay, if there is any irritation in this pathway, now what will happen is, he will feel the sensations. So, the phantom limb phenomena, it is explained by law of projection. Okay? Done. Completed, sir. Now, last. Retina. You are coming last. Retina. Okay, the special senses, retina. Retina have how many layers? 10 layers are there. In the retinal, 10 layers are there. You will study this in detail in your ophthalmology. But my point is, sir, what are the first order neurons, second order neurons and third order neurons? In this retina, who is considered as a first order neuron? The photoreceptor layer, this last layer, this rods and cones, these are considered as first order neurons. Okay, rods and cones are the photoreceptor layer. And the bipolar cells, we have discussed Pseudo unipolar neurons are seen in the dorsal root ganglion. Bipolar cells are seen in the retina as well as the olfactory epithelium. See that same bipolar cell. Okay, this guy. Okay, see two poles. Okay, bipolar cells. Bipolar cells are considered as the second order neurons. Okay, and the ganglionic cells. These are the ganglionic cells. Okay, these are the ganglionic cells. These ganglionic cells are considered as the third order neurons. So now tell me, in the visual pathway, who is the first order, second order, and third order neuron? First order neurons are the photoreceptor cells, second order neurons are the bipolar cells, third order neurons are the ganglionic cells. <coughs> Sorry. See, these are the ganglionic cells, right? The axons, these are the axons of the ganglionic cells. See, these axons of the ganglionic cells, so do you know what they form? A collection of the axons of the ganglionic cells are nothing but the optic nerve. 
So optic nerve, it is formed by it's nothing but if you cut open the optic nerve, what you will see, you will see the axons of the ganglionic cells. The axons of the ganglionic cells are the ones which are forming the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve. Okay, the one point which I want you to know now. So I have already said to you the ganglionic cells. The ganglionic cells are the ones forming the optic nerve. Optic nerve MCQ. That's the MCQ. Okay, that's why it's considered as the output cell. Optic nerve is coming out, right? This is the optic nerve. So this optic nerve is nothing but the axons of ganglionic cells. Next step, what you should know. See, this is the optic pathway. You know it. This is the optic nerve. This is the optic chasm. These are the optic tracts. In the neat PG, in the last neat PG exam, which was happened, I think almost 120, 130 days back. This question was asked. Okay, I will tell you what is the question, but you should know. See, this is the area of optic asthma. If optic asthma is damaged, what happens? If optic asthma is damaged, let me tell you. See, compression of the optic asthma is going to cause what kind of vision loss? Vision loss will be there. See, on both the sides, the temporal vision, okay, the side vision, both the sides, the temporal vision is lost. So, compression of the optic chasm because of maybe prolactinomas, the tumors, okay, the tumors of the anterior pituitary. See, if this area, optic chasm, if it is damaged, what happens if optic chasm is damaged, the person is going to have bitemporal on both the sides, half of the vision is lost, half of the vision is lost. Okay, next, this is the question which was asked in the NEET PG exam, this question. Why optic asthma damage will cause bitemporal hemianopsia? Not now in detail, simple remember, optic asthma damage will cause bitemporal hemianopsia. Now, if there is a damage at this level, what is this? Optic tracts, these are the optic tract, right? Whenever this optic tract is damaged, gone, what kind of vision loss will be seen? Bitemporal hemianopsia? No. Now, whenever this optic chiasm is damaged, see, yes, now again, half of the vision is lost, but not by temporal. One side, temporal vision is lost, on the other side, the nasal vision. Here is the nose, this is the nasal vision. In this side, this side vision loss, in this side, this side vision loss. So, this is called as homo nimus hemi anopia. Homo nimus, homo nimus hemi anopia. Okay. So, homo nimus hemi anopia, it is due to damage. Where? Where the damage? Damage in the optic tract. Okay. Damage in the optic tract. Optic chiasm damage. Optic chiasm damage is going to cause bitemporal hemi anopia. Hemianopsia, okay. Next step. Important MCQ, which I expect that will come in your exam is lateral geniculate body. Okay, in this visual pathway, optic nerve, you know, optic, see, this is the optic nerve, optic chasm, you know, the center point. After that, there is optic tract, this is the optic tract, you know. Now, where this optic tract is going? Sir, optic tract is going into an area called, see, the, all this optic tract, this is the right optic tract. Look here, this is the right optic tract. Where it is going? The right optic tract is going into something called as a lateral geniculate body or the lateral geniculate nucleus. It is made up of how many layers? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 layers are there. I don't want you to know how many layers. Important point is layer number 1 and layer number 2. See, from the layer number 1 and layer number 2, who is coming out? Now, from the layer number 1 and layer number 2, this pink color pathway is coming out. A distinct pink color pathway is coming out. From the layer number 3, 4, 5, 6, this green color pathway which is coming out. So, what are these two pathways? So, there are two pathways which are coming out. From the layer number 1 and 2, magnocellular pathway is coming out. And from the layer number 3, 4, 5, 6, the visual pathway that is coming out is called as a PCP, parvocellular pathway. So, magnocellular pathway coming from the layer number 1 and 2 of the lateral geniculate nucleus. Layer number 3, 4, 5, 6 is giving origin for parvocellular pathway. Now, in your exam, they will ask you, Are these are visual pathways, magnocellular, parvocellular, doesn't matter. They are, they, are, they are carrying the visual information. Which type of visual information? The magnocellular pathway, this is MCP, not MLP. This is the magnocellular pathway. It is carrying information about the movement, flickering of the lights, okay, flickering and the depth vision, the 3D vision. Okay, I can feel the depth in the vision, right? Okay, this is like little forward, that's backward. I can feel the depth in my vision. This is not like a 2D vision, depth. So, Important points, sir. Information about the movement, flickering, depth are carried by the magnocellular pathway. The parvocellular pathway is carrying about information, the color vision, colors, textures, 
fine fine details small small details so color texture and fine details are carried by the parvo cellular pathway okay so these are the important points about the lateral geniculate nucleus six layers layer number one and two gives magnocellular pathway three four five six gives the parvo cellular pathway functions of the magnocellular pathway functions of the parvo cellular pathway important okay now after this regarding the ear i want you to know okay regarding the ear what you should know is Look, this is the cochlea. We know every student knows this is the cochlea. If you do the cross section of the cochlea, this is how the cochlea looks. See, there is this membrane called as the basilar membrane. Okay, there is this membrane which is called as the reasoner's membrane. Basilar membrane is there, sir. Reasoner's membrane is there. The questions what they will ask you is, what is this chamber? Scala vestibuli, scala media, and scala tympani. Now we will tell you what the questions they will ask you. See, question number one by one. What are the receptors of hearing? Most of the students will think cochlea is the receptor of the hearing. No, inside the cochlea, there are these cells. Have you seen? These cells are the hair cells. Okay, these hair cells, especially the inner hair cells, hair cells are of two types, inner hair cells and outer hair cells. The inner hair cells are the receptors of hearing. Rods and cones, photoreceptors, rods and cones are the receptors of vision. The inner hair cells are the receptors of hearing. Now, endolymph is secreted by in the scala media here there is a fluid present okay this fluid it is secreted by stria vascularis so the fluid which is present in the scala media it is called as the endolymph the fluid which is present in the scala vestibula it is called as a perilymph okay so look here endolymph it is secreted by stria vascularis this is also a question which was asked in the nitpj exam organ of corti okay in the cochlea there is something called as organ of corti. Look here. This is the organ of corti. Okay. Here you are seeing the organ of corti. See this organ of corti, it is lying on which membrane? It is lying on a basilar membrane. That's MCQ. Okay. It's lying on the basilar membrane. In the endolymph, yeah, we know the stria vascularis is secreting the endolymph. In the endolymph, which ions are more in concentration? Potassium ions. Okay. So this potassium ions will actually activate whenever sound is coming. This potassium ions are responsible for the activation of the inner hair cells, depolarization of the inner hair cells. So that's why, see, everywhere in the body, sodium will cause a depolarization or calcium will cause a depolarization. Everywhere, most of the places, it's a sodium which causes the depolarization. But here, organ of corti, the inner hair cells, they are little different. So depolarization of the hair cells is due to potassium influx. From where this potassium is coming, potassium ions are richly, highly present in endolymph. Endolymph. Okay. Now, scala vestibuli and scala tympani. These two chambers are there, no? The upper chamber, scala vestibuli and scala tympani. Actually, you are like if you see in this view, they are looking like they are separated. But no. Normally, if I show you cochlea something like this, this is a cochlea. No, I am unwounding the cochlea. Okay, I am unwounding the cochlea. See, this is how the cochlea will be if I unbound it. Okay, untie it. Now, this cochlea is having how many chambers? Three chambers are there. Scala vestibuli, scala tympani, scala media. See, in the scala tympani, sorry, scala vestibuli, who is there? Perilymph. In the scala tympani also perilymph. So, scala vestibuli actually it communicates with the scala tympani. So, there is this area which is called as helicotrima. So, scala vestibuli and Tympani, scala vestibular and tympani communicate via the helicotrima MCQs. Okay, done, sir. And regarding the auditory pathway, is also important. I am not teaching here. That's a, that will also come in the ENT auditory pathway. Do you know the mnemonic for the auditory pathway? Guys, do you know the mnemonic for the auditory pathway? The mnemonic, sir. Do you know? It starts with the letter E. E colima. Okay, E colima. Eighth cranial nerve. C stands for the cochlear nuclei. O stands for the olivary nuclei. Okay, E colima. That's the auditory pathway. That's a mnemonic. Okay, you, you must and should go through it. Okay, that's a very important thing. And next important points about the utricle and saccule. See, we have discussed about the cochlea. Cochlea or function completed. Next, what we have back to it, we are having this vestibule and semicircular canals. No. See, in this vestibule, there is something called as a utricle as well as a saccule. Okay, there is something called as utricle and saccule. So, look here. In this vestibule, this is the area of the vestibule. Okay, this is the vestibule. Not the semicircular canal. Before the semicircular canal, there is vestibule. In the vestibule, two compartments are there. Two compartments. One is called as a utricle and saccule. What is the function of this, sir? Cochlea 
is for hearing. What is this utricle and saccule for? I have written the U something like this, right? What is this? Horizontal. Horizontal. So, this utricle is the one which is responsible for the horizontal linear acceleration. If you sit in a car, if you go forward or if you are going backward, even without looking, even with your closed eyes, you can still say whether the car is moving forward or backward direction. So, this horizontal linear acceleration is going to be sensed by the utricle. And the saccule, saccule, I have shown like a dollar symbol. This is also linear only but vertical. If you stand in a lift, even without closed eyes, you can still say whether the lift is going upward or downward. So, that is a vertical linear acceleration. So, vertical linear acceleration is detected by saccule. Utricle detects horizontal linear acceleration. Now, receptor for linear acceleration. What is the receptor for linear acceleration? Macula. So, in the utricle as well as saccule, in both these areas, in utricle and saccule, there is a receptor present called as a macula. Just like organ of corti, just like inner hair cells, this macula is the one. See, macula is the one which detects a linear acceleration. How many types of linear acceleration are there? Horizontal linear acceleration, vertical linear acceleration. Horizontal linear acceleration is detected by the utricle and vertical linear acceleration is detected by the saccule. And whenever you are bending your body, that is the angular acceleration. Okay, in the three-dimensional space, your body is being bent. That is the angular acceleration. Who will detect this angular acceleration by the semicircular canals? You are having semicircular canals, no? The semicircular canals, it contains something called as crista ampullaris. This is the receptor. So, crista ampullaris is the receptor of angular acceleration. Angular acceleration. Yeah. Horizontal linear acceleration, vertical linear acceleration and angular acceleration. Detected by whom form? Completed. Okay. So, one more point here I want you to know is already I have taught you this. The gamma motor neurons. Where we have discussed sir? Gamma motor neurons. A gamma fibers. A gamma fibers are the Motor neurons going to muscle spindles. Okay, are the fibers going to the muscle spindles? I have discussed this with you. Okay, and alpha motor neurons. Okay, A alpha are the alpha motor neurons going to the muscles for the muscle contraction. Already I have discussed this with you. Uh, here inside the muscle, see inside this muscle there is something called as a muscle spindle. See this muscle spindle is innervated by the gamma motor neuron. Okay, it's innervated by the gamma motor neuron. A alpha, alpha motor neuron is innervating the actin as well as the myosin. Okay, alpha motor neuron is innervating the extra fusel fiber. This is called as the extra fusel fiber. Actin and myosin are considered as the extra fusel fibers. This gamma motor neurons are innervating these fibers which are called as the intra fusel fibers. This, this is the intra fusel fiber, nothing but the muscle spindle. Okay, look here. Gamma motor neurons, they are innervating intrafusal fibers, nothing but the muscle spindles which maintains the muscle tone. So, muscle spindles, one question guys, muscle spindles are innervated by gamma motor neurons. Muscle spindles helps in maintenance of the muscle tone. Okay, so that is the one point which I want you to know. Now, if you are really good, just single error questions. One nucleus, one answer you should say. Supracasmatic nucleus, supracasmatic nucleus, tell me, it is maintaining what? It is maintaining the supracasmatic nucleus, circadian rhythm. Okay, the circadian rhythm is maintained by the supracasmatic nucleus. The supracasmatic nucleus is considered as the biological clock. It's considered as a biological clock. Means every for every 24 hours, the same activities are going to be repeated. Okay, so the supracasmatic nucleus is considered as a biological clock. And is the one responsible for the maintenance of the circadian rhythm. The lateral nucleus. Okay, Henry, yes, you are true. Excellent. Excellent, Yashank. You are also. It's true. That's the gamma motor neuron innervating the muscle spindles. The lateral nucleus of the hypothalamus. Right now I am talking about the different, different nuclei which are present in the hypothalamus. Hypothalamic nuclei is also very important for the exam. Lateral nucleus is considered as hunger center. Okay. So whenever you are not eating food, this hunger center is the one which is responsible for the creation of this feeling of hunger, lateral nucleus. What is this ventromedial nucleus? Ventromedial nucleus, whenever you eat full of food, okay, now you'll feel, oh my god, I don't want to eat anymore. That's the feeling of satiety. So, this ventromedial nucleus is considered as a satiety center. Satiety center. Okay, satiety center, MCQ. 
Now, anterior hypothalamic nuclei. There is a nucleus called as the anterior hypothalamic nuclei. So, anterior hypothalamic nuclei, what it will do is cools your body. Cools the body. Means helping in what? Helping in heat adaptation. Heat adaptation. So, whenever you are in a desert, okay, with the help of sweating, okay, this uh, anterior nucleus of the hypothalamus, it helps in the sweating, it uh, cools down your body. Okay, so adapting your body to the hot environment. And the posterior hypothalamic nucleus is exact opposite thing. Posterior thing is going to warm your body. Warms the body. Okay, helping in cold adaptation. Okay, helping in the cold adaptation. So these are the different nucleus which I want you to know. <coughs> and one more thing, uh, the medial forebrain bundle. One more thing is there, medial forebrain bundle. Uh, Medial It is considered as a reward center Okay, so the reward center is a medial forebrain bundle There is this structure which is a medial forebrain bundle whenever the patient is uh, whenever the person is taking the drugs or whenever the person is enjoying some activity the reward Like you know you will have the pleasure center, right? So that's the medial forebrain bundle. So different nuclei are completed. Now, regarding the ECGs, only four or five important points. There are different types of EEG waves. No, sorry, not ECG, EEG, EEG, EEG. There will be alpha waves, alpha waves, beta waves, gamma waves, delta waves, and theta waves. When these waves are seen, see these waves are nothing but the electrical activity that is happening in the cortex. <clears throat> The electrical activity that happens in the cortex is represented as the EEG waves. For example, see, now let's start from like this. In the morning, morning, I just woke up. I haven't even opened my eyes. I am just sitting like this. I am not thinking about anything. I am not thinking about my life. I am not thinking about my girlfriend. I am not thinking about anything. Simply I am sitting like this, almost in a meditative state with my eyes closed. Now my brain activity is less, not more. My brain, act yes, it, brain is, it's awake. I am awake. Brain activity is there, but less activity. So, less number of waves will come. So, alpha waves will come. So, now, alpha waves seen in relaxed state. When eyes are closed, but not sleeping. Okay, eyes are closed, but not sleeping. Then, alpha waves are going to come. Alpha wave frequency, how many waves will come? 8 to 12 hertz. 8 to 12 waves will come in a second. Okay. So, the frequency of the alpha waves is 8 to 12 hertz. When eyes closed. Relaxed state, almost in a meditative state, but not sleeping. Now, after that, I woke up. Now, daily day activities. I have to work. I have to think. Active thinking now. So, busy active mind. When you are active with the busy day-to-day -day life, <coughs> day -day life activities, then the beta waves will come. Beta wave means what? Are if more number of waves are coming, then it is called as a beta wave. If 8 to 12 waves, if 8 to 12 waves, if they are coming, then it is called as an alpha wave. Beta wave means more number of waves are coming in a particular time. Okay. So, beta wave frequency is 13 to 30 hertz. Okay. 13 to 30 hertz is the frequency of the beta waves. When the beta waves are seen in active mind. This is important. Busy active mind. Okay. This beta wave is also called as, there is one more name. It is also called as the EEG desynchronization wave. If you want to remember, yeah, you can remember it. Next. After that, suddenly I am starting to thinking about my life. How my life. What I have to do. About the FMG exam. Imagine I am a student who is giving the FMG exam. Okay, in 40 days, exam is going to be there. So, intense mental activity. Or I am a scientist who is like, you know, thinking on some formulas, hypothesizing the things. Very intense mental activity. So more number of waves will come. More number of waves. More than 60 waves will come now. <laughs> so, whenever the, pay, uh, whenever the person is showing extreme focus, okay, extreme focus, like problem solving or cognitive processing, then the patient, then the gamma waves are going to come on the EEG. Okay, gamma waves are going to come. So simply tell me, alpha waves are seen during relaxed state. Beta waves are seen during busy active mind. Alpha wave frequency is 12 to, uh, sorry, 8 to 12 hertz. Beta wave frequency is 13 to 30 hertz. Gamma waves are going to be seen during intense mental activity or uh, focus. Okay, focused things. The frequency is going to be more than 60 hertz. Okay, next at the end of the day, after this class, I will go to the sleep. You will also go to the sleep. Okay? 
So, directly do you, will, will you go into the deep sleep? No, first you will go into light sleep. Later you will go into the deep sleep. Right? So, light sleep means little mental activities. That your mental activity is going down. So, see how many waves are going? Coming. For only 4 to 7 waves are coming. You are going into drowsiness, light sleep. So, theta waves are seen. So, theta waves are seen during light sleep. Okay? Now, when you are going into the deep sleep, now you are dreaming. Deep sleep, sir. Only 1 to 3 waves will come. Okay? So, delta waves. So, delta waves are seen in the deep sleep. Light sleep, theta waves are seen. Delta wave frequency is 1 to 3 hertz. Theta wave frequency is 4 to 7 hertz. So, EEG is also completed. Next, regarding sleep, two important points which I want you to know is, so sleep is divided into REM sleep as well as NREM sleep. <laughs> See, all the, like parasomnias, okay, there are certain things called as a parasomnias. Let me show you here itself. The parasomnias, what are these parasomnias? Parasomnias are the abnormalities of the sleep. Okay, abnormalities of the sleep. So during sleep, you have to be like relaxed. You have to be relaxed. Absolutely, you should be happy. Completely taking rest. But what if you are having night terrors? What if you are having somnambulism? You, the person is walking and going away somewhere. What if the patient is talking to himself? Bruxism, grinding the teeth. A nocturnal enuris is passing the urine during like, you know, bedwetting. Okay. So these are the abnormalities during the sleep, right? So all these parasomnias, remember, all of them, they will happen during NREM. MCQ. All the parasomnias will happen during NREM sleep. I have taught you. Sleep is divided into how many types? Sleep is divided into NREM, REM. Okay. First important thing. In NREM, parasomnias. Okay. Abnormalities of the sleep. What are the parasomnias? MCQs. What are the parasomnias? Here I have discussed with you. Somnambulism means sleep walking, sleep talking. Bruxism is grinding the teeth. This is the MCQ. Bruxism is seen in stage 2 NREM. Okay, NREM is divided into many, many types. Stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. A point I want you to know is, sir, this Bruxism is seen during stage 2 NREM. Okay, this somnambulism, walking and going away somewhere. It is seen, that's a slow sleep walking. It is seen during deep sleep, stage 3 and stage 4 NREM. So tell me, sleep is divided into how many phases? NREM, REM, sir. All the abnormalities of the sleep is seen when, sir, the abnormalities of the sleep are seen during NREM only, not REM. Now, next step, point which I want you to know is difference between NREM and REM is <coughs> dreams. When the patient is going to have dreams during NREM or REM? See, dreams are present in both REM and NREM. Dreams will occur in both NREM as well as REM. But dreams are not remembered. See, remember something like, like have a mnemonic. NREM means non-remembered. NREM means non-rapid eye movement. I'm not talking about that. Remember it like NREM, whatever the events happen in NREM, whatever the events that happen in NREM, a person cannot remember anything. Sleepwalking, sleep talking, bruxism, nocturnal neurosis. Tomorrow ask him, Are, what is this all? Like you are waiting everything. He will say, I don't know. Something like that. In the, hey, yesterday night you are talking to someone, you are talking with, with, like you know, during the sleep he will say, me? No, I am not. He will say, yesterday night you are going somewhere, sleepwalking. He will say, no, 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 I am not, I didn't went anywhere. So, whatever the events that happens in the NREM are not remembered. Even the dreams are not remembered. But the dreams that occur in REM are remembered. Okay. So, dreams are going to be remembered. Here, not remembered. In REM, dreams are going to be remembered. That's the one point which I want you to know. Okay. So, REM, NREM, important points. And <clears throat> one more thing, which is, see, in REM, see this, all the muscles in the body during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, there is a sleep called as rapid eye movement sleep, during this, all the muscles in the body are relaxed. So, that's why sleep walking not possible, sleep talking not possible, grinding of the teeth is not possible. Okay. So, the point which I want you to know is, sir, during REM, all the muscles in the body are relaxed. So, parasomnias are not possible. Okay? So, that's the point which I want you to know. These are the points. And uh, the last slide for today, with this, the uh, central nervous system topic will also be completed. Okay, the last slide, basal ganglia. Can you tell me? Now, this slide is for you. Can you tell me what is the function of the basal ganglia? 
What is the function of the basal ganglia? The function of the basal ganglia is <coughs> stores is basal ganglia stores motor programs. Okay, basal ganglia it stores the motor programs. Okay, how a motor activity need to be done? Cycling, walking, swimming, typing, writing, all these are the motor activities, right? How a motor activity should be executed? Which muscles to contract, which muscles to relax? This information about a motor activity, see, I don't know swimming, I don't have the motor planning for swimming. But if I do go for training, yeah, that motor activity, that motor program will be stored in my basal ganglia. Okay, I don't know how to do the somersaulting. If I try my basal ganglia, it will understand, it will learn and it will store the program how to do that motor activity. Okay, so basal ganglia, the function is it stores the motor programs. Okay, sir. Now, MCQ, number one, stores the motor programs. Basal ganglia, what are the components of the basal ganglia? The components of the basal ganglia are cardiac nucleus, putamen. Both this cardiac nucleus and putamen together, they are called as a striatum. Okay, MCQ, very, very important. Striatum includes what? Striatum includes CP. This is the cardiac nucleus and putamen. These are the structures which are present in the uh, brain, the deep parts of the brain. This cardiac nucleus and putamen is considered as the striatum. And it produces which neurotransmitter? It releases the inhibitory neurotransmitter as the GABA. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Okay, GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Very, very important. Lot of times this question has been asked. GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Okay, GABA, GABA and glycine. GABA and glycine are the inhibitory neurotransmitters. Okay, GABA and glycine. Glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter. I will, I will talk about that. Anyway, globus pallidus, it is also producing the GABA. And substantia nigra, which is producing the dopamine, it is present in midbrain. Okay, substantia nigra, it is present in the midbrain. And the subthalamic nucleus, not the thalamus, subthalamic nucleus. There are five components of the basal ganglia. Tell me what are they? They are cardiac nucleus, putamen, Globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and subthalamic nuclei. These are the components of the basal ganglia. Out of these five components, who produces dopamine? Substantia nigra. The dopaminergic neurons are present in substantia nigra. Which nucleus produces the excitatory neurotransmitter? Glutamate. Glutamate is produced by subthalamic nucleus. This is also the MCQ. Okay, this is also MCQ. Okay, these are the components of the basal ganglia. Stratum consists of CP. Cardiac nucleus, putamen. Remember that. Okay. Now, here in basal ganglia, for your FMG, at least for your FMG, what you need to know is, so this basal ganglia, okay, <coughs> there are two pathways present. Okay, there are two pathways present. There is something called as a direct pathway, indirect pathway. See, there's a direct